Chapter 22 Mr. Pickwick journeys to Ipswich and meets with a romantic adventure with a middle-aged lady in yellow curl papers. That, ere your governor's luggage, Sammy, inquired Mr. Weller of his affectionate son, as he entered the yard of the Bull Inn, Whitechapel, with a traveling bag and a small portmanteau. You might hop made a worser guess than that, old feller, replied Mr. Weller the younger, setting down his burden in the yard, and sitting himself down upon it afterwards. The governor hisself will be down here presently. He's a cabin, it, I suppose, said the father. Yes, he's a haven, two mile o, oh, danger at eight pence, responded the son. How's mother-in-law this morning? Queer, Sammy, queer, replied the elder Mr. Weller, with impressive gravity. She's been gettin' rather in the Methodistical order lately, Sammy, and she is uncommon pious, to be sure. She's too good a creeter for me, Sammy. I feel I don't deserve her. Ah, said Mr. Samuel. That's wary self-denying, oh, you. Wary, replied his parent, with a sigh. She's got hold o' oh, some invention for grown-up people being born again, Sammy, the new birth, I think they calls it. I should wary much like to see that system in haction, Sammy. I should wary much like to see your mother-in-law born again. Wouldn't I put her out to nurse? What do you think them women does t'other day, continued Mr. Weller, after a short pause, during which he had significantly struck the side of his nose with his forefinger some half-dozen times. What do you think they does, t'other day, Sammy? Don't know, replied Sam, what? Goes and gets up a grand tea drinkin' for a feller they calls their shepherd, said Mr. Weller. I was a standing starin' in at the picter shop down at our place, when I sees a little bill about it, tickets half a crown. All applications to be made to the committee. Secretary, Mrs. Weller, and when I got home there was the committee a sittin' in our back parlor. Fourteen women, I wish you could ha, heard M, Sammy. There they was, a passin, resolutions, and woden, supplies, and all sorts o, oh, games. Well, what with your mother-in-law a worrying me to go, and what with my looking for art to see in, some queer starts if I did, I put my name down for a ticket. At six o'clock on the Friday evening I dresses myself out wary smart, and off I goes with the old woman, and up we walks into a fust floor where there was tea things for thirty, and a whole lot o' oh, women as begins whisperin' to one another. And lookin' at me, as if they'd never seen a rather stout Gen LMN of eight and fifty afore. By and by, there comes a great bustle downstairs, and a lanky chap with a red nose and a white neckcloth rushes up, and sings out, here's the shepherd a coming to visit his faithful flock. And in comes a fat chap in black, with a great white face, a smiling avery like clockwork. Such goings on, Sammy. The kiss of peace, says the shepherd, and then he kissed the women all round, and then he'd done, the man with the red nose began. I was just a thinking whether I hadn't better begin too, specially as there was a wary nice lady a sitting next me, then in comes the tea, and your mother-in-law, as had been making the kettle bile downstairs. At it they went, tooth and nail. Such a precious loud him, Sammy, while the tea was a-brewing, such a grace, such eaten, and drinkin. I wish you could ha, seen the shepherd walkin, into the ham and muffins. I never see such a chap to eat and drink, never. The red-nosed man warned by no means the sort of person you'd like to grub by contract, but he was nothing to the shepherd. Well. Arter the tea was over, they sang another hymn, and then the shepherd began to preach, and wary well he did it, considering how heavy the muffins must have lied on his chest. Presently he pulls up, all of a sudden, and hollers out, Where is the sinner, where is the miserable sinner? Upon which, all the women looked at me, and began to groan as if they was a dying. I thought it was rather singular, but howsoever, I says nothing. Presently he pulls up again, and looking wary hard at me, says, Where is the sinner, where is the miserable sinner, and all the women groans again, ten times louder than afore. I got rather savage at this, so I takes a step or two forward and says, My friend, says I, did you apply that, hair observation to me? 
Stead of begging, my pardon as any Gen LMN would ha done, he got more abusive than ever, called me a wessel, Sammy, a wessel of wrath, and all sorts o, oh, names. So my blood being reg larly up, I first gave him two or three for himself, and then two or three more to hand over to the man with the red nose, and walked off. I wish you could ha, heard how the women screamed, Sammy, then they picked up the shepherd from underneath the table, hollow. Here's the governor, the size of life. As Mr. Weller spoke, Mr. Pickwick dismounted from a cab, and entered the yard. Fine morning, sir, said Mr. Weller, senior. Beautiful indeed, replied Mr. Pickwick. Beautiful indeed, echoes a red-haired man with an inquisitive nose and green spectacles, who had unpacked himself from a cab at the same moment as Mr. Pickwick. Going to Ipswich, sir. I am, replied Mr. Pickwick. Extraordinary coincidence. So am I. Mr. Pickwick bowed. Going outside, said the red-haired man. Mr. Pickwick bowed again. Bless my soul, how remarkable, I am going outside, too, said the red-haired man, we are positively going together. And the red-haired man, who was an important-looking, sharp-nosed, mysterious-spoken personage, with a bird-like habit of giving his head a jerk every time he said anything, smiled as if he had made one of the strangest discoveries that ever fell to the lot of human wisdom. I am happy in the prospect of your company, sir, said Mr. Pickwick. Ah, said the newcomer, it's a good thing for both of us, isn't it? Company, you see, company, is, is, it's a very different thing from solitude, ain't it? There's no denying that air, said Mr. Weller, joining in the conversation, with an affable smile. That's what I call a self-evident proposition, as the dog's meat man said, when the housemaid told him he weren't a gentleman. Ah, said the red-haired man, surveying Mr. Weller from head to foot with a supercilious look. Friend of yours, sir. Not exactly a friend, replied Mr. Pickwick, in a low tone. The fact is, he is my servant, but I allow him to take a good many liberties, for, between ourselves, I flatter myself he is an original, and I am rather proud of him. Ah, said the red-haired man, that, you see, is a matter of taste. I am not fond of anything original, I don't like it, don't see the necessity for it. What's your name, sir? Here is my card, sir, replied Mr. Pickwick, much amused by the abruptness of the question, and the singular manner of the stranger. Ah, said the red-haired man, placing the card in his pocketbook, Pickwick, very good. I like to know a man's name, it saves so much trouble. That's my card, sir. Magnus, you will perceive, sir, Magnus is my name. It's rather a good name, I think, sir. A very good name, indeed, said Mr. Pickwick, wholly unable to repress a smile. Yes, I think it is, resumed Mr. Magnus. There's a good name before it, too, you will observe. Permit me, sir, if you hold the card a little slanting, this way, you catch the light upon the upstroke. There, Peter Magnus, sounds well, I think, sir. Very, said Mr. Pickwick. Curious circumstance about those initials, sir, said Mr. Magnus. You will observe, P.M., Post Meridian. In hasty notes to intimate acquaintance, I sometimes sign myself afternoon. It amuses my friends very much, Mr. Pickwick. It is calculated to afford them the highest gratification, should conceive, said Mr. Pickwick, rather envying the ease with which Mr. Magnus' friends were entertained. Now, Gen LMN, said the hostler, coach is ready, if you please. Is all my luggage in, inquired Mr. Magnus. All right, sir. Is the red bag in? All right, sir. And the striped bag? For boot, sir. And the brown paper parcel? Under the seat, sir. And the leather hat box? They're all in, sir. Now, will you get up, said Mr. Pickwick. Excuse me, replied Magnus, standing on the wheel. Excuse me, Mr. Pickwick. I cannot consent to get up, in this state of uncertainty. I am quite satisfied from that man's manner, 
that the leather hat box is not in. The solemn protestations of the hostler being wholly unavailing, the leather hat box was obliged to be raked up from the lowest depth of the boot to satisfy him that it had been safely packed. And after he had been assured on this head, he felt a solemn presentiment, first, that the red bag was mislaid, and next that the striped bag had been stolen, and then that the brown paper parcel had come untied. At length when he had received ocular demonstration of the groundless nature of each and every of these suspicions, he consented to climb up to the roof of the coach, observing that now he had taken everything off his mind. He felt quite comfortable and happy. You're given to nervousness, ain't you, sir? inquired Mr. Weller, senior, eyeing the stranger askance, as he mounted to his place. Yes, I always am rather about these little matters, said the stranger, but I am all right now, quite right. Well, that's a blessin', said Mr. Weller. Sammy, help your master up to the box, t'other leg, sir, that's it, give us your hand, sir. Up with you. You was a lighter weight when you was a boy, sir. True enough, that, Mr. Weller, said the breathless Mr. Pickwick good-humouredly, as he took his seat on the box beside him. Jump up in front, Sammy, said Mr. Weller. Now Villem, run, em out. Take care o, oh, the archvay, gen l m n. Heads, as the pieman says. That'll do, Villem. Let, em alone. And away went the coach up Whitechapel, to the admiration of the whole population of that pretty densely populated quarter. Not a very nice neighborhood, this, sir, said Sam, with a touch of the hat, which always preceded his entering into conversation with his master. It is not indeed, Sam, replied Mr. Pickwick, surveying the crowded and filthy street through which they were passing. It's a very remarkable circumstance, sir, said Sam, that poverty and oysters always seem to go together. I don't understand you, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. What I mean, sir, said Sam, is, that the poorer a place is, the greater call there seems to be for oysters. Look here, sir, here's a oyster stall to every half dozen houses. The streets lined with M. Blessed if I don't think that Venna man's wary poor, he rushes out of his lodgings, and eats oysters in Reglar desperation. To be sure he does, said Mr. Weller, senior, and it's just the same with pickled salmon. Those are two very remarkable facts which never occurred to me before, said Mr. Pickwick. The very first place we stop at, I'll make a note of them. By this time they had reached the turnpike at Mile End. A profound silence prevailed until they had got two or three miles farther on, when Mr. Weller, senior, turning suddenly to Mr. Pickwick, said. Wary queer life is a pike keeper's, sir. A what? said Mr. Pickwick. A pike keeper. What do you mean by a pike keeper? inquired Mr. Peter Magnus. The old fund means a turnpike keeper, Gen L M N, observed Mr. Samuel Weller, in explanation. Oh, said Mr. Pickwick, I see. Yes, very curious life. Very uncomfortable. They're all on M men as has met with some disappointment in life, said Mr. Weller, Sr. I, I, said Mr. Pickwick. Yes. Consequence of which, they retires from the world, and shuts themselves up in pikes. Partly with the view of being solitary, and partly to rewenge themselves on mankind by talking tolls. Dear me, said Mr. Pickwick, I never knew that before. Fact, sir, said Mr. Weller. If they was Gen L M N, you'd call M misanthropes, but as it is, they only takes to pike keepin', dot. With such conversation, possessing the inestimable charm of blending amusement with instruction, did Mr. Weller beguile the tediousness of the journey, during the greater part of the day. Topics of conversation were never wanting, for even when any pause occurred in Mr. Weller's loquacity, it was abundantly supplied by the desire evinced by Mr. Magnus to make himself acquainted with the whole of the personal history of his fellow travellers, and his loudly expressed anxiety at every stage, respecting the safety and well-being of the two bags, the leather hat-box, and the brown paper parcel. In the main street of Ipswich, on the left-hand side of the way, 
a short distance after you have passed through the open space fronting the town hall, stands an inn known far and wide by the appellation of the Great White Horse. Rendered the more conspicuous by a stone statue of some rampacious animal with flowing mane and tail, distantly resembling an insane cart horse, which is elevated above the principal door. The Great White Horse is famous in the neighborhood, in the same degree as a prize ox, or a county paper chronicle turnip, or unwieldy pig, for its enormous size. Never was such labyrinths of uncarpeted passages, such clusters of moldy, ill-lighted rooms, such huge numbers of small dens for eating or sleeping in, beneath any one roof. As are collected together between the four walls of the great white horse at Ipswich. It was at the door of this overgrown tavern that the London coach stopped, at the same hour every evening, and it was from this same London coach that Mr. Pickwick, Sam Weller, and Mr. Peter Magnus dismounted, on the particular evening to which this chapter of our history bears reference. Do you stop here, sir? inquired Mr. Peter Magnus, when the striped bag, and the red bag, and the brown paper parcel, and the leather hat box, had all been deposited in the passage. Do you stop here, sir? I do, said Mr. Pickwick. Dear me, said Mr. Magnus, I never knew anything like these extraordinary coincidences. Why, I stop here too. I hope we dine together. With pleasure, replied Mr. Pickwick. I am not quite certain whether I have any friends here or not, though. Is there any gentleman of the name of Tupman here, waiter? A corpulent man, with a fortnight's napkin under his arm, and coeval stockings on his legs, slowly desisted from his occupation of staring down the street, on this question being put to him by Mr. Pickwick. And, after minutely inspecting that gentleman's appearance, from the crown of his hat to the lowest button of his gaiters, replied emphatically. No. Nor any gentleman of the name of Snodgrass, inquired Mr. Pickwick. No. Nor Winkle. No. My friends have not arrived today, sir, said Mr. Pickwick. We will dine alone, then. Show us a private room, waiter. On this request being preferred, the corpulent man condescended to order the boots to bring in the gentleman's luggage. And preceding them down a long, dark passage, ushered them into a large, badly furnished apartment, with a dirty grate, in which a small fire was making a wretched attempt to be cheerful. But was fast sinking beneath the dispiriting influence of the place. After the lapse of an hour, a bit of fish and a steak was served up to the travellers, and when the dinner was cleared away, Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Peter Magnus drew their chairs up to the fire, and having ordered a bottle of the worst possible port wine, at the highest possible price, for the good of the house, drank brandy and water for their own. Mr. Peter Magnus was naturally of a very communicative disposition, and the brandy and water operated with wonderful effect in warming into life the deepest hidden secrets of his bosom. After sundry accounts of himself, his family, his connections, his friends, his jokes, his business, and his brothers, most talkative men have a great deal to say about their brothers, Mr. Peter Magnus took a view of Mr. Pickwick through his colored spectacles for several minutes, and then said, with an air of modesty. And what do you think, what do you think, Mr. Pickwick, I have come down here for? Upon my word, said Mr. Pickwick, it is wholly impossible for me to guess, on business, perhaps. Partly right, sir, replied Mr. Peter Magnus, but partly wrong at the same time, try again, Mr. Pickwick. Really, said Mr. Pickwick, I must throw myself on your mercy, to tell me or not, as you may think best, for I should never guess, if I were to try all night. Why, then, he he he, said Mr. Peter Magnus, with a bashful titter, what should you think, Mr. Pickwick, if I had come down here to make a proposal, sir, eh? He, he, he. Think. That you are very likely to succeed, replied Mr. Pickwick, with one of his beaming smiles. Ah, said Mr. Magnus. But do you really think so, Mr. Pickwick? Do you, though? Certainly, said Mr. Pickwick. No, but you're joking, though. I am not. Indeed. Why, 
Then, said Mr. Magnus, to let you into a little secret, I think so too. I don't mind telling you, Mr. Pickwick, although I'm dreadful jealous by nature, horrid, that the lady is in this house. Here Mr. Magnus took off his spectacles, on purpose to wink, and then put them on again. That's what you were running out of the room for, before dinner, then, so often, said Mr. Pickwick archly. Hush. Yes, you're right, that was it, not such a fool as to see her, though. No. No. Wouldn't do, you know, after having just come off a journey. Wait till tomorrow, sir, double the chance then. Mr. Pickwick, sir, there is a suit of clothes in that bag, and a hat in that box, which, I expect, in the effect they will produce, will be invaluable to me, sir. Indeed, said Mr. Pickwick. Yes, you must have observed my anxiety about them today. I do not believe that such another suit of clothes, and such a hat, could be bought for money, Mr. Pickwick. Mr. Pickwick congratulated the fortunate owner of the irresistible garments on their acquisition, and Mr. Peter Magnus remained a few moments apparently absorbed in contemplation. She's a fine creature, said Mr. Magnus. Is she? said Mr. Pickwick. Very, said Mr. Magnus. Very. She lives about twenty miles from here, Mr. Pickwick. I heard she would be here tonight and all tomorrow forenoon, and came down to seize the opportunity. I think an inn is a good sort of a place to propose to a single woman in, Mr. Pickwick. She is more likely to feel the loneliness of her situation in traveling, perhaps, than she would be at home. What do you think, Mr. Pickwick? I think it is very probable, replied that gentleman. I beg your pardon, Mr. Pickwick, said Mr. Peter Magnus, but I am naturally rather curious, what may you have come down here for? On a far less pleasant errand, sir, replied Mr. Pickwick, the color mounting to his face at the recollection. I have come down here, sir, to expose the treachery and falsehood of an individual, upon whose truth and honor I placed implicit reliance. Dear me, said Mr. Peter Magnus, that's very unpleasant. It is a lady, I presume. Eh. Ah. Sly, Mr. Pickwick, Sly. Well, Mr. Pickwick, sir, I wouldn't probe your feelings for the world. Painful subjects, these, sir, very painful. Don't mind me, Mr. Pickwick, if you wish to give vent to your feelings. I know what it is to be jilted, sir. I have endured that sort of thing three or four times. I am much obliged to you, for your condolence on what you presume to be my melancholy case, said Mr. Pickwick, winding up his watch and laying it on the table, but. No, no, said Mr. Peter Magnus, not a word more, it's a painful subject. I see, I see. What's the time, Mr. Pickwick? Past twelve. Dear me, it's time to go to bed. It will never do, sitting here. I shall be pale tomorrow, Mr. Pickwick. At the bare notion of such a calamity, Mr. Peter Magnus rang the bell for the chambermaid. And the striped bag, the red bag, the leathern hat box, and the brown paper parcel, having been conveyed to his bedroom, he retired in company with a Japan candlestick, to one side of the house, while Mr. Pickwick, and another Japan candlestick, were conducted through a multitude of tortuous windings, to another. This is your room, sir, said the chambermaid. Very well, replied Mr. Pickwick, looking round him. It was a tolerably large double-bedded room, with a fire, upon the whole, a more comfortable-looking apartment than Mr. Pickwick's short experience of the accommodations of the great white horse had led him to expect. Nobody sleeps in the other bed, of course, said Mr. Pickwick. Oh, no, sir. Very good. Tell my servant to bring me up some hot water at half past eight in the morning, and that I shall not want him any more tonight. Yes, sir, and bidding Mr. Pickwick good night, the chambermaid retired, and left him alone. Mr. Pickwick sat himself down in a chair before the fire, and fell into a train of rambling meditations. First he thought of his friends, and wondered when they would join him. 
Then his mind reverted to Mrs. Martha Bardell, and from that lady it wandered, by a natural process, to the dingy counting house of Dodson and Fogg. From Dodson and Fogg's it flew off at a tangent, to the very center of the history of the queer client. And then it came back to the great white horse at Ipswich, with sufficient clearness to convince Mr. Pickwick that he was falling asleep. So he roused himself, and began to undress, when he recollected he had left his watch on the table downstairs. Now this watch was a special favorite with Mr. Pickwick, having been carried about, beneath the shadow of his waistcoat, for a greater number of years than we feel called upon to state at present. The possibility of going to sleep, unless it were ticking gently beneath his pillow, or in the watch pocket over his head, had never entered Mr. Pickwick's brain. So as it was pretty late now, and he was unwilling to ring his bell at that hour of the night, he slipped on his coat, of which he had just divested himself, and taking the Japan candlestick in his hand, walked quietly downstairs. The more stairs Mr. Pickwick went down, the more stairs there seemed to be to descend, and again and again, when Mr. Pickwick got into some narrow passage, and began to congratulate himself on having gained the ground floor, did another flight of stairs appear before his astonished eyes. At last he reached a stone hall, which he remembered to have seen when he entered the house. Passage after passage did he explore, room after room did he peep into. At length, as he was on the point of giving up the search in despair, he opened the door of the identical room in which he had spent the evening, and beheld his missing property on the table. Mr. Pickwick seized the watch in triumph, and proceeded to retrace his steps to his bedchamber. If his progress downward had been attended with difficulties and uncertainty, his journey back was infinitely more perplexing. Rows of doors, garnished with boots of every shape, make, and size, branched off in every possible direction. A dozen times did he softly turn the handle of some bedroom door which resembled his own, when a gruff cry from within of, who the devil's that, or, what do you want here, caused him to steal away, on tiptoe, with a perfectly marvellous celerity. He was reduced to the verge of despair, when an open door attracted his attention. He peeped in. Right at last. There were the two beds, whose situation he perfectly remembered, and the fire still burning. His candle, not a long one when he first received it, had flickered away in the draughts of air through which he had passed and sank into the socket as he closed the door after him. No matter, said Mr. Pickwick. I can undress myself just as well by the light of the fire. The bedsteads stood one on each side of the door. And on the inner side of each was a little path, terminating in a rush-bottomed chair, just wide enough to admit of a person's getting into or out of bed, on that side, if he or she thought proper. Having carefully drawn the curtains of his bed on the outside, Mr. Pickwick sat down on the rush-bottomed chair, and leisurely divested himself of his shoes and gaiters. He then took off and folded up his coat, waistcoat, and neckcloth, and slowly drawing on his tasseled nightcap, secured it firmly on his head, by tying beneath his chin the strings which he always had attached to that article of dress. It was at this moment that the absurdity of his recent bewilderment struck upon his mind. Throwing himself back in the rush-bottom chair, Mr. Pickwick laughed to himself so heartily, that it would have been quite delightful to any man of well-constituted mind to have watched the smiles that expanded his amiable features as they shone forth from beneath the nightcap. It is the best idea, said Mr. Pickwick to himself, smiling till he almost cracked the nightcap strings, it is the best idea, my losing myself in this place, and wandering about these staircases, that I ever heard of. Droll, droll, very droll. Here Mr. Pickwick smiled again, a broader smile than before, and was about to continue the process of undressing, in the best possible humor, when he was suddenly stopped by a most unexpected interruption, to wit. The entrance into the room of some person with a candle, who, after locking the door, advanced to the dressing table, and set down the light upon it. The smile that played on Mr. Pickwick's features was instantaneously lost in a look of the most unbounded and wonder-stricken surprise. The person, whoever it was, had come in so suddenly and with so little noise, that Mr. Pickwick had had no time to call out, or oppose their entrance. Who could it be? A robber. 
some evil-minded person who had seen him come upstairs with a handsome watch in his hand, perhaps. What was he to do? The only way in which Mr. Pickwick could catch a glimpse of his mysterious visitor with the least danger of being seen himself, was by creeping on to the bed, and peeping out from between the curtains on the opposite side. To this maneuver he accordingly resorted. Keeping the curtains carefully closed with his hand, so that nothing more of him could be seen than his face and nightcap, and putting on his spectacles, he mustered up courage and looked out. Mr. Pickwick almost fainted with horror and dismay. Standing before the dressing glass was a middle-aged lady, in yellow curl papers, busily engaged in brushing what ladies call their back hair. However the unconscious middle-aged lady came into that room, it was quite clear that she contemplated remaining there for the night. For she had brought a rush light and shade with her, which, with praiseworthy precaution against fire, she had stationed in a basin on the floor, where it was glimmering away, like a gigantic lighthouse in a particularly small piece of water. Bless my soul, thought Mr. Pickwick, what a dreadful thing. Hem, said the lady, and in went Mr. Pickwick's head with automaton-like rapidity. I never met with anything so awful as this, thought poor Mr. Pickwick, the cold perspiration starting in drops upon his nightcap. Never. This is fearful. It was quite impossible to resist the urgent desire to see what was going forward. So out went Mr. Pickwick's head again. The prospect was worse than before. The middle-aged lady had finished arranging her hair, had carefully enveloped it in a muslin nightcap with a small plated border, and was gazing pensively on the fire. This matter is growing alarming, reasoned Mr. Pickwick with himself. I can't allow things to go on in this way. By the self-possession of that lady, it is clear to me that I must have come into the wrong room. If I call out she'll alarm the house, but if I remain here the consequences will be still more frightful. Mr. Pickwick, it is quite unnecessary to say, was one of the most modest and delicate-minded of mortals. The very idea of exhibiting his nightcap to a lady overpowered him, but he had tied those confounded strings in a knot, and, do what he would, he couldn't get it off. The disclosure must be made. There was only one other way of doing it. He shrunk behind the curtains, and called out very loudly. Ha hum! That the lady started at this unexpected sound was evident, by her falling up against the rushlight shade. That she persuaded herself it must have been the effect of imagination was equally clear, for when Mr. Pickwick, under the impression that she had fainted away stone dead with fright, ventured to peep out again, she was gazing pensively on the fire as before. Most extraordinary female this, thought Mr. Pickwick, popping in again. Ha hum. These last sounds, so like those in which, as legends inform us, the ferocious giant blunderbore was in the habit of expressing his opinion that it was time to lay the cloth, were too distinctly audible to be again mistaken for the workings of fancy. Gracious heaven, said the middle-aged lady, what's that? It's, it's, only a gentleman, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, from behind the curtains. A gentleman, said the lady, with a terrific scream. It's all over, thought Mr. Pickwick. A strange man, shrieked the lady. Another instant and the house would be alarmed. Her garments rustled as she rushed towards the door. Ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, thrusting out his head in the extremity of his desperation, ma'am. Now, although Mr. Pickwick was not actuated by any definite object in putting out his head, it was instantaneously productive of a good effect. The lady, as we have already stated, was near the door. She must pass it, to reach the staircase, and she would most undoubtedly have done so by this time, had not the sudden apparition of Mr. Pickwick's nightcap driven her back into the remotest corner of the apartment, where she stood staring wildly at Mr. Pickwick, while Mr. Pickwick in his turn stared wildly at her. Wretch, said the lady, covering her eyes with her hands, what do you want here? Nothing, ma'am, nothing whatever, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick earnestly. Nothing, said the lady, looking up. Nothing, ma'am, upon my honor, said Mr. Pickwick, nodding his head so energetically, that the tassel of his nightcap danced again. I am almost ready to sink, 
ma'am, beneath the confusion of addressing a lady in my nightcap, here the lady hastily snatched off hers, but I can't get it off, ma'am, here Mr. Pickwick gave it a tremendous tug, in proof of the statement. It is evident to me, ma'am, now, that I have mistaken this bedroom for my own. I had not been here five minutes, ma'am, when you suddenly entered it. If this improbable story be really true, sir, said the lady, sobbing violently, you will leave it instantly. I will, ma'am, with the greatest pleasure, replied Mr. Pickwick. Instantly, sir, said the lady. Certainly, ma'am, interposed Mr. Pickwick, very quickly. Certainly, ma'am. I, I, am very sorry, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, making his appearance at the bottom of the bed, to have been the innocent occasion of this alarm and emotion, deeply sorry, ma'am. The lady pointed to the door. One excellent quality of Mr. Pickwick's character was beautifully displayed at this moment, under the most trying circumstances. Although he had hastily put on his hat over his nightcap, after the manner of the old patrol, although he carried his shoes and gaiters in his hand, and his coat and waistcoat over his arm, nothing could subdue his native politeness. I am exceedingly sorry, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, bowing very low. If you are, sir, you will at once leave the room, said the lady. Immediately, ma'am, this instant, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, opening the door, and dropping both his shoes with a crash in so doing. I trust, ma'am, resumed Mr. Pickwick, gathering up his shoes, and turning round to bow again, I trust, ma'am, that my unblemished character, and the devoted respect I entertain for your sex, will plead as some slight excuse for this, but before Mr. Pickwick could conclude the sentence, the lady had thrust him into the passage, and locked and bolted the door behind him. Whatever grounds of self-congratulation Mr. Pickwick might have for having escaped so quietly from his late awkward situation, his present position was by no means enviable. He was alone, in an open passage, in a strange house in the middle of the night, half-dressed. It was not to be supposed that he could find his way in perfect darkness to a room which he had been wholly unable to discover with a light, and if he made the slightest noise in his fruitless attempts to do so. He stood every chance of being shot at, and perhaps killed, by some wakeful traveller. He had no resource but to remain where he was until daylight appeared. So after groping his way a few paces down the passage, and, to his infinite alarm, stumbling over several pairs of boots in so doing, Mr. Pickwick crouched into a little recess in the wall, to wait for morning, as philosophically as he might. He was not destined, however, to undergo this additional trial of patience. For he had not been long ensconced in his present concealment when, to his unspeakable horror, a man, bearing a light, appeared at the end of the passage. His horror was suddenly converted into joy, however, when he recognized the form of his faithful attendant. It was indeed Mr. Samuel Weller, who after sitting up thus late, in conversation with the Boots, who was sitting up for the mail, was now about to retire to rest. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, suddenly appearing before him, where's my bedroom? Mr. Weller stared at his master with the most emphatic surprise, and it was not until the question had been repeated three several times, that he turned round, and led the way to the long-sought apartment. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, as he got into bed, I have made one of the most extraordinary mistakes tonight, that ever were heard of. Very likely, sir, replied Mr. Weller drilly. But of this I am determined, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. That if I were to stop in this house for six months, I would never trust myself about it, alone, again. That's the very prudentest resolution as you could come to, sir, replied Mr. Weller. You rather want somebody to look arter you, sir, when your judgment goes out a wizard in dot. What do you mean by that, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. He raised himself in bed, and extended his hand, as if he were about to say something more. But suddenly checking himself, turned round, and bade his valet good night. Good night, sir, replied Mr. Weller. He paused when he got outside the door, shook his head, walked on, stopped, snuffed the candle, shook his head again, 
and finally proceeded slowly to his chamber, apparently buried in the profoundest meditation. Chapter 23 In which Mr. Samuel Weller begins to devote his energies to the return match between himself and Mr. Trotter. In a small room in the vicinity of the stable yard, betimes in the morning, which was ushered in by Mr. Pickwick's adventure with the middle, aged lady in the yellow curl papers, sat Mr. Weller, senior, preparing himself for his journey to London. He was sitting in an excellent attitude for having his portrait taken, and here it is. It is very possible that at some earlier period of his career, Mr. Weller's profile might have presented a bold and determined outline. His face, however, had expanded under the influence of good living, and a disposition remarkable for resignation. And its bold, fleshy curves had so far extended beyond the limits originally assigned them, that unless you took a full view of his countenance in front, it was difficult to distinguish more than the extreme tip of a very rubicund nose. His chin, from the same cause, had acquired the grave and imposing form which is generally described by prefixing the word double to that expressive feature. And his complexion exhibited that peculiarly modelled combination of colours which is only to be seen in gentlemen of his profession, and in underdone roast beef. Round his neck he wore a crimson travelling shawl, which merged into his chin by such imperceptible gradations, that it was difficult to distinguish the folds of the one, from the folds of the other. Over this, he mounted a long waistcoat of a broad pink-striped pattern, and over that again, a wide-skirted green coat, ornamented with large brass buttons, whereof the two which garnished the waist, were so far apart. That no man had ever beheld them both at the same time. His hair, which was short, sleek, and black, was just visible beneath the capacious brim of a low-crowned brown hat. His legs were encased in knee-cord breeches, and painted top boots. And a copper watch chain, terminating in one seal, and a key of the same material, dangled loosely from his capacious waistband. We have said that Mr. Weller was engaged in preparing for his journey to London, he was taking sustenance, in fact. On the table before him, stood a pot of ale, a cold round of beef, and a very respectable-looking loaf, to each of which he distributed his favours in turn, with the most rigid impartiality. He had just cut a mighty slice from the latter, when the footsteps of somebody entering the room, caused him to raise his head, and he beheld his son. Mornin, Sammy, said the father. The son walked up to the pot of ale, and nodding significantly to his parent, took a long draught by way of reply. Wery good power o, oh, suction, Sammy, said Mr. Weller the elder, looking into the pot, when his firstborn had set it down half empty. You'd hawk made an uncommon fine oyster, Sammy, if you'd been born in that station o oh, life. Yes, I de say, I should hawk manage to pick up a respectable livin', replied Sam applying himself to the cold beef, with considerable vigor. I'm wery sorry, Sammy, said the elder Mr. Weller, shaking up the ale, by describing small circles with the pot, preparatory to drinking. I'm wery sorry, Sammy, to hear from your lips, as you let yourself be gammoned by that, air mulberry man. I always thought, up to three days ago, that the names of Veller and Gammon could never come into contract, Sammy, never. Always except in the case of a widder, of course, said Sam. Widders, Sammy, replied Mr. Weller, slightly changing color. Widders are exceptions to every rule. I have heard how many ordinary women one widder's equal to in pint o oh, comin' over you. I think it's five and twenty, but I don't rightly know vether it ain't more. Well, that's pretty well, said Sam. Besides, continued Mr. Weller, not noticing the interruption, that's a wary different thing. You know what the council said, Sammy, as defended the Gen LMN as beat his wife with the poker, beneath he got jolly. And arter all, my lord, says he, it's a amiable weakness. So I says respectin' widders, Sammy, and so you'll say, then you gets as old as me. I ought to ha knowed better, I know, said Sam. Ought to ha knowed better, repeated Mr. Weller, striking the table with his fist. Ought to ha knowed better. Why, I know a young un as hasn't had half nor quarter your education, as hasn't slept about the markets, no, not six months, 
hoot ha, scorned to be let in, in such a vey. Scorned it, Sammy. In the excitement of feeling produced by this agonizing reflection, Mr. Weller rang the bell, and ordered an additional pint of ale. Well, it's no use talking about it now, said Sam. It's over, and can't be helped, and that's one consolation, as they always says in Turkey, then they cuts the wrong man's head off. It's my innings now, Governor, and as soon as I catches hold oh, this air trotter, I'll have a good pun. I hope you will, Sammy. I hope you will, returned Mr. Weller. Here's your health, Sammy, and may you speedily vipe off the disgrace as you've inflicted on the family name. In honor of this toast Mr. Weller imbibed at a draft, at least two-thirds of a newly arrived pint, and handed it over to his son, to dispose of the remainder, which he instantaneously did. And now, Sammy, said Mr. Weller, consulting a large double-faced silver watch that hung at the end of the copper chain. Now it's time I was up at the office to get my vey bill and see the coach loaded. For coaches, Sammy, is like guns, they requires to be loaded with wary great care, before they go off. At this parental and professional joke, Mr. Weller, Jr., smiled a filial smile. His revered parent continued in a solemn tone. I may go in, to leave you, Samavel, my boy, and there's no telling then I shall see you again. Your mother-in-law may ha, been too much for me, or a thousand things may have happened by the time you next hears any news, oh, the celebrated Mr. Veller oh, the Bell Savage. The family name depends very much upon you, Samavel, and I hope you'll do what's right by it. Upon all little pints oh, Breeden, I know I may trust you as vel as if it was my own self. So I've only this here one little bit of advice to give you. If ever you gets to upwards oh, 50, and feels disposed to go a marry in anybody, no matter who, just you shut yourself up in your own room, if you've got one, and pison yourself offhand. Hanjin's wulgar, so don't you have nothing to say to that. Pison yourself, Samavel, my boy, pison yourself, and you'll be glad on it afterwards. With these affecting words, Mr. Weller looked steadfastly on his son, and turning slowly upon his heel, disappeared from his sight. In the contemplative mood which these words had awakened, Mr. Samuel Weller walked forth from the great white horse when his father had left him, and bending his steps towards Esti. Clement's church, endeavored to dissipate his melancholy, by strolling among its ancient precincts. He had loitered about, for some time, when he found himself in a retired spot, a kind of courtyard of venerable appearance, which he discovered had no other outlet than the turning by which he had entered. He was about retracing his steps, when he was suddenly transfixed to the spot by a sudden appearance, and the mode and manner of this appearance, we now proceed to relate. Mr. Samuel Weller had been staring up at the old brick houses now and then, in his deep abstraction, bestowing a wink upon some healthy-looking servant girl as she drew up a blind, or threw open a bedroom window. When the green gate of a garden at the bottom of the yard opened, and a man having emerged therefrom, closed the green gate very carefully after him, and walked briskly towards the very spot where Mr. Weller was standing. Now, taking this, as an isolated fact, unaccompanied by any attendant circumstances, there was nothing very extraordinary in it. Because in many parts of the world men do come out of gardens, close green gates after them, and even walk briskly away, without attracting any particular share of public observation. It is clear, therefore, that there must have been something in the man, or in his manner, or both, to attract Mr. Weller's particular notice. Whether there was, or not, we must leave the reader to determine, when we have faithfully recorded the behavior of the individual in question. When the man had shut the green gate after him, he walked, as we have said twice already, with a brisk pace up the courtyard, but he no sooner caught sight of Mr. Weller than he faltered, and stopped, as if uncertain, for the moment, what course to adopt. As the green gate was closed behind him, and there was no other outlet but the one in front, however, he was not long in perceiving that he must pass Mr. Samuel Weller to get away. He therefore resumed his brisk pace, and advanced, staring straight before him. 
The most extraordinary thing about the man was, that he was contorting his face into the most fearful and astonishing grimaces that ever were beheld. Nature's handiwork never was disguised with such extraordinary artificial carving, as the man had overlaid his countenance within one moment. Well, said Mr. Weller to himself, as the man approached. This is very odd. I could ha, swore it was him. Up came the man, and his face became more frightfully distorted than ever, as he drew nearer. I could take my oath to that air black hair and mulberry suit, said Mr. Weller. Only I never see such a face as that afore. As Mr. Weller said this, the man's features assumed an unearthly twinge, perfectly hideous. He was obliged to pass very near Sam, however, and the scrutinizing glance of that gentleman enabled him to detect, under all these appalling twists of feature, something too like the small eyes of Mr. Job Trotter to be easily mistaken. Hollow, you sir, shouted Sam fiercely. The stranger stopped. Hollow, repeated Sam, still more gruffly. The man with the horrible face looked, with the greatest surprise, up the court, and down the court, and in at the windows of the houses, everywhere but at Sam Weller, and took another step forward, when he was brought to again by another shout. Hollow, you sir, said Sam, for the third time. There was no pretending to mistake where the voice came from now, so the stranger, having no other resource, at last looked Sam Weller full in the face. It won't do, Job Trotter, said Sam. Come. None o' oh, that air nonsense. You ain't so wary, handsome that you can afford to throw Avery many o' oh, your good looks. Bring them air eyes o' oh, yourn back into their proper places, or I'll knock em out of your head. Gee here. As Mr. Weller appeared fully disposed to act up to the spirit of this address, Mr. Trotter gradually allowed his face to resume its natural expression, and then giving a start of joy, exclaimed, What do I see? Mr. Walker. Ah, replied Sam. You're very glad to see me, ain't you? Glad, exclaimed Job Trotter, Oh, Mr. Walker, if you had but known how I have looked forward to this meeting. It is too much, Mr. Walker, I cannot bear it, indeed I cannot. And with these words, Mr. Trotter burst into a regular inundation of tears, and, flinging his arms around those of Mr. Weller, embraced him closely, in an ecstasy of joy. Get off! cried Sam, indignant at this process, and vainly endeavoring to extricate himself from the grasp of his enthusiastic acquaintance. Get off, I tell you! What are you crying over me for, you portable engine? Because I am so glad to see you, replied Job Trotter, gradually releasing Mr. Weller, as the first symptoms of his pugnacity disappeared. Oh, Mr. Walker, this is too much. Too much, echoed Sam, I think it is too much, rather. Now, what have you got to say to me, eh? Mr. Trotter made no reply, for the little pink pocket handkerchief was in full force. What have you got to say to me, afore I knock your head off, repeated Mr. Weller, in a threatening manner. Eh? said Mr. Trotter, with a look of virtuous surprise. What have you got to say to me? I, Mr. Walker. Don't call me Walker, my name's Veller, you know that well enough. What have you got to say to me? Bless you, Mr. Walker, Weller, I mean, a great many things, if you will come away somewhere, where we can talk comfortably. If you knew how I have looked for you, Mr. Weller. Very hard, indeed, I suppose, said Sam Drilly. Very, very, sir, replied Mr. Trotter, without moving a muscle of his face. But shake hands, Mr. Weller. Sam eyed his companion for a few seconds, and then, as if actuated by a sudden impulse, complied with his request. How, said Job Trotter, as they walked away, how is your dear, good master? Oh, he is a worthy gentleman, Mr. Weller. I hope he didn't catch cold, that dreadful night, sir. There was a momentary look of deep slyness in Job Trotter's eye, as he said this, which ran a thrill through Mr. Weller's clenched fist, as he burned with a desire to make a demonstration on his ribs. Sam constrained himself, however, and replied that his master was extremely well. 
Oh, I am so glad, replied Mr. Trotter, is he here? Is Yorn, asked Sam, by way of reply. Oh, yes, he is here, and I grieve to say, Mr. Weller, he is going on worse than ever. Ah, ah, said Sam. Oh, shocking, terrible. At a boarding school, said Sam. No, not at a boarding school, replied Job Trotter, with the same sly look which Sam had noticed before. Not at a boarding school. At the house with the green gate, said Sam, eyeing his companion closely. No, no, oh, not there, replied Job, with a quickness very unusual to him, not there. What was you a doin', there? Asked Sam, with a sharp glance. Got inside the gate by accident, perhaps. Why, Mr. Weller, replied Job, I don't mind telling you my little secrets, because, you know, we took such a fancy for each other when we first met. You recollect how pleasant we were that morning? Oh, yes, said Sam, impatiently. I remember. Well? Well, replied Job, speaking with great precision, and in the low tone of a man who communicates an important secret. In that house with the green gate, Mr. Weller, they keep a good many servants. So I should think, from the look on it, interposed Sam. Yes, continued Mr. Trotter, and one of them is a cook, who has saved up a little money, Mr. Weller, and is desirous, if she can establish herself in life, to open a little shop in the Chandlery Way, you see. Yes. Yes, Mr. Weller. Well, sir, I met her at a chapel that I go to, a very neat little chapel in this town, Mr. Weller, where they sing the number four collection of hymns, which I generally carry about with me, in a little book, which you may perhaps have seen in my hand, and I got a little intimate with her, Mr. Weller, and from that, an acquaintance sprung up between us, and I may venture to say, Mr. Weller, that I am to be the Chandler. Ah, and a wary amiable Chandler you'll make, replied Sam, eyeing Job with a side look of intense dislike. The great advantage of this, Mr. Weller, continued Job, his eyes filling with tears as he spoke, will be, that I shall be able to leave my present disgraceful service with that bad man, and to devote myself to a better and more virtuous life. More like the way in which I was brought up, Mr. Weller. You must have been very nicely brought up, said Sam. Oh, very, Mr. Weller, very, replied Job. At the recollection of the purity of his youthful days, Mr. Trotter pulled forth the pink handkerchief, and wept copiously. You must ha been an uncommon nice boy, to go to school with, said Sam. I was, sir, replied Job, heaving a deep sigh, I was the idol of the place. Ah, uh, said Sam, I don't wonder at it. What a comfort you must ha been to your blessed mother. At these words, Mr. Job Trotter inserted an end of the pink handkerchief into the corner of each eye, one after the other, and began to weep copiously. What's the matter with the man, said Sam, indignantly. Chelsea Waterworks is nothing to you. What are you melting with now? The consciousness, oh, Willany. I cannot keep my feelings down, Mr. Weller, said Job, after a short pause. To think that my master should have suspected the conversation I had with yours, and so dragged me away in a post-chaise, and after persuading the sweet young lady to say she knew nothing of him, and bribing the schoolmistress to do the same. Deserted her for a better speculation. Oh. Mr. Weller, it makes me shudder. Oh, that was the vey, was it, said Mr. Weller. To be sure it was, replied Job. Vell, said Sam, as they had now arrived near the hotel, I vant to have a little bit o oh, talk with you, Job. So if you're not particular engaged, I should like to see you at the Great White Horse tonight, somewheres about eight o'clock. I shall be sure to come, said Job. Yes, you'd better, replied Sam, with a very meaning look, or else I shall perhaps be a skin arter you, at the other side of the green gate, and then I might cut you out, you know. I shall be sure to be with you, sir, said Mr. Trotter. And wringing Sam's hand with the utmost fervor, he walked away. Take care, Job Trotter, take care, said Sam, looking after him, or I shall be one too many for you this time. 
I shall, indeed. Having uttered this soliloquy, and looked after Job till he was to be seen no more, Mr. Weller made the best of his way to his master's bedroom. It's all in training, sir, said Sam. What's in training, Sam, inquired Mr. Pickwick. I found M out, sir, said Sam. Found out who? That air queer customer, and the melancholy chap with the black hair. Impossible, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, with the greatest energy. Where are they, Sam, where are they? Hush, hush. Replied Mr. Weller, and as he assisted Mr. Pickwick to dress, he detailed the plan of action on which he proposed to enter. But when is this to be done, Sam, inquired Mr. Pickwick. All in good time, sir, replied Sam. Whether it was done in good time, or not, will be seen hereafter. Chapter 24 Wherein Mr. Peter Magnus grows jealous, and the middle-aged lady apprehensive, which brings the Pickwickians within the grasp of the law. When Mr. Pickwick descended to the room in which he and Mr. Peter Magnus had spent the preceding evening, he found that gentleman with the major part of the contents of the two bags, the leathern hatbox, and the brown paper parcel, displaying to all possible advantage on his person. While he himself was pacing up and down the room in a state of the utmost excitement and agitation. Good morning, sir, said Mr. Peter Magnus. What do you think of this, sir? Very effective indeed, replied Mr. Pickwick, surveying the garments of Mr. Peter Magnus with a good-natured smile. Yes, I think it'll do, said Mr. Magnus. Mr. Pickwick, sir, I have sent up my card. Have you, said Mr. Pickwick. And the waiter brought back word, that she would see me at eleven, at eleven, sir, it only wants a quarter now. Very near the time, said Mr. Pickwick. Yes, it is rather near, replied Mr. Magnus, rather too near to be pleasant, eh? Mr. Pickwick, sir. Confidence is a great thing in these cases, observed Mr. Pickwick. I believe it is, sir, said Mr. Peter Magnus. I am very confident, sir. Really, Mr. Pickwick, I do not see why a man should feel any fear in such a case as this, sir. What is it, sir? There's nothing to be ashamed of, it's a matter of mutual accommodation, nothing more. Husband on one side, wife on the other. That's my view of the matter, Mr. Pickwick. It is a very philosophical one, replied Mr. Pickwick. But breakfast is waiting, Mr. Magnus. Come. Down they sat to breakfast, but it was evident, notwithstanding the boasting of Mr. Peter Magnus, that he labored under a very considerable degree of nervousness, of which loss of appetite, a propensity to upset the tea things, a spectral attempt at drollery, and an irresistible inclination to look at the clock. Every other second, were among the principal symptoms. He he he, tittered Mr. Magnus, affecting cheerfulness, and gasping with agitation. It only wants two minutes, Mr. Pickwick. Am I pale, sir? Not very, replied Mr. Pickwick. There was a brief pause. I beg your pardon, Mr. Pickwick. But have you ever done this sort of thing in your time, said Mr. Magnus. You mean proposing, said Mr. Pickwick. Yes. Never, said Mr. Pickwick, with great energy, never. You have no idea, then, how it's best to begin, said Mr. Magnus. Why, said Mr. Pickwick, I may have formed some ideas upon the subject, but, as I have never submitted them to the test of experience, I should be sorry if you were induced to regulate your proceedings by them. I should feel very much obliged to you, for any advice, sir, said Mr. Magnus, taking another look at the clock, the hand of which was verging on the five minutes past. Well, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, with the profound solemnity with which that great man could, when he pleased, render his remarks so deeply impressive. I should commence, sir, with a tribute to the lady's beauty and excellent qualities. From them, sir, I should diverge to my own unworthiness. Very good, said Mr. Magnus. Unworthiness for her only, mind, sir, resumed Mr. Pickwick. For to show that I was not wholly unworthy, 
sir, I should take a brief review of my past life, and present condition. I should argue, by analogy, that to anybody else, I must be a very desirable object. I should then expatiate on the warmth of my love, and the depth of my devotion. Perhaps I might then be tempted to seize her hand. Yes, I see, said Mr. Magnus, that would be a very great point. I should then, sir, continued Mr. Pickwick, growing warmer as the subject presented itself in more glowing colors before him, I should then, sir, come to the plain and simple question, will you have me? I think I am justified in assuming that upon this, she would turn away her head. You think that may be taken for granted, said Mr. Magnus. Because, if she did not do that at the right place, it would be embarrassing. I think she would, said Mr. Pickwick. Upon this, sir, I should squeeze her hand, and I think, I think, Mr. Magnus, that after I had done that, supposing there was no refusal, I should gently draw away the handkerchief, which my slight knowledge of human nature leads me to suppose the lady would be applying to her eyes at the moment. And steal a respectful kiss. I think I should kiss her, Mr. Magnus, and at this particular point, I am decidedly of opinion that if the lady were going to take me at all, she would murmur into my ears a bashful acceptance. Mr. Magnus started, gazed on Mr. Pickwick's intelligent face, for a short time in silence, and then, the dial pointing to the ten minutes past, shook him warmly by the hand, and rushed desperately from the room. Mr. Pickwick had taken a few strides to and fro. And the small hand of the clock following the latter part of his example, had arrived at the figure which indicates the half hour, when the door suddenly opened. He turned round to meet Mr. Peter Magnus, and encountered, in his stead, the joyous face of Mr. Tupman, the serene countenance of Mr. Winkle, and the intellectual lineaments of Mr. Snodgrass. As Mr. Pickwick greeted them, Mr. Peter Magnus tripped into the room. My friends, the gentleman I was speaking of, Mr. Magnus, said Mr. Pickwick. Your servant, gentlemen, said Mr. Magnus, evidently in a high state of excitement, Mr. Pickwick, allow me to speak to you one moment, sir. As he said this, Mr. Magnus harnessed his forefinger to Mr. Pickwick's buttonhole, and, drawing him to a window recess, said. Congratulate me, Mr. Pickwick, I followed your advice to the very letter. And it was all correct, was it? inquired Mr. Pickwick. It was, sir. Could not possibly have been better, replied Mr. Magnus. Mr. Pickwick, she is mine. I congratulate you, with all my heart, replied Mr. Pickwick, warmly shaking his new friend by the hand. You must see her. Sir, said Mr. Magnus. This way, if you please. Excuse us for one instant, gentlemen. Hurrying on in this way, Mr. Peter Magnus drew Mr. Pickwick from the room. He paused at the next door in the passage, and tapped gently thereat. Come in, said a female voice. And in they went. Miss Witherfield, said Mr. Magnus, allow me to introduce my very particular friend, Mr. Pickwick. Mr. Pickwick, I beg to make you known to Miss Witherfield. The lady was at the upper end of the room. As Mr. Pickwick bowed, he took his spectacles from his waistcoat pocket, and put them on, a process which he had no sooner gone through, than, uttering an exclamation of surprise, Mr. Pickwick retreated several paces, and the lady, with a half-suppressed scream, hid her face in her hands, and dropped into a chair, whereupon Mr. Peter Magnus was stricken motionless on the spot, and gazed from one to the other, with a countenance expressive of the extremities of horror and surprise. This certainly was, to all appearance, very unaccountable behavior. But the fact is, that Mr. Pickwick no sooner put on his spectacles, than he at once recognized in the future Mrs. Magnus the lady into whose room he had so unwarrantably intruded on the previous night, and the spectacles had no sooner crossed Mr. Pickwick's nose, than the lady at once identified the countenance which she had seen surrounded by all the horrors of a nightcap. So the lady screamed, and Mr. Pickwick started. Mr. Pickwick, exclaimed Mr. Magnus, lost in astonishment, what is the meaning of this, sir? What is the meaning of it, sir, 
added Mr. Magnus, in a threatening, and a louder tone. Sir, said Mr. Pickwick, somewhat indignant at the very sudden manner in which Mr. Peter Magnus had conjugated himself into the imperative mood, I decline answering that question. You decline it, sir, said Mr. Magnus. I do, sir, replied Mr. Pickwick. I object to say anything which may compromise that lady, or awaken unpleasant recollections in her breast, without her consent and permission. Miss Witherfield, said Mr. Peter Magnus, do you know this person? Know him. Repeated the middle-aged lady, hesitating. Yes, know him, ma'am, I said know him, replied Mr. Magnus, with ferocity. I have seen him, replied the middle-aged lady. Where? inquired Mr. Magnus, where? That, said the middle-aged lady, rising from her seat, and averting her head, that I would not reveal for worlds. I understand you, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, and respect your delicacy, it shall never be revealed by me depend upon it. Upon my word, ma'am, said Mr. Magnus, considering the situation in which I am placed with regard to yourself, you carry this matter off with tolerable coolness, tolerable coolness, ma'am. Cruel Mr. Magnus, said the middle-aged lady. Here she wept very copiously indeed. Address your observations to me, sir, interposed Mr. Pickwick, I alone am to blame, if anybody be. Oh! You alone are to blame, are you, sir, said Mr. Magnus, I, I, see through this, sir. You repent of your determination now, do you? My determination, said Mr. Pickwick. Your determination, sir. Oh! Don't stare at me, sir, said Mr. Magnus, I recollect your words last night, sir. You came down here, sir, to expose the treachery and falsehood of an individual on whose truth and honor you had placed implicit reliance, eh? Here Mr. Peter Magnus indulged in a prolonged sneer. And taking off his green spectacles, which he probably found superfluous in his fit of jealousy, rolled his little eyes about, in a manner frightful to behold. Eh? said Mr. Magnus, and then he repeated the sneer with increased effect. But you shall answer it, sir. Answer what? said Mr. Pickwick. Never mind, sir, replied Mr. Magnus, striding up and down the room. Never mind. There must be something very comprehensive in this phrase of, never mind, for we do not recollect to have ever witnessed a quarrel in the street, at a theater, public room, or elsewhere. In which it has not been the standard reply to all belligerent inquiries. Do you call yourself a gentleman, sir? Never mind, sir. Did I offer to say anything to the young woman, sir? Never mind, sir. Do you want your head knocked up against that wall, sir? Never mind, sir. It is observable, too, that there would appear to be some hidden taunt in this universal, never mind, which rouses more indignation in the bosom of the individual addressed, than the most lavish abuse could possibly awaken. We do not mean to assert that the application of this brevity to himself, struck exactly that indignation to Mr. Pickwick's soul, which it would infallibly have roused in a vulgar breast. We merely record the fact that Mr. Pickwick opened the room door, and abruptly called out, Tupman, come here. Mr. Tupman immediately presented himself, with a look of very considerable surprise. Tupman, said Mr. Pickwick, a secret of some delicacy, in which that lady is concerned, is the cause of a difference which has just arisen between this gentleman and myself. When I assure him, in your presence, that it has no relation to himself, and is not in any way connected with his affairs, I need hardly beg you to take notice that if he continue to dispute it, he expresses a doubt of my veracity. Which I shall consider extremely insulting. As Mr. Pickwick said this, he looked encyclopedias at Mr. Peter Magnus. Mr. Pickwick's upright and honorable bearing, coupled with that force and energy of speech which so eminently distinguished him, would have carried conviction to any reasonable mind, but, unfortunately, at that particular moment, the mind of Mr. Peter Magnus was in anything but reasonable order. Consequently, instead of receiving Mr. Pickwick's explanation as he ought to have done, he forthwith proceeded to work himself into a red-hot, scorching, consuming passion, 
and to talk about what was due to his own feelings, and all that sort of thing. Adding force to his declamation by striding to and fro, and pulling his hair, amusements which he would vary occasionally, by shaking his fist in Mr. Pickwick's philanthropic countenance. Mr. Pickwick, in his turn, conscious of his own innocence and rectitude, and irritated by having unfortunately involved the middle-aged lady in such an unpleasant affair, was not so quietly disposed as was his wont. The consequence was, that words ran high, and voices higher, and at length Mr. Magnus told Mr. Pickwick he should hear from him, to which Mr. Pickwick replied, with laudable politeness, that the sooner he heard from him the better. Whereupon the middle-aged lady rushed in terror from the room, out of which Mr. Tupman dragged Mr. Pickwick, leaving Mr. Peter Magnus to himself and meditation. If the middle-aged lady had mingled much with the busy world, or had profited at all by the manners and customs of those who make the laws and set the fashions, she would have known that this sort of ferocity is the most harmless thing in nature. But as she had lived for the most part in the country, and never read the parliamentary debates, she was little versed in these particular refinements of civilized life. Accordingly, when she had gained her bedchamber, bolted herself in, and began to meditate on the scene she had just witnessed, the most terrific pictures of slaughter and destruction presented themselves to her imagination. Among which, a full-length portrait of Mr. Peter Magnus borne home by four men, with the embellishment of a whole barrel full of bullets in his left side, was among the very least. The more the middle-aged lady meditated, the more terrified she became, and at length she determined to repair to the house of the principal magistrate of the town, and request him to secure the persons of Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Tupman without delay. To this decision the middle-aged lady was impelled by a variety of considerations, the chief of which was the incontestable proof it would afford of her devotion to Mr. Peter Magnus, and her anxiety for his safety. She was too well acquainted with his jealous temperament to venture the slightest allusion to the real cause of her agitation on beholding Mr. Pickwick. And she trusted to her own influence and power of persuasion with the little man, to quell his boisterous jealousy, supposing that Mr. Pickwick were removed, and no fresh quarrel could arise. Filled with these reflections, the middle-aged lady arrayed herself in her bonnet and shawl, and repaired to the mayor's dwelling straightway. Now George Nupkins, Esquire, the principal magistrate aforesaid, was as grand a personage as the fastest walker would find out, between sunrise and sunset, on the 21st of June, which being, according to the almanacs, the longest day in the whole year, would naturally afford him the longest period for his search. On this particular morning, Mr. Nupkins was in a state of the utmost excitement and irritation, for there had been a rebellion in the town. All the day scholars at the largest day school had conspired to break the windows of an obnoxious apple seller, and had hooted the beetle and pelted the constabulary, an elderly gentleman in top boots, who had been called out to repress the tumult. And who had been a peace officer, man and boy, for half a century at least. And Mr. Nupkins was sitting in his easy chair, frowning with majesty, and boiling with rage, when a lady was announced on pressing, private, and particular business. Mr. Nupkins looked calmly terrible, and commanded that the lady should be shown in. Which command, like all the mandates of emperors, and magistrates, and other great potentates of the earth, was forthwith obeyed, and Miss Witherfield, interestingly agitated, was ushered in accordingly. Muzzle, said the magistrate. Muzzle was an undersized footman, with a long body and short legs. Muzzle. Yes, your worship. Place a chair, and leave the room. Yes, your worship. Now, ma'am, will you state your business, said the magistrate. It is of a very painful kind, sir, said Miss Witherfield. Very likely, ma'am, said the magistrate. Compose your feelings, ma'am. Here Mr. Nupkins looked benignant. And then tell me what legal business brings you here, ma'am. Here the magistrate triumphed over the man, and he looked stern again. It is very distressing to me, sir, to give this information, said Miss Witherfield, but I fear a duel is going to be fought here. Here, ma'am, said the magistrate. Where, ma'am? In Ipswich. In Ipswich, ma'am. A duel in Ipswich, said the magistrate, perfectly aghast at the notion. Impossible, ma'am, 
nothing of the kind can be contemplated in this town, I am persuaded. Bless my soul, ma'am, are you aware of the activity of our local magistracy? Do you happen to have heard, ma'am, that I rushed into a prize ring on the 4th of May last, attended by only sixty special constables? And, at the hazard of falling a sacrifice to the angry passions of an infuriated multitude, prohibited a pugilistic contest between the Middlesex Dumpling and the Suffolk Bantam? A duel in Ipswich, ma'am? I don't think, I do not think, said the magistrate, reasoning with himself, that any two men can have had the hardihood to plan such a breach of the peace, in this town. My information is, unfortunately, but too correct, said the middle-aged lady, I was present at the quarrel. It's a most extraordinary thing, said the astounded magistrate. Muzzle. Yes, your worship. Send Mr. Jinx here, directly. Instantly. Yes, your worship. Muzzle retired, and a pale, sharp-nosed, half-fed, shabbily clad clerk, of middle age, entered the room. Mr. Jinx, said the magistrate. Mr. Jinx. Sir, said Mr. Jinx. This lady, Mr. Jinx, has come here, to give information of an intended duel in this town. Mr. Jinx, not knowing exactly what to do, smiled a dependent smile. What are you laughing at, Mr. Jinx, said the magistrate. Mr. Jinx looked serious instantly. Mr. Jinx, said the magistrate, you're a fool. Mr. Jinx looked humbly at the great man, and bit the top of his pen. You may see something very comical in this information, sir, but I can tell you this, Mr. Jinx, that you have very little to laugh at, said the magistrate. The hungry-looking Jinx sighed, as if he were quite aware of the fact of his having very little indeed to be merry about. And, being ordered to take the lady's information, shambled to a seat, and proceeded to write it down. This man, Pickwick, is the principal, I understand, said the magistrate, when the statement was finished. He is, said the middle-aged lady. And the other rioter, what's his name, Mr. Jinx? Tupman, sir. Tupman is the second? Yes. The other principal, you say, has absconded, ma'am? Yes, replied Miss Witherfield, with a short cough. Very well, said the magistrate. These are two cutthroats from London, who have come down here to destroy His Majesty's population, thinking that at this distance from the capital, the arm of the law is weak and paralyzed. They shall be made an example of. Draw up the warrants, Mr. Jinx. Muzzle. Yes, Your Worship. Is Grummer downstairs? Yes, Your Worship. Send him up. The obsequious muzzle retired, and presently returned, introducing the elderly gentleman in the top boots, who was chiefly remarkable for a bottlenose, a hoarse voice, a snuff-colored surtout, and a wandering eye. Grummer, said the magistrate. Your wash-up. Is the town quiet now? Pretty well, your wash-up, replied Grummer. Poplar feeling has in a measure subsided, consequence oh, the boys having dispersed to cricket. Nothing but vigorous measures will do in these times, Grummer, said the magistrate, in a determined manner. If the authority of the king's officers is set at naught, we must have the riot act read. If the civil power cannot protect these windows, Grummer, the military must protect the civil power, and the windows too. I believe that is a maxim of the constitution, Mr. Jinx. Certainly, sir, said Jinx. Very good, said the magistrate signing the warrants. Grummer, you will bring these persons before me, this afternoon. You will find them at the Great White Horse. You recollect the case of the Middlesex Dumpling and the Suffolk Bantam, Grummer? Mr. Grummer intimated, by a retrospective shake of the head, that he should never forget it, as indeed it was not likely he would, so long as it continued to be cited daily. This is even more unconstitutional, said the magistrate. This is even a greater breach of the peace, and a grosser infringement of His Majesty's prerogative. I believe dueling is one of His Majesty's most undoubted prerogatives, Mr. Jinx. Expressly stipulated in Magna Carta, sir, said Mr. Jinx. 
one of the brightest jewels in the British crown, wrung from his majesty by the barons, I believe, Mr. Jinks, said the magistrate. Just so, sir, replied Mr. Jinks. Very well, said the magistrate, drawing himself up proudly, it shall not be violated in this portion of his dominions. Grummer, procure assistance, and execute these warrants with as little delay as possible. Muzzle. Yes, your worship. Show the lady out. Miss Witherfield retired, deeply impressed with the magistrate's learning and research, Mr. Nupkins retired to lunch, Mr. Jinx retired within himself, that being the only retirement he had, except the sofa bedstead in the small parlor which was occupied by his landlady's family in the daytime, and Mr. Grummer retired, to wipe out, by his mode of discharging his present commission, the insult which had been fastened upon himself, and the other representative of his majesty, the beadle, in the course of the morning. While these resolute and determined preparations for the conservation of the king's peace were pending, Mr. Pickwick and his friends, wholly unconscious of the mighty events in progress, had sat quietly down to dinner. And very talkative and companionable they all were. Mr. Pickwick was in the very act of relating his adventure of the preceding night, to the great amusement of his followers, Mr. Tupman especially, when the door opened, and a somewhat forbidding countenance peeped into the room. The eyes in the forbidding countenance looked very earnestly at Mr. Pickwick, for several seconds, and were to all appearance satisfied with their investigation. For the body to which the forbidding countenance belonged, slowly brought itself into the apartment, and presented the form of an elderly individual in top boots, not to keep the reader any longer in suspense, in short. The eyes were the wandering eyes of Mr. Grummer, and the body was the body of the same gentleman. Mr. Grummer's mode of proceeding was professional, but peculiar. His first act was to bolt the door on the inside. His second, to polish his head and countenance very carefully with a cotton handkerchief, his third, to place his hat, with the cotton handkerchief in it, on the nearest chair. And his fourth, to produce from the breast pocket of his coat a short truncheon, surmounted by a brazen crown, with which he beckoned to Mr. Pickwick with a grave and ghost-like air. Mr. Snodgrass was the first to break the astonished silence. He looked steadily at Mr. Grummer for a brief space, and then said emphatically, This is a private room, sir. A private room. Mr. Grummer shook his head, and replied, No rooms private to His Majesty when the street doors once passed. That's law. Some people maintains that an Englishman's house is his castle. That's gammon. The Pequickians gazed on each other with wondering eyes. Which is Mr. Tupman? inquired Mr. Grummer. He had an intuitive perception of Mr. Pickwick. He knew him at once. My name's Tupman, said that gentleman. My name's Law, said Mr. Grummer. What, said Mr. Tupman. Law, replied Mr. Grummer, Law, civil power, and executive, them's my titles, here's my authority. Blank Tupman, blank Pickwick, against the peace of our sufferin Lord the King, statted in the case made and provided, and all regular. I apprehend you Pickwick. Tupman, the aforesaid. What do you mean by this insolence, said Mr. Tupman, starting up. Leave the room. Hollow, said Mr. Grummer, retreating very expeditiously to the door, and opening it an inch or two, doubly. Well, said a deep voice from the passage. Come Farrard, doubly. At the word of command, a dirty-faced man, something over six feet high, and stout in proportion, squeezed himself through the half-open door, making his face very red in the process, and entered the room. Is the other specials outside, Dubley? inquired Mr. Grummer. Mr. Dubley, who was a man of few words, nodded assent. Order in the division under your charge, Dubley, said Mr. Grummer. Mr. Dubley did as he was desired and half a dozen men, each with a short truncheon and a brass crown, flocked into the room. Mr. Grummer pocketed his staff, and looked at Mr. Dubley, Mr. Dubley pocketed his staff and looked at the division. The division pocketed their staves and looked at Messrs. Tupman and Pickwick. Mr. Pickwick and his followers rose as one man. 
What is the meaning of this atrocious intrusion upon my privacy? said Mr. Pickwick. Who dares apprehend me? said Mr. Tupman. What do you want here, scoundrels? said Mr. Snodgrass. Mr. Winkle said nothing, but he fixed his eyes on Grummer, and bestowed a look upon him, which, if he had had any feeling, must have pierced his brain. As it was, however, it had no visible effect on him whatever. When the executive perceived that Mr. Pickwick and his friends were disposed to resist the authority of the law, they very significantly turned up their coat sleeves, as if knocking them down in the first instance, and taking them up afterwards. Were a mere professional act which had only to be thought of to be done, as a matter of course. This demonstration was not lost upon Mr. Pickwick. He conferred a few moments with Mr. Tubman apart, and then signified his readiness to proceed to the mayor's residence, merely begging the parties then and there assembled, to take notice. That it was his firm intention to resent this monstrous invasion of his privileges as an Englishman, the instant he was at liberty. Whereat the parties then and there assembled laughed very heartily, with the single exception of Mr. Grummer, who seemed to consider that any slight cast upon the divine right of magistrates was a species of blasphemy not to be tolerated. But when Mr. Pickwick had signified his readiness to bow to the laws of his country, and just when the waiters, and hostlers, and chambermaids, and postboys, who had anticipated a delightful commotion from his threatened obstinacy, began to turn away. Disappointed and disgusted, a difficulty arose which had not been foreseen. With every sentiment of veneration for the constituted authorities, Mr. Pickwick resolutely protested against making his appearance in the public streets, surrounded and guarded by the officers of justice, like a common criminal. Mr. Grummer, in the then disturbed state of public feeling, for it was half holiday, and the boys had not yet gone home, as resolutely protested against walking on the opposite side of the way, and taking Mr. Pickwick's parole that he would go straight to the magistrates, and both Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Tupman as strenuously objected to the expense of a post-coach, which was the only respectable conveyance that could be obtained. The dispute ran high, and the dilemma lasted long, and just as the executive were on the point of overcoming Mr. Pickwick's objection to walking to the magistrates, by the trite expedient of carrying him thither, it was recollected that there stood in the inn-yard, an old sedan chair, which, having been originally built for a gouty gentleman with funded property, would hold Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Tupman, at least as conveniently as a modern post-chaise. The chair was hired, and brought into the hall, Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Tupman squeezed themselves inside, and pulled down the blinds, a couple of chairmen were speedily found. And the procession started in grand order. The special surrounded the body of the vehicle, Mr. Grummer and Mr. Dubley marched triumphantly in front, Mr. Snodgrass and Mr. Winkle walked arm in arm behind. And the unsoaked of Ipswich brought up the rear. The shopkeepers of the town, although they had a very indistinct notion of the nature of the offence, could not but be much edified and gratified by this spectacle. Here was the strong arm of the law, coming down with twenty gold-beater force, upon two offenders from the metropolis itself, the mighty engine was directed by their own magistrate and worked by their own officers. And both the criminals, by their united efforts, were securely shut up, in the narrow compass of one sedan chair. Many were the expressions of approval and admiration which greeted Mr. Grummer, as he headed the cavalcade, staff in hand. Loud and long were the shouts raised by the unsoaked, and amidst these united testimonials of public approbation, the procession moved slowly and majestically along. Mr. Weller, habited in his morning jacket, with the black calico sleeves, was returning in a rather desponding state from an unsuccessful survey of the mysterious house with the green gate, when, raising his eyes, he beheld a crowd pouring down the street, surrounding an object which had very much the appearance of a sedan chair. Willing to divert his thoughts from the failure of his enterprise, he stepped aside to see the crowd pass. And finding that they were cheering away, very much to their own satisfaction, forthwith began, by way of raising his spirits, to cheer too, with all his might and main. Mr. Grummer passed, and Mr. Dubley passed, and the sedan passed, and the bodyguard of specials passed, 
and Sam was still responding to the enthusiastic cheers of the mob, and waving his hat about as if he were in the very last extreme of the wildest joy, though, of course. He had not the faintest idea of the matter in hand, when he was suddenly stopped by the unexpected appearance of Mr. Winkle and Mr. Snodgrass. What's the row, Jen Lemon? cried Sam. Who have they got in this here watchbox in mornin'? Both gentlemen replied together, but their words were lost in the tumult. Who is it? cried Sam again. Once more was a joint reply returned, and, though the words were inaudible, Sam saw by the motion of the two pairs of lips that they had uttered the magic word, Pickwick. This was enough. In another minute Mr. Weller had made his way through the crowd, stopped the chairman, and confronted the portly grummer. Hollo, old Jen Lemon, said Sam. Who have you got in this here conveyance? Stand back, said Mr. Grummer, whose dignity, like the dignity of a great many other men, had been wondrously augmented by a little popularity. Knock him down, if he don't, said Mr. Dubley. I'm very much obliged to you, old Jen Lemon, replied Sam, for consulting my convenience, and I'm still more obliged to the other Jen Lemon, who looks as if he'd just escaped from a giant's carry-wan, for his wary, handsome suggestion. But I should prefer your given me a answer to my question, if it's all the same to you. How are you, sir? This last observation was addressed with a patronizing air to Mr. Pickwick, who was peeping through the front window. Mr. Grummer, perfectly speechless with indignation, dragged the truncheon with the brass crown from its particular pocket and flourished it before Sam's eyes. Ah, said Sam, it's very pretty, especially the crown, which is uncommon like the real one. Stand back, said the outraged Mr. Grummer. By way of adding force to the command, he thrust the brass emblem of royalty into Sam's neckcloth with one hand, and seized Sam's collar with the other, a compliment which Mr. Weller returned by knocking him down out of hand, having previously with the utmost consideration, knocked down a chairman for him to lie upon. Whether Mr. Winkle was seized with a temporary attack of that species of insanity which originates in a sense of injury, or animated by this display of Mr. Weller's valor, is uncertain, but certain it is, that he no sooner saw Mr. Grummer fall than he made a terrific onslaught on a small boy who stood next him, whereupon Mr. Snodgrass, in a truly Christian spirit, and in order that he might take no one unawares, announced in a very loud tone that he was going to begin, and proceeded to take off his coat with the utmost deliberation. He was immediately surrounded and secured, and it is but common justice both to him and Mr. Winkle to say, that they did not make the slightest attempt to rescue either themselves or Mr. Weller. Who, after a most vigorous resistance, was overpowered by numbers and taken prisoner. The procession then reformed, the chairmen resumed their stations, and the march was recommenced. Mr. Pickwick's indignation during the whole of this proceeding was beyond all bounds. He could just see Sam upsetting the specials, and flying about in every direction. And that was all he could see, for the sedan doors wouldn't open, and the blinds wouldn't pull up. At length, with the assistance of Mr. Tupman, he managed to push open the roof. And mounting on the seat and steadying himself as well as he could, by placing his hand on that gentleman's shoulder, Mr. Pickwick proceeded to address the multitude, to dwell upon the unjustifiable manner in which he had been treated, and to call upon them to take notice that his servant had been first assaulted. In this order they reached the magistrate's house, the chairman trotting, the prisoners following, Mr. Pickwick oratorising, and the crowd shouting. Chapter 25 Showing, among a variety of pleasant matters, how majestic and impartial Mr. Nupkins was and how Mr. Weller returned Mr. Job Trotter's shuttlecock as heavily as it came, with another matter, which will be found in its place. Violent was Mr. Weller's indignation as he was borne along, numerous were the allusions to the personal appearance and demeanor of Mr. Grummer and his companion. And valorous were the defiances to any six of the gentlemen present, in which he vented his dissatisfaction. Mr. Snodgrass and Mr. Winkle listened with gloomy respect to the torrent of eloquence which their leader poured forth from the sedan chair, and the rapid course of which not all Mr. 
Tupman's earnest entreaties to have the lid of the vehicle closed, were able to check for an instant. But Mr. Weller's anger quickly gave way to curiosity when the procession turned down the identical courtyard in which he had met with the runaway job trotter. And curiosity was exchanged for a feeling of the most gleeful astonishment, when the all-important Mr. Grummer, commanding the sedan bearers to halt, advanced with dignified and portentous steps to the very green gate from which Job Trotter had emerged, and gave a mighty pull at the bell handle which hung at the side thereof. The ring was answered by a very smart and pretty-faced servant girl, who, after holding up her hands in astonishment at the rebellious appearance of the prisoners, and the impassioned language of Mr. Pickwick, summoned Mr. Muzzle. Mr. Muzzle opened one half of the carriage gate, to admit the sedan, the captured ones, and the specials. And immediately slammed it in the faces of the mob, who, indignant at being excluded, and anxious to see what followed, relieved their feelings by kicking at the gate and ringing the bell, for an hour or two afterwards. In this amusement they all took part by turns, except three or four fortunate individuals, who, having discovered a grating in the gate, which commanded a view of nothing, stared through it with the indefatigable perseverance with which people will flatten their noses against the front windows of a chemist's shop, when a drunken man, who has been run over by a dog cart in the street, is undergoing a surgical inspection in the back parlor. At the foot of a flight of steps, leading to the house door, which was guarded on either side by an American aloe in a green tub, the sedan chair stopped. Mr. Pickwick and his friends were conducted into the hall, whence, having been previously announced by Muzzle, and ordered in by Mr. Nupkins, they were ushered into the worshipful presence of that public-spirited officer. The scene was an impressive one, well calculated to strike terror to the hearts of culprits, and to impress them with an adequate idea of the stern majesty of the law. In front of a big bookcase, in a big chair, behind a big table, and before a big volume, sat Mr. Nupkins, looking a full size larger than any one of them, big as they were. The table was adorned with piles of papers. And above the farther end of it, appeared the head and shoulders of Mr. Jinks, who was busily engaged in looking as busy as possible. The party having all entered, Muzzle carefully closed the door, and placed himself behind his master's chair to await his orders. Mr. Nupkins threw himself back with thrilling solemnity, and scrutinized the faces of his unwilling visitors. Now, Grummer, who is that person, said Mr. Nupkins, pointing to Mr. Pickwick, who, as the spokesman of his friends, stood hat in hand, bowing with the utmost politeness and respect. This here's Pickwick, your wash up, said Grummer. Come, none o' that air, old strike a light, interposed Mr. Weller, elbowing himself into the front rank. Beg your pardon, sir, but this here officer o' yourn in the gambudge tops, you'll never earn a decent livin' as a master o' the ceremonies any veer. This here, sir, continued Mr. Weller, thrusting Grummer aside, and addressing the magistrate with pleasant familiarity, this here is S. Pickvick, Esquire, this here's Mr. Tupman, that airs Mr. Snodgrass, and farther on, next him on the t'other side, Mr. Winkle, all wary nice gen LMN, sir, as you'll be wary happy to have the acquaintance on, so the sooner you commits these here officers, oh, or into the treadmill for a month or two, the sooner we shall begin to be on a pleasant understanding. Business first, pleasure arterwards, as King Richard III said when he stabbed the t'other king in the tower, afore he smothered the babbies. At the conclusion of this address, Mr. Weller brushed his hat with his right elbow, and nodded benignly to Jinx, who had heard him throughout with unspeakable awe. Who is this man, Grummer, said the magistrate. Wary desperate C.A. Tractor, your wash up, replied Grummer. He attempted to rescue the prisoners, and assaulted the officers, so we took him into custody, and brought him here. You did quite right, replied the magistrate. He is evidently a desperate ruffian. He is my servant, sir, said Mr. Pickwick angrily. Oh. He is your servant, is he, said Mr. Nupkins. A conspiracy to defeat the ends of justice, and murder its officers. Pickwick servant. Put that down, Mr. Jinks. Mr. Jinks did so. What's your name, fellow, 
thundered Mr. Nupkins. Veller, replied Sam. A very good name for the Newgate calendar, said Mr. Nupkins. This was a joke, so Jinx, Grummer, Dubley, all the specials, and Muzzle, went into fits of laughter of five minutes' duration. Put down his name, Mr. Jinx, said the magistrate. Two L's, old feller, said Sam. Here an unfortunate special laughed again, whereupon the magistrate threatened to commit him instantly. It is a dangerous thing to laugh at the wrong man, in these cases. Where do you live, said the magistrate. Veer ever I can, replied Sam. Put down that, Mr. Jinx, said the magistrate, who was fast rising into a rage. Score it under, said Sam. He is a vagabond, Mr. Jinx, said the magistrate. He is a vagabond on his own statement, is he not, Mr. Jinx? Certainly, sir. Then I'll commit him, I'll commit him as such, said Mr. Nupkins. This is a wary impartial country for justice, said Sam. There ain't a magistrate goin' as don't commit himself twice as he commits other people. At this sally another special laughed, and then tried to look so supernaturally solemn, that the magistrate detected him immediately. Grummer, said Mr. Nupkins, reddening with passion, how dare you select such an inefficient and disreputable person for a special constable, as that man. How dare you do it, sir. I am very sorry, your wash-up, stammered Grummer. Very sorry. Said the furious magistrate. You shall repent of this neglect of duty, Mr. Grummer, you shall be made an example of. Take that fellow's staff away. He's drunk. You're drunk, fellow. I am not drunk, your worship, said the man. You are drunk, returned the magistrate. How dare you say you are not drunk, sir, when I say you are. Doesn't he smell of spirits, Grummer? Horrid, your wash up, replied Grummer who had a vague impression that there was a smell of rum somewhere. I knew he did, said Mr. Nupkins. I saw he was drunk when he first came into the room, by his excited eye. Did you observe his excited eye, Mr. Jinx? Certainly, sir. I haven't touched a drop of spirits this morning, said the man, who was as sober a fellow as need be. How dare you tell me a falsehood, said Mr. Nupkins. Isn't he drunk at this moment, Mr. Jinx? Certainly, sir, replied Jinx. Mr. Jinx, said the magistrate, I shall commit that man for contempt. Make out his committal, Mr. Jinx. And committed the special would have been, only Jinx, who was the magistrate's adviser, having had a legal education of three years in a country attorney's office, whispered the magistrate that he thought it wouldn't do. So the magistrate made a speech, and said, that in consideration of the special's family, he would merely reprimand and discharge him. Accordingly, the special was abused, vehemently, for a quarter of an hour, and sent about his business. And Grummer, Dubley, Muzzle, and all the other specials, murmured their admiration of the magnanimity of Mr. Nupkins. Now, Mr. Jinks, said the magistrate, swear Grummer. Grummer was sworn directly, but as Grummer wandered, and Mr. Nupkins's dinner was nearly ready, Mr. Nupkins cut the matter short, by putting leading questions to Grummer, which Grummer answered as nearly in the affirmative as he could. So the examination went off, all very smooth and comfortable, and two assaults were proved against Mr. Weller, and a threat against Mr. Winkle, and a push against Mr. Snodgrass. When all this was done to the magistrate's satisfaction, the magistrate and Mr. Jinx consulted in whispers. The consultation having lasted about ten minutes, Mr. Jinx retired to his end of the table. And the magistrate, with a preparatory cough, drew himself up in his chair, and was proceeding to commence his address, when Mr. Pickwick interposed. I beg your pardon, sir, for interrupting you, said Mr. Pickwick. But before you proceed to express, and act upon, any opinion you may have formed on the statements which have been made here, I must claim my right to be heard so far as I am personally concerned. Hold your tongue, sir, said the magistrate peremptorily. I must submit to you, sir, said Mr. Pickwick. Hold your tongue, sir, interposed the magistrate, 
or I shall order an officer to remove you. You may order your officers to do whatever you please, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, and I have no doubt, from the specimen I have had of the subordination preserved amongst them, that whatever you order, they will execute, sir. But I shall take the liberty, sir, of claiming my right to be heard, until I am removed by force. Pickwick and principal, exclaimed Mr. Weller, in a very audible voice. Sam, be quiet, said Mr. Pickwick. Dumb as a drum with a hole in it, sir, replied Sam. Mr. Nupkins looked at Mr. Pickwick with a gaze of intense astonishment, at his displaying such unwanted temerity, and was apparently about to return a very angry reply, when Mr. Jinx pulled him by the sleeve, and whispered something in his ear. To this, the magistrate returned a half-audible answer, and then the whispering was renewed. Jinx was evidently remonstrating. At length the magistrate, gulping down, with a very bad grace, his disinclination to hear anything more, turned to Mr. Pickwick, and said sharply, What do you want to say? First, said Mr. Pickwick, sending a look through his spectacles, under which even Nupkins quailed, First, I wish to know what I and my friend have been brought here for. Must I tell him, whispered the magistrate to Jinx. I think you had better, sir, whispered Jinx to the magistrate. An information has been sworn before me, said the magistrate, that it is apprehended you are going to fight a duel, and that the other man, Tupman, is your aider and a better in it. Therefore, eh, Mr. Jinx. Certainly, sir. Therefore, I call upon you both, to, I think that's the course, Mr. Jinx. Certainly, sir. To, to, what, Mr. Jinx, said the magistrate pettishly. To find bail, sir. Yes. Therefore, I call upon you both, as I was about to say when I was interrupted by my clerk, to find bail. Good bail, whispered Mr. Jinx. I shall require good bail, said the magistrate. Townspeople, whispered Jinx. They must be townspeople, said the magistrate. Fifty pounds each, whispered Jinx, and householders, of course. I shall require two sureties of fifty pounds each, said the magistrate aloud, with great dignity, and they must be householders, of course. But bless my heart, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, who, together with Mr. Tupman, was all amazement and indignation, we are perfect strangers in this town. I have as little knowledge of any householders here, as I have intention of fighting a duel with anybody. I dare say, replied the magistrate, I dare say, don't you, Mr. Jinx? Certainly, sir. Have you anything more to say? inquired the magistrate. Mr. Pickwick had a great deal more to say, which he would no doubt have said, very little to his own advantage, or the magistrate's satisfaction, if he had not, the moment he ceased speaking, been pulled by the sleeve by Mr. Weller, with whom he was immediately engaged in so earnest a conversation, that he suffered the magistrate's inquiry to pass wholly unnoticed. Mr. Nupkins was not the man to ask a question of the kind twice over. And so, with another preparatory cough, he proceeded, amidst the reverential and admiring silence of the constables, to pronounce his decision. He should fine Weller two pounds for the first assault, and three pounds for the second. He should fine Winkle two pounds, and Snodgrass one pound, besides requiring them to enter into their own recognizances to keep the peace towards all His Majesty's subjects, and especially towards his liege servant, Daniel Grummer. Pickwick and Tupman he had already held to bail. Immediately on the magistrate ceasing to speak, Mr. Pickwick, with a smile mantling on his again good-humoured countenance, stepped forward, and said, I beg the magistrate's pardon, but may I request a few minutes' private conversation with him, on a matter of deep importance to himself? What? said the magistrate. Mr. Pickwick repeated his request. This is a most extraordinary request, said the magistrate. A private interview? A private interview, replied Mr. Pickwick firmly. Only, as a part of the information which I wish to communicate is derived from my servant, I should wish him to be present. The magistrate looked at Mr. Jinx, Mr. Jinx looked at the magistrate, the officers looked at each other in amazement. Mr. 
Nupkins turned suddenly pale. Could the man Weller, in a moment of remorse, have divulged some secret conspiracy for his assassination? It was a dreadful thought. He was a public man, and he turned paler, as he thought of Julius Caesar and Mr. Perceval. The magistrate looked at Mr. Pickwick again, and beckoned Mr. Jinx. What do you think of this request, Mr. Jinx, murmured Mr. Nupkins. Mr. Jinx, who didn't exactly know what to think of it, and was afraid he might offend, smiled feebly, after a dubious fashion, and, screwing up the corners of his mouth, shook his head slowly from side to side. Mr. Jinx, said the magistrate gravely, you are an ass. At this little expression of opinion, Mr. Jinx smiled again, rather more feebly than before, and edged himself, by degrees, back into his own corner. Mr. Nupkins debated the matter within himself for a few seconds, and then, rising from his chair, and requesting Mr. Pickwick and Sam to follow him, led the way into a small room which opened into the justice parlor. Desiring Mr. Pickwick to walk to the upper end of the little apartment, and holding his hand upon the half-closed door, that he might be able to effect an immediate escape, in case there was the least tendency to a display of hostilities, Mr. Nupkins expressed his readiness to hear the communication, whatever it might be. I will come to the point at once, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, it affects yourself and your credit materially. I have every reason to believe, sir, that you are harboring in your house a gross impostor. Two, interrupted Sam. Mulberry Agin all nature, for tears and willany. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, if I am to render myself intelligible to this gentleman, I must beg you to control your feelings. Very sorry, sir, replied Mr. Weller, but when I think oh, that, bare job, I can't help opening the wall a inch or two. In one word, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, is my servant right in suspecting that a certain Captain Fitzmarshall is in the habit of visiting here? Because, added Mr. Pickwick, as he saw that Mr. Nupkins was about to offer a very indignant interruption, because if he be, I know that person to be a... Hush, hush, said Mr. Nupkins, closing the door. Know him to be what, sir? An unprincipled adventurer, a dishonorable character, a man who preys upon society, and makes easily deceive people his dupes, sir, his absurd, his foolish, his wretched dupes, sir, said the excited Mr. Pickwick. Dear me, said Mr. Nupkins, turning very red, and altering his whole manner directly. Dear me, Mr. Pickwick, said Sam. Pickwick, said the magistrate, dear me, Mr. Pickwick, pray take a seat, you cannot mean this. Captain Fitzmarshall. Don't call him a cap n, said Sam, nor Fitzmarshall neither, he ain't neither one nor t'other. He's a strolling actor, he is, and his name's Jingle, and if ever there was a wolf in a mulberry suit, that, air job trotters him. It is very true, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, replying to the magistrate's look of amazement, my only business in this town, is to expose the person of whom we now speak. Mr. Pickwick proceeded to pour into the horror-stricken ear of Mr. Nupkins, an abridged account of all Mr. Jingle's atrocities. He related how he had first met him, how he had eloped with Miss Wardle, how he had cheerfully resigned the lady for a pecuniary consideration. How he had entrapped himself into a lady's boarding school at midnight, and how he, Mr. Pickwick, now felt it his duty to expose his assumption of his present name and rank. As the narrative proceeded, all the warm blood in the body of Mr. Nupkins tingled up into the very tips of his ears. He had picked up the captain at a neighboring racecourse. Charmed with his long list of aristocratic acquaintance, his extensive travel, and his fashionable demeanor, Mrs. Nupkins and Miss Nupkins had exhibited Captain Fitzmarshall, and quoted Captain Fitzmarshall, and hurled Captain Fitzmarshall at the devoted heads of their select circle of acquaintance, until their bosom friends, Mrs. Porkenham and the Mrs. Porkenhams, and Mr. Sidney Porkenham, were ready to burst with jealousy and despair. And now, to hear, after all, that he was a needy adventurer, a strolling player, and if not a swindler, something so very like it, that it was hard to tell the difference. Heavens! 
What would the Porkenham say? What would be the triumph of Mr. Sidney Porkenham when he found that his addresses had been slighted for such a rival? How should he, Nupkins, meet the eye of old Porkenham at the next quarter sessions? And what a handle would it be for the opposition magisterial party if the story got abroad? But after all, said Mr. Nupkins, brightening for a moment, after a long pause, after all, this is a mere statement. Captain Fitzmarshall is a man of very engaging manners, and, I dare say, has many enemies. What proof have you of the truth of these representations? Confront me with him, said Mr. Pickwick, that is all I ask, and all I require. Confront him with me and my friends here, you will want no further proof. Why, said Mr. Nupkins, that might be very easily done, for he will be here tonight, and then there would be no occasion to make the matter public, just, just, for the young man's own sake, you know. I, I, should like to consult Mrs. Nupkins on the propriety of the step, in the first instance, though. At all events, Mr. Pickwick, we must dispatch this legal business before we can do anything else. Pray step back into the next room. Into the next room they went. Grummer, said the magistrate, in an awful voice. Your wash up, replied Grummer, with the smile of a favorite. Come, come, sir, said the magistrate sternly, don't let me see any of this levity here. It is very unbecoming, and I can assure you that you have very little to smile at. Was the account you gave me just now strictly true? Now be careful, sir. Your wash up, stammered Grummer, I dash. Oh, you are confused, are you? said the magistrate. Mr. Jinx, you observe this confusion? Certainly, sir, replied Jinx. Now, said the magistrate, repeat your statement, Grummer, and again I warn you to be careful. Mr. Jinx, take his words down. The unfortunate Grummer proceeded to restate his complaint, but, what between Mr. Jinx's taking down his words, and the magistrate's taking them up, his natural tendency to rambling, and his extreme confusion, he managed to get involved, in something under three minutes, in such a mass of entanglement and contradiction, that Mr. Nupkins at once declared he didn't believe him. So the fines were remitted, and Mr. Jinx found a couple of bail in no time. And all these solemn proceedings having been satisfactorily concluded, Mr. Grummer was ignominiously ordered out, an awful instance of the instability of human greatness, and the uncertain tenure of great men's favor. Mrs. Nupkins was a majestic female in a pink gauze turban and a light brown wig. Miss Nupkins possessed all her mama's haughtiness without the turban, and all her ill nature without the wig. And whenever the exercise of these two amiable qualities involved mother and daughter in some unpleasant dilemma, as they not infrequently did, they both concurred in laying the blame on the shoulders of Mr. Nupkins. Accordingly, when Mr. Nupkins sought Mrs. Nupkins, and detailed the communication which had been made by Mr. Pickwick, Mrs. Nupkins suddenly recollected that she had always expected something of the kind, that she had always said it would be so. That her advice was never taken, that she really did not know what Mr. Nupkins supposed she was, and so forth. The idea, said Miss Nupkins, forcing a tear of very scanty proportions into the corner of each eye. The idea of my being made such a fool of. Ah! You may thank your papa, my dear, said Mrs. Nupkins, how I have implored and begged that man to inquire into the captain's family connections. How I have urged and entreated him to take some decisive step. I am quite certain nobody would believe it, quite. But, my dear, said Mr. Nupkins. Don't talk to me, you aggravating thing, don't, said Mrs. Nupkins. My love, said Mr. Nupkins, you professed yourself very fond of Captain Fitzmarshall. You have constantly asked him here, my dear, and you have lost no opportunity of introducing him elsewhere. Didn't I say so, Henrietta, cried Mrs. Nupkins, appealing to her daughter with the air of a much-injured female. Didn't I say that your papa would turn round and lay all this at my door? Didn't I say so? Here Mrs. Nupkins sobbed. Oh, pa, remonstrated Miss Nupkins. 
and here she sobbed too. Isn't it too much, when he has brought all this disgrace and ridicule upon us, to taunt me with being the cause of it, exclaimed Mrs. Nupkins. How can we ever show ourselves in society, said Miss Nupkins. How can we face the Porkenhams, cried Mrs. Nupkins. Or the Griggs, cried Miss Nupkins. Or the Slumentaukens, cried Mrs. Nupkins. But what does your papa care? What is it to him? At this dreadful reflection, Mrs. Nupkins wept mental anguish, and Miss Nupkins followed on the same side. Mrs. Nupkins's tears continued to gush forth, with great velocity, until she had gained a little time to think the matter over. When she decided, in her own mind, that the best thing to do would be to ask Mr. Pickwick and his friends to remain until the captain's arrival, and then to give Mr. Pickwick the opportunity he sought. If it appeared that he had spoken truly, the captain could be turned out of the house without noising the matter abroad, and they could easily account to the Porkenhams for his disappearance, by saying that he had been appointed. Through the court influence of his family, to the governor generalship of Sierra Leone, of Sauger Point, or any other of those salubrious climates which enchant Europeans so much, that when they once get there, they can hardly ever prevail upon themselves to come back again. When Mrs. Nupkins dried up her tears, Miss Nupkins dried up hers, and Mr. Nupkins was very glad to settle the matter as Mrs. Nupkins had proposed. So Mr. Pickwick and his friends, having washed off all marks of their late encounter, were introduced to the ladies, and soon afterwards to their dinner, and Mr. Weller, whom the magistrate, with his peculiar sagacity, had discovered in half an hour to be one of the finest fellows alive, was consigned to the care and guardianship of Mr. Muzzle, who was specially enjoined to take him below, and make much of him. How to do, sir, said Mr. Muzzle, as he conducted Mr. Weller down the kitchen stairs. Why, no considerable change has taken place in the state of my system, since I see you cocked up behind your governor's chair in the parlor, a little while ago, replied Sam. You will excuse my not taking more notice of you then, said Mr. Muzzle. You see, Master hadn't introduced us, then. Lord, how fond he is of you, Mr. Weller, to be sure. Ah, said Sam, what a pleasant chap he is. Ain't he, replied Mr. Muzzle. So much humor, said Sam. And such a man to speak, said Mr. Muzzle. How his ideas flow, don't they? Wonderful, replied Sam, they comes a pouring out, knocking each other's heads so fast, that they seems to stun one another, you hardly know what he's arter, do you? That's the great merit of his style of speaking, rejoined Mr. Muzzle. Take care of the last step, Mr. Weller. Would you like to wash your hands, sir? before we join the ladies. Here's a sink, with the water laid on, sir, and a clean jack towel behind the door. Ah! Perhaps I may as well have a rinse, replied Mr. Weller, applying plenty of yellow soap to the towel, and rubbing away till his face shone again. How many ladies are there? Only two in our kitchen, said Mr. Muzzle, cook and booze maid. We keep a boy to do the dirty work, and a gal besides, but they dine in the wash us. Oh, they dines in the wash us, do they? said Mr. Weller. Yes, replied Mr. Muzzle, we tried them at our table when they first come, but we couldn't keep them. The gal's manners is dreadful vulgar, and the boy breathes so very hard while he's eating, that we found it impossible to sit at table with him. Young Grampus, said Mr. Weller. Oh, dreadful, rejoined Mr. Muzzle, but that is the worst of country service, Mr. Weller, the juniors is always so very savage. This way, sir, if you please, this way. Preceding Mr. Weller, with the utmost politeness, Mr. Muzzle conducted him into the kitchen. Mary, said Mr. Muzzle to the pretty servant girl, this is Mr. Weller, a gentleman as master has sent down, to be made as comfortable as possible. And your master's a knowin' hand, and has just sent me to the right place, said Mr. Weller, with a glance of admiration at Mary. If I was master o' oh, this here house, I should always find the materials for comfort veer Mary was. Lor, Mr. Weller, said Mary blushing. Well, I never, ejaculated the cook. Bless me, cook, 
I forgot you, said Mr. Muzzle. Mr. Weller, let me introduce you. How are you, ma'am, said Mr. Weller. Very glad to see you, indeed, and hope our acquaintance may be a long un, as the Gen LMN said to the Phi pun note. When this ceremony of introduction had been gone through, the cook and Mary retired into the back kitchen to titter, for ten minutes, then returning, all giggles and blushes, they sat down to dinner. Mr. Weller's easy manners and conversational powers had such irresistible influence with his new friends, that before the dinner was half over, they were on a footing of perfect intimacy. And in possession of a full account of the delinquency of Job Trotter. I never could a bear that job, said Mary. No more you never ought to, my dear, replied Mr. Weller. Why not, inquired Mary. Cos ugliness and spindlin never ought to be familiar with elegance and were to, replied Mr. Weller. Ought they, Mr. Muzzle? Not by no means, replied that gentleman. Here Mary laughed, and said the cook had made her, and the cook laughed, and said she hadn't. I hain't got a glass, said Mary. Drink with me, my dear, said Mr. Weller. Put your lips to this here tumbler, and then I can kiss you by deputy. For shame, Mr. Weller, said Mary. What's a shame, my dear? Talkin' in that way. Nonsense, it ain't no harm. It's nature, ain't it, cook? Don't ask me, imperence, replied the cook, in a high state of delight. And hereupon the cook and Mary laughed again, till what between the beer, and the cold meat, and the laughter combined. The latter young lady was brought to the verge of choking, an alarming crisis from which she was only recovered by sundry pats on the back, and other necessary attentions, most delicately administered by Mr. Samuel Weller. In the midst of all this jollity and conviviality, a loud ring was heard at the garden gate, to which the young gentleman who took his meals in the wash house, immediately responded. Mr. Weller was in the height of his attentions to the pretty housemaid, Mr. Muzzle was busy doing the honors of the table, and the cook had just paused to laugh, in the very act of raising a huge morsel to her lips. When the kitchen door opened, and in walked Mr. Job Trotter. We have said in walked Mr. Job Trotter, but the statement is not distinguished by our usual scrupulous adherence to fact. The door opened and Mr. Trotter appeared. He would have walked in, and was in the very act of doing so, indeed, when catching sight of Mr. Weller, he involuntarily shrank back a pace or two, and stood gazing on the unexpected scene before him, perfectly motionless with amazement and terror. Here he is, said Sam, rising with great glee. Why we were that wary moment a speaking o oh, you. How are you? Where have you been? Come in. Laying his hand on the mulberry collar of the unresisting job, Mr. Weller dragged him into the kitchen. And, locking the door, handed the key to Mr. Muzzle, who very coolly buttoned it up in a side pocket. Well, here's a game, cried Sam. Only think oh, my master havin' the pleasure oh, meeting yourn upstairs, and me havin' the joy oh, meetin' you down here. How are you gettin' on, and how is the chandlery business likely to do? Well, I am so glad to see you. How happy you look. It's quite a treat to see you, ain't it? Mr. Muzzle. Quite, said Mr. Muzzle. So cheerful he is, said Sam. In such good spirits, said Muzzle. And so glad to see us, that makes it so much more comfortable, said Sam. Sit down, sit down. Mr. Trotter suffered himself to be forced into a chair by the fireside. He cast his small eyes, first on Mr. Weller, and then on Mr. Muzzle but said nothing. Well, now, said Sam, afore these here ladies, I should just like to ask you, as a sort of curiosity, whether you don't consider yourself as nice and well-behaved a young Gen LMN as ever used a pink check pocket handkerchief. And the number four collection. And as was ever a going to be married to a cook, said that lady indignantly. The willin. And leave off his evil ways, and set up in the chandlery line arterwards, said the housemaid. Now, I'll tell you what it is, young man, said Mr. Muzzle solemnly, 
enraged at the last two allusions, this here lady, pointing to the cook, keeps company with me. And when you presume, sir, to talk of keeping Chandler's shops with her, you injure me in one of the most delicatest points in which one man can injure another. Do you understand that, sir? Here Mr. Muzzle, who had a great notion of his eloquence, in which he imitated his master, paused for a reply. But Mr. Trotter made no reply. So Mr. Muzzle proceeded in a solemn manner. It's very probable, sir, that you won't be wanted upstairs for several minutes, sir, because my master is at this moment particularly engaged in settling the hash of your master, sir. And therefore you'll have leisure, sir, for a little private talk with me, sir. Do you understand that, sir? Mr. Muzzle again paused for a reply, and again Mr. Trotter disappointed him. Well, then, said Mr. Muzzle, I'm very sorry to have to explain myself before ladies, but the urgency of the case will be my excuse. The back kitchen's empty, sir. If you will step in there, sir, Mr. Weller will see fair, and we can have mutual satisfaction till the bell rings. Follow me, sir. As Mr. Muzzle uttered these words, he took a step or two towards the door, and, by way of saving time, began to pull off his coat as he walked along. Now, the cook no sooner heard the concluding words of this desperate challenge, and saw Mr. Muzzle about to put it into execution, than she uttered a loud and piercing shriek, and rushing on Mr. Job Trotter, who rose from his chair on the instant, tore and buffeted his large flat face, with an energy peculiar to excited females, and twining her hands in his long black hair. Tore therefrom about enough to make five or six dozen of the very largest sized morning rings. Having accomplished this feat with all the ardor which her devoted love for Mr. Muzzle inspired, she staggered back, and being a lady of very excitable and delicate feelings, she instantly fell under the dresser, and fainted away. At this moment, the bell rang. That's for you, Job Trotter, said Sam, and before Mr. Trotter could offer remonstrance or reply, even before he had time to stanch the wounds inflicted by the insensible lady, Sam seized one arm and Mr. Muzzle the other, and one pulling before, and the other pushing behind, they conveyed him upstairs, and into the parlor. It was an impressive tableau. Alfred Jingle, Esquire, alias Captain Fitzmarshall, was standing near the door with his hat in his hand, and a smile on his face, wholly unmoved by his very unpleasant situation. Confronting him, stood Mr. Pickwick, who had evidently been inculcating some high moral lesson, for his left hand was beneath his coat tail, and his right extended in air, as was his wont when delivering himself of an impressive address. At a little distance, stood Mr. Tupman with indignant countenance, carefully held back by his two younger friends, at the farther end of the room were Mr. Nupkins, Mrs. Nupkins, and Miss Nupkins, gloomily grand and savagely vexed. What prevents me, said Mr. Nupkins, with magisterial dignity, as Job was brought in, what prevents me from detaining these men as rogues and impostors? It is a foolish mercy. What prevents me? Pride, old fellow, pride, replied Jingle, quite at his ease. Wouldn't do, no go, caught a captain, eh, ha. Ha. Very good, husband for daughter, bite a bit, make it public, not for worlds, look stupid, very. Wretch, said Mr. Nupkins, we scorn your base insinuations. I always hated him, added Henrietta. Oh, of course, said Jingle. Tall young man, old lover, Sidney Porkenham, rich, fine fellow, not so rich as captain, though, eh, turn him away, off with him, anything for captain, nothing like captain anywhere, all the girls, raving mad. Job, eh. Here Mr. Jingle laughed very heartily. And Job, rubbing his hands with delight, uttered the first sound he had given vent to since he entered the house, a low, noiseless chuckle, which seemed to intimate that he enjoyed his laugh too much, to let any of it escape in sound. Mr. Nupkins, said the elder lady, this is not a fit conversation for the servants to overhear. Let these wretches be removed. Certainly, my dear, said Mr. Nupkins. 
Muzzle. Your Worship. Open the front door. Yes, Your Worship. Leave the house, said Mr. Nupkins, waving his hand emphatically. Jingle smiled, and moved towards the door. Stay, said Mr. Pickwick. Jingle stopped. I might, said Mr. Pickwick, have taken a much greater revenge for the treatment I have experienced at your hands, and that of your hypocritical friend there. Job Trotter bowed with great politeness, and laid his hand upon his heart. I say, said Mr. Pickwick, growing gradually angry, that I might have taken a greater revenge, but I content myself with exposing you, which I consider a duty I owe to society. This is a leniency, sir, which I hope you will remember. When Mr. Pickwick arrived at this point, Job Trotter, with facetious gravity, applied his hand to his ear, as if desirous not to lose a syllable he uttered. And I have only to add, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, now thoroughly angry, that I consider you a rascal, and a ruffian, and, and worse than any man I ever saw, or heard of, except that pious and sanctified vagabond in the mulberry livery. Ha! Ha! said Jingle, good fellow, Pickwick, fine heart, stout old boy, but must not be passionate, bad thing, very, bye, bye, see you again some day, keep up your spirits, now, job, trot. With these words, Mr. Jingle stuck on his hat in his old fashion, and strode out of the room. Job Trotter paused, looked round, smiled and then with a bow of mock solemnity to Mr. Pickwick, and a wink to Mr. Weller, the audacious slyness of which baffles all description, followed the footsteps of his hopeful master. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, as Mr. Weller was following. Sir. Stay here. Mr. Weller seemed uncertain. Stay here, repeated Mr. Pickwick. Mayn't I polish that air job off, in the front garden, said Mr. Weller. Certainly not, replied Mr. Pickwick. Mayn't I kick him out o' oh, the gate, sir, said Mr. Weller. Not on any account, replied his master. For the first time since his engagement, Mr. Weller looked, for a moment, discontented and unhappy. But his countenance immediately cleared up, for the wily Mr. Muzzle, by concealing himself behind the street door, and rushing violently out, at the right instant, contrived with great dexterity to overturn both Mr. Jingle and his attendant, down the flight of steps, into the American aloe tubs that stood beneath. Having discharged my duty, sir, said Mr. Pickwick to Mr. Nupkins, I will, with my friends, bid you farewell. While we thank you for such hospitality as we have received, permit me to assure you, in our joint names, that we should not have accepted it, or have consented to extricate ourselves in this way, from our previous dilemma. Had we not been impelled by a strong sense of duty. We return to London tomorrow. Your secret is safe with us. Having thus entered his protest against their treatment of the morning, Mr. Pickwick bowed low to the ladies, and notwithstanding the solicitations of the family, left the room with his friends. Get your hat, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. It's below stairs, sir, said Sam, and he ran down after it. Now, there was nobody in the kitchen, but the pretty housemaid, and as Sam's hat was mislaid, he had to look for it, and the pretty housemaid lighted him. They had to look all over the place for the hat. The pretty housemaid, in her anxiety to find it, went down on her knees, and turned over all the things that were heaped together in a little corner by the door. It was an awkward corner. You couldn't get at it without shutting the door first. Here it is, said the pretty housemaid. This is it, ain't it? Let me look, said Sam. The pretty housemaid had stood the candle on the floor. And, as it gave a very dim light, Sam was obliged to go down on his knees before he could see whether it really was his own hat or not. It was a remarkably small corner, and so, it was nobody's fault but the man's who built the house, Sam and the pretty housemaid were necessarily very close together. Yes, this is it, said Sam. Goodbye. Goodbye, said the pretty housemaid. Goodbye, said Sam, and as he said it, 
he dropped the hat that had caused so much trouble in looking for. How awkward you are, said the pretty housemaid. You'll lose it again, if you don't take care. So just to prevent his losing it again, she put it on for him. Whether it was that the pretty housemaid's face looked prettier still, when it was raised towards Sam's, or whether it was the accidental consequence of their being so near to each other, is matter of uncertainty to this day, but Sam kissed her. You don't mean to say you did that on purpose, said the pretty housemaid, blushing. No, I didn't then, said Sam, but I will now. So he kissed her again. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, calling over the banisters. Coming, sir, replied Sam, running upstairs. How long you have been, said Mr. Pickwick. There was something behind the door, sir, which prevented our getting it open, for ever so long, sir, replied Sam. And this was the first passage of Mr. Weller's First Love. Chapter 26 which contains a brief account of the progress of the action of Bardell against Pickwick. Having accomplished the main end and object of his journey, by the exposure of Jingle, Mr. Pickwick resolved on immediately returning to London, with the view of becoming acquainted with the proceedings which had been taken against him, in the meantime, by Messrs. Dodson and Fogg. Acting upon this resolution with all the energy and decision of his character, he mounted to the back seat of the first coach which left Ipswich on the morning after the memorable occurrences detailed at length in the two preceding chapters. And accompanied by his three friends, and Mr. Samuel Weller, arrived in the metropolis, in perfect health and safety, the same evening. Here the friends, for a short time, separated. Messrs. Tupman, Winkle, and Snodgrass repaired to their several homes to make such preparations as might be requisite for their forthcoming visit to Dingley Dell, and Mr. Pickwick and Sam took up their present abode in very good, old-fashioned, and comfortable quarters, to wit, the George and Vulture Tavern and Hotel, George Yard, Lombard Street. Mr. Pickwick had dined, finished his second pint of particular port, pulled his silk handkerchief over his head, put his feet on the fender, and thrown himself back in an easy chair, when the entrance of Mr. Weller with his carpet bag, aroused him from his tranquil meditation. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. Sir, said Mr. Weller. I have just been thinking, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, that having left a good many things at Mrs. Bardell's, in Goswell Street, I ought to arrange for taking them away, before I leave town again. Very good, sir replied Mr. Weller. I could send them to Mr. Tupman's, for the present, Sam, continued Mr. Pickwick, but before we take them away, it is necessary that they should be looked up, and put together. I wish you would step up to Goswell Street, Sam, and arrange about it. At once, sir, inquired Mr. Weller. At once, replied Mr. Pickwick. And stay, Sam, added Mr. Pickwick, pulling out his purse, there is some rent to pay. The quarter is not due till Christmas, but you may pay it, and have done with it. A month's notice terminates my tenancy. Here it is, written out. Give it, and tell Mrs. Bardell she may put a bill up, as soon as she likes. Very good, sir, replied Mr. Weller, anything more, sir. Nothing more, Sam. Mr. Weller stepped slowly to the door, as if he expected something more. Slowly opened it, slowly stepped out, and had slowly closed it within a couple of inches, when Mr. Pickwick called out. Sam. Yes, sir, said Mr. Weller, stepping quickly back, and closing the door behind him. I have no objection, Sam, to your endeavouring to ascertain how Mrs. Bardell herself seems disposed towards me, and whether it is really probable that this vile and groundless action is to be carried to extremity. I say I do not object to you doing this, if you wish it, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. Sam gave a short nod of intelligence, and left the room. Mr. Pickwick drew the silk handkerchief once more over his head, and composed himself for a nap. Mr. Weller promptly walked forth, to execute his commission. It was nearly nine o'clock when he reached Goswell Street. A couple of candles were burning in the little front parlor, and a couple of caps were reflected on the window blind. Mrs. 
Bardell had got company. Mr. Weller knocked at the door, and after a pretty long interval, occupied by the party without, in whistling a tune, and by the party within. In persuading a refractory flat candle to allow itself to be lighted, a pair of small boots pattered over the floor cloth, and Master Bardell presented himself. Well, young town skip, said Sam, how's mother? She's pretty well, replied Master Bardell, so am I. Well, that's a mercy, said Sam, tell her I want to speak to her, will you, my infant phenomenon? Master Bardell, thus adjured, placed the refractory flat candle on the bottom stair, and vanished into the front parlor with his message. The two caps, reflected on the window blind, were the respective headdresses of a couple of misses. Bardell's most particular acquaintance, who had just stepped in, to have a quiet cup of tea, and a little warm supper of a couple of sets of pettitoes and some toasted cheese. The cheese was simmering and browning away, most delightfully, in a little Dutch oven before the fire, the pettitoes were getting on deliciously in a little tin saucepan on the hob, and Mrs. Bardell and her two friends were getting on very well, also, in a little quiet conversation about and concerning all their particular friends and acquaintance. When Master Bardell came back from answering the door, and delivered the message entrusted to him by Mr. Samuel Weller. Mr. Pickwick's servant, said Mrs. Bardell, turning pale. Bless my soul, said Mrs. Cluppins. Well, I rawly would not ha believed it, unless I had ha happened to ha been here, said Mrs. Sanders. Mrs. Cluppins was a little, brisk, busy-looking woman, Mrs. Sanders was a big, fat, heavy-faced personage, and the two were the company. Mrs. Bardell felt it proper to be agitated, and as none of the three exactly knew whether under existing circumstances, any communication, otherwise than through Dodson and Fogg, ought to be held with Mr. Pickwick's servant, they were all rather taken by surprise. In this state of indecision, obviously the first thing to be done, was to thump the boy for finding Mr. Weller at the door. So his mother thumped him, and he cried melodiously. Hold your noise, do, you naughty creeter, said Mrs. Bardell. Yes, don't worry your poor mother, said Mrs. Sanders. She's quite enough to worry her, as it is, without you, Tommy, said Mrs. Cluppins, with sympathizing resignation. Ah! Worse luck, poor lamb, said Mrs. Sanders. At all which moral reflections, Master Bardell howled the louder. Now, what shall I do? said Mrs. Bardell to Mrs. Cluppins. I think you ought to see him, replied Mrs. Cluppins. But on no account without a witness. I think two witnesses would be more lawful, said Mrs. Sanders, who, like the other friend, was bursting with curiosity. Perhaps he'd better come in here, said Mrs. Bardell. To be sure, replied Mrs. Cluppins, eagerly catching at the idea, walk in, young man, and shut the street door first, please. Mr. Weller immediately took the hint, and presenting himself in the parlor, explained his business to Mrs. Bardell thus. Wery sorry to cast eye on any personal inconvenience, ma'am, as the housebreaker said to the old lady when he put her on the fire. But as me and my governor s only just come to town, and is just going away again, it can't be helped, you see. Of course, the young man can't help the faults of his master, said Mrs. Cluppins, much struck by Mr. Weller's appearance and conversation. Certainly not, chimed in Mrs. Sanders, who, from certain wistful glances at the little tin saucepan, seemed to be engaged in a mental calculation of the probable extent of the pettitoes, in the event of Sam's being asked to stop to supper. So all I've come about, is just this here, said Sam, disregarding the interruption, first, to give my governor's notice, there it is. Secondly, to pay the rent, here it is. Thirdly, to say as all his things is to be put together, and give to anybody as we sends for M. Fourthly, that you may let the place as soon as you like, and that's all. Whatever has happened, said Mrs. Bardell, I always have said, and always will say, that in every respect but one, Mr. Pickwick has always behaved himself like a perfect gentleman. His money always as good as the bank, always. 
as Mrs. Bardell said this, she applied her handkerchief to her eyes, and went out of the room to get the receipt. Samwell knew that he had only to remain quiet, and the women were sure to talk. So he looked alternately at the tin saucepan, the toasted cheese, the wall, and the ceiling, in profound silence. Poor dear, said Mrs. Cluppins. Ah, poor thing, replied Mrs. Sanders. Sam said nothing. He saw they were coming to the subject. I really cannot contain myself, said Mrs. Cluppins, when I think of such perjury. I don't wish to say anything to make you uncomfortable, young man, but your master's an old brute, and I wish I had him here to tell him so. I wish you had, said Sam. To see how dreadful she takes on, going moping about, and taking no pleasure in nothing, except when her friends comes in, out of charity, to sit with her, and make her comfortable, resumed Mrs. Cluppins, glancing at the tin saucepan and the Dutch oven, it's shocking. Barbarous, said Mrs. Sanders. And your master, young man. A gentleman with money, as could never feel the expense of a wife, no more than nothing, continued Mrs. Cluppins, with great volubility, why there ain't the faintest shade of an excuse for his behavior. Why don't he marry her? Ah, said Sam, to be sure, that's the question. Question, indeed, retorted Mrs. Cluppins, she'd question him, if she'd my spirit. Howsever, there is law for us women, miserable creatures as they'd make us, if they could, and that your master will find out, young man, to his cost, before he's six months older. At this consolatory reflection, Mrs. Cluppins bridled up and smiled at Mrs. Sanders, who smiled back again. The action's going on, and no mistake, thought Sam, as Mrs. Bardell re-entered with the receipt. Here's the receipt, Mr. Weller, said Mrs. Bardell, and here's the change, and I hope you'll take a little drop of something to keep the cold out, if it's only for old acquaintance's sake, Mr. Weller. Sam saw the advantage he should gain, and at once acquiesced. Whereupon Mrs. Bardell produced, from a small closet, a black bottle and a wine glass, and so great was her abstraction, in her deep mental affliction, that, after filling Mr. Weller's glass, she brought out three more wine glasses, and filled them too. Lauk, Mrs. Bardell, said Mrs. Cluppins, see what you've been and done. Well, that is a good one, ejaculated Mrs. Sanders. Ah, my poor head, said Mrs. Bardell, with a faint smile. Sam understood all this, of course, so he said at once, that he never could drink before supper, unless a lady drank with him. A great deal of laughter ensued, and Mrs. Sanders volunteered to humor him, so she took a slight sip out of her glass. Then Sam said it must go all round, so they all took a slight sip. Then little Mrs. Cluppins proposed as a toast, success to Bardell Egg and Pickwick. And then the ladies emptied their glasses in honor of the sentiment, and got very talkative directly. I suppose you've heard what's going forward, Mr. Weller, said Mrs. Bardell. I've heard something on it, replied Sam. It's a terrible thing to be dragged before the public, in that way, Mr. Weller, said Mrs. Bardell, but I see now, that it's the only thing I ought to do, and my lawyers, Mr. Dodson and Fogg, tell me that, with the evidence as we shall call, we must succeed. I don't know what I should do, Mr. Weller, if I didn't. The mere idea of Mrs. Bardell's failing in her action, affected Mrs. Sanders so deeply, that she was under the necessity of refilling and re-emptying her glass immediately, feeling, as she said afterwards, that if she hadn't had the presence of mind to do so, she must have dropped. Then is it expected to come on? inquired Sam. Either in February or March, replied Mrs. Bardell. What a number of witnesses there'll be, won't there, said Mrs. Cluppins. Ah. Won't there, replied Mrs. Sanders. And won't Mr. Dodson and Fogg be wild if the plaintiff shouldn't get it, added Mrs. Cluppins, when they do it all on speculation. Ah. Won't they, said Mrs. Sanders. But the plaintiff must get it resumed Mrs. Cluppins. I hope so, said Mrs. Bardell. Oh, there can't be any doubt about it, 
rejoined Mrs. Sanders. Vell, said Sam, rising and setting down his glass, all I can say is, that I wish you may get it. Thank ye, Mr. Weller, said Mrs. Bardell fervently. And of them Dodson and Foggs, as does these sort o' oh, things on spec, continued Mr. Weller, as vell as for the other kind and genrouse people o' oh, the same profession, as sets people by the ears, free gratis for nothing. And sets their clerks to work to find out little disputes among their neighbors and acquaintances as Vance Settlin, by means of lawsuits, all I can say o' oh, them is, that I wish they had the reward I'd give em. Ah, I wish they had the reward that every kind and generous heart would be inclined to bestow upon them, said the gratified Mrs. Bardell. Amen to that, replied Sam, and a fat and happy liven, they'd get out of it. Wish you good night, ladies. To the great relief of Mrs. Sanders, Sam was allowed to depart without any reference, on the part of the hostess, to the pettitoes and toasted cheese. To which the ladies, with such juvenile assistance as Master Bardell could afford, soon afterwards rendered the amplest justice, indeed they wholly vanished before their strenuous exertions. Mr. Weller wended his way back to the George and Vulture, and faithfully recounted to his master, such indications of the sharp practice of Dodson and Fogg, as he had contrived to pick up in his visit to Mrs. Bardell's. An interview with Mr. Perker, next day, more than confirmed Mr. Weller's statement, and Mr. Pickwick was fain to prepare for his Christmas visit to Dingley Dell, with the pleasant anticipation that some two or three months afterwards, an action brought against him for damages sustained by reason of a breach of promise of marriage, would be publicly tried in the Court of Common Pleas. The plaintiff having all the advantages derivable, not only from the force of circumstances, but from the sharp practice of Dodson and Fogg to boot. Chapter 27 Samuel Weller makes a pilgrimage to Dorking, and beholds his mother-in-law. There still remaining an interval of two days before the time agreed upon for the departure of the Pequickians to Dingley Dell, Mr. Weller sat himself down in a back room at the George and Vulture, after eating an early dinner, to muse on the best way of disposing of his time. It was a remarkably fine day. And he had not turned the matter over in his mind ten minutes, when he was suddenly stricken filial and affectionate. And it occurred to him so strongly that he ought to go down and see his father, and pay his duty to his mother-in-law, that he was lost in astonishment at his own remissness in never thinking of this moral obligation before. Anxious to atone for his past neglect without another hour's delay, he straightway walked upstairs to Mr. Pickwick, and requested leave of absence for this laudable purpose. Certainly, Sam, certainly, said Mr. Pickwick, his eyes glistening with delight at this manifestation of filial feeling on the part of his attendant, certainly, Sam. Mr. Weller made a grateful bow. I am very glad to see that you have so high a sense of your duties as a son, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. I always had, sir, replied Mr. Weller. That's a very gratifying reflection, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick approvingly. Wary, sir, replied Mr. Weller, if ever I wanted anything, oh, my father, I always asked for it in a wary, spectful and obligent manner. If he didn't give it me, I took it, for fear I should be led to do anything wrong, through not having, it. I saved him a world oh trouble this way, sir. That's not precisely what I meant, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, shaking his head, with a slight smile. All good feelin', sir the wary best intentions, as the Gen LMN said when he run away from his wife, cause she seemed unhappy with him, replied Mr. Weller. You may go, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. Thank ye, sir, replied Mr. Weller. And having made his best bow, and put on his best clothes, Sam planted himself on the top of the Arundel coach, and journeyed on to Dorking. The Marquis of Granby, in Mrs. Weller's time, was quite a model of a roadside public house of the better class, just large enough to be convenient, and small enough to be snug. On the opposite side of the road was a large signboard on a high post, representing the head and shoulders of a gentleman with an apoplectic countenance, in a red coat with deep blue facings. And a touch of the same blue over his three-cornered hat, for a sky. Over that again were a pair of flags, 
beneath the last button of his coat were a couple of cannon, and the whole formed an expressive and undoubted likeness of the Marquis of Granby of glorious memory. The bar window displayed a choice collection of geranium plants, and a well-dusted row of spirit files. The open shutters bore a variety of golden inscriptions, eulogistic of good beds and neat wines. And the choice group of countrymen and hostlers lounging about the stable door and horse trough, afforded presumptive proof of the excellent quality of the ale and spirits which were sold within. Sam Weller paused, when he dismounted from the coach, to note all these little indications of a thriving business, with the eye of an experienced traveller, and having done so, stepped in at once, highly satisfied with everything he had observed. Now, then, said a shrill female voice the instant Sam thrust his head in at the door, what do you want, young man? Sam looked round in the direction whence the voice proceeded. It came from a rather stout lady of comfortable appearance, who was seated beside the fireplace in the bar, blowing the fire to make the kettle boil for tea. She was not alone. For on the other side of the fireplace, sitting bolt upright in a high-backed chair, was a man in threadbare black clothes, with a back almost as long and stiff as that of the chair itself. Who caught Sam's most particular and especial attention at once? He was a prim-faced, red-nosed man, with a long, thin countenance, and a semi-rattlesnake sort of eye, rather sharp, but decidedly bad. He wore very short trousers, and black cotton stockings, which, like the rest of his apparel, were particularly rusty. His looks were starched, but his white neckerchief was not, and its long limp ends straggled over his closely buttoned waistcoat in a very uncouth and unpicturesque fashion. A pair of old, worn, beaver gloves, a broad-brimmed hat, and a faded green umbrella, with plenty of whalebone sticking through the bottom, as if to counterbalance the want of a handle at the top, lay on a chair beside him. And, being disposed in a very tidy and careful manner, seemed to imply that the red-nosed man, whoever he was, had no intention of going away in a hurry. To do the red-nosed man justice, he would have been very far from wise if he had entertained any such intention. For, to judge from all appearances, he must have been possessed of a most desirable circle of acquaintance, if he could have reasonably expected to be more comfortable anywhere else. The fire was blazing brightly under the influence of the bellows, and the kettle was singing gaily under the influence of both. A small tray of tea things was arranged on the table, a plate of hot buttered toast was gently simmering before the fire. And the red-nosed man himself was busily engaged in converting a large slice of bread into the same agreeable edible, through the instrumentality of a long brass toasting fork. Beside him stood a glass of reeking hot pineapple rum and water, with a slice of lemon in it. And every time the red-nosed man stopped to bring the round of toast to his eye, with the view of ascertaining how it got on, he imbibed a drop or two of the hot pineapple rum and water, and smiled upon the rather stout lady, as she blew the fire. Sam was so lost in the contemplation of this comfortable scene, that he suffered the first inquiry of the rather stout lady to pass unheeded. It was not until it had been twice repeated, each time in a shriller tone, that he became conscious of the impropriety of his behavior. Governor in, inquired Sam, in reply to the question. No, he isn't, replied Mrs. Weller. For the rather stout lady was no other than the quondam relict and sole executrix of the dead and gone Mr. Clark, no, he isn't, and I don't expect him either. I suppose he's driving up today, said Sam. He may be, or he may not, replied Mrs. Weller, buttering the round of toast which the red-nosed man had just finished. I don't know, and, what's more, I don't care. Dot, ask a blessin', Mr. Stiggins. The red-nosed man did as he was desired, and instantly commenced on the toast with fierce voracity. The appearance of the red-nosed man had induced Sam, at first sight, to more than half suspect that he was the deputy shepherd of whom his estimable parent had spoken. The moment he saw him eat, all doubt on the subject was removed, and he perceived at once that if he purposed to take up his temporary quarters where he was, he must make his footing good without delay. He therefore commenced proceedings by putting his arm over the half-door of the bar, coolly unbolting it, and leisurely walking in. Mother-in-law, said Sam, how are you? Why, I do believe he is a weller, said Mrs. W. 
raising her eyes to Sam's face, with no very gratified expression of countenance. I rather think he is, said the imperturbable Sam. And I hope this here Reverend Gen L M N L L excuse me saying that I wish I was the weller as owns you, mother-in-law. This was a double-barreled compliment. It implied that Mrs. Weller was a most agreeable female, and also that Mr. Stiggins had a clerical appearance. It made a visible impression at once, and Sam followed up his advantage by kissing his mother-in-law. Get along with you, said Mrs. Weller, pushing him away. For shame, young man. Said the gentleman with the red nose. No offense, sir, no offense, replied Sam, you're wary right, though, it ain't the right sort o oh, thing, Van Mother's-in-law is young and good-looking, is it, sir? It's all vanity, said Mr. Stiggins. Ah, so it is, said Mrs. Weller, setting her cap to rights. Sam thought it was, too, but he held his peace. The deputy shepherd seemed by no means best pleased with Sam's arrival. And when the first effervescence of the compliment had subsided, even Mrs. Weller looked as if she could have spared him without the smallest inconvenience. However, there he was. And as he couldn't be decently turned out, they all three sat down to tea. And how's father? said Sam. At this inquiry, Mrs. Weller raised her hands, and turned up her eyes, as if the subject were too painful to be alluded to. Mr. Stiggins groaned. What's the matter with that air Gen L M N? inquired Sam. He's shocked at the way your father goes on in, replied Mrs. Weller. Oh, he is, is he, said Sam. And with too good reason, added Mrs. Weller gravely. Mr. Stiggins took up a fresh piece of toast, and groaned heavily. He is a dreadful reprobate, said Mrs. Weller. A man of wrath, exclaimed Mr. Stiggins. He took a large semicircular bite out of the toast, and groaned again. Sam felt very strongly disposed to give the Reverend Mr. Stiggins something to groan for, but he repressed his inclination, and merely asked, what's the old un up to now? Up to, indeed, said Mrs. Weller, oh, he has a hard heart. Night after night does this excellent man, don't frown, Mr. Stiggins, I will say you are an excellent man, come and sit here, for hours together, and it has not the least effect upon him. Well, that is odd, said Sam. It, you d have a very considerable effect upon me, if I was in his place, I know that. The fact is, my young friend, said Mr. Stiggins solemnly, he has an obdurate bosom. Oh, my young friend, who else could have resisted the pleading of sixteen of our fairest sisters? and withstood their exhortations to subscribe to our noble society for providing the infant negroes in the West Indies with flannel waistcoats and moral pocket handkerchiefs. What's a moral pocket handkerchief, said Sam, I never see one o' oh, them articles, oh, furniture. Those which combine amusement with instruction, my young friend, replied Mr. Stiggins, blending select tails with woodcuts. Oh, I know, said Sam. Them as hangs up in the linen drapers' shops, with beggars' petitions and all that, air upon him. Mr. Stiggins began a third round of toast, and nodded assent. And he wouldn't be persuaded by the ladies, wouldn't he, said Sam. Sat and smoked his pipe, and said the infant negroes were, what did he say the infant negroes were, said Mrs. Weller. Little humbugs, replied Mr. Stiggins, deeply affected. Said the infant negroes were little humbugs, repeated Mrs. Weller. And they both groaned at the atrocious conduct of the elder Mr. Weller. A great many more iniquities of a similar nature might have been disclosed, only the toast being all eaten, the tea having got very weak, and Sam holding out no indications of meaning to go, Mr. Stiggins suddenly recollected that he had a most pressing appointment with the shepherd, and took himself off accordingly. The tea things had been scarcely put away, and the hearth swept up, when the London coach deposited Mr. Weller, Sr., at the door, his legs deposited him in the bar, and his eyes showed him his son. What, Sammy, exclaimed the father. What, old knobs, ejaculated the son. And they shook hands heartily. Very glad to see you, Sammy, said the elder Mr. Weller, 
though how you've managed to get over your mother-in-law, is a mystery to me. I only wish you'd write me out the receipt, that's all. Hush, said Sam, she's at home, old feller. She ain't within hearin', replied Mr. Weller, she always goes and blows up, downstairs, for a couple of hours arter tea, so we'll just give ourselves a damp, Sammy. Saying this, Mr. Weller mixed two glasses of spirits and water, and produced a couple of pipes. The father and son sitting down opposite each other, Sam on one side of the fire, in the high-backed chair, and Mr. Weller, Sr., on the other, in an easy ditto, they proceeded to enjoy themselves with all due gravity. Anybody been here, Sammy, asked Mr. Weller, Sr., dryly, after a long silence. Sam nodded an expressive assent. Red-nosed chap. Inquired Mr. Weller. Sam nodded again. Amiable man that air, Sammy, said Mr. Weller, smoking violently. Seems so, observed Sam. Good hand at accounts, said Mr. Weller. Is he, said Sam. Borrows eighteen pence on Monday, and comes on Tuesday for a shillin' to make it up half a crown, calls again on Wednesday for another half crown to make it five shillings. And goes on, doubling, till he gets it up to a five pun note in no time, like them sums in the arithmetic book, bout the nails in the horse's shoes, Sammy. Sam intimated by a nod that he recollected the problem alluded to by his parent. So you wouldn't subscribe to the flannel veskets, said Sam, after another interval of smoking. Certain and why not, replied Mr. Weller, what's the good o' oh, flannel veskets to the young niggers abroad? But I'll tell you what it is, Sammy, said Mr. Weller, lowering his voice, and bending across the fireplace, I'd come down wary handsome toward straight veskets for some people at home. As Mr. Weller said this, he slowly recovered his former position, and winked at his firstborn, in a profound manner. It certain L.Y. seems a queer start to send out pocket handkerchiefs to people as don't know the use on M., observed Sam. They're always a doin' some gammon of that sort, Sammy, replied his father. T'other Sunday I was walkin' up the road, when who should I see, a standin' at a chapel door, with a blue soup plate in her hand, but your mother-in-law. I warily believe there was change for a couple o suvirins in it, then, Sammy, all in ha pence. And as the people come out, they rattled the pennies in it, till you'd ha thought that no mortal plate as ever was baked, could ha stood the wear and tear. What do you think it was all for? For another tea drinkin', perhaps, said Sam. Not a bit on it, replied the father, for the shepherd's water rate, Sammy. The shepherd's water rate, said Sam. I, replied Mr. Weller, there was three quarters Owen, and the shepherd hadn't paid a far den, not he, perhaps it might be on account that the water warn't o oh, much use to him, for it's wary little o oh, that tap he drinks, Sammy, wary. He knows a trick worth a good half dozen of that, he does. Howsever, it warn't paid, and so they cuts the water off. Down goes the shepherd to chapel, gives out as he's a persecuted saint, and says he hopes the heart of the turncock has cut the water off, ll be softened, and turned in the right vey, but he rather thinks he's booked for something uncomfortable. Upon this, the women calls a meeting, sings a hymn, what's your mother-in-law into the chair, volunteers a collection next Sunday, and hands it all over to the shepherd. And if he ain't got enough out on M. Sammy, to make him free of the water company for life, said Mr. Weller, in conclusion, I'm one Dutchman, and you're another, and that's all about it. Mr. Weller smoked for some minutes in silence, and then resumed. The worst o' oh, these here shepherds is, my boy, that they reg larly turns the heads of all the young ladies, about here. Lord bless their little hearts, they thinks it's all right, and don't know no better but they're the victims o' oh, gammon, Samavel, they're the victims o' oh, gammon. I suppose they are, said Sam. Nothing else, said Mr. Weller, shaking his head gravely, and what aggrawats me, Samavel, is to see M.A. wastin' all their time and labor in making clothes for copper-colored people as don't want M, and taking no notice of flesh-colored Christians as do. If I'd my vey, Samavel, 
I'd just stick some o' these here lazy shepherds behind a heavy wheelbarrow, and run em up and down a fourteen-inch wide plank all day. That, you'd shake the nonsense out of em, if anything, vood. Mr. Weller, having delivered this gentle recipe with strong emphasis, eked out by a variety of nods and contortions of the eye, emptied his glass at a draught, and knocked the ashes out of his pipe, with native dignity. He was engaged in this operation, when a shrill voice was heard in the passage. Here's your dear relation, Sammy, said Mr. Weller, and Mrs. W. hurried into the room. Oh, you've come back, have you, said Mrs. Weller. Yes, my dear, replied Mr. Weller, filling a fresh pipe. Has Mr. Stiggins been back, said Mrs. Weller. No, my dear, he hasn't, replied Mr. Weller, lighting the pipe by the ingenious process of holding to the bowl thereof, between the tongs, a red-hot coal from the adjacent fire, and what's more, my dear, I shall manage to survive it, if he don't come back at all. Ugh, you wretch! said Mrs. Weller. Thank ye, my love, said Mr. Weller. Come, come, father, said Sam, none owe these little lovin's of four strangers. Here's the Reverend Gen L M N A comin' in now. At this announcement, Mrs. Weller hastily wiped off the tears which she had just begun to force on, and Mr. W. drew his chair sullenly into the chimney corner. Mr. Stiggins was easily prevailed on to take another glass of the hot pineapple rum and water, and a second, and a third, and then to refresh himself with a slight supper, previous to beginning again. He sat on the same side as Mr. Weller, Sr. And every time he could contrive to do so, unseen by his wife, that gentleman indicated to his son the hidden emotions of his bosom, by shaking his fist over the deputy shepherd's head. A process which afforded his son the most unmingled delight and satisfaction, the more especially as Mr. Stiggins went on, quietly drinking the hot pineapple rum and water, wholly unconscious of what was going forward. The major part of the conversation was confined to Mrs. Weller and the Reverend Mr. Stiggins. And the topics principally descanted on, were the virtues of the shepherd, the worthiness of his flock, and the high crimes and misdemeanors of everybody beside, dissertations which the elder Mr. Weller occasionally interrupted by half-suppressed references to a gentleman of the name of Walker, and other running commentaries of the same kind. At length Mr. Stiggins, with several most indubitable symptoms of having quite as much pineapple rum and water about him as he could comfortably accommodate, took his hat, and his leave, and Sam was, immediately afterwards, shown to bed by his father. The respectable old gentleman wrung his hand fervently, and seemed disposed to address some observation to his son, but on Mrs. Weller advancing towards him, he appeared to relinquish that intention, and abruptly bade him good night. Sam was up betimes next day, and having partaken of a hasty breakfast, prepared to return to London. He had scarcely set foot without the house, when his father stood before him. Go in, Sammy, inquired Mr. Weller. Off at once, replied Sam. I wish you could muffle that air Stiggins, and take him with you, said Mr. Weller. I am ashamed on you, said Sam reproachfully, what do you let him show his red nose in the Marcus O. Granby at all, for? Mr. Weller the elder fixed on his son an earnest look, and replied, Cos I'm a married man, Samavel, cos I'm a married man. Then you're a married man, Samavel, you'll understand a good many things as you don't understand now. But whether it's worth while going through so much, to learn so little, as the charity boy said when he got to the end of the alphabet, is a matter o' taste. I rather think it isn't. Well, said Sam, goodbye. Tar, tar, Sammy, replied his father. I've only got to say this here, said Sam, stopping short, that if I was the propitiator o, oh, the Marcus o, oh, Granby, and that, ere Stiggins came and made toast in my bar, I'd. What? interposed Mr. Weller, with great anxiety. What? Pison his rum and water, said Sam. No, said Mr. Weller, shaking his son eagerly by the hand, would you Raleigh, Sammy would you, though? I would, said Sam. I wouldn't be too hard upon him at first. 
I'd drop him in the water butt, and put the lid on, and if I found he was insensible to kindness, I'd try the other persuasion. The elder mister. Weller bestowed a look of deep, unspeakable admiration on his son, and, having once more grasped his hand, walked slowly away, revolving in his mind the numerous reflections to which his advice had given rise. Sam looked after him, until he turned a corner of the road, and then set forward on his walk to London. He meditated at first, on the probable consequences of his own advice, and the likelihood of his father's adopting it. He dismissed the subject from his mind, however, with the consolatory reflection that time alone would show, and this is the reflection we would impress upon the reader. Chapter 28 A good-humored Christmas chapter, containing an account of a wedding, and some other sports beside, which although in their way, even as good customs as marriage itself, are not quite so religiously kept up. In these degenerate times, as brisk as bees, if not altogether as light as fairies, did the four Pequickians assemble on the morning of the twenty-second day of December, in the year of grace in which these, their faithfully recorded adventures, were undertaken and accomplished. Christmas was close at hand, in all his bluff and hearty honesty, it was the season of hospitality, merriment, and open-heartedness. The old year was preparing, like an ancient philosopher, to call his friends around him, and amidst the sound of feasting and revelry to pass gently and calmly away. Gay and merry was the time. And right gay and merry were at least four of the numerous hearts that were gladdened by its coming. And numerous indeed are the hearts to which Christmas brings a brief season of happiness and enjoyment. How many families, whose members have been dispersed and scattered far and wide, in the restless struggles of life, are then reunited, and meet once again in that happy state of companionship and mutual goodwill. Which is a source of such pure and unalloyed delight. And one so incompatible with the cares and sorrows of the world, that the religious belief of the most civilized nations, and the rude traditions of the roughest savages, alike number it among the first joys of a future condition of existence. Provided for the blessed and happy. How many old recollections, and how many dormant sympathies, does Christmas time awaken? We write these words now, many miles distant from the spot at which, year after year, we met on that day, a merry and joyous circle. Many of the hearts that throbbed so gaily then, have ceased to beat, many of the looks that shone so brightly then, have ceased to glow, the hands we grasped, have grown cold, the eyes we sought, have hid their luster in the grave. And yet the old house, the room, the merry voices and smiling faces, the jest, the laugh, the most minute and trivial circumstances connected with those happy meetings, crowd upon our mind at each recurrence of the season. As if the last assemblage had been but yesterday. Happy, happy Christmas, that can win us back to the delusions of our childish days, that can recall to the old man the pleasures of his youth. That can transport the sailor and the traveler, thousands of miles away, back to his own fireside in his quiet home. But we are so taken up and occupied with the good qualities of this Saint Christmas, that we are keeping Mr. Pickwick and his friends waiting in the cold on the outside of the Muggleton coach, which they have just attained, well wrapped up in great coats, shawls, and comforters. The portmanteaus and carpet bags have been stowed away, and Mr. Weller and the guard are endeavoring to insinuate into the foreboot a huge codfish several sizes too large for it, which is snugly packed up, in a long brown basket, with a layer of straw over the top, and which has been left to the last in order that he may repose in safety on the half-dozen barrels of real native oysters, all the property of Mr. Pickwick, which have been arranged in regular order at the bottom of the receptacle. The interest displayed in Mr. Pickwick's countenance is most intense, as Mr. Weller and the guard try to squeeze the codfish into the boot, first head first, and then tail first, and then top upward, and then bottom upward, and then sideways, and then long ways all of which artifices the implacable codfish sturdily resists, until the guard accidentally hits him in the very middle of the basket, whereupon he suddenly disappears into the boot, and with him, the head and shoulders of the guard himself, who, not calculating upon so sudden a cessation of the passive resistance of the codfish, experiences a very unexpected shock, 
to the unsmotherable delight of all the porters and bystanders. Upon this, Mr. Pickwick smiles with great good humor, and drawing a shilling from his waistcoat pocket, begs the guard, as he picks himself out of the boot, to drink his health in a glass of hot brandy and water. At which the guard smiles too, and Messrs. Snodgrass, Winkle, and Tupman, all smile in company. The guard and Mr. Weller disappear for five minutes, most probably to get the hot brandy and water, for they smell very strongly of it, when they return, the coachman mounts to the box, Mr. Weller jumps up behind, the Pequickians pull their coats round their legs and their shawls over their noses, the helpers pull the horse cloths off, the coachman shouts out a cheery, all right, and away they go. They have rumbled through the streets, and jolted over the stones, and at length reach the wide and open country. The wheels skim over the hard and frosty ground. And the horses, bursting into a canter at a smart crack of the whip, step along the road as if the load behind them, coach, passengers, codfish, oyster barrels, and all, were but a feather at their heels. They have descended a gentle slope, and enter upon a level, as compact and dry as a solid block of marble, two miles long. Another crack of the whip, and on they speed, at a smart gallop, the horses tossing their heads and rattling the harness, as if in exhilaration at the rapidity of the motion. While the coachman, holding whip and reins in one hand, takes off his hat with the other, and resting it on his knees, pulls out his handkerchief, and wipes his forehead, partly because he has a habit of doing it. And partly because it's as well to show the passengers how cool he is, and what an easy thing it is to drive four in hand, when you have had as much practice as he has. Having done this very leisurely, otherwise the effect would be materially impaired, he replaces his handkerchief, pulls on his hat, adjusts his gloves, squares his elbows, cracks the whip again, and on they speed, more merrily than before. A few small houses, scattered on either side of the road, betoken the entrance to some town or village. The lively notes of the guard's key bugle vibrate in the clear cold air, and wake up the old gentleman inside, who, carefully letting down the window sash halfway, and standing sentry over the air, takes a short peep out. And then carefully pulling it up again, informs the other inside that they're going to change directly. On which the other inside wakes himself up, and determines to postpone his next nap until after the stoppage. Again the bugle sounds lustily forth, and rouses the Kateger's wife and children, who peep out at the house door, and watch the coach till it turns the corner, when they once more crouch round the blazing fire. And throw on another log of wood against father comes home. While father himself, a full mile off, has just exchanged a friendly nod with the coachman, and turned round to take a good long stare at the vehicle as it whirls away. And now the bugle plays a lively air as the coach rattles through the ill-paved streets of a country town, and the coachman, undoing the buckle which keeps his ribbons together, prepares to throw them off the moment he stops. Mr. Pickwick emerges from his coat collar, and looks about him with great curiosity, perceiving which, the coachman informs Mr. Pickwick of the name of the town, and tells him it was market day yesterday, both of which pieces of information Mr. Pickwick retails to his fellow passengers, whereupon they emerge from their coat collars too, and look about them also. Mr. Winkle, who sits at the extreme edge, with one leg dangling in the air, is nearly precipitated into the street, as the coach twists round the sharp corner by the cheesemonger's shop, and turns into the marketplace, and before Mr. Snodgrass, who sits next to him, has recovered from his alarm, they pull up at the inn yard where the fresh horses, with cloths on, are already waiting. The coachman throws down the reins and gets down himself, and the other outside passengers drop down also, except those who have no great confidence in their ability to get up again. And they remain where they are, and stamp their feet against the coach to warm them, looking, with longing eyes and red noses, at the bright fire in the inn bar, and the sprigs of holly with red berries which ornament the window. But the guard has delivered at the corn dealer's shop, the brown paper packet he took out of the little pouch which hangs over his shoulder by a leathern strap, and has seen the horses carefully put to and has thrown on the pavement the saddle which was brought from London on the coach roof, and has assisted in the conference between the coachman and the hostler about the grey mare that hurt her off four leg last Tuesday, and he and Mr. 
Weller are all right behind, and the coachman is all right in front, and the old gentleman inside, who has kept the window down full two inches all this time, has pulled it up again, and the cloths are off, and they are all ready for starting. Except the two stout gentlemen, whom the coachman inquires after with some impatience. Hereupon the coachman, and the guard, and Sam Weller, and Mr. Winkle, and Mr. Snodgrass, and all the hostlers, and every one of the idlers, who are more in number than all the others put together, shout for the missing gentleman as loud as they can bawl. A distant response is heard from the yard, and Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Tupman come running down it, quite out of breath, for they have been having a glass of ale apiece, and Mr. Pickwick's fingers are so cold that he has been full five minutes before he could find the sixpence to pay for it. The coachman shouts an admonitory now then, Gen LMN, the guard re-echoes it, the old gentleman inside thinks it a very extraordinary thing that people will get down when they know there isn't time for it, Mr. Pickwick struggles up on one side, Mr. Tupman on the other, Mr. Winkle cries, all right, and off they start. Shawls are pulled up, coat collars are readjusted, the pavement ceases, the houses disappear. And they are once again dashing along the open road, with the fresh clear air blowing in their faces, and gladdening their very hearts within them. Such was the progress of Mr. Pickwick and his friends by the Muggleton Telegraph, on their way to Dingley Dell. And at three o'clock that afternoon they all stood high and dry, safe and sound, hale and hearty, upon the steps of the Blue Lion, having taken on the road quite enough of ale and brandy. To enable them to bid defiance to the frost that was binding up the earth in its iron fetters, and weaving its beautiful network upon the trees and hedges. Mr. Pickwick was busily engaged in counting the barrels of oysters and superintending the disinterment of the codfish, when he felt himself gently pulled by the skirts of the coat. Looking round, he discovered that the individual who resorted to this mode of catching his attention was no other than Mr. Wardle's favorite page, better known to the readers of this unvarnished history, by the distinguishing appellation of the fat boy. Aha, said Mr. Pickwick. Aha, said the fat boy. As he said it, he glanced from the codfish to the oyster barrels, and chuckled joyously. He was fatter than ever. Well, you look rosy enough, my young friend, said Mr. Pickwick. I've been asleep, right in front of the taproom fire, replied the fat boy, who had heated himself to the color of a new chimney pot, in the course of an hour's nap. Master sent me over with the che cart, to carry your luggage up to the house. He'd ha, sent some saddle horses, but he thought you'd rather walk, being a cold day. Yes, yes, said Mr. Pickwick hastily, for he remembered how they had traveled over nearly the same ground on a previous occasion. Yes, we would rather walk. Here, Sam. Sir, said Mr. Weller. Help Mr. Wardle's servant to put the packages into the cart, and then ride on with him. We will walk forward at once. Having given this direction, and settled with the coachman, Mr. Pickwick and his three friends struck into the footpath across the fields, and walked briskly away, leaving Mr. Weller and the fat boy confronted together for the first time. Sam looked at the fat boy with great astonishment, but without saying a word, and began to stow the luggage rapidly away in the cart, while the fat boy stood quietly by, and seemed to think it a very interesting sort of thing to see Mr. Weller working by himself. There, said Sam, throwing in the last carpet bag, there they are. Yes, said the fat boy, in a very satisfied tone, there they are. Vell, young twenty stun, said Sam, you're a nice specimen of a prize boy, you are. Thank ye, said the fat boy. You ain't got nothin' on your mind as makes you fret yourself, have you? inquired Sam. Not as I knows on, replied the fat boy. I should rather ha, thought, to look at you, that you was a laburin under an unrequited attachment to some young woman, said Sam. The fat boy shook his head. Vell, said Sam, I am glad to hear it. Do you ever drink anything? I likes eating better, replied the boy. Ah, said Sam, I should ha best pose that, but what I mean is, should you like a drop of anything best warm you? But I suppose you never was cold, 
with all them elastic fixtures, was you? Sometimes, replied the boy, and I likes a drop of something, when it's good. Oh, you do, do you, said Sam, come this way, then. The blue lion tap was soon gained, and the fat boy swallowed a glass of liquor without so much as winking, a feat which considerably advanced him in Mr. Weller's good opinion. Mr. Weller having transacted a similar piece of business on his own account, they got into the cart. Can you drive? said the fat boy. I should rather think so, replied Sam. There, then, said the fat boy, putting the reins in his hand, and pointing up a lane, it's as straight as you can go, you can't miss it. With these words, the fat boy laid himself affectionately down by the side of the codfish, and, placing an oyster barrel under his head for a pillow, fell asleep instantaneously. Well, said Sam, of all the cool boys ever I set my eyes on, this here young Gen LMN is the coolest. Come, wake up, young Dropsy. But as young Dropsy evinced no symptoms of returning animation, Sam Weller sat himself down in front of the cart and starting the old horse with a jerk of the rein, jogged steadily on, towards the manor farm. Meanwhile, Mr. Pickwick and his friends having walked their blood into active circulation, proceeded cheerfully on. The paths were hard, the grass was crisp and frosty, the air had a fine, dry, bracing coldness. And the rapid approach of the grey twilight, slate-coloured is a better term in frosty weather, made them look forward with pleasant anticipation to the comforts which awaited them at their hospitable entertainers. It was the sort of afternoon that might induce a couple of elderly gentlemen, in a lonely field, to take off their greatcoats and play at leapfrog in pure lightness of heart and gaiety, and we firmly believe that had Mr. Tupman at that moment proffered a back, Mr. Pickwick would have accepted his offer with the utmost avidity. However, Mr. Tupman did not volunteer any such accommodation, and the friends walked on, conversing merrily. As they turned into a lane they had to cross, the sound of many voices burst upon their ears. And before they had even had time to form a guest to whom they belonged, they walked into the very center of the party who were expecting their arrival a fact which was first notified to the Pequickians, by the loud hurrah, which burst from old Wardle's lips, when they appeared in sight. First, there was Wardle himself, looking, if that were possible, more jolly than ever, then there were Bella and her faithful trundle. And, lastly, there were Emily and some eight or ten young ladies, who had all come down to the wedding, which was to take place next day, and who were in as happy and important a state as young ladies usually are on such momentous occasions. And they were, one and all, startling the fields and lanes, far and wide, with their frolic and laughter. The ceremony of introduction, under such circumstances, was very soon performed, or we should rather say that the introduction was soon over, without any ceremony at all. In two minutes thereafter, Mr. Pickwick was joking with the young ladies who wouldn't come over the stile while he looked, or who, having pretty feet and unexceptionable ankles, preferred standing on the top rail for five minutes or so. Declaring that they were too frightened to move, with as much ease and absence of reserve or constraint, as if he had known them for life. It is worthy of remark, too, that Mr. Snodgrass offered Emily far more assistance than the absolute terrors of the style, although it was full three feet high, and had only a couple of stepping stones, would seem to require. While one black-eyed young lady in a very nice little pair of boots with fur round the top, was observed to scream very loudly, when Mr. Winkle offered to help her over. All this was very snug and pleasant. And when the difficulties of the style were at last surmounted, and they once more entered on the open field, Old Wardle informed Mr. Pickwick how they had all been down in a body to inspect the furniture and fittings up of the house, which the young couple were to tenant, after the Christmas holidays. At which communication Bella and Trundle both colored up, as red as the fat boy after the taproom fire, and the young lady with the black eyes and the fur round the boots, whispered something in Emily's ear, and then glanced archly at Mr. Snodgrass, to which Emily responded that she was a foolish girl, but turned very red, notwithstanding, and Mr. 
Snodgrass, who was as modest as all great geniuses usually are, felt the crimson rising to the crown of his head, and devoutly wished, in the inmost recesses of his own heart, that the young lady aforesaid, with her black eyes, and her archness, and her boots with the fur round the top, were all comfortably deposited in the adjacent county. But if they were social and happy outside the house, what was the warmth and cordiality of their reception when they reached the farm? The very servants grinned with pleasure at sight of Mr. Pickwick. And Emma bestowed a half-demure, half-impudent, and all-pretty look of recognition, on Mr. Tupman, which was enough to make the statue of Bonaparte in the passage, unfold his arms, and clasp her within them. The old lady was seated with customary state in the front parlour, but she was rather cross, and, by consequence, most particularly deaf. She never went out herself, and like a great many other old ladies of the same stamp, she was apt to consider it an act of domestic treason, if anybody else took the liberty of doing what she couldn't. So, bless her old soul, she sat as upright as she could, in her great chair, and looked as fierce as might be, and that was benevolent after all. Mother, said Wardle, Mr. Pickwick. You recollect him? Never mind, replied the old lady, with great dignity. Don't trouble Mr. Pickwick about an old creeter like me. Nobody cares about me now, and it's very natural they shouldn't. Here the old lady tossed her head, and smoothed down her lavender-colored silk dress with trembling hands. Come, come, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, I can't let you cut an old friend in this way. I have come down expressly to have a long talk, and another rubber with you, and will show these boys and girls how to dance a minuet, before they're eight and forty hours older. The old lady was rapidly giving way, but she did not like to do it all at once, so she only said, Ah! I can't hear him. Nonsense, mother, said Wardle. Come, come, don't be cross, there's a good soul. Recollect Bella. Come, you must keep her spirits up, poor girl. The good old lady heard this, for her lip quivered as her son said it. But age has its little infirmities of temper, and she was not quite brought round yet. So, she smoothed down the lavender-colored dress again, and turning to Mr. Pickwick said, Ah, Mr. Pickwick, young people was very different, when I was a girl. No doubt of that, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, and that's the reason why I would make much of the few that have any traces of the old stock, and saying this, Mr. Pickwick gently pulled Bella towards him, and bestowing a kiss upon her forehead, bade her sit down on the little stool at her grandmother's feet. Whether the expression of her countenance, as it was raised towards the old lady's face, called up a thought of old times, or whether the old lady was touched by Mr. Pickwick's affectionate good nature, or whatever was the cause, she was fairly melted, so she threw herself on her granddaughter's neck, and all the little ill humor evaporated in a gush of silent tears. A happy party they were, that night. Sedate and solemn were the score of rubbers in which Mr. Pickwick and the old lady played together, uproarious was the mirth of the round table. Long after the ladies had retired, did the hot elder wine, well qualified with brandy and spice, go round, and round, and round again, and sound was the sleep and pleasant were the dreams that followed. It is a remarkable fact that those of Mr. Snodgrass bore constant reference to Emily Wardle, and that the principal figure in Mr. Winkle's visions was a young lady with black eyes, an arch smile, and a pair of remarkably nice boots with fur round the tops. Mr. Pickwick was awakened early in the morning, by a hum of voices and a pattering of feet, sufficient to rouse even the fat boy from his heavy slumbers. He sat up in bed and listened. The female servants and female visitors were running constantly to and fro. And there were such multitudinous demands for hot water, such repeated outcries for needles and thread, and so many half-suppressed entreaties of, oh, do come and tie me, there's a dear, that mister. Pickwick in his innocence began to imagine that something dreadful must have occurred, when he grew more awake, and remembered the wedding. The occasion being an important one, he dressed himself with peculiar care, and descended to the breakfast room. There were all the female servants in a brand new uniform of pink muslin gowns with white bows in their caps, running about the house in a state of excitement and agitation which it would be impossible to describe. 
The old lady was dressed out in a brocaded gown, which had not seen the light for twenty years, saving and accepting such truant rays as had stolen through the chinks in the box in which it had been laid by, during the whole time. Mr. Trundle was in high feather and spirits, but a little nervous withal. The hearty old landlord was trying to look very cheerful and unconcerned, but failing signally in the attempt. All the girls were in tears and white muslin, except a select two or three, who were being honored with a private view of the bride and bridesmaids, upstairs. All the Pequickians were in most blooming array. And there was a terrific roaring on the grass in front of the house, occasioned by all the men, boys, and hobbledehoys attached to the farm, each of whom had got a white bow in his buttonhole, and all of whom were cheering with might and main. Being incited thereto, and stimulated therein by the precept and example of Mr. Samuel Weller, who had managed to become mighty popular already, and was as much at home as if he had been born on the land. A wedding is a licensed subject to joke upon, but there really is no great joke in the matter after all, we speak merely of the ceremony, and beg it to be distinctly understood that we indulge in no hidden sarcasm upon a married life. Mixed up with the pleasure and joy of the occasion, are the many regrets at quitting home, the tears of parting between parent and child, the consciousness of leaving the dearest and kindest friends of the happiest portion of human life. To encounter its cares and troubles with others still untried and little known, natural feelings which we would not render this chapter mournful by describing, and which we should be still more unwilling to be supposed to ridicule. Let us briefly say, then, that the ceremony was performed by the old clergyman, in the parish church of Dingley Dell, and that Mr. Pickwick's name is attached to the register, still preserved in the vestry thereof. That the young lady with the black eyes signed her name in a very unsteady and tremulous manner, that Emily's signature, as the other bridesmaid, is nearly illegible, that it all went off in very admirable style. That the young ladies generally thought it far less shocking than they had expected, and that although the owner of the black eyes and the arch smile informed Mr. Wardle that she was sure she could never submit to anything so dreadful, we have the very best reasons for thinking she was mistaken. To all this, we may add, that Mr. Pickwick was the first who saluted the bride, and that in so doing he threw over her neck a rich gold watch and chain, which no mortal eyes but the jewellers had ever beheld before. Then, the old church bell rang as gaily as it could, and they all returned to breakfast. Veer does the mince pies go, young opium eater, said Mr. Weller to the fat boy, as he assisted in laying out such articles of consumption as had not been duly arranged on the previous night. The fat boy pointed to the destination of the pies. Very good, said Sam, stick a bit o, oh, Christmas in, m. T'other dish opposite. There, now we look compact and comfortable, as the father said when he cut his little boy's head off, to cure him o, oh, squintin, dot. As Mr. Weller made the comparison, he fell back a step or two, to give full effect to it, and surveyed the preparations with the utmost satisfaction. Wardle, said Mr. Pickwick, almost as soon as they were all seated, a glass of wine in honor of this happy occasion. I shall be delighted, my boy, said Wardle. Joe, damn that boy, he's gone to sleep. No, I ain't, sir, replied the fat boy, starting up from a remote corner, where, like the patron saint of fat boys, the immortal Horner, he had been devouring a Christmas pie. Though not with the coolness and deliberation which characterized that young gentleman's proceedings. Fill Mr. Pickwick's glass. Yes, sir. The fat boy filled Mr. Pickwick's glass, and then retired behind his master's chair, from whence he watched the play of the knives and forks, and the progress of the choice morsels from the dishes to the mouths of the company. With a kind of dark and gloomy joy that was most impressive. God bless you, old fellow, said Mr. Pickwick. Same to you, my boy, replied Wardle, and they pledged each other, heartily. Mrs. Wardle, said Mr. Pickwick, we old folks must have a glass of wine together, in honor of this joyful event. The old lady was in a state of great grandeur just then, for she was sitting at the top of the table in the brocaded gown, with her newly married granddaughter on one side, and Mr. Pickwick on the other, to do the carving. Mr. 
Pickwick had not spoken in a very loud tone, but she understood him at once, and drank off a full glass of wine to his long life and happiness. After which the worthy old soul launched forth into a minute and particular account of her own wedding, with a dissertation on the fashion of wearing high-heeled shoes. And some particulars concerning the life and adventures of the beautiful Lady Tollenglower, deceased. At all of which the old lady herself laughed very heartily indeed, and so did the young ladies too, for they were wondering among themselves what on earth grandma was talking about. When they laughed, the old lady laughed ten times more heartily, and said that these always had been considered capital stories, which caused them all to laugh again, and put the old lady into the very best of humors. Then the cake was cut, and passed through the ring, the young ladies saved pieces to put under their pillows to dream of their future husbands on, and a great deal of blushing and merriment was thereby occasioned. Mr. Miller, said Mr. Pickwick to his old acquaintance, the hard-headed gentleman, a glass of wine. With great satisfaction, Mr. Pickwick, replied the hard-headed gentleman solemnly. You'll take me in, said the benevolent old clergyman. And me, interposed his wife. And me, and me, said a couple of poor relations at the bottom of the table, who had eaten and drunk very heartily, and laughed at everything. Mr. Pickwick expressed his heartfelt delight at every additional suggestion, and his eyes beamed with hilarity and cheerfulness. Ladies and gentlemen, said Mr. Pickwick, suddenly rising. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here, cried Mr. Weller, in the excitement of his feelings. Call in all the servants, cried old Wardle, interposing to prevent the public rebuke which Mr. Weller would otherwise most indubitably have received from his master. Give them a glass of wine each to drink the toast in. Now, Pickwick. Amidst the silence of the company, the whispering of the women servants, and the awkward embarrassment of the men, Mr. Pickwick proceeded. Ladies and gentlemen, no, I won't say ladies and gentlemen, I'll call you my friends, my dear friends, if the ladies will allow me to take so great a liberty. Here Mr. Pickwick was interrupted by immense applause from the ladies, echoed by the gentlemen, during which the owner of the eyes was distinctly heard to state that she could kiss that dear Mr. Pickwick. Whereupon Mr. Winkle gallantly inquired if it couldn't be done by deputy, to which the young lady with the black eyes replied go away, and accompanied the request with a look which said as plainly as a look could do, if you can. My dear friends, resumed Mr. Pickwick, I am going to propose the health of the bride and bridegroom, God bless, M, cheers and tears. My young friend, Trundle, I believe to be a very excellent and manly fellow. And his wife I know to be a very amiable and lovely girl, well qualified to transfer to another sphere of action the happiness which for twenty years she has diffused around her, in her father's house. Here, the fat boy burst forth into stentorian blubberings, and was led forth by the coat collar, by Mr. Weller. I wish, added Mr. Pickwick. I wish I was young enough to be her sister's husband, cheers, but, failing that, I am happy to be old enough to be her father. For, being so, I shall not be suspected of any latent designs when I say, that I admire, esteem, and love them both, cheers and sobs. The bride's father, our good friend there, is a noble person, and I am proud to know him, great uproar. He is a kind, excellent, independent-spirited, fine-hearted, hospitable, liberal man, enthusiastic shouts from the poor relations, at all the adjectives, and especially at the two last. That his daughter may enjoy all the happiness, even he can desire, and that he may derive from the contemplation of her felicity all the gratification of heart and peace of mind which he so well deserves, is, I am persuaded, our united wish. So, let us drink their healths, and wish them prolonged life, and every blessing. Mr. Pickwick concluded amidst a whirlwind of applause, and once more were the lungs of the supernumeraries, under Mr. Weller's command, brought into active and efficient operation. Mr. Wardle proposed Mr. Pickwick, Mr. Pickwick proposed the old lady. Mr. Snodgrass proposed Mr. Wardle, Mr. Wardle proposed Mr. Snodgrass. One of the poor relations proposed Mr. 
Tupman, and the other poor relation proposed Mr. Winkle, all was happiness and festivity, until the mysterious disappearance of both the poor relations beneath the table warned the party that it was time to adjourn. At dinner they met again, after a five-and-twenty-mile walk, undertaken by the males at Wardle's recommendation, to get rid of the effects of the wine at breakfast. The poor relations had kept in bed all day, with the view of attaining the same happy consummation, but, as they had been unsuccessful, they stopped there. Mr. Weller kept the domestics in a state of perpetual hilarity. And the fat boy divided his time into small alternate allotments of eating and sleeping. The dinner was as hearty an affair as the breakfast, and was quite as noisy, without the tears. Then came the dessert and some more toasts. Then came the tea and coffee, and then, the ball. The best sitting room at Manor Farm was a good, long, dark panelled room with a high chimney piece, and a capacious chimney, up which you could have driven one of the new patent cabs, wheels and all. At the upper end of the room, seated in a shady bower of holly and evergreens were the two best fiddlers, and the only harp, in all Muggleton. In all sorts of recesses, and on all kinds of brackets, stood massive old silver candlesticks with four branches each. The carpet was up, the candles burned bright, the fire blazed and crackled on the hearth, and merry voices and light-hearted laughter rang through the room. If any of the old English yeomen had turned into fairies when they died, it was just the place in which they would have held their revels. If anything could have added to the interest of this agreeable scene, it would have been the remarkable fact of Mr. Pickwick's appearing without his gaiters, for the first time within the memory of his oldest friends. You mean to dance? said Wardle. Of course I do, replied Mr. Pickwick. Don't you see I am dressed for the purpose? Mr. Pickwick called attention to his speckled silk stockings and smartly tied pumps. You in silk stockings, exclaimed Mr. Tupman jocosely. And why not, sir, why not, said Mr. Pickwick, turning warmly upon him. Oh, of course there is no reason why you shouldn't wear them, responded Mr. Tupman. I imagine not, sir, I imagine not, said Mr. Pickwick, in a very peremptory tone. Mr. Tupman had contemplated a laugh, but he found it was a serious matter, so he looked grave, and said they were a pretty pattern. I hope they are, said Mr. Pickwick, fixing his eyes upon his friend. You see nothing extraordinary in the stockings, as stockings, I trust, sir. Certainly not. Oh, certainly not, replied Mr. Tupman. He walked away, and Mr. Pickwick's countenance resumed its customary benign expression. We are all ready, I believe, said Mr. Pickwick, who was stationed with the old lady at the top of the dance, and had already made four false starts, in his excessive anxiety to commence. Then begin at once, said Wardle. Now. Up struck the two fiddles and the one harp, and off went Mr. Pickwick into hands across, when there was a general clapping of hands, and a cry of, Stop, stop. What's the matter, said Mr. Pickwick, who was only brought to, by the fiddles and harp desisting, and could have been stopped by no other earthly power, if the house had been on fire. Where's Arabella Allen, cried a dozen voices. And Winkle, added Mr. Tupman. Here we are, exclaimed that gentleman, emerging with his pretty companion from the corner, as he did so, it would have been hard to tell which was the redder in the face, he or the young lady with the black eyes. What an extraordinary thing it is, Winkle, said Mr. Pickwick, rather pettishly, that you couldn't have taken your place before. Not at all extraordinary, said Mr. Winkle. Well, said Mr. Pickwick, with a very expressive smile, as his eyes rested on Arabella, well, I don't know that it was extraordinary, either, after all. However, there was no time to think more about the matter, for the fiddles and harp began in real earnest. Away went Mr. Pickwick, hands across, down the middle to the very end of the room, and halfway up the chimney. Back again to the door, who sat everywhere, loud stamp on the ground, ready for the next couple, off again, all the figure over once more, another stamp to beat out the time, next couple, and the next, and the next again, never was such going. At last, after they had reached the bottom of the dance, and full fourteen couple after the old lady had retired in an exhausted state, 
and the clergyman's wife had been substituted in her stead, did that gentleman. When there was no demand whatever on his exertions, keep perpetually dancing in his place, to keep time to the music, smiling on his partner all the while with a blandness of demeanor which baffles all description. Long before Mr. Pickwick was weary of dancing, the newly married couple had retired from the scene. There was a glorious supper downstairs, notwithstanding, and a good long sitting after it, and when Mr. Pickwick awoke, late the next morning, he had a confused recollection of having, severally and confidentially, invited somewhere about five and forty people to dine with him at the George and Vulture, the very first time they came to London. Which Mr. Pickwick rightly considered a pretty certain indication of his having taken something besides exercise, on the previous night. And so your family has games in the kitchen tonight, my dear, has they? inquired Sam of Emma. Yes, Mr. Weller, replied Emma, we always have on Christmas Eve. Master wouldn't neglect to keep it up on any account. Your master's a wary pretty notion of keeping anything up, my dear, said Mr. Weller. I never see such a sensible sort of man as he is, or such a reglar gen lmn. Oh, that he is, said the fat boy, joining in the conversation, don't he breed nice pork. The fat youth gave a semi-cannibalic leer at Mr. Weller, as he thought of the roast legs and gravy. Oh, you've woke up, at last, have you, said Sam. The fat boy nodded. I'll tell you what it is, young boa constructor, said Mr. Weller impressively. If you don't sleep a little less, and exercise a little more, when you comes to be a man you'll lay yourself open to the same sort of personal inconvenience as was inflicted on the old Gen LMN as wore the pigtail. What did they do to him? inquired the fat boy, in a faltering voice. I may going to tell you, replied Mr. Weller, he was one o' oh, the largest patterns as was ever turned out, reglar fat man, as hadn't caught a glimpse of his own shoes for five and forty year. Lore! exclaimed Emma. No, that he hadn't, my dear, said Mr. Weller, and if you'd put an exact model of his own legs on the dining table afore him, he wouldn't have known M. Well, he always walks to his office with a wary handsome gold watch chain hanging out, about a foot and a quarter, and a gold watch in his fob pocket as was worth, I'm afraid to say how much, but as much as a watch can be, a large, heavy. Round manufacture, as stout for a watch, as he was for a man, and with a big face in proportion. You'd better not carry that, pair watch, says the old Gen LMNS friends, you'll be robbed on it, says they. Shall I, says he. Yes, you will, says they. Well, says he, I should like to see the thief as could get this here watch out, for I'm blessed if I ever can, it's such a tight fit, says he, and whenever I advance to know what's o'clock, I'm obliged to stare into the baker's shops, he says. Well, then he laughs as hearty as if he was a goin' to pieces, and out he walks agin with his powdered head and pigtail, and rolls down the strand with the chain hangin out further than ever. And the great round watch almost bust in through his grey cursy smalls. There weren't a pickpocket in all London as didn't take a pull at that chain, but the chain UD never break, and the watch UD never come out, so they soon got tired of dragging such a heavy old Gen LMN along the pavement. And he'd go home and laugh till the pigtail vibrated like the pendulum of a Dutch clock. At last, one day the old Gen LMN was a rollin' along, and he sees a pickpocket as he knowed by sight, a coming up, arm in arm with a little boy with a wary large head. Here's a game, says the old Gen LMN to himself, they're a goin' to have another try, but it won't do. So he begins a chucklin', wary hearty, one, all of a sudden, the little boy leaves hold of the pickpocket's arm, and rushes head foremost straight into the old Gen LMN's stomach, and for a moment doubles him right up with the pain. Murder! says the old Gen LMN. All right, sir, says the pickpocket, a whisperin', in his ear. And when he comes straight again, the watch and chain was gone, and what's worse than that, the old Gen LMN's digestion was all wrong ever afterwards, to the wary last day of his life. So just you look about you, young feller, and take care you don't get too fat. As Mr. Weller concluded this moral tale, 
with which the fat boy appeared much affected, they all three repaired to the large kitchen, in which the family were by this time assembled, according to annual custom on Christmas Eve. Observed by old Wardle's forefathers from time immemorial. From the center of the ceiling of this kitchen, old Wardle had just suspended, with his own hands, a huge branch of mistletoe. And this same branch of mistletoe instantaneously gave rise to a scene of general and most delightful struggling and confusion. In the midst of which, Mr. Pickwick, with a gallantry that would have done honor to a descendant of Lady Tollemglower herself, took the old lady by the hand, led her beneath the mystic branch, and saluted her in all courtesy and decorum. The old lady submitted to this piece of practical politeness with all the dignity which befitted so important and serious a solemnity, but the younger ladies, not being so thoroughly imbued with a superstitious veneration for the custom, or imagining that the value of a salute is very much enhanced if it cost a little trouble to obtain it, screamed and struggled, and ran into corners, and threatened and remonstrated, and did everything but leave the room. Until some of the less adventurous gentlemen were on the point of desisting, when they all at once found it useless to resist any longer, and submitted to be kissed with a good grace. Mr. Winkle kissed the young lady with the black eyes, and Mr. Snodgrass kissed Emily, and Mr. Weller, not being particular about the form of being under the mistletoe, kissed Emma and the other female servants, just as he caught them. As to the poor relations, they kissed everybody, not even excepting the plainer portions of the young lady visitors, who, in their excessive confusion, ran right under the mistletoe, as soon as it was hung up, without knowing it. Wardle stood with his back to the fire, surveying the whole scene, with the utmost satisfaction. And the fat boy took the opportunity of appropriating to his own use, and summarily devouring, a particularly fine mince pie, that had been carefully put by, for somebody else. Now, the screaming had subsided, and faces were in a glow, and curls in a tangle, and Mr. Pickwick, after kissing the old lady as before mentioned, was standing under the mistletoe, looking with a very pleased countenance on all that was passing around him, when the young lady with the black eyes, after a little whispering with the other young ladies, made a sudden dart forward, and, putting her arm round Mr. Pickwick's neck, saluted him affectionately on the left cheek, and before Mr. Pickwick distinctly knew what was the matter, he was surrounded by the whole body, and kissed by every one of them. It was a pleasant thing to see Mr. Pickwick in the center of the group, now pulled this way, and then that, and first kissed on the chin, and then on the nose, and then on the spectacles, and to hear the peals of laughter which were raised on every side. But it was a still more pleasant thing to see Mr. Pickwick, blinded shortly afterwards with a silk handkerchief, falling up against the wall, and scrambling into corners, and going through all the mysteries of blind man's buff, with the utmost relish for the game. Until at last he caught one of the poor relations, and then had to evade the blind man himself, which he did with a nimbleness and agility that elicited the admiration and applause of all beholders. The poor relations caught the people who they thought would like it, and, when the game flagged, got caught themselves. When they all tired of blind man's buff, there was a great game at Snapdragon, and when fingers enough were burned with that, and all the raisins were gone, they sat down by the huge fire of blazing logs to a substantial supper. And a mighty bowl of wassail, something smaller than an ordinary washhouse copper, in which the hot apples were hissing and bubbling with a rich look, and a jolly sound, that were perfectly irresistible. This, said Mr. Pickwick, looking round him, this is, indeed, comfort. Our invariable custom, replied Mr. Wardle. Everybody sits down with us on Christmas Eve, as you see them now, servants and all. And here we wait, until the clock strikes twelve, to usher Christmas in, and beguile the time with forfeits and old stories. Trundle, my boy, rake up the fire. Up flew the bright sparks in myriads as the logs were stirred. The deep red blaze sent forth a rich glow, that penetrated into the farthest corner of the room, and cast its cheerful tint on every face. Come, said Wardle, a song, a Christmas song. I'll give you one, in default of a better. Bravo, said Mr. Pickwick. Fill up, cried Wardle. It will be two hours, good, 
before you see the bottom of the bowl through the deep rich color of the wassail, fill up all round, and now for the song. Thus saying, the merry old gentleman, in a good, round, sturdy voice, commenced without more ado. A Christmas Carol I care not for spring, on his fickle wing. Let the blossoms and buds be born. He woos them amain with his treacherous rain. And he scatters them ere the morn. An inconstant elf, he knows not himself. Nor his own changing mind an hour. He'll smile in your face, and, with wry grimace. He'll wither your youngest flower. Let the summer sun to his bright home run. He shall never be sought by me. When he's dimmed by a cloud I can laugh aloud. And care not how sulky he be. For his darling child is the madness wild. That sports in fierce fever's train. And when love is too strong, it don't last long. As many have found to their pain. A mild harvest night, by the tranquil light. Of the modest and gentle moon. Has a far sweeter sheen for me, I ween. Than the broad and unblushing noon. But every leaf awakens my grief. As it leaf beneath the tree. So let autumn air be never so fair. It by no means agrees with me. But my song I troll out, for Christmas stout. The hardy, the true, and the bold. A bumper I drain, and with might and main. Give three cheers for this Christmas old. We'll usher him in with a merry din. That shall gladden his joyous heart. And we'll keep him up, while there's bite or sup. And in fellowship good, we'll part. In his fine honest pride, he scorns to hide. One jot of his hard weather scars. They're no disgrace, for there's much the same trace. On the cheeks of our bravest tars. Then again I sing till the roof doth ring. And it echoes from wall to wall. To the stout old white, fair welcome tonight. As the king of the seasons all. This song was tumultuously applauded, for friends and dependents make a capital audience, and the poor relations, especially, were in perfect ecstasies of rapture. Again was the fire replenished, and again went the wassail round. How it snows! said one of the men, in a low tone. Snows, does it? said Wardle. Rough, cold night, sir, replied the man, and there's a wind got up, that drifts it across the fields, in a thick white cloud. What does Jem say? inquired the old lady. There ain't anything the matter, is there? No, no, mother, replied Wardle, he says there's a snowdrift, and a wind that's piercing cold. I should know that, by the way it rumbles in the chimney. Ah! said the old lady, there was just such a wind, and just such a fall of snow, a good many years back, I recollect, just five years before your poor father died. It was a Christmas Eve, too. And I remember that on that very night he told us the story about the goblins that carried away old Gabriel Grubb. The story about what? said Mr. Pickwick. Oh, nothing, nothing, replied Wardle. About an old sexton, that the good people down here supposed to have been carried away by goblins. Suppose, ejaculated the old lady. Is there anybody hardy enough to disbelieve it? Suppose. Haven't you heard ever since you were a child, that he was carried away by the goblins, and don't you know he was? Very well, mother, he was, if you like, said Wardle laughing. He was carried away by goblins, Pickwick. And there's an end of the matter. No, no, said Mr. Pickwick, not an end of it, I assure you, for I must hear how, and why, and all about it. Wardle smiled, as every head was bent forward to hear, and filling out the wassail with no stinted hand, nodded a health to Mr. Pickwick, and began as follows. But bless our editorial heart, what a long chapter we have been betrayed into. We had quite forgotten all such petty restrictions as chapters, we solemnly declare. So here goes, to give the goblin a fair start in a new one. A clear stage and no favor for the goblins, ladies and gentlemen, if you please. Chapter 29 The Story of the Goblins Who Stole a Sexton In an old abbey town, down in this part of the country, 
a long, long while ago, so long, that the story must be a true one. Because our great-grandfathers implicitly believed it, there officiated as sexton and grave digger in the churchyard, one Gabriel Grubb. It by no means follows that because a man is a sexton, and constantly surrounded by the emblems of mortality, therefore he should be a morose and melancholy man, your undertakers are the merriest fellows in the world. And I once had the honour of being on intimate terms with a mute, who in private life, and off-duty, was as comical and jocose a little fellow as ever chirped out a devil-may-care song, without a hitch in his memory. Or drained off a good stiff glass without stopping for breath. But notwithstanding these precedents to the contrary, Gabriel Grubb was an ill-conditioned, cross-grained, surly fellow, a morose and lonely man, who consorted with nobody but himself. And an old wicker bottle which fitted into his large deep waistcoat pocket, and who eyed each merry face, as it passed him by, with such a deep scowl of malice and ill-humour, as it was difficult to meet without feeling something the worse for. A little before twilight, one Christmas Eve, Gabriel shouldered his spade, lighted his lantern, and betook himself towards the old churchyard. For he had got a grave to finish by next morning, and, feeling very low, he thought it might raise his spirits, perhaps, if he went on with his work at once. As he went his way, up the ancient street, he saw the cheerful light of the blazing fires gleam through the old casements, and heard the loud laugh and the cheerful shouts of those who were assembled around them. He marked the bustling preparations for next day's cheer, and smelled the numerous savory odors consequent thereupon, as they steamed up from the kitchen windows in clouds. All this was gall and wormwood to the heart of Gabriel Grubb. And when groups of children bounded out of the houses, tripped across the road, and were met, before they could knock at the opposite door. By half a dozen curly-headed little rascals who crowded round them as they flocked upstairs to spend the evening in their Christmas games, Gabriel smiled grimly, and clutched the handle of his spade with a firmer grasp, as he thought of measles. Scarlet fever, thrush, whooping cough, and a good many other sources of consolation besides. In this happy frame of mind, Gabriel strode along, returning a short, sullen growl to the good-humoured greetings of such of his neighbours as now and then passed him, until he turned into the dark lane which led to the churchyard. Now, Gabriel had been looking forward to reaching the dark lane, because it was, generally speaking, a nice, gloomy, mournful place, into which the townspeople did not much care to go, except in broad daylight, and when the sun was shining. Consequently, he was not a little indignant to hear a young urchin roaring out some jolly song about a Merry Christmas, in this very sanctuary which had been called Coffin Lane ever since the days of the old abbey. And the time of the shaven-headed monks. As Gabriel walked on, and the voice drew nearer, he found it proceeded from a small boy, who was hurrying along, to join one of the little parties in the old street, and who, partly to keep himself company, and partly to prepare himself for the occasion, was shouting out the song at the highest pitch of his lungs. So Gabriel waited until the boy came up, and then dodged him into a corner, and wrapped him over the head with his lantern five or six times, just to teach him to modulate his voice. And as the boy hurried away with his hand to his head, singing quite a different sort of tune, Gabriel Grubb chuckled very heartily to himself, and entered the churchyard, locking the gate behind him. He took off his coat, set down his lantern, and getting into the unfinished grave, worked at it for an hour or so with right goodwill. But the earth was hardened with the frost, and it was no very easy matter to break it up, and shovel it out, and although there was a moon, it was a very young one, and shed little light upon the grave, which was in the shadow of the church. At any other time, these obstacles would have made Gabriel Grubb very moody and miserable, but he was so well pleased with having stopped the small boy's singing, that he took little heed of the scanty progress he had made. And looked down into the grave, when he had finished work for the night, with grim satisfaction, murmuring as he gathered up his things. Brave lodgings for one, brave lodgings for one. A few feet of cold earth, when life is done. A stone at the head, a stone at the feet. A rich, juicy meal for the worms to eat. Rank grass overhead, and damp clay around. Brave lodgings for one, these, in holy ground. Ho! Ho! Laughed Gabriel Grubb, 
as he sat himself down on a flat tombstone which was a favorite resting place of his, and drew forth his wicker bottle. A coffin at Christmas. A Christmas box. Ho. 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 Repeated a voice which sounded close behind him. Gabriel paused, in some alarm, in the act of raising the wicker bottle to his lips, and looked round. The bottom of the oldest grave about him was not more still and quiet than the churchyard in the pale moonlight. The cold hoarfrost glistened on the tombstones, and sparkled like rows of gems, among the stone carvings of the old church. The snow lay hard and crisp upon the ground, and spread over the thickly strewn mounds of earth, so white and smooth a cover that it seemed as if corpses lay there, hidden only by their winding sheets. Not the faintest rustle broke the profound tranquility of the solemn scene. Sound itself appeared to be frozen up, all was so cold and still. It was the echoes, said Gabriel Grubb, raising the bottle to his lips again. It was not, said a deep voice. Gabriel started up, and stood rooted to the spot with astonishment and terror, for his eyes rested on a form that made his blood run cold. Seated on an upright tombstone, close to him, was a strange, unearthly figure, whom Gabriel felt at once, was no being of this world. His long, fantastic legs which might have reached the ground, were cocked up, and crossed after a quaint, fantastic fashion, his sinewy arms were bare, and his hands rested on his knees. On his short, round body, he wore a close covering, ornamented with small slashes, a short cloak dangled at his back, the collar was cut into curious peaks, which served the goblin in lieu of ruff or neckerchief. And his shoes curled up at his toes into long points. On his head, he wore a broad-brimmed sugarloaf hat, garnished with a single feather. The hat was covered with the white frost. And the goblin looked as if he had sat on the same tombstone very comfortably, for two or three hundred years. He was sitting perfectly still, his tongue was put out, as if in derision. And he was grinning at Gabriel Grubb with such a grin as only a goblin could call up. It was not the echoes, said the goblin. Gabriel Grubb was paralyzed, and could make no reply. What do you do here on Christmas Eve, said the goblin sternly. I came to dig a grave, sir, stammered Gabriel Grubb. What man wanders among graves and churchyards on such a night as this, cried the goblin. Gabriel Grubb. Gabriel Grubb, screamed a wild chorus of voices that seemed to fill the churchyard. Gabriel looked fearfully round, nothing was to be seen. What have you got in that bottle, said the goblin. Hollands, sir, replied the sexton, trembling more than ever. For he had bought it of the smugglers, and he thought that perhaps his questioner might be in the excise department of the goblins. Who drinks Hollands alone, and in a churchyard, on such a night as this? said the goblin. Gabriel Grubb. Gabriel Grubb, exclaimed the wild voices again. The goblin leered maliciously at the terrified sexton, and then raising his voice, exclaimed. And who, then, is our fair and lawful prize? To this inquiry the invisible chorus replied, in a strain that sounded like the voices of many choristers singing to the mighty swell of the old church organ a strain that seemed borne to the sexton's ears upon a wild wind. And to die away as it passed onward. But the burden of the reply was still the same, Gabriel Grubb. Gabriel Grubb. The goblin grinned a broader grin than before, as he said, Well, Gabriel, what do you say to this? The sexton gasped for breath. What do you think of this, Gabriel? Said the goblin, kicking up his feet in the air on either side of the tombstone, and looking at the turned-up points with as much complacency as if he had been contemplating the most fashionable pair of Wellingtons in all Bond Street. It's, it's, very curious, sir, replied the sexton, half dead with fright, very curious, and very pretty, but I think I'll go back and finish my work, sir, if you please. Work, said the goblin, what work? The grave, sir. Making the grave, stammered the sexton. Oh, the grave, eh, said the goblin, who makes graves at a time when all other men are merry, and takes a pleasure in it. Again the mysterious voices replied, Gabriel Grubb. 
Gabriel Grubb. I am afraid my friends want you, Gabriel, said the goblin, thrusting his tongue farther into his cheek than ever, and a most astonishing tongue it was, I'm afraid my friends want you, Gabriel, said the goblin. Under favor, sir, replied the horror-stricken sexton, I don't think they can, sir, they don't know me, sir, I don't think the gentlemen have ever seen me, sir. Oh, yes, they have, replied the goblin. We know the man with the sulky face and grim scowl, that came down the street tonight, throwing his evil looks at the children, and grasping his burying spade the tighter. We know the man who struck the boy in the envious malice of his heart, because the boy could be merry, and he could not. We know him, we know him. Here, the goblin gave a loud, shrill laugh, which the echoes returned twentyfold. And throwing his legs up in the air, stood upon his head, or rather upon the very point of his sugar-loaf hat, on the narrow edge of the tombstone, whence he threw a somerset with extraordinary agility, right to the sexton's feet. At which he planted himself in the attitude in which tailors generally sit upon the shopboard. I, I, am afraid I must leave you, sir, said the sexton, making an effort to move. Leave us, said the goblin, Gabriel Grubb going to leave us. Ho! 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 As the goblin laughed, the sexton observed, for one instant, a brilliant illumination within the windows of the church, as if the whole building were lighted up. It disappeared, the organ pealed forth a lively air, and whole troops of goblins, the very counterpart of the first one, poured into the churchyard, and began playing at leapfrog with the tombstones, never stopping for an instant to take breath. But, overing, the highest among them, one after the other, with the most marvelous dexterity. The first goblin was a most astonishing leaper, and none of the others could come near him. Even in the extremity of his terror the sexton could not help observing, that while his friends were content to leap over the common-sized gravestones, the first one took the family vaults, iron railings and all. With as much ease as if they had been so many street posts. At last the game reached to a most exciting pitch, the organ played quicker and quicker, and the goblins leaped faster and faster, coiling themselves up, rolling head over heels upon the ground, and bounding over the tombstones like footballs. The sexton's brain whirled round with the rapidity of the motion he beheld, and his legs reeled beneath him, as the spirits flew before his eyes. When the goblin king, suddenly darting towards him, laid his hand upon his collar, and sank with him through the earth. When Gabriel Grubb had had time to fetch his breath, which the rapidity of his descent had for the moment taken away, he found himself in what appeared to be a large cavern, surrounded on all sides by crowds of goblins, ugly and grim. In the center of the room, on an elevated seat, was stationed his friend of the churchyard, and close behind him stood Gabriel Grubb himself, without power of motion. Cold tonight, said the king of the goblins, very cold. A glass of something warm here. At this command, half a dozen officious goblins, with a perpetual smile upon their faces, whom Gabriel Grubb imagined to be courtiers, on that account, hastily disappeared, and presently returned with a goblet of liquid fire. Which they presented to the king. Ah, cried the goblin, whose cheeks and throat were transparent, as he tossed down the flame, this warms one, indeed. Bring a bumper of the same, for Mr. Grubb. It was in vain for the unfortunate sexton to protest that he was not in the habit of taking anything warm at night, one of the goblins held him while another poured the blazing liquid down his throat. The whole assembly screeched with laughter, as he coughed and choked, and wiped away the tears which gushed plentifully from his eyes, after swallowing the burning draught. And now, said the king, fantastically poking the taper corner of his sugar-loaf hat into the sexton's eye, and thereby occasioning him the most exquisite pain. And now, show the man of misery and gloom, a few of the pictures from our own great storehouse. As the goblin said this, a thick cloud which obscured the remoter end of the cavern rolled gradually away, and disclosed, apparently at a great distance, a small and scantily furnished, but neat and clean apartment. A crowd of little children were gathered round a bright fire, clinging to their mother's gown, and gambling around her chair. The mother occasionally rose, and drew aside the window curtain, as if to look for some expected object. A frugal meal was ready spread upon the table, 
and an elbow chair was placed near the fire. A knock was heard at the door, the mother opened it, and the children crowded round her, and clapped their hands for joy, as their father entered. He was wet and weary, and shook the snow from his garments, as the children crowded round him, and seizing his cloak, hat, stick, and gloves, with busy zeal, ran with them from the room. Then, as he sat down to his meal before the fire, the children climbed about his knee, and the mother sat by his side, and all seemed happiness and comfort. But a change came upon the view, almost imperceptibly. The scene was altered to a small bedroom, where the fairest and youngest child lay dying, the roses had fled from his cheek, and the light from his eye. And even as the sexton looked upon him with an interest he had never felt or known before, he died. His young brothers and sisters crowded round his little bed, and seized his tiny hand, so cold and heavy. But they shrank back from its touch, and looked with awe on his infant face. For calm and tranquil as it was, and sleeping in rest and peace as the beautiful child seemed to be, they saw that he was dead, and they knew that he was an angel looking down upon, and blessing them, from a bright and happy heaven. Again the light cloud passed across the picture, and again the subject changed. The father and mother were old and helpless now, and the number of those about them was diminished more than half. But content and cheerfulness sat on every face, and beamed in every eye, as they crowded round the fireside, and told and listened to old stories of earlier and bygone days. Slowly and peacefully, the father sank into the grave, and, soon after, the sharer of all his cares and troubles followed him to a place of rest. The few who yet survived them, kneeled by their tomb, and watered the green turf which covered it with their tears. Then rose, and turned away, sadly and mournfully, but not with bitter cries, or despairing lamentations, for they knew that they should one day meet again. And once more they mixed with the busy world, and their content and cheerfulness were restored. The cloud settled upon the picture, and concealed it from the sexton's view. What do you think of that? said the goblin, turning his large face towards Gabriel Grubb. Gabriel murmured out something about its being very pretty, and looked somewhat ashamed, as the goblin bent his fiery eyes upon him. You a miserable man! said the goblin, in a tone of excessive contempt. You! He appeared disposed to add more, but indignation choked his utterance, so he lifted up one of his very pliable legs, and, flourishing it above his head a little, to ensure his aim, administered a good sound kick to Gabriel Grubb. Immediately after which, all the goblins in waiting crowded round the wretched sexton, and kicked him without mercy, according to the established and invariable custom of courtiers upon earth, who kick whom royalty kicks, and hug whom royalty hugs. Show him some more, said the king of the goblins. At these words, the cloud was dispelled, and a rich and beautiful landscape was disclosed to view there is just such another, to this day, within half a mile of the old abbey town. The sun shone from out the clear blue sky, the water sparkled beneath his rays, and the trees looked greener, and the flowers more gay, beneath its cheering influence. The water rippled on with a pleasant sound, the trees rustled in the light wind that murmured among their leaves, the birds sang upon the boughs, and the lark caroled on high her welcome to the morning. Yes, it was morning. The bright, Balmy morning of summer, the minutest leaf, the smallest blade of grass, was instinct with life. The ant crept forth to her daily toil, the butterfly fluttered and basked in the warm rays of the sun. Myriads of insects spread their transparent wings, and reveled in their brief but happy existence. Man walked forth, elated with the scene, and all was brightness and splendor. You a miserable man! said the king of the goblins, in a more contemptuous tone than before. And again the king of the goblins gave his leg a flourish, again it descended on the shoulders of the sexton, and again the attendant goblins imitated the example of their chief. Many a time the cloud went and came, and many a lesson it taught to Gabriel Grubb, who, although his shoulders smarted with pain from the frequent applications of the goblins' feet thereunto, looked on with an interest that nothing could diminish. He saw that men who worked hard, and earned their scanty bread with lives of labor, were cheerful and happy, and that to the most ignorant, the sweet face of nature was a never-failing source of cheerfulness and joy. 
he saw those who had been delicately nurtured, and tenderly brought up, cheerful under privations, and superior to suffering, that would have crushed many of a rougher grain, because they bore within their own bosoms the materials of happiness, contentment, and peace. He saw that women, the tenderest and most fragile of all God's creatures, were the oftenest superior to sorrow, adversity, and distress. And he saw that it was because they bore, in their own hearts, an inexhaustible wellspring of affection and devotion. Above all, he saw that men like himself, who snarled at the mirth and cheerfulness of others, were the foulest weeds on the fair surface of the earth. And setting all the good of the world against the evil, he came to the conclusion that it was a very decent and respectable sort of world after all. No sooner had he formed it, than the cloud which had closed over the last picture, seemed to settle on his senses, and lull him to repose. One by one, the goblins faded from his sight, and, as the last one disappeared, he sank to sleep. The day had broken when Gabriel Grubb awoke, and found himself lying at full length on the flat gravestone in the churchyard, with the wicker bottle lying empty by his side, and his coat, spade, and lantern. All well whitened by the last night's frost, scattered on the ground. The stone on which he had first seen the goblin seated, stood bolt upright before him, and the grave at which he had worked, the night before, was not far off. At first, he began to doubt the reality of his adventures, but the acute pain in his shoulders when he attempted to rise, assured him that the kicking of the goblins was certainly not ideal. He was staggered again, by observing no traces of footsteps in the snow on which the goblins had played at leapfrog with the gravestones, but he speedily accounted for this circumstance when he remembered that, being spirits, they would leave no visible impression behind them. So, Gabriel Grubb got on his feet as well as he could, for the pain in his back, and, brushing the frost off his coat, put it on, and turned his face towards the town. But he was an altered man, and he could not bear the thought of returning to a place where his repentance would be scoffed at, and his reformation disbelieved. He hesitated for a few moments. And then turned away to wander where he might, and seek his bread elsewhere. The lantern, the spade, and the wicker bottle were found, that day, in the churchyard. There were a great many speculations about the sexton's fate, at first, but it was speedily determined that he had been carried away by the goblins. And there were not wanting some very credible witnesses who had distinctly seen him whisk through the air on the back of a chestnut horse blind of one eye, with the hindquarters of a lion, and the tail of a bear. At length all this was devoutly believed. And the new sexton used to exhibit to the curious, for a trifling emolument, a good-sized piece of the church weathercock which had been accidentally kicked off by the aforesaid horse in his aerial flight, and picked up by himself in the churchyard. A year or two afterwards. Unfortunately, these stories were somewhat disturbed by the unlooked-for reappearance of Gabriel Grubb himself, some ten years afterwards, a ragged, contented, rheumatic old man. He told his story to the clergyman, and also to the mayor. And in course of time it began to be received as a matter of history, in which form it has continued down to this very day. The believers in the weathercock tale, having misplaced their confidence once, were not easily prevailed upon to part with it again, so they looked as wise as they could, shrugged their shoulders, touched their foreheads, and murmured something about Gabriel Grubb having drunk all the Hollands, and then fallen asleep on the flat tombstone. And they affected to explain what he supposed he had witnessed in the goblin's cavern, by saying that he had seen the world, and grown wiser. But this opinion, which was by no means a popular one at any time, gradually died off. And be the matter how it may, as Gabriel Grubb was afflicted with rheumatism to the end of his days, this story has at least one moral, if it teach no better one, and that is, that if a man turns sulky and drink by himself at Christmas time, he may make up his mind to be not a bit the better for it, let the spirits be never so good, or let them be even as many degrees beyond proof, as those which Gabriel Grubb saw in the Goblin's Cavern. Chapter 30 How the Pequickians made and cultivated the acquaintance of a couple of nice young men belonging to one of the liberal professions, how they disported themselves on the ice. And how their visit came to a conclusion. Well, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, as that favoured servitor entered his bedchamber, with his warm water, 
on the morning of Christmas Day, still frosty? Water in the washhand basins a mask o' oh, ice, sir, responded Sam. Severe weather, Sam, observed Mr. Pickwick. Fine time for them as is well wrapped up, as the polar bear said to himself, then he was practicing his skating, replied Mr. Weller. I shall be down in a quarter of an hour, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, untying his nightcap. Very good, sir, replied Sam. There's a couple o' oh, sawbones downstairs. A couple of what, exclaimed Mr. Pickwick, sitting up in bed. A couple o' oh, sawbones, said Sam. What's a sawbones? inquired Mr. Pickwick, not quite certain whether it was a live animal or something to eat. What? Don't you know what a sawbones is, sir? inquired Mr. Weller. I thought everybody knowed as a sawbones was a surgeon. Oh, a surgeon, eh? said Mr. Pickwick, with a smile. Just that, sir, replied Sam. These here ones as is below, though, ain't reglar thoroughbred sawbones, they're only in training dot. In other words they're medical students, I suppose, said Mr. Pickwick. Sam Weller nodded assent. I am glad of it, said Mr. Pickwick, casting his nightcap energetically on the counterpane. They are fine fellows, very fine fellows. With judgments matured by observation and reflection, and tastes refined by reading and study. I am very glad of it. There a smokin' cigars by the kitchen fire, said Sam. Ah, observed Mr. Pickwick, rubbing his hands, overflowing with kindly feelings and animal spirits. Just what I like to see. And one on M, said Sam, not noticing his master's interruption, one on M's got his legs on the table, and is a drinking brandy neat, while the t'other one, him in the barnacles, has got a barrel o' oh, oysters atween his knees. Which he's a openin' like steam, and as fast as he eats M, he takes a aim with the shells at young Dropsy, who's a sittin' down fast asleep, in the chimbley corner. Eccentricities of genius, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. You may retire. Sam did retire accordingly. Mr. Pickwick at the expiration of the quarter of an hour, went down to breakfast. Here he is at last, said old Mr. Wardle. Pickwick, this is Miss Allen's brother, Mr. Benjamin Allen. Ben we call him, and so may you, if you like. This gentleman is his very particular friend, Mr. Mr. Bob Sawyer, interposed Mr. Benjamin Allen, whereupon Mr. Bob Sawyer and Mr. Benjamin Allen laughed in concert. Mr. Pickwick bowed to Bob Sawyer, and Bob Sawyer bowed to Mr. Pickwick. Bob and his very particular friend then applied themselves most assiduously to the eatables before them, and Mr. Pickwick had an opportunity of glancing at them both. Mr. Benjamin Allen was a coarse, stout, thick-set young man, with black hair cut rather short, and a white face cut rather long. He was embellished with spectacles, and wore a white neckerchief. Below his single-breasted black surtout, which was buttoned up to his chin, appeared the usual number of pepper and salt colored legs, terminating in a pair of imperfectly polished boots. Although his coat was short in the sleeves, it disclosed no vestige of a linen wristband, and although there was quite enough of his face to admit of the encroachment of a shirt collar, it was not graced by the smallest approach to that appendage. He presented, altogether, rather a mildewy appearance, and emitted a fragrant odor of full-flavored kubas. Mr. Bob Sawyer, who was habited in a coarse, blue coat, which, without being either a greatcoat or a surtout, partook of the nature and qualities of both, had about him that sort of slovenly smartness, and swaggering gait. Which is peculiar to young gentlemen who smoke in the streets by day, shout and scream in the same by night, call waiters by their Christian names, and do various other acts and deeds of an equally facetious description. He wore a pair of plaid trousers, and a large, rough, double-breasted waistcoat, out of doors, he carried a thick stick with a big top. He issued gloves, and looked, upon the whole, something like a dissipated Robinson Crusoe. Such were the two worthies to whom Mr. Pickwick was introduced, as he took his seat at the breakfast table on Christmas morning. Splendid morning, gentlemen, said Mr. Pickwick. Mr. 
Bob Sawyer slightly nodded his assent to the proposition, and asked Mr. Benjamin Allen for the mustard. Have you come far this morning, gentlemen, inquired Mr. Pickwick. Blue Lion at Muggleton, briefly responded Mr. Allen. You should have joined us last night, said Mr. Pickwick. So we should, replied Bob Sawyer, but the brandy was too good to leave in a hurry, wasn't it, Ben? Certainly, said Mr. Benjamin Allen. And the cigars were not bad, or the pork chops either, were they, Bob? Decidedly not, said Bob. The particular friends resumed their attack upon the breakfast, more freely than before, as if the recollection of last night's supper had imparted a new relish to the meal. Peg away, Bob, said Mr. Allen, to his companion, encouragingly. So I do, replied Bob Sawyer. And so, to do him justice, he did. Nothing like dissecting, to give one an appetite, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, looking round the table. Mr. Pickwick slightly shuddered. By the by, Bob, said Mr. Allen, have you finished that leg yet? Nearly, replied Sawyer, helping himself to half a fowl as he spoke. It's a very muscular one for a child's. Is it? inquired Mr. Allen carelessly. Very, said Bob Sawyer, with his mouth full. I've put my name down for an arm at our place, said Mr. Allen. We're clubbing for a subject, and the list is nearly full, only we can't get hold of any fellow that wants a head. I wish you'd take it. No, replied Bob Sawyer. Can't afford expensive luxuries. Nonsense, said Allen. Can't, indeed, rejoined Bob Sawyer, I wouldn't mind a brain, but I couldn't stand a whole head. Hush, hush, gentlemen, pray, said Mr. Pickwick, I hear the ladies. As Mr. Pickwick spoke, the ladies, gallantly escorted by Messrs. Snodgrass, Winkle, and Tupman, returned from an early walk. Why, Ben, said Arabella, in a tone which expressed more surprise than pleasure at the sight of her brother. Come to take you home tomorrow, replied Benjamin. Mr. Winkle turned pale. Don't you see Bob Sawyer, Arabella, inquired Mr. Benjamin Allen, somewhat reproachfully. Arabella gracefully held out her hand, in acknowledgment of Bob Sawyer's presence. A thrill of hatred struck to Mr. Winkle's heart, as Bob Sawyer inflicted on the proffered hand a perceptible squeeze. Ben, dear, said Arabella, blushing. Have, have, you been introduced to Mr. Winkle? I have not been, but I shall be very happy to be, Arabella, replied her brother gravely. Here Mr. Allen bowed grimly to Mr. Winkle, while Mr. Winkle and Mr. Bob Sawyer glanced mutual distrust out of the corners of their eyes. The arrival of the two new visitors, and the consequent check upon Mr. Winkle and the young lady with the fur round her boots, would in all probability have proved a very unpleasant interruption to the hilarity of the party, had not the cheerfulness of Mr. Pickwick, and the good humor of the host, been exerted to the very utmost for the common weal. Mr. Winkle gradually insinuated himself into the good graces of Mr. Benjamin Allen, and even joined in a friendly conversation with Mr. Bob Sawyer. Who, enlivened with the brandy, and the breakfast, and the talking, gradually ripened into a state of extreme facetiousness, and related with much glee an agreeable anecdote, about the removal of a tumor on some gentleman's head which he illustrated by means of an oyster knife and a half quartern loaf, to the great edification of the assembled company. Then the whole train went to church, where Mr. Benjamin Allen fell fast asleep, while Mr. Bob Sawyer abstracted his thoughts from worldly matters, by the ingenious process of carving his name on the seat of the pew, in corpulent letters of four inches long. Now, said Wardle, after a substantial lunch, with the agreeable items of strong beer and cherry brandy, had been done ample justice to, what say you to an hour on the ice? We shall have plenty of time. Capital, said Mr. Benjamin Allen. Prime, ejaculated Mr. Bob Sawyer. You skate, of course, Winkle, said Wardle. Ye yes, oh, yes, replied Mr. Winkle. I, I, am rather out of practice. Oh, do skate, Mr. Winkle, said Arabella. I like to see it so much. 
Oh, it is so graceful, said another young lady. A third young lady said it was elegant, and a fourth expressed her opinion that it was swan-like. I should be very happy, I'm sure, said Mr. Winkle, reddening, but I have no skates. This objection was at once overruled. Trundle had a couple of pair, and the fat boy announced that there were half a dozen more downstairs, whereat Mr. Winkle expressed exquisite delight, and looked exquisitely uncomfortable. Old Wardle led the way to a pretty large sheet of ice, and the fat boy and Mr. Weller, having shoveled and swept away the snow which had fallen on it during the night, Mr. Bob Sawyer adjusted his skates with a dexterity which to Mr. Winkle was perfectly marvellous, and described circles with his left leg, and cut figures of eight, and inscribed upon the ice, without one stopping for breath, a great many other pleasant and astonishing devices. To the excessive satisfaction of Mr. Pickwick, Mr. Tupman, and the ladies, which reached a pitch of positive enthusiasm, when old Wardle and Benjamin Allen, assisted by the aforesaid Bob Sawyer, performed some mystic evolutions, which they called a reel. All this time, Mr. Winkle, with his face and hands blue with the cold, had been forcing a gimlet into the sole of his feet, and putting his skates on, with the points behind, and getting the straps into a very complicated and entangled state. With the assistance of Mr. Snodgrass, who knew rather less about skates than a Hindu. At length, however, with the assistance of Mr. Weller, the unfortunate skates were firmly screwed and buckled on, and Mr. Winkle was raised to his feet. Now, then, sir, said Sam, in an encouraging tone, off with you, and show them how to do it. Stop, Sam, stop, said Mr. Winkle, trembling violently, and clutching hold of Sam's arms with the grasp of a drowning man. How slippery it is, Sam! Not an uncommon thing upon ice, sir, replied Mr. Weller. Hold up, sir! This last observation of Mr. Weller's bore reference to a demonstration Mr. Winkle made at the instant of a frantic desire to throw his feet in the air, and dash the back of his head on the ice. These, these, are very awkward skates, ain't they, Sam, inquired Mr. Winkle, staggering. I'm afeard there's a orchard gen man in M, sir, replied Sam. Now, Winkle, cried Mr. Pickwick, quite unconscious that there was anything the matter. Come, the ladies are all anxiety. Yes, yes, replied Mr. Winkle, with a ghastly smile. I'm coming. Just a goin', to begin, said Sam, endeavoring to disengage himself. Now, sir, start off. Stop an instant, Sam, gasped Mr. Winkle, clinging most affectionately to Mr. Weller. I find I've got a couple of coats at home that I don't want, Sam. You may have them, Sam. Thank ye, sir, replied Mr. Weller. Never mind touching your hat, Sam, said Mr. Winkle hastily. You needn't take your hand away to do that. I meant to have given you five shillings this morning for a Christmas box, Sam. I'll give it you this afternoon, Sam. You're very good, sir, replied Mr. Weller. Just hold me at first, Sam, will you, said Mr. Winkle. There, that's right. I shall soon get in the way of it, Sam. Not too fast, Sam, not too fast. Mr. Winkle, stooping forward, with his body half doubled up, was being assisted over the ice by Mr. Weller, in a very singular and unswan-like manner, when Mr. Pickwick most innocently shouted from the opposite bank. Sam! Sir! Here! I want you! Let go, sir, said Sam. Don't you hear the Governor A. Callan? Let go, sir! With a violent effort, Mr. Weller disengaged himself from the grasp of the agonized Pickwickian, and, in so doing, administered a considerable impetus to the unhappy Mr. Winkle. With an accuracy which no degree of dexterity or practice could have ensured, that unfortunate gentleman bore swiftly down into the center of the reel, at the very moment when Mr. Bob Sawyer was performing a flourish of unparalleled beauty. Mr. Winkle struck wildly against him, and with a loud crash they both fell heavily down. Mr. Pickwick ran to the spot. Bob Sawyer had risen to his feet,
but Mr. Winkle was far too wise to do anything of the kind, in skates. He was seated on the ice, making spasmodic efforts to smile, but anguish was depicted on every lineament of his countenance. Are you hurt? inquired Mr. Benjamin Allen, with great anxiety. Not much, said Mr. Winkle, rubbing his back very hard. I wish you'd let me bleed you, said Mr. Benjamin, with great eagerness. No, thank you, replied Mr. Winkle hurriedly. I really think you had better, said Allen. Thank you, replied Mr. Winkle, I'd rather not. What do you think, Mr. Pickwick, inquired Bob Sawyer. Mr. Pickwick was excited and indignant. He beckoned to Mr. Weller, and said in a stern voice, Take his skates off. No, but really I had scarcely begun, remonstrated Mr. Winkle. Take his skates off, repeated Mr. Pickwick firmly. The command was not to be resisted. Mr. Winkle allowed Sam to obey it, in silence. Lift him up, said Mr. Pickwick. Sam assisted him to rise. Mr. Pickwick retired a few paces apart from the bystanders. And, beckoning his friend to approach, fixed a searching look upon him, and uttered in a low, but distinct and emphatic tone, these remarkable words. You're a humbug, sir. A what? said Mr. Winkle, starting. A humbug, sir. I will speak plainer, if you wish it. An impostor, sir. With those words, Mr. Pickwick turned slowly on his heel, and rejoined his friends. While Mr. Pickwick was delivering himself of the sentiment just recorded, Mr. Weller and the fat boy, having by their joint endeavors cut out a slide, were exercising themselves thereupon, in a very masterly and brilliant manner. Sam Weller, in particular, was displaying that beautiful feat of fancy sliding which is currently denominated knocking at the cobbler's door, and which is achieved by skimming over the ice on one foot, and occasionally giving a postman's knock upon it with the other. It was a good long slide, and there was something in the motion which Mr. Pickwick, who was very cold with standing still, could not help envying. It looks a nice warm exercise that, doesn't it? He inquired of Wardle, when that gentleman was thoroughly out of breath, by reason of the indefatigable manner in which he had converted his legs into a pair of compasses, and drawn complicated problems on the ice. Ah, it does, indeed, replied Wardle. Do you slide? I used to do so, on the gutters, when I was a boy, replied Mr. Pickwick. Try it now, said Wardle. Oh, do, please, Mr. Pickwick, cried all the ladies. I should be very happy to afford you any amusement, replied Mr. Pickwick, but I haven't done such a thing these thirty years. Pooh! Pooh! Nonsense! said Wardle, dragging off his skates with the impetuosity which characterized all his proceedings. Here, I'll keep you company, come along. And away went the good-tempered old fellow down the slide, with a rapidity which came very close upon Mr. Weller, and beat the fat boy all to nothing. Mr. Pickwick paused, considered, pulled off his gloves and put them in his hat. Took two or three short runs, balked himself as often, and at last took another run, and went slowly and gravely down the slide, with his feet about a yard and a quarter apart, amidst the gratified shouts of all the spectators. Keep the pot a bylin, sir, said Sam, and down went Wardle again, and then Mr. Pickwick, and then Sam, and then Mr. Winkle, and then Mr. Bob Sawyer, and then the fat boy, and then Mr. Snodgrass, following closely upon each other's heels, and running after each other with as much eagerness as if their future prospects in life depended on their expedition. It was the most intensely interesting thing, to observe the manner in which Mr. Pickwick performed his share in the ceremony. To watch the torture of anxiety with which he viewed the person behind, gaining upon him at the imminent hazard of tripping him up. To see him gradually expend the painful force he had put on at first, and turn slowly round on the slide, with his face towards the point from which he had started. To contemplate the playful smile which mantled on his face when he had accomplished the distance, and the eagerness with which he turned round when he had done so, and ran after his predecessor. His black gaiters tripping pleasantly through the snow, and his eyes beaming cheerfulness and gladness through his spectacles. 
And when he was knocked down, which happened upon the average every third round, it was the most invigorating sight that can possibly be imagined to behold him gather up his hat, gloves, and handkerchief, with a glowing countenance. And resume his station in the rank, with an ardor and enthusiasm that nothing could abate. The sport was at its height, the sliding was at the quickest, the laughter was at the loudest, when a sharp smart crack was heard. There was a quick rush towards the bank, a wild scream from the ladies, and a shout from Mr. Tupman. A large mass of ice disappeared, the water bubbled up over it, Mr. Pickwick's hat, gloves, and handkerchief were floating on the surface, and this was all of Mr. Pickwick that anybody could see. Dismay and anguish were depicted on every countenance. The males turned pale, and the females fainted, Mr. Snodgrass and Mr. Winkle grasped each other by the hand, and gazed at the spot where their leader had gone down, with frenzied eagerness, while Mr. Tupman, by way of rendering the promptest assistance, and at the same time conveying to any persons who might be within hearing, the clearest possible notion of the catastrophe, ran off across the country at his utmost speed, screaming, fire! With all his might! It was at this moment, when old Wardle and Sam Weller were approaching the hole with cautious steps, and Mr. Benjamin Allen was holding a hurried consultation with Mr. Bob Sawyer on the advisability of bleeding the company generally, as an improving little bit of professional practice, it was at this very moment, that a face, head, and shoulders, emerged from beneath the water. And disclosed the features and spectacles of Mr. Pickwick. Keep yourself up for an instant, for only one instant, bawled Mr. Snodgrass. Yes, do, let me implore you, for my sake, roared Mr. Winkle, deeply affected. The adjuration was rather unnecessary, the probability being, that if Mr. Pickwick had declined to keep himself up for anybody else's sake, it would have occurred to him that he might as well do so, for his own. Do you feel the bottom there, old fellow, said Wardle. Yes, certainly, replied Mr. Pickwick, wringing the water from his head and face, and gasping for breath. I fell upon my back. I couldn't get on my feet at first. The clay upon so much of Mr. Pickwick's coat as was yet visible, bore testimony to the accuracy of this statement. And as the fears of the spectators were still further relieved by the fat boys suddenly recollecting that the water was nowhere more than five feet deep, prodigies of valor were performed to get him out. After a vast quantity of splashing, and cracking, and struggling, Mr. Pickwick was at length fairly extricated from his unpleasant position, and once more stood on dry land. Oh, he'll catch his death of cold, said Emily. Dear old thing! said Arabella. Let me wrap this shawl round you, Mr. Pickwick. Ah, that's the best thing you can do, said Wardle, and when you've got it on, run home as fast as your legs can carry you, and jump into bed directly. A dozen shawls were offered on the instant. Three or four of the thickest having been selected, Mr. Pickwick was wrapped up, and started off, under the guidance of Mr. Weller. Presenting the singular phenomenon of an elderly gentleman, dripping wet, and without a hat, with his arms bound down to his sides, skimming over the ground, without any clearly defined purpose, at the rate of six good English miles an hour. But Mr. Pickwick cared not for appearances in such an extreme case, and urged on by Sam Weller, he kept at the very top of his speed until he reached the door of Manor Farm, where Mr. Tupman had arrived some five minutes before and had frightened the old lady into palpitations of the heart by impressing her with the unalterable conviction that the kitchen chimney was on fire, a calamity which always presented itself in glowing colors to the old lady's mind. When anybody about her evinced the smallest agitation, Mr. Pickwick paused not an instant until he was snug in bed. Sam Weller lighted a blazing fire in the room, and took up his dinner, a bowl of punch was carried up afterwards, and a grand carouse held in honor of his safety. Old Wardle would not hear of his rising, so they made the bed the chair, and Mr. Pickwick presided. A second and a third bowl were ordered in, and when Mr. Pickwick awoke next morning, there was not a symptom of rheumatism about him. Which proves, as Mr. Bob Sawyer very justly observed, that there is nothing like hot punch in such cases.
and that if ever hot punch did fail to act as a preventive, it was merely because the patient fell into the vulgar error of not taking enough of it. The jovial party broke up next morning. Breakings up are capital things in our school days, but in afterlife they are painful enough. Death, self-interest, and fortune's changes, are every day breaking up many a happy group, and scattering them far and wide. And the boys and girls never come back again. We do not mean to say that it was exactly the case in this particular instance, all we wish to inform the reader is, that the different members of the party dispersed to their several homes, that Mr. Pickwick and his friends once more took their seats on the top of the Muggleton coach, and that Arabella Allen repaired to her place of destination, wherever it might have been, we dare say Mr. Winkle knew, but we confess we don't, under the care and guardianship of her brother Benjamin, and his most intimate and particular friend, Mr. Bob Sawyer. Before they separated, however, that gentleman and Mr. Benjamin Allen drew Mr. Pickwick aside with an air of some mystery, and Mr. Bob Sawyer, thrusting his forefinger between two of Mr. Pickwick's ribs, and thereby displaying his native drollery, and his knowledge of the anatomy of the human frame, at one and the same time, inquired. I say, old boy, where do you hang out? Mr. Pickwick replied that he was at present suspended at the George and Vulture. I wish you'd come and see me, said Bob Sawyer. Nothing would give me greater pleasure, replied Mr. Pickwick. There's my lodgings, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, producing a card. Lance Street, Borough, it's near Guy's, and handy for me, you know. Little distance after you've passed St. George's Church, turns out of the high street on the right-hand side the way. I shall find it, said Mr. Pickwick. Come on Thursday fortnight and bring the other chaps with you, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, I'm going to have a few medical fellows that night. Mr. Pickwick expressed the pleasure it would afford him to meet the medical fellows, and after Mr. Bob Sawyer had informed him that he meant to be very cozy, and that his friend Ben was to be one of the party, they shook hands and separated. We feel that in this place we lay ourselves open to the inquiry whether Mr. Winkle was whispering, during this brief conversation, to Arabella Allen, and if so, what he said, and furthermore, whether Mr. Snodgrass was conversing apart with Emily Wardle, and if so, what he said. To this, we reply, that whatever they might have said to the ladies, they said nothing at all to Mr. Pickwick or Mr. Tupman for eight and twenty miles, and that they sighed very often, refused ale and brandy, and looked gloomy. If our observant lady readers can deduce any satisfactory inferences from these facts, we beg them by all means to do so. Chapter 31 Which is all about the law, and sundry great authorities learned therein. Scattered about, in various holes and corners of the temple, are certain dark and dirty chambers, in and out of which, all the morning in vacation. And half the evening too in term time, there may be seen constantly hurrying with bundles of papers under their arms, and protruding from their pockets, an almost uninterrupted succession of lawyers' clerks. There are several grades of lawyers' clerks. There is the articled clerk, who has paid a premium, and is an attorney in perspective, who runs a tailor's bill, receives invitations to parties, knows a family in Gower Street, and another in Tavistock Square. Who goes out of town every long vacation to see his father, who keeps live horses innumerable, and who is, in short, the very aristocrat of clerks. There is the salaried clerk, out of door, or in door, as the case may be, who devotes the major part of his thirty shillings a week to his personal pleasure and adornments, repairs half-price to the Adelphi Theatre at least three times a week, dissipates majestically at the cider cellars afterwards, and is a dirty caricature of the fashion which expired six months ago. There is the middle-aged copying clerk, with a large family, who is always shabby, and often drunk. And there are the office lads in their first surtouts, who feel a befitting contempt for boys at day schools, club as they go home at night, for Savaloys and Porter, and think there's nothing like life. There are varieties of the genus, too numerous to recapitulate, but however numerous they may be, they are all to be seen, at certain regulated business hours, hurrying to and from the places we have just mentioned. These sequestered nooks are the public offices of the legal profession, 
where writs are issued, judgments signed, declarations filed, and numerous other ingenious machines put in motion for the torture and torment of His Majesty's liege subjects. And the comfort and emolument of the practitioners of the law. They are, for the most part, low-roofed, moldy rooms, where innumerable rolls of parchment, which have been perspiring in secret for the last century, send forth an agreeable odor, which is mingled by day with the scent of the dry rot. And by night with the various exhalations which arise from damp cloaks, festering umbrellas, and the coarsest tallow candles. About half past seven o'clock in the evening, some ten days or a fortnight after Mr. Pickwick and his friends returned to London, there hurried into one of these offices, an individual in a brown coat and brass buttons, whose long hair was scrupulously twisted round the rim of his napless hat, and whose soiled drab trousers were so tightly strapped over his blucher boots, that his knees threatened every moment to start from their concealment. He produced from his coat pockets a long and narrow strip of parchment, on which the presiding functionary impressed an illegible black stamp. He then drew forth four scraps of paper, of similar dimensions, each containing a printed copy of the strip of parchment with blanks for a name, and having filled up the blanks, put all the five documents in his pocket, and hurried away. The man in the brown coat, with the cabalistic documents in his pocket, was no other than our old acquaintance Mr. Jackson, of the house of Dodson and Fogg, Freeman's Court, Cornhill. Instead of returning to the office whence he came, however, he bent his steps direct to Sun Court, and walking straight into the George and Vulture, demanded to know whether one Mr. Pickwick was within. Call Mr. Pickwick servant, Tom, said the barmaid of the George and Vulture. Don't trouble yourself, said Mr. Jackson. I've come on business. If you'll show me Mr. Pickwick's room I'll step up myself. What name, sir, said the waiter. Jackson, replied the clerk. The waiter stepped upstairs to announce Mr. Jackson, but Mr. Jackson saved him the trouble by following close at his heels, and walking into the apartment before he could articulate a syllable. Mr. Pickwick had, that day, invited his three friends to dinner, they were all seated round the fire, drinking their wine, when Mr. Jackson presented himself, as above described. How to do, sir, said Mr. Jackson, nodding to Mr. Pickwick. That gentleman bowed, and looked somewhat surprised, for the physiognomy of Mr. Jackson dwelt not in his recollection. I have called from Dodson and Foggs, said Mr. Jackson, in an explanatory tone. Mr. Pickwick roused at the name. I refer you to my attorney, sir, Mr. Perker, of Gray's Inn, said he. Waiter, show this gentleman out. Beg your pardon, Mr. Pickwick, said Jackson, deliberately depositing his hat on the floor, and drawing from his pocket the strip of parchment. But personal service, by clerk or agent, in these cases, you know, Mr. Pickwick, nothing like caution, sir, in all legal forms, eh? Here Mr. Jackson cast his eye on the parchment, and, resting his hands on the table, and looking round with a winning and persuasive smile, said, Now, come. Don't let's have no words about such a little matter as this. Which of you gentlemen's name Snodgrass? At this inquiry, Mr. Snodgrass gave such a very undisguised and palpable start, that no further reply was needed. Ah! I thought so, said Mr. Jackson, more affably than before. I've a little something to trouble you with, sir. Me, exclaimed Mr. Snodgrass. It's only a subpoena in Bardell and Pickwick on behalf of the plaintiff, replied Jackson, singling out one of the slips of paper, and producing a shilling from his waistcoat pocket. It'll come on, in the set tens after term, 14th of February, we expect, we've marked it a special jury cause, and it's only ten down the paper. That's yours, Mr. Snodgrass. As Jackson said this, he presented the parchment before the eyes of Mr. Snodgrass, and slipped the paper and the shilling into his hand. Mr. Tupman had witnessed this process in silent astonishment, when Jackson, turning sharply upon him, said. I think I ain't mistaken when I say your name's Tupman, am I? Mr. Tupman looked at Mr. Pickwick. But, perceiving no encouragement in that gentleman's widely opened eyes to deny his name, said. 
Yes, my name is Tupman, sir. And that other gentleman's Mr. Winkle, I think, said Jackson. Mr. Winkle faltered out a reply in the affirmative. And both gentlemen were forthwith invested with a slip of paper, and a shilling each, by the dexterous Mr. Jackson. Now, said Jackson, I'm afraid you'll think me rather troublesome, but I want somebody else, if it ain't inconvenient. I have Samuel Weller's name here, Mr. Pickwick. Send my servant here, waiter, said Mr. Pickwick. The waiter retired, considerably astonished, and Mr. Pickwick motioned Jackson to a seat. There was a painful pause, which was at length broken by the innocent defendant. I suppose, sir, said Mr. Pickwick, his indignation rising while he spoke, I suppose, sir, that it is the intention of your employers to seek to criminate me upon the testimony of my own friends? Mr. Jackson struck his forefinger several times against the left side of his nose, to intimate that he was not there to disclose the secrets of the prison house, and playfully rejoined. Not knowing, can't say. For what other reason, sir, pursued Mr. Pickwick, are these subpoenas served upon them, if not for this? Very good plant, Mr. Pickwick, replied Jackson, slowly shaking his head. But it won't do. No harm in trying, but there's little to be got out of me. Here Mr. Jackson smiled once more upon the company, and, applying his left thumb to the tip of his nose, worked a visionary coffee mill with his right hand, thereby performing a very graceful piece of pantomime, then much in vogue, but now, unhappily. Almost obsolete, which was familiarly denominated, taking a grinder. No, no, Mr. Pickwick, said Jackson, in conclusion, Perker's people must guess what we've served these subpoenas for. If they can't, they must wait till the action comes on, and then they'll find out. Mr. Pickwick bestowed a look of excessive disgust on his unwelcome visitor, and would probably have hurled some tremendous anathema at the heads of Messrs. Dodson and Fogg, had not Sam's entrance at the instant interrupted him. Samuel Weller, said Mr. Jackson, inquiringly. Von O, oh, the truest things as you've said for many a long year, replied Sam, in a most composed manner. Here's a subpoena for you, Mr. Weller, said Jackson. What's that in English, inquired Sam. Here's the original, said Jackson, declining the required explanation. Which, said Sam. This, replied Jackson, shaking the parchment. Oh, that's the rig and al, is it, said Sam. Well, I'm very glad I've seen the rig and al, cause it's a gratifying sort o' oh, thing, and eases Vun's mind so much. And here's the shilling, said Jackson. It's from Dodson and Foggs. And it's uncommon handsome o' oh, Dodson and Fogg, as knows so little of me, to come down with a present, said Sam. I feel it as a wary high compliment, sir. It's a wary honorable thing to them, as they knows how to reward merit wherever they meets it. Besides which, it's affectin' to one's feelings. As Mr. Weller said this, he inflicted a little friction on his right eyelid, with the sleeve of his coat, after the most approved manner of actors when they are in domestic pathetics. Mr. Jackson seemed rather puzzled by Sam's proceedings. But, as he had served the subpoenas, and had nothing more to say, he made a feint of putting on the one glove which he usually carried in his hand, for the sake of appearances, and returned to the office to report progress. Mr. Pickwick slept little that night, his memory had received a very disagreeable refresher on the subject of Mrs. Bardell's action. He breakfasted betimes next morning, and, desiring Sam to accompany him, set forth towards Gray's Inn Square. Sam! said Mr. Pickwick, looking round, when they got to the end of Cheapside. Sir, said Sam, stepping up to his master. Which way? Up Newgate Street. Mr. Pickwick did not turn round immediately, but looked vacantly in Sam's face for a few seconds, and heaved a deep sigh. What's the matter, sir? inquired Sam. This action, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, is expected to come on, on the 14th of next month. Remarkable coincidence that, there, sir, replied Sam. Why remarkable, 
Sam, inquired Mr. Pickwick. Wallentine's day, sir, responded Sam. Reglar good day for a breach o oh, promise trial. Mr. Weller's smile awakened no gleam of mirth in his master's countenance. Mr. Pickwick turned abruptly round, and led the way in silence. They had walked some distance, Mr. Pickwick trotting on before, plunged in profound meditation, and Sam following behind, with a countenance expressive of the most enviable and easy defiance of everything and everybody, when the latter, who was always especially anxious to impart to his master any exclusive information he possessed, quickened his pace until he was close at Mr. Pickwick's heels, and, pointing up at a house they were passing, said. Wery nice pork shop that air, sir. Yes, it seems so, said Mr. Pickwick. Celebrated sausage factory, said Sam. Is it, said Mr. Pickwick. Is it? Reiterated Sam, with some indignation, I should rather think it was. Why, sir, bless your innocent eyebrows, that's where the mysterious disappearance of a respectable tradesman took place four years ago. You don't mean to say he was burnt, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, looking hastily round. No, I don't indeed, sir, replied Mr. Weller, I wish I did, far worse than that. He was the master o oh, that bear shop, sir, and the inventor o oh, the patent never leaving off sausage steam engine, as you'd swaller up a paven stone if you put it too near, and grind it into sausage as easy as if it was a tender young babby. Wery proud o oh, that machine he was, as it was nat ral he should be, and he'd stand down in the cellar a lookin' at it when it was in full play, till he got quite melancholy with joy. A wary happy man he'd ha been, sir, in the procession o oh, that air engine and two more lovely hinfants besides, if it hadn't been for his wife, who was a most audacious wixen. She was always a follerin' him about, and didn't mean, in his ears, till at last he couldn't stand it no longer. I'll tell you what it is, my dear, he says one day. If you perswear in this here sort of amusement, he says, I'm blessed if I don't go away to America, and that's all about it. You're a idle willin, says she, and I wish that Americans joy of their bargain. Arter which she keeps on Abu Sin of him for half an hour, and then runs into the little parlor behind the shop, sets to a screamin', says he'll be the death on her, and falls in a fit. Which lasts for three good hours, one o oh, them fits which is all screamin' and kickin'. Well, next mornin', the husband was missin'. He hadn't taken nothin' from the till, hadn't even put on his greatcoat, so it was quite clear he warn't gone to America. Didn't come back next day, didn't come back next week. Mrs. had bills printed, sayin' that, if he'd come back, he should be forgiven everything, which was very liberal, seein' that he hadn't done nothin' at all. The canals was dragged, and for two months afterwards, whenever a body turned up, it was carried, as a reglar thing, straight off to the sausage shop. However, none on em answered. So they gave out that he'd run away, and she kept on the business. One Saturday night, a little, thin, old Gen L M N comes into the shop in a great passion and says, Are you the Mrs. O, oh, this here shop? Yes, I am, says she. Well, ma'am, says he, then I've just looked in to say that me and my family ain't a goin' to be choked for nothin'. And more than that, ma'am, he says, you'll allow me to observe that as you don't use the primest parts of the meat in the manufacture, oh, sausages, I'd think you'd find beef come nearly as cheap as buttons. As buttons, sir, says she. Buttons, ma'am, says the little, old gentleman, unfolding a bit of paper, and showin' twenty or thirty halves o' oh, buttons. Nice seasonin' for sausages is trousers buttons, ma'am. They're my husband's buttons. Says the widow beginning to faint, what, screams the little old gen lmn, tenin' wary pale. I see it all, says the widow, in a fit of temporary insanity he rashly converted himself into sausages. And so he had, sir, said Mr. Weller, looking steadily into Mr. Pickwick's horror-stricken countenance, or else he'd been drawed into the engine. But however that might have been, the little, old Gen L M N, who had been remarkably partial to sausage all his life, 
rushed out o oh, the shop in a wild state, and was never heard on arterwards. The relation of this affecting incident of private life brought master and man to Mr. Perker's chambers. Lo Ten, holding the door half open, was in conversation with a rustily clad, miserable-looking man, in boots without toes and gloves without fingers. There were traces of privation and suffering, almost of despair, in his lank and careworn countenance, he felt his poverty, for he shrank to the dark side of the staircase as Mr. Pickwick approached. It's very unfortunate, said the stranger, with a sigh. Very, said Lo Ten, scribbling his name on the doorpost with his pen, and rubbing it out again with the feather. Will you leave a message for him? When do you think he'll be back? Inquired the stranger. Quite uncertain, replied Lo Ten, winking at Mr. Pickwick, as the stranger cast his eyes towards the ground. You don't think it would be of any use my waiting for him, said the stranger, looking wistfully into the office. Oh, no, I'm sure it wouldn't, replied the clerk, moving a little more into the center of the doorway. He's certain not to be back this week and it's a chance whether he will be next. For when Perker once gets out of town, he's never in a hurry to come back again. Out of town, said Mr. Pickwick, dear me, how unfortunate. Don't go away, Mr. Pickwick, said Lo Ten, I've got a letter for you. The stranger, seeming to hesitate, once more looked towards the ground, and the clerk winked slyly at Mr. Pickwick, as if to intimate that some exquisite piece of humor was going forward, though what it was Mr. Pickwick could not for the life of him divine. Step in, Mr. Pickwick, said Lo Ten. Well, will you leave a message, Mr. Waddy, or will you call again? Ask him to be so kind as to leave out word what has been done in my business, said the man. For God's sake don't neglect it, Mr. Lo Ten. No, no, I won't forget it, replied the clerk. Walk in, Mr. Pickwick. Good morning, Mr. Waddy. It's a fine day for walking, isn't it? Seeing that the stranger still lingered, he beckoned Sam Weller to follow his master in, and shut the door in his face. There never was such a pestering bankrupt as that since the world began, I do believe. Said Lo Ten, throwing down his pen with the air of an injured man. His affairs haven't been in chancery quite four years yet, and I'm d, d if he don't come worrying here twice a week. Step this way. Mr. Pickwick. Perker is in, and he'll see you, I know. Devilish cold, he added pettishly, standing at that door, wasting one's time with such seedy vagabonds. Having very vehemently stirred a particularly large fire with a particularly small poker, the clerk led the way to his principal's private room, and announced Mr. Pickwick. Ah, uh, my dear sir, said little Mr. Perker, bustling up from his chair. Well, my dear sir, and what's the news about your matter, eh? Anything more about our friends in Freeman's Court? They've not been sleeping, I know that. Ah, they're very smart fellows, very smart, indeed. As the little man concluded, he took an emphatic pinch of snuff, as a tribute to the smartness of Messrs. Dodson and Fogg. They are great scoundrels, said Mr. Pickwick. I, I, said the little man. That's a matter of opinion, you know, and we won't dispute about terms, because of course you can't be expected to view these subjects with a professional eye. Well, we've done everything that's necessary. I have retained Sergeant Snubbin. Is he a good man? inquired Mr. Pickwick. Good man, replied Perker, bless your heart and soul, my dear sir, Sergeant Snubbin is at the very top of his profession. Gets treble the business of any man in court engaged in every case. You needn't mention it abroad, but we say, we of the profession, that Sergeant Snubbin leads the court by the nose. The little man took another pinch of snuff as he made this communication, and nodded mysteriously to Mr. Pickwick. They have subpoenaed my three friends, said Mr. Pickwick. Ah! Of course they would, replied Perker. Important witnesses, saw you in a delicate situation. But she fainted of her own accord, said Mr. Pickwick. She threw herself into my arms. Very likely, my dear sir, replied Perker, very likely and very natural. Nothing more so, my dear sir, nothing. But who's to prove it? 
They have subpoenaed my servant, too, said Mr. Pickwick, quitting the other point, for their mister. Perker's question had somewhat staggered him. Sam, said Perker. Mr. Pickwick replied in the affirmative. Of course, my dear sir, of course. I knew they would. I could have told you that, a month ago. You know, my dear sir, if you will take the management of your affairs into your own hands after entrusting them to your solicitor, you must also take the consequences. Here Mr. Perker drew himself up with conscious dignity, and brushed some stray grains of snuff from his shirt frill. And what do they want him to prove, asked Mr. Pickwick, after two or three minutes' silence. That you sent him up to the plaintiff, S. to make some offer of a compromise, I suppose, replied Perker. It don't matter much, though, I don't think many counsel could get a great deal out of him. I don't think they could, said Mr. Pickwick, smiling, despite his vexation, at the idea of Sam's appearance as a witness. What course do we pursue? We have only one to adopt, my dear sir, replied Perker, cross-examine the witnesses, trust to Snubbin's eloquence. Throw dust in the eyes of the judge, throw ourselves on the jury. And suppose the verdict is against me, said Mr. Pickwick. Mr. Perker smiled, took a very long pinch of snuff, stirred the fire, shrugged his shoulders, and remained expressively silent. You mean that in that case I must pay the damages, said Mr. Pickwick, who had watched this telegraphic answer with considerable sternness. Perker gave the fire another very unnecessary poke, and said, I am afraid so. Then I beg to announce to you my unalterable determination to pay no damages whatever, said Mr. Pickwick, most emphatically. None, Perker. Not a pound, not a penny of my money, shall find its way into the pockets of Dodson and Fogg. That is my deliberate and irrevocable determination. Mr. Pickwick gave a heavy blow on the table before him, in confirmation of the irrevocability of his intention. Very well, my dear sir, very well, said Perker. You know best, of course. Of course, replied Mr. Pickwick hastily. Where does Sergeant Snubbin live? In Lincoln's in Old Square, replied Perker. I should like to see him, said Mr. Pickwick. See Sergeant Snubbin, my dear sir, rejoined Perker, in utter amazement. Pooh, pooh, my dear sir, impossible. See Sergeant Snubbin. Bless you, my dear sir, such a thing was never heard of, without a consultation fee being previously paid, and a consultation fixed. It couldn't be done, my dear sir, it couldn't be done. Mr. Pickwick, however, had made up his mind not only that it could be done, but that it should be done. And the consequence was, that within ten minutes after he had received the assurance that the thing was impossible, he was conducted by his solicitor into the outer office of the great Sergeant Snubbin himself. It was an uncarpeted room of tolerable dimensions, with a large writing table drawn up near the fire, the base top of which had long since lost all claim to its original hue of green, and had gradually grown grey with dust and age. Except where all traces of its natural colour were obliterated by ink stains. Upon the table were numerous little bundles of papers tied with red tape, and behind it, sat an elderly clerk, whose sleek appearance and heavy gold watch chain presented imposing indications of the extensive and lucrative practice of Mr. Sergeant Snubbin. Is the sergeant in his room, Mr. Mallard? inquired Perker, offering his box with all imaginable courtesy. Yes, he is, was the reply, but he's very busy. Look here not an opinion given yet, on any one of these cases. And an expedition fee paid with all of them. The clerk smiled as he said this, and inhaled the pinch of snuff with a zest which seemed to be compounded of a fondness for snuff and a relish for fees. Something like practice that, said Perker. Yes, said the barrister's clerk, producing his own box, and offering it with the greatest cordiality. And the best of it is, that as nobody alive except myself can read the sergeant's writing, they are obliged to wait for the opinions, when he has given them, till I have copied M, ahaha. Which makes good for we know who, besides the sergeant, and draws a little more out of the clients, eh, said Perker, ha, ha, ha.
At this the sergeant's clerk laughed again, not a noisy boisterous laugh, but a silent, internal chuckle, which Mr. Pickwick disliked to hear. When a man bleeds inwardly, it is a dangerous thing for himself, but when he laughs inwardly, it bodes no good to other people. You haven't made me out that little list of the fees that I'm in your debt, have you? said Perker. No, I have not, replied the clerk. I wish you would, said Perker. Let me have them, and I'll send you a check. But I suppose you're too busy pocketing the ready money to think of the debtors, eh? Ha, ha, ha. This sally seemed to tickle the clerk amazingly, and he once more enjoyed a little quiet laugh to himself. But, Mr. Mallard, my dear friend, said Perker, suddenly recovering his gravity, and drawing the great man's great man into a corner, by the lapel of his coat, you must persuade the sergeant to see me, and my client here. Come, come, said the clerk, that's not bad either. See the sergeant. Come, that's too absurd. Notwithstanding the absurdity of the proposal, however, the clerk allowed himself to be gently drawn beyond the hearing of Mr. Pickwick. And after a short conversation conducted in whispers, walked softly down a little dark passage, and disappeared into the legal luminary's sanctum, whence he shortly returned on tiptoe, and informed Mr. Perker and Mr. Pickwick that the sergeant had been prevailed upon, in violation of all established rules and customs, to admit them at once. Mr. Sergeant Snubbins was a lantern-faced, sallow-complexioned man, of about five and forty, or, as the novels say, he might be fifty. He had that dull-looking, boiled eye which is often to be seen in the heads of people who have applied themselves during many years to a weary and laborious course of study. And which would have been sufficient, without the additional eyeglass which dangled from a broad black ribbon round his neck, to warn a stranger that he was very nearsighted. His hair was thin and weak, which was partly attributable to his having never devoted much time to its arrangement, and partly to his having worn for five and twenty years the forensic wig which hung on a block beside him. The marks of hair powder on his coat collar, and the ill-washed and worse tied white neckerchief round his throat, showed that he had not found leisure since he left the court to make any alteration in his dress. While the slovenly style of the remainder of his costume warranted the inference that his personal appearance would not have been very much improved if he had. Books of practice, heaps of papers, and opened letters, were scattered over the table, without any attempt at order or arrangement, the furniture of the room was old and rickety, the doors of the bookcase were rotting in their hinges. The dust flew out from the carpet in little clouds at every step, the blinds were yellow with age and dirt, the state of everything in the room showed, with a clearness not to be mistaken, that Mr. Sergeant Snubbin was far too much occupied with his professional pursuits to take any great heed or regard of his personal comforts. The sergeant was writing when his clients entered, he bowed abstractedly when Mr. Pickwick was introduced by his solicitor, and then, motioning them to a seat, put his pen carefully in the inkstand, nursed his left leg, and waited to be spoken to. Mr. Pickwick is the defendant in Bardell and Pickwick, Sergeant Snubbin, said Perker. I am retained in that, am I, said the sergeant. You are, sir, replied Perker. The sergeant nodded his head, and waited for something else. Mr. Pickwick was anxious to call upon you, Sergeant Snubbin, said Perker, to state to you, before you entered upon the case, that he denies there being any ground or pretense whatever for the action against him. And that unless he came into court with clean hands, and without the most conscientious conviction that he was right in resisting the plaintiff's demand, he would not be there at all. I believe I state your views correctly, do I not, my dear sir? Said the little man, turning to Mr. Pickwick. Quite so, replied that gentleman. Mr. Sergeant Snubbin unfolded his glasses, raised them to his eyes, and, after looking at Mr. Pickwick for a few seconds with great curiosity, turned to Mr. Perker, and said, smiling slightly as he spoke. Has Mr. Pickwick a strong case? The attorney shrugged his shoulders. Do you propose calling witnesses? No. The smile on the sergeant's countenance became more defined. He rocked his leg with increased violence, 
and, throwing himself back in his easy chair, coughed dubiously. These tokens of the sergeant's presentiments on the subject, slight as they were, were not lost on Mr. Pickwick. He settled the spectacles, through which he had attentively regarded such demonstrations of the barrister's feelings as he had permitted himself to exhibit, more firmly on his nose, and said with great energy, and in utter disregard of all Mr. Perker's admonitory winkings and frownings. My wishing to wait upon you, for such a purpose as this, sir, appears, I have no doubt, to a gentleman who sees so much of these matters as you must necessarily do, a very extraordinary circumstance. The sergeant tried to look gravely at the fire, but the smile came back again. Gentlemen of your profession, sir, continued Mr. Pickwick, see the worst side of human nature. All its disputes, all its ill will and bad blood, rise up before you. You know from your experience of juries, I mean no disparagement to you, or them, how much depends upon effect. And you are apt to attribute to others, a desire to use, for purposes of deception and self-interest, the very instruments which you, in pure honesty and honor of purpose, and with a laudable desire to do your utmost for your client. Know the temper and worth of so well, from constantly employing them yourselves. I really believe that to this circumstance may be attributed the vulgar but very general notion of your being, as a body, suspicious, distrustful, and overcautious. Conscious as I am, sir, of the disadvantage of making such a declaration to you, under such circumstances, I have come here, because I wish you distinctly to understand, as my friend Mr. Perker has said, that I am innocent of the falsehood laid to my charge. And although I am very well aware of the inestimable value of your assistance, sir, I must beg to add, that unless you sincerely believe this, I would rather be deprived of the aid of your talents than have the advantage of them. Long before the close of this address, which we are bound to say was of a very prosy character for Mr. Pickwick, the sergeant had relapsed into a state of abstraction. After some minutes, however, during which he had reassumed his pen, he appeared to be again aware of the presence of his clients, raising his head from the paper, he said, rather snappishly. Who is with me in this case? Mr. Funky, Sergeant Snubbin, replied the attorney. Funky, Funky, said the sergeant, I never heard the name before. He must be a very young man. Yes, he is a very young man, replied the attorney. He was only called the other day. Let me see, he has not been at the bar eight years yet. Ah, uh, I thought not, said the sergeant, in that sort of pitying tone in which ordinary folks would speak of a very helpless little child. Mr. F. Mallard, send round to Mr. Mr. Funkies, Holborn Court, Gray's Inn, interposed Perker. Holborn Court, by the by, is South Square now. Mr. Funky, and say I should be glad if he'd step here, a moment. Mr. Mallard departed to execute his commission. And Sergeant Snubbin relapsed into abstraction until Mr. Funky himself was introduced. Although an infant barrister, he was a full grown man. He had a very nervous manner and a painful hesitation in his speech. It did not appear to be a natural defect, but seemed rather the result of timidity, arising from the consciousness of being, kept down, by want of means, or interest, or connection, or impudence, as the case might be. He was overawed by the sergeant, and profoundly courteous to the attorney. I have not had the pleasure of seeing you before, Mr. Funky, said Sergeant Snubbin, with haughty condescension. Mr. Funky bowed. He had had the pleasure of seeing the sergeant, and of envying him too, with all a poor man's envy, for eight years and a quarter. You are with me in this case, I understand, said the sergeant. If Mr. Funky had been a rich man, he would have instantly sent for his clerk to remind him. If he had been a wise one, he would have applied his forefinger to his forehead, and endeavored to recollect, whether, in the multiplicity of his engagements, he had undertaken this one or not. But as he was neither rich nor wise, in this sense, at all events, he turned red, and bowed. Have you read the papers, Mr. Funky? inquired the sergeant. Here again, Mr. Funky should have professed to have forgotten all about the merits of the case. 
But as he had read such papers as had been laid before him in the course of the action, and had thought of nothing else, waking or sleeping, throughout the two months during which he had been retained as Mr. Sergeant Snubbins Jr., he turned a deeper red and bowed again. This is Mr. Pickwick, said the sergeant, waving his pen in the direction in which that gentleman was standing. Mr. Funky bowed to Mr. Pickwick, with a reverence which a first client must ever awaken, and again inclined his head towards his leader. Perhaps you will take Mr. Pickwick away, said the sergeant, and, 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 hear anything Mr. Pickwick may wish to communicate. We shall have a consultation, of course. With that hint that he had been interrupted quite long enough, Mr. Sergeant Snubbin, who had been gradually growing more and more abstracted, applied his glass to his eyes for an instant, bowed slightly round, and was once more deeply immersed in the case before him, which arose out of an interminable lawsuit. Originating in the act of an individual, deceased a century or so ago, who had stopped up a pathway leading from some place which nobody ever came from, to some other place which nobody ever went to. Mr. Funky would not hear of passing through any door until Mr. Pickwick and his solicitor had passed through before him, so it was some time before they got into the square. And when they did reach it, they walked up and down, and held a long conference, the result of which was, that it was a very difficult matter to say how the verdict would go, that nobody could presume to calculate on the issue of an action. That it was very lucky they had prevented the other party from getting Sergeant Snubbin, in other topics of doubt and consolation, common in such a position of affairs. Mr. Weller was then roused by his master from a sweet sleep of an hour's duration, and, bidding adieu to low ten, they returned to the city. Chapter 32 Describes, far more fully than the court newsman ever did, a bachelor's party, given by Mr. Bob Sawyer at his lodgings in the borough. There is a repose about Lant Street, in the borough, which sheds a gentle melancholy upon the soul. There are always a good many houses to let in the street, it is a by-street too, and its dullness is soothing. A house in Lant Street would not come within the denomination of a first-rate residence, in the strict acceptation of the term. But it is a most desirable spot nevertheless. If a man wished to abstract himself from the world, to remove himself from within the reach of temptation, to place himself beyond the possibility of any inducement to look out of the window, we should recommend him by all means go to Lant Street. In this happy retreat are colonized a few clear starches, a sprinkling of journeyman bookbinders, one or two prison agents for the insolvent court, several small housekeepers who are employed in the docks, a handful of mantua makers, and a seasoning of jobbing tailors. The majority of the inhabitants either direct their energies to the letting of furnished apartments, or devote themselves to the healthful and invigorating pursuit of mangling. The chief features in the still life of the street are green shutters, lodging bills, brass doorplates, and bell handles, the principal specimens of animated nature, the potboy, the muffin youth, and the baked potato man. The population is migratory, usually disappearing on the verge of quarter day, and generally by night. His Majesty's revenues are seldom collected in this happy valley, the rents are dubious, and the water communication is very frequently cut off. Mr. Bob Sawyer embellished one side of the fire, in his first floor front, early on the evening for which he had invited Mr. Pickwick, and Mr. Ben Allen the other. The preparations for the reception of visitors appeared to be completed. The umbrellas in the passage had been heaped into the little corner outside the back parlor door, the bonnet and shawl of the landlady's servant had been removed from the banisters. There were not more than two pairs of pattens on the street door mat, and a kitchen candle, with a very long snuff, burned cheerfully on the ledge of the staircase window. Mr. Bob Sawyer had himself purchased the spirits at a wine vaults in High Street, and had returned home preceding the bearer thereof, to preclude the possibility of their delivery at the wrong house. The punch was ready made in a red pan in the bedroom. A little table, covered with a green baize cloth, had been borrowed from the parlor, to play at cards on. And the glasses of the establishment, together with those which had been borrowed for the occasion from the public house, were all drawn up in a tray, which was deposited on the landing outside the door. Notwithstanding the highly satisfactory nature of all these arrangements, there was a cloud on the countenance of Mr. Bob Sawyer, as he sat by the fireside. 
there was a sympathizing expression, too, in the features of Mr. Ben Allen, as he gazed intently on the coals, and a tone of melancholy in his voice, as he said, after a long silence. Well, it is unlucky she should have taken it in her head to turn sour, just on this occasion. She might at least have waited till tomorrow. That's her malevolence, that's her malevolence, returned Mr. Bob Sawyer vehemently. She says that if I can afford to give a party I ought to be able to pay her confounded little bill. How long has it been running? inquired Mr. Ben Allen. A bill, by the by, is the most extraordinary locomotive engine that the genius of man ever produced. It would keep on running during the longest lifetime, without ever once stopping of its own accord. Only a quarter, and a month or so, replied Mr. Bob Sawyer. Ben Allen coughed hopelessly, and directed a searching look between the two top bars of the stove. It'll be a deuced unpleasant thing if she takes it into her head to let out, when those fellows are here, won't it, said Mr. Ben Allen at length. Horrible, replied Bob Sawyer, horrible. A low tap was heard at the room door. Mr. Bob Sawyer looked expressively at his friend, and bade the tapper come in. Whereupon a dirty, slipshod girl in black cotton stockings, who might have passed for the neglected daughter of a superannuated dustman in very reduced circumstances, thrust in her head, and said. Please, Mr. Sawyer. Mrs. Rattle wants to speak to you. Before Mr. Bob Sawyer could return any answer, the girl suddenly disappeared with a jerk, as if somebody had given her a violent pull behind. This mysterious exit was no sooner accomplished, than there was another tap at the door, a smart, pointed tap, which seemed to say, here I am, and in I'm coming. Mr. Bob Sawyer glanced at his friend with a look of abject apprehension, and once more cried, come in. The permission was not at all necessary, for, before Mr. Bob Sawyer had uttered the words, a little, fierce woman bounced into the room, all in a tremble with passion, and pale with rage. Now, Mr. Sawyer, said the little, fierce woman, trying to appear very calm, if you'll have the kindness to settle that little bill of mine I'll thank you, because I've got my rent to pay this afternoon, and my landlord's a waiting below now. Here the little woman rubbed her hands, and looked steadily over Mr. Bob Sawyer's head, at the wall behind him. I am very sorry to put you to any inconvenience, Mrs. Rattle, said Bob Sawyer deferentially, but. Oh, it isn't any inconvenience, replied the little woman, with a shrill titter. I didn't want it particular before today. Leastways, as it has to go to my landlord directly, it was as well for you to keep it as me. You promised me this afternoon, Mr. Sawyer, and every gentleman as has ever lived here, has kept his word, sir, as of course anybody as calls himself a gentleman does. Mrs. Rattle tossed her head, bit her lips, rubbed her hands harder, and looked at the wall more steadily than ever. It was plain to see, as Mr. Bob Sawyer remarked in a style of Eastern allegory on a subsequent occasion, that she was, getting the steam up. I am very sorry, Mrs. Rattle, said Bob Sawyer, with all imaginable humility, but the fact is, that I have been disappointed in the city today. Extraordinary place that city. An astonishing number of men always are getting disappointed there. Well, Mr. Sawyer, said Mrs. Rattle, planting herself firmly on a purple cauliflower in the Kidderminster carpet, and what's that to me, sir? I, I, have no doubt, Mrs. Rattle, said Bob Sawyer, blinking this last question, that before the middle of next week we shall be able to set ourselves quite square, and go on, on a better system, afterwards. This was all Mrs. Rattle wanted. She had bustled up to the apartment of the unlucky Bob Sawyer, so bent upon going into a passion, that, in all probability, payment would have rather disappointed her than otherwise. She was in excellent order for a little relaxation of the kind, having just exchanged a few introductory compliments with Mr. R., in the front kitchen. Do you suppose, Mr. Sawyer, said Mrs. Rattle, elevating her voice for the information of the neighbors, do you suppose that I may going day after day to let a feller occupy my lodgings as never thinks of paying his rent? 
nor even the very money laid out for the fresh butter and lump sugar that's bought for his breakfast, and the very milk that's took in, at the street door. Do you suppose a hard-working and industrious woman as has lived in this street for twenty year, ten year over the way, and nine year and three quarters in this very house, has nothing else to do but to work herself to death after a parcel of lazy idle fellers, that are always smoking and drinking, and lounging, when they ought to be glad to turn their hands to anything that would help them to pay their bills? Do you? My good soul, interposed Mr. Benjamin Allen soothingly. Have the goodness to keep your observations to yourself, sir, I beg, said Mrs. Rattle, suddenly arresting the rapid torrent of her speech, and addressing the third party with impressive slowness and solemnity. I am not or, sir, that you have any right to address your conversation to me. I don't think I let these apartments to you, sir. No, you certainly did not, said Mr. Benjamin Allen. Very good, sir, responded Mrs. Rattle, with lofty politeness. Then perhaps, sir, you'll confine yourself to breaking the arms and legs of the poor people in the hospitals, and keep yourself to yourself, sir, or there may be some persons here as will make you, sir. But you are such an unreasonable woman, remonstrated Mr. Benjamin Allen. I beg your pardon, young man, said Mrs. Rattle, in a cold perspiration of anger. But will you have the goodness just to call me that again, sir? I didn't make use of the word in any invidious sense, ma'am, replied Mr. Benjamin Allen, growing somewhat uneasy on his own account. I beg your pardon, young man, demanded Mrs. Rattle, in a louder and more imperative tone. But who do you call a woman? Did you make that remark to me, sir? Why, bless my heart, said Mr. Benjamin Allen. Did you apply that name to me, I ask of you, sir, interrupted Mrs. Rattle, with intense fierceness, throwing the door wide open. Why, of course I did, replied Mr. Benjamin Allen. Yes, of course you did, said Mrs. Rattle, backing gradually to the door, and raising her voice to its loudest pitch, for the special behoof of Mr. Rattle in the kitchen. Yes, of course you did. And everybody knows that they may safely insult me in my own goose while my husband sits sleeping downstairs, and taking no more notice than if I was a dog in the streets. He ought to be ashamed of himself, here Mrs. Rattle sobbed, to allow his wife to be treated in this way by a parcel of young cutters and carvers of live people's bodies, that disgraces the lodgings, another sob, and leaving her exposed to all manner of abuse. A base, faint-hearted, timorous wretch, that's afraid to come upstairs, and face the ruffinly creatures, that's afraid, that's afraid to come. Mrs. Rattle paused to listen whether the repetition of the taunt had roused her better half. And finding that it had not been successful, proceeded to descend the stairs with sobs innumerable, when there came a loud double knock at the street door. Whereupon she burst into an hysterical fit of weeping, accompanied with dismal moans, which was prolonged until the knock had been repeated six times, when, in an uncontrollable burst of mental agony, she threw down all the umbrellas, and disappeared into the back parlor, closing the door after her with an awful crash. Does Mr. Sawyer live here, said Mr. Pickwick, when the door was opened. Yes, said the girl, first floor. It's the door straight afore you, when you gets to the top of the stairs. Having given this instruction, the handmaid, who had been brought up among the aboriginal inhabitants of Southwark, disappeared, with the candle in her hand, down the kitchen stairs. Perfectly satisfied that she had done everything that could possibly be required of her under the circumstances. Mr. Snodgrass, who entered last, secured the street door, after several ineffectual efforts, by putting up the chain, and the friends stumbled upstairs, where they were received by Mr. Bob Sawyer, who had been afraid to go down, lest he should be waylaid by Mrs. Rattle. How are you, said the discomfited student. Glad to see you, take care of the glasses. This caution was addressed to Mr. Pickwick, who had put his hat in the tray. Dear me, said Mr. Pickwick, I beg your pardon. Don't mention it, don't mention it, said Bob Sawyer. I'm rather confined for room here, but you must put up with all that, when you come to see a young bachelor. Walk in. You've seen this gentleman before, I think. 
Mr. Pickwick shook hands with Mr. Benjamin Allen, and his friends followed his example. They had scarcely taken their seats when there was another double knock. I hope that's Jack Hopkins, said Mr. Bob Sawyer. Hush. Yes, it is. Come up, Jack, come up. A heavy footstep was heard upon the stairs, and Jack Hopkins presented himself. He wore a black velvet waistcoat, with thunder and lightning buttons, and a blue striped shirt, with a white false collar. You're late, Jack, said Mr. Benjamin Allen. Been detained at Bartholomew's, replied Hopkins. Anything new? No, nothing particular. Rather a good accident brought into the casualty ward. What was that, sir, inquired Mr. Pickwick. Only a man fallen out of a four pair of stairs window. But it's a very fair case indeed. Do you mean that the patient is in a fair way to recover, inquired Mr. Pickwick. No, replied Mr. Hopkins carelessly. No, I should rather say he wouldn't. There must be a splendid operation, though, tomorrow, magnificent sight if Slasher does it. You consider Mr. Slasher a good operator, said Mr. Pickwick. Best alive, replied Hopkins. Took a boy's leg out of the socket last week, boy ate five apples and a gingerbread cake, exactly two minutes after it was all over, boy said he wouldn't lie there to be made game of, and he'd tell his mother if they didn't begin. Dear me! said Mr. Pickwick, astonished. Pooh! That's nothing, that ain't, said Jack Hopkins. Is it, Bob? Nothing at all, replied Mr. Bob Sawyer. By the by, Bob, said Hopkins, with a scarcely perceptible glance at Mr. Pickwick's attentive face, we had a curious accident last night. A child was brought in, who had swallowed a necklace. Swallowed what, sir, interrupted Mr. Pickwick. A necklace, replied Jack Hopkins. Not all at once, you know, that would be too much, you couldn't swallow that, if the child did, Mr. Pickwick. Ha, ha. Mr. Hopkins appeared highly gratified with his own pleasantry, and continued, no, the way was this. Child's parents were poor people who lived in a court. Child's eldest sister bought a necklace, common necklace, made of large black wooden beads. Child being fond of toys, cribbed the necklace, hid it, played with it, cut the string, and swallowed a bead. Child thought it capital fun, went back next day, and swallowed another bead. Bless my heart, said Mr. Pickwick, what a dreadful thing. I beg your pardon, sir. Go on. Next day, child swallowed two beads, the day after that, he treated himself to three, and so on, till in a week's time he had got through the necklace, five and twenty beads in all. The sister, who was an industrious girl, and seldom treated herself to a bit of finery, cried her eyes out, at the loss of the necklace, looked high and low for it, but, I needn't say, didn't find it. A few days afterwards, the family were at dinner, baked shoulder of mutton, and potatoes under it, the child, who wasn't hungry, was playing about the room, when suddenly there was heard a devil of a noise, like a small hailstorm. Don't do that, my boy, said the father. I ain't a doin' nothing, said the child. Well, don't do it again, said the father. There was a short silence, and then the noise began again, worse than ever. If you don't mind what I say, my boy, said the father, you'll find yourself in bed, in something less than a pig's whisper. He gave the child a shake to make him obedient, and such a rattling ensued as nobody ever heard before. Why, damn, it's in the child, said the father, he's got the croup in the wrong place. No, I haven't, father, said the child, beginning to cry, it's the necklace, I swallowed it, father. The father caught the child up, and ran with him to the hospital, the beads in the boy's stomach rattling all the way with the jolting, and the people looking up in the air, and down in the cellars, to see where the unusual sound came from. He's in the hospital now, said Jack Hopkins, and he makes such a devil of a noise when he walks about, that they're obliged to muffle him in a watchman's coat, for fear he should wake the patients. That's the most extraordinary case I ever heard of, said Mr. Pickwick, with an emphatic blow on the table. 
Oh, that's nothing, said Jack Hopkins. Is it, Bob? Certainly not, replied Bob Sawyer. Very singular things occur in our profession, I can assure you, sir, said Hopkins. So I should be disposed to imagine, replied Mr. Pickwick. Another knock at the door announced a large-headed young man in a black wig, who brought with him a scorbutic youth in a long stock. The next comer was a gentleman in a shirt emblazoned with pink anchors, who was closely followed by a pale youth with a plated watchguard. The arrival of a prim personage in clean linen and cloth boots rendered the party complete. The little table with the green baize cover was wheeled out, the first installment of punch was brought in, in a white jug. And the succeeding three hours were devoted to Vingt Etienne at sixpence a dozen, which was only once interrupted by a slight dispute between the scorbutic youth and the gentleman with the pink anchors. In the course of which, the scorbutic youth intimated a burning desire to pull the nose of the gentleman with the emblems of hope. In reply to which, that individual expressed his decided unwillingness to accept of any sauce on gratuitous terms, either from the irascible young gentleman with the scorbutic countenance or any other person who was ornamented with a head. When the last natural had been declared, and the profit and loss account of fish and sixpences adjusted, to the satisfaction of all parties, Mr. Bob Sawyer rang for supper, and the visitors squeezed themselves into corners while it was getting ready. It was not so easily got ready as some people may imagine. First of all, it was necessary to awaken the girl, who had fallen asleep with her face on the kitchen table. This took a little time, and, even when she did answer the bell, another quarter of an hour was consumed in fruitless endeavors to impart to her a faint and distant glimmering of reason. The man to whom the order for the oysters had been sent, had not been told to open them, it is a very difficult thing to open an oyster with a limp knife and a two-pronged fork, and very little was done in this way. Very little of the beef was done either, and the ham, which was also from the German sausage shop round the corner, was in a similar predicament. However, there was plenty of porter in a tin can. And the cheese went a great way, for it was very strong. So upon the whole, perhaps, the supper was quite as good as such matters usually are. After supper, another jug of punch was put upon the table, together with a paper of cigars, and a couple of bottles of spirits. Then there was an awful pause. And this awful pause was occasioned by a very common occurrence in this sort of place, but a very embarrassing one notwithstanding. The fact is, the girl was washing the glasses. The establishment boasted for, we do not record the circumstance as at all derogatory to Mrs. Rattle, for there never was a lodging house yet, that was not short of glasses. The landlady's glasses were little, thin, blown glass tumblers, and those which had been borrowed from the public house were great, dropsical, bloated articles, each supported on a huge gouty leg. This would have been in itself sufficient to have possessed the company with the real state of affairs. But the young woman of all work had prevented the possibility of any misconception arising in the mind of any gentleman upon the subject, by forcibly dragging every man's glass away, long before he had finished his beer, and audibly stating. Despite the winks and interruptions of Mr. Bob Sawyer, that it was to be conveyed downstairs, and washed forthwith. It is a very ill wind that blows nobody any good. The prim man in the cloth boots, who had been unsuccessfully attempting to make a joke during the whole time the round game lasted, saw his opportunity, and availed himself of it. The instant the glasses disappeared, he commenced a long story about a great public character, whose name he had forgotten, making a particularly happy reply to another eminent and illustrious individual whom he had never been able to identify. He enlarged at some length and with great minuteness upon divers collateral circumstances, distantly connected with the anecdote in hand, but for the life of him he couldn't recollect at that precise moment what the anecdote was. Although he had been in the habit of telling the story with great applause for the last ten years. Dear me, said the prim man in the cloth boots, it is a very extraordinary circumstance. I am sorry you have forgotten it, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, glancing eagerly at the door, as he thought he heard the noise of glasses jingling, very sorry. So am I, responded the prim man, because I know it would have afforded so much amusement. Never mind, I dare say I shall manage to recollect it, in the course of half an hour or so. 
The prim man arrived at this point just as the glasses came back, when Mr. Bob Sawyer, who had been absorbed in attention during the whole time, said he should very much like to hear the end of it, for, so far as it went, it was, without exception, the very best story he had ever heard. The sight of the tumblers restored Bob Sawyer to a degree of equanimity which he had not possessed since his interview with his landlady. His face brightened up, and he began to feel quite convivial. Now, Betsy, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, with great suavity, and dispersing, at the same time, the tumultuous little mob of glasses the girl had collected in the center of the table, now, Betsy, the warm water, be brisk, there's a good girl. You can't have no warm water, replied Betsy. No warm water, exclaimed Mr. Bob Sawyer. No, said the girl, with a shake of the head which expressed a more decided negative than the most copious language could have conveyed. Mrs. Rattle said you weren't to have none. The surprise depicted on the countenances of his guests imparted new courage to the host. Bring up the warm water instantly, instantly, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, with desperate sternness. No. I can't, replied the girl, Mrs. Rattle raked out the kitchen fire afore she went to bed, and locked up the kittle. Oh, never mind, never mind. Pray don't disturb yourself about such a trifle, said Mr. Pickwick, observing the conflict of Bob Sawyer's passions, as depicted in his countenance, cold water will do very well. Oh, admirably, said Mr. Benjamin Allen. My landlady is subject to some slight attacks of mental derangement, remarked Bob Sawyer, with a ghastly smile, I fear I must give her warning. No, don't, said Ben Allen. I fear I must, said Bob, with heroic firmness. I'll pay her what I owe her, and give her warning tomorrow morning. Poor fellow! How devoutly he wished he could! Mr. Bob Sawyer's heart-sickening attempts to rally under this last blow, communicated a dispiriting influence to the company, the greater part of whom, with the view of raising their spirits, attached themselves with extra cordiality to the cold brandy and water, the first perceptible effects of which were displayed in a renewal of hostilities between the scorbutic youth and the gentleman in the shirt. The belligerents vented their feelings of mutual contempt, for some time, in a variety of frownings and snortings, until at last the scorbutic youth felt it necessary to come to a more explicit understanding on the matter. When the following clear understanding took place. Sawyer, said the scorbutic youth, in a loud voice. Well, naughty, replied Mr. Bob Sawyer. I should be very sorry, Sawyer, said Mr. Naughty, to create any unpleasantness at any friend's table, and much less at yours, Sawyer, very but I must take this opportunity of informing Mr. Gunter that he is no gentleman. And I should be very sorry, Sawyer, to create any disturbance in the street in which you reside, said Mr. Gunter, but I'm afraid I shall be under the necessity of alarming the neighbors by throwing the person who has just spoken, out o window. What do you mean by that, sir, inquired Mr. Naughty. What I say, sir, replied Mr. Gunter. I should like to see you do it, sir, said Mr. Naughty. You shall feel me do it in half a minute, sir, replied Mr. Gunter. I request that you'll favor me with your card, sir, said Mr. Naughty. I'll do nothing of the kind, sir, replied Mr. Gunter. Why not, sir, inquired Mr. Naughty. Because you'll stick it up over your chimney piece, and delude your visitors into the false belief that a gentleman has been to see you, sir, replied Mr. Gunter. Sir, a friend of mine shall wait on you in the morning said Mr. Naughty. Sir, I'm very much obliged to you for the caution, and I'll leave particular directions with the servant to lock up the spoons, replied Mr. Gunter. At this point the remainder of the guests interposed, and remonstrated with both parties on the impropriety of their conduct, on which Mr. Naughty begged to state that his father was quite as respectable as Mr. Gunter's father, to which Mr. Gunter replied that his father was to the full as respectable as Mr. Naughty's father, and that his father's son was as good a man as Mr. Naughty, any day in the week. As this announcement seemed the prelude to a recommencement of the dispute, there was another interference on the part of the company, and a vast quantity of talking and clamoring ensued, in the course of which Mr. Naughty gradually allowed his feelings to overpower him, 
and professed that he had ever entertained a devoted personal attachment towards Mr. Gunter. To this Mr. Gunter replied that, upon the whole, he rather preferred Mr. Noddy to his own brother. On hearing which admission, Mr. Noddy magnanimously rose from his seat, and proffered his hand to Mr. Gunter. Mr. Gunter grasped it with affecting fervor. And everybody said that the whole dispute had been conducted in a manner which was highly honorable to both parties concerned. Now, said Jack Hopkins, just to set us going again, Bob, I don't mind singing a song. And Hopkins, incited thereto by tumultuous applause, plunged himself at once into, The King, God Bless Him, which he sang as loud as he could, to a novel air, compounded of the, Bay of Biscay, and, A Frog He Would. The chorus was the essence of the song, and, as each gentleman sang it to the tune he knew best, the effect was very striking indeed. It was at the end of the chorus to the first verse, that Mr. Pickwick held up his hand in a listening attitude, and said, as soon as silence was restored. Hush! I beg your pardon. I thought I heard somebody calling from upstairs. A profound silence immediately ensued, and Mr. Bob Sawyer was observed to turn pale. I think I hear it now, said Mr. Pickwick. Have the goodness to open the door. The door was no sooner opened than all doubt on the subject was removed. Mr. Sawyer. Mr. Sawyer. Screamed a voice from the two-pair landing. It's my landlady, said Bob Sawyer, looking round him with great dismay. Yes, Mrs. Rattle. What do you mean by this, Mr. Sawyer, replied the voice, with great shrillness and rapidity of utterance. Ain't it enough to be swindled out of one's rent, and money lent out of pocket besides, and abused and insulted by your friends that dares to call themselves men, without having the house turned out of the window? And noise enough made to bring the fire engines here, at two o'clock in the morning? Turn them wretches away. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves, said the voice of Mr. Rattle which appeared to proceed from beneath some distant bedclothes. Ashamed of themselves, said Mrs. Rattle. Why don't you go down and knock em everyone downstairs? You would if you was a man. I should if I was a dozen men, my dear, replied Mr. Rattle pacifically, but they have the advantage of me in numbers, my dear. Ugh, you coward, replied Mrs. Rattle, with supreme contempt. Do you mean to turn them wretches out? or not, Mr. Sawyer. They're going, Mrs. Rattle, they're going, said the miserable Bob. I am afraid you'd better go, said Mr. Bob Sawyer to his friends. I thought you were making too much noise. It's a very unfortunate thing, said the prim man. Just as we were getting so comfortable too. The prim man was just beginning to have a dawning recollection of the story he had forgotten. It's hardly to be born, said the prim man, looking round. Hardly to be born, is it? Not to be endured, replied Jack Hopkins, let's have the other verse, Bob. Come, here goes. No, no, Jack, don't, interposed Bob Sawyer. It's a capital song, but I am afraid we had better not have the other verse. They are very violent people, the people of the house. Shall I step upstairs, and pitch into the landlord? Inquired Hopkins, or keep on ringing the bell, or go and groan on the staircase. You may command me, Bob. I am very much indebted to you for your friendship and good nature, Hopkins, said the wretched mister. Bob Sawyer, but I think the best plan to avoid any further dispute is for us to break up at once. Now, Mr. Sawyer, screamed the shrill voice of Mrs. Rattle, are them brutes going? They're only looking for their hats, Mrs. Rattle, said Bob. They are going directly. Going, said Mrs. Rattle, thrusting her nightcap over the banisters just as Mr. Pickwick, followed by Mr. Tupman, emerged from the sitting room. Going. What did they ever come for? My dear ma'am, remonstrated Mr. Pickwick, looking up. Get along with you, old wretch replied Mrs. Rattle, hastily withdrawing the nightcap. Old enough to be his grandfather, you willin. You're worse than any of M. Mr. Pickwick found it in vain to protest his innocence, so hurried downstairs into the street, 
whither he was closely followed by Mr. Tupman, Mr. Winkle, and Mr. Snodgrass. Mr. Ben Allen, who was dismally depressed with spirits and agitation, accompanied them as far as London Bridge, and in the course of the walk confided to Mr. Winkle, as an especially eligible person to entrust the secret to, that he was resolved to cut the throat of any gentleman, except Mr. Bob Sawyer, who should aspire to the affections of his sister Arabella. Having expressed his determination to perform this painful duty of a brother with proper firmness, he burst into tears, knocked his hat over his eyes, and, making the best of his way back, knocked double knocks at the door of the borough market office, and took short naps on the steps alternately, until daybreak, under the firm impression that he lived there, and had forgotten the key. The visitors having all departed, in compliance with the rather pressing request of Mrs. Rattle, the luckless Mr. Bob Sawyer was left alone, to meditate on the probable events of tomorrow, and the pleasures of the evening. Chapter 33 Mr. Weller the Elder delivers some critical sentiments respecting literary composition. And, assisted by his son Samuel, pays a small installment of retaliation to the account of the reverend gentleman with the red nose. The morning of the 13th of February, which the readers of this authentic narrative know, as well as we do, to have been the day immediately preceding that which was appointed for the trial of Mrs. Bardell's action, was a busy time for Mr. Samuel Weller, who was perpetually engaged in travelling from the George and Vulture to Mr. Perker's chambers and back again, from and between the hours of nine o'clock in the morning and two in the afternoon, both inclusive. Not that there was anything whatever to be done, for the consultation had taken place, and the course of proceeding to be adopted, had been finally determined on, but Mr. Pickwick being in a most extreme state of excitement, persevered in constantly sending small notes to his attorney, merely containing the inquiry, Dear Perker. Is all going on well? To which Mr. Perker invariably forwarded the reply, Dear Pickwick. As well as possible, the fact being, as we have already hinted, that there was nothing whatever to go on, either well or ill, until the sitting of the court on the following morning. But people who go voluntarily to law, or are taken forcibly there, for the first time, may be allowed to labor under some temporary irritation and anxiety. And Sam, with a due allowance for the frailties of human nature, obeyed all his master's behests with that imperturbable good humor and unruffable composure which formed one of his most striking and amiable characteristics. Sam had solaced himself with a most agreeable little dinner, and was waiting at the bar for the glass of warm mixture in which Mr. Pickwick had requested him to drown the fatigues of his morning's walks, when a young boy of about three feet high, or thereabouts, in a hairy cap and fustian overalls, whose garb bespoke a laudable ambition to attain in time the elevation of an hostler, entered the passage of the George and Vulture, and looked first up the stairs, and then along the passage, and then into the bar, as if in search of somebody to whom he bore a commission. Whereupon the barmaid, conceiving it not improbable that the said commission might be directed to the tea or table spoons of the establishment, accosted the boy with. Now, young man, what do you want? Is there anybody here, named Sam? inquired the youth, in a loud voice of treble quality. What's the t'other name? said Sam Weller, looking round. How should I know? briskly replied the young gentleman below the hairy cap. You're a sharp boy, you are, said Mr. Weller. Only I wouldn't show that wary fine edge too much, if I was you, in case anybody took it off. What do you mean by comin' to a hot hell, and asking arter Sam, with as much politeness as a vilt Indian? Cause an old gen LMN told me to, replied the boy. What old gen LMN, inquired Sam, with deep disdain. Him as drives a Ipswich coach, and uses our parlor, rejoined the boy. He told me yesterday morning to come to the George and Wolter this afternoon and ask for Sam. It's my father, my dear, said Mr. Weller, turning with an explanatory air to the young lady in the bar. Blessed if I think he hardly knows what my other name is. Well, young broccoli sprout, what then? Why then, said the boy, you was to come to him at six o'clock to our goose, cause he wants to see you, blue boar, let an all market. Shall I say you're coming? You may venture on that air statement, sir, 
replied Sam. And thus empowered, the young gentleman walked away, awakening all the echoes in George Yard as he did so, with several chaste and extremely correct imitations of a drover's whistle, delivered in a tone of peculiar richness and volume. Mr. Weller having obtained leave of absence from Mr. Pickwick, who, in his then state of excitement and worry, was by no means displeased at being left alone, set forth, long before the appointed hour, and having plenty of time at his disposal, sauntered down as far as the mansion house. Where he paused and contemplated, with a face of great calmness and philosophy, the numerous cads and drivers of short stages who assemble near that famous place of resort. To the great terror and confusion of the old lady population of these realms. Having loitered here, for half an hour or so, Mr. Weller turned, and began wending his way towards Leadenhall Market, through a variety of by-streets and courts. As he was sauntering away his spare time, and stopped to look at almost every object that met his gaze, it is by no means surprising that Mr. Weller should have paused before a small stationer's and print seller's window. But without further explanation it does appear surprising that his eyes should have no sooner rested on certain pictures which were exposed for sale therein, than he gave a sudden start, smote his right leg with great vehemence, and exclaimed. With energy, if it hadn't been for this, I should have forgot all about it, till it was too late. The particular picture on which Sam Weller's eyes were fixed, as he said this, was a highly colored representation of a couple of human hearts skewered together with an arrow, cooking before a cheerful fire. While a male and female cannibal in modern attire, the gentleman being clad in a blue coat and white trousers, and the lady in a deep red pelisse with a parasol of the same, were approaching the meal with hungry eyes. Up a serpentine gravel path leading thereunto. A decidedly indelicate young gentleman, in a pair of wings and nothing else, was depicted as superintending the cooking, a representation of the spire of the church in Langham Place, London, appeared in the distance. And the whole formed at the valentine, of which, as a written inscription in the window testified, there was a large assortment within, which the shopkeeper pledged himself to dispose of, to his countrymen generally. At the reduced rate of one and sixpence each. I should ha forgot it, I should certainly ha forgot it, said Sam. So saying, he at once stepped into the stationer's shop, and requested to be served with a sheet of the best gilt-edged letter paper, and a hard-nibbed pen which could be warranted not to splutter. These articles having been promptly supplied, he walked on direct towards Leadenhall Market at a good round pace, very different from his recent lingering one. Looking round him, he there beheld a signboard on which the painter's art had delineated something remotely resembling a cerulean elephant with an aquiline nose in lieu of trunk. Rightly conjecturing that this was the blue boar himself, he stepped into the house, and inquired concerning his parent. He won't be here this three-quarters of an hour or more, said the young lady who superintended the domestic arrangements of the blue boar. Very good, my dear, replied Sam. Let me have nine penatho, brandy and water luke, and the inkstand, will you, miss? The brandy and water luke, and the inkstand, having been carried into the little parlor, and the young lady having carefully flattened down the coals to prevent their blazing, and carried away the poker to preclude the possibility of the fire being stirred, without the full privity and concurrence of the blue boar being first had and obtained, Sam Weller sat himself down in a box near the stove and pulled out the sheet of gilt-edged letter paper, and the hard-nibbed pen. Then looking carefully at the pen to see that there were no hairs in it, and dusting down the table, so that there might be no crumbs of bread under the paper, Sam tucked up the cuffs of his coat, squared his elbows, and composed himself to write. To ladies and gentlemen who are not in the habit of devoting themselves practically to the science of penmanship, writing a letter is no very easy task. It being always considered necessary in such cases for the writer to recline his head on his left arm, so as to place his eyes as nearly as possible on a level with the paper, and, while glancing sideways at the letters he is constructing, to form with his tongue imaginary characters to correspond. These motions, although unquestionably of the greatest assistance to original composition, retard in some degree the progress of the writer. And Sam had unconsciously been a full hour and a half writing words in small text, smearing out wrong letters with his little finger, 
and putting in new ones which required going over very often to render them visible through the old blots. When he was roused by the opening of the door and the entrance of his parent. Vel, Sammy, said the father. Vel, my Prussian blue, responded the son, laying down his pen. What's the last bulletin about mother-in-law? Mrs. Veller passed a very good night, but is uncommon perverse, and unpleasant this morning. Signed upon oath, Tony Veller, Esquire. That's the last one as was issued, Sammy, replied Mr. Weller, untying his shawl. No better yet, inquired Sam. All the symptoms aggravated, replied Mr. Weller, shaking his head. But what's that, you're a doin' of? Pursuit of knowledge under difficulties, Sammy. I've done now, said Sam, with slight embarrassment, I've been a writin' dot. So I see, replied Mr. Weller. Not to any young woman, I hope, Sammy. Why, it's no use a sayin', it ain't, replied Sam, it's a wallentine. A what, exclaimed Mr. Weller, apparently horror-stricken by the word. A wallentine, replied Sam. Samavel, Samavel, said Mr. Weller, in reproachful accents, I didn't think you'd ha done it. Arter the warning you've had o' oh, your father's wishes propensities, arter all I've said to you upon this here wary subject. Arter actually seein' and bein' in the company o' oh, your own mother-in-law, bitch I should ha thought was a moral lesson as no man could never ha forgotten to his dying day. I didn't think you'd ha done it, Sammy, I didn't think you'd ha done it. These reflections were too much for the good old man. He raised Sam's tumbler to his lips and drank off its contents. What's the matter now, said Sam. Never mind, Sammy, replied Mr. Weller, it'll be a wary agonison trial to me at my time of life, but I'm pretty tough, that's one consolation, as the wary old turkey remarked when the farmer said he was afeard he should be obliged to kill him for the London market. What'll be a trial, inquired Sam. To see you married, Sammy, to see you a deluded victim, and thinkin', in your innocence that it's all wary capital, replied Mr. Weller. It's a dreadful trial to a father's feelings, that air, Sammy. Nonsense, said Sam. I ain't a goin' to get married, don't you fret yourself about that, I know you're a judge of these things. Order in your pipe and I'll read you the letter. There. We cannot distinctly say whether it was the prospect of the pipe, or the consolatory reflection that a fatal disposition to get married ran in the family, and couldn't be helped, which calmed Mr. Weller's feelings, and caused his grief to subside. We should be rather disposed to say that the result was attained by combining the two sources of consolation, for he repeated the second in a low tone, very frequently. Ringing the bell meanwhile, to order in the first. He then divested himself of his upper coat. And lighting the pipe and placing himself in front of the fire with his back towards it, so that he could feel its full heat, and recline against the mantelpiece at the same time, turned towards Sam, and, with a countenance greatly mollified by the softening influence of tobacco, requested him to fire away. Sam dipped his pen into the ink to be ready for any corrections, and began with a very theatrical air. Lovely. Stop, said Mr. Weller, ringing the bell. A double glass, oh, the invariable, my dear. Very well, sir, replied the girl. Who with great quickness appeared, vanished, returned, and disappeared. They seem to know your ways here, observed Sam. Yes, replied his father, I've been here before, in my time. Go on, Sammy. Lovely creeter, repeated Sam. Taint in poetry, is it, interposed his father. No, no, replied Sam. Wery glad to hear it, said Mr. Weller. Poetry's a nut row. No man ever talked poetry except a beetle on bushing day, or Warren's blacken, or Roland's oil, or some of them low fellows, never you let yourself down to talk poetry, my boy. Begin again, Sammy. Mr. Weller resumed his pipe with critical solemnity, and Sam once more commenced, and read as follows. Lovely creeter I feel myself a damned. That ain't proper, said Mr. Weller, 
taking his pipe from his mouth. No. It ain't damned, observed Sam, holding the letter up to the light, it's shamed, there's a blot there, I feel myself ashamed. Very good, said Mr. Weller. Go on. Feel myself ashamed, and completely C.I.R., I forget what this here word is, said Sam, scratching his head with the pen, in vain attempts to remember. Why don't you look at it, then, inquired Mr. Weller. So I am a lookin' at it, replied Sam, but there's another blot. Here's a C, and a I, and a D. Circumvented, piraps, suggested Mr. Weller. No, it ain't that, said Sam, circumscribed, that's it. That ain't as good a word as circumvented, Sammy, said Mr. Weller gravely. Think not, said Sam. Nothing like it, replied his father. But don't you think it means more, inquired Sam. Vel piraps it's a more tender word, said Mr. Weller, after a few moments' reflection. Go on, Sammy. Feel myself ashamed and completely circumscribed in a dressin' of you, for you are a nice gal and nothin' but it. That's a wary pretty sentiment, said the elder Mr. Weller, removing his pipe to make way for the remark. Yes, I think it is rather good, observed Sam, highly flattered. What I like in that air style of writin', said the elder Mr. Weller, is, that there ain't no callin' names in it, no one uses, nor nothin', oh, that kind. What's the good o, oh, callin', a young woman a weenus or a angel, Sammy? Ah. What, indeed, replied Sam. You might jist as well call her a griffin, or a unicorn, or a king's arms at once, which is very well known to be a collection o, oh, fabulous animals, added Mr. Weller. Just as well, replied Sam. Drive on, Sammy, said Mr. Weller. Sam complied with the request, and proceeded as follows, his father continuing to smoke, with a mixed expression of wisdom and complacency, which was particularly edifying. Afore I see you, I thought all women was alike. So they are, observed the elder Mr. Weller parenthetically. But now, continued Sam, now I find what a reglar soft-headed, Incredlaus turnip I must hop bin, for there ain't nobody like you, though I like you better than nothin' at all. I thought it best to make that rather strong, said Sam, looking up. Mr. Weller nodded approvingly, and Sam resumed. So I take the privilege of the day, Mary, my dear, as the Gen L M N in difficulties did, then he walked out of a Sunday, to tell you that the first and only time I see you. Your likeness was took on my heart in much quicker time and brighter colors than ever a likeness was took by the profil machine, which pure apps you may have heard on Mary my dear, although it does finish a portrait and put the frame and glass on complete. With a hook at the end to hang it up by, and all in two minutes and a quarter. I am afeard that words on the poetical, Sammy, said Mr. Weller dubiously. No, it don't, replied Sam, reading on very quickly, to avoid contesting the point. Accept of me Mary my dear as your Wallentine and think over what I've said. My dear Mary the first will now conclude. That's all, said Sam. That's rather a sudden pull-up, ain't it, Sammy, inquired Mr. Weller. Not a bit on it, said Sam, she'll wish there was more, and that's the great art o oh, letter writin' dot. Well, said Mr. Weller, there's something in that and I wish your mother-in-law, U.D., only conduct her conversation on the same genteel principle. Ain't you a goin' to sign it? That's the difficulty, said Sam, I don't know what to sign it. Sign it, Veller, said the oldest surviving proprietor of that name. Won't do, said Sam. Never sign a Wallentine with your own name. Sign it, Pickwick, then, said Mr. Weller, it's a wary good name, and a easy one to spell. The wary thing, said Sam. I could end with a worse, what do you think? I don't like it, Sam, rejoined Mr. Weller. I never knowed a respectable coachman as wrote poetry, cept one, as made an affectant copy, oh, worse as the night afore he was hung for a highway robbery, and he was only a Camberville man, so even that's no rule. But Sam was not to be dissuaded from the poetical idea that had occurred to him, so he signed the letter. 
your love sick. Pickwick. And having folded it, in a very intricate manner, squeezed a downhill direction in one corner, to Mary, housemaid, at Mr. Nupkins's, Mayor's, Ipswich, Suffolk, and put it into his pocket, wafered, and ready for the general post. This important business having been transacted, Mr. Weller the elder proceeded to open that, on which he had summoned his son. The first matter relates to your governor, Sammy, said Mr. Weller. He's a goin' to be tried tomorrow, ain't he? The trial's a comin' on, replied Sam. Vell, said Mr. Weller, now I suppose he'll want to call some witnesses to speak to his character, or peer apps to prove a alibi. I've been aethin' the business over in my mind, and he may make hisself easy, Sammy. I've got some friends as'll do either for him, but my advice you'd be this here, never mind the character, and stick to the alibi. Nothing like a alibi, Sammy, nothing. Mr. Weller looked very profound as he delivered this legal opinion, and burying his nose in his tumbler, winked over the top thereof, at his astonished son. Why, what do you mean? said Sam. You don't think he's a goin' to be tried at the old Bailey, do you? That ain't no part of the present consideration, Sammy, replied Mr. Weller. Verever he's a goin' to be tried, my boy, a alibi's the thing to get him off. V got Tom Vildspark off that air manslaughter, with a alibi, then all the big vigs to a man said as nothing couldn't save him. And my opinion is, Sammy, that if your governor don't prove a alibi, he'll be what the Italians call Reg Larley flummoxed, and that's all about it. As the elder Mr. Weller entertained a firm and unalterable conviction that the Old Bailey was the Supreme Court of Judicature in this country, and that its rules and forms of proceeding regulated and controlled the practice of all other courts of justice whatsoever. He totally disregarded the assurances and arguments of his son, tending to show that the alibi was inadmissible and vehemently protested that Mr. Pickwick was being victimized. Finding that it was of no use to discuss the matter further, Sam changed the subject, and inquired what the second topic was, on which his revered parent wished to consult him. That's a pint o' domestic policy, Sammy, said Mr. Weller. This here Stiggins. Red-nosed man, inquired Sam. The wary same, replied Mr. Weller. This here red-nosed man, Sammy, wisits your mother-in-law with a kindness and constancy I never see equaled. He's sich a friend o' the family, Sammy, that when he's avey from us, he can't be comfortable unless he has something to remember us by. And I'd give him something as U.D. Turpentine and beeswax his memory for the next ten years or so, if I was you, interposed Sam. Stop a minute, said Mr. Weller. I was a going to say, he always brings now, a flat bottle as holds about a pint and a half, and fills it with the pineapple rum afore he goes avy. And empties it afore he comes back, I suppose, said Sam. Clean, replied Mr. Weller. Never leaves nothing in it but the cork and the smell, trust him for that, Sammy. Now, these here fellows, my boy, are a goin' tonight to get up the monthly meetin' o oh, the Brick Lane Branch o oh, the United Grand Junction Ebenezer Temperance Association. Your mother-in-law was a goin', Sammy, but she's got the rheumatics, and can't, and I, Sammy, I've got the two tickets as was sent her. Mr. Weller communicated this secret with great glee, and winked so indefatigably after doing so, that Sam began to think he must have got the tick dollaroo in his right eyelid. Well, said that young gentleman. Well, continued his progenitor, looking round him very cautiously, you and I'll go, punctual to the time. The deputy shepherd won't, Sammy, the deputy shepherd won't. Here Mr. Weller was seized with a paroxysm of chuckles, which gradually terminated in as near an approach to a choke as an elderly gentleman can, with safety, sustain. Well, I never see sich an old ghost in all my born days, exclaimed Sam, rubbing the old gentleman's back, hard enough to set him on fire with the friction. What are you a Logan at, corpulence? Hush! Sammy, said Mr. Weller, looking round him with increased caution, and speaking in a whisper. Two friends, oh, mine, as works the Oxford Road, and is up to all kinds, oh, games, 
has got the deputy shepherd safe in tow, Sammy. And then he does come to the Ebenezer Junction, which he's sure to do, for they'll see him to the door, and shove him in, if necessary, he'll be as far gone in rum and water, as ever he was at the Marcus O. Granby, Dorkin. And that's not saying a little neither. And with this, Mr. Weller once more laughed immoderately, and once more relapsed into a state of partial suffocation, in consequence. Nothing could have been more in accordance with Sam Weller's feelings than the projected exposure of the real propensities and qualities of the red-nosed man. And it being very near the appointed hour of meeting, the father and son took their way at once to Brick Lane, Sam not forgetting to drop his letter into a general post office as they walked along. The monthly meetings of the Brick Lane branch of the United Grand Junction Ebenezer Temperance Association were held in a large room, pleasantly and airily situated at the top of a safe and commodious ladder. The president was the straight-walking Mr. Anthony Hum, a converted fireman, now a schoolmaster, and occasionally an itinerant preacher, and the secretary was Mr. Jonas Mudge, Chandler's shopkeeper, an enthusiastic and disinterested vessel, who sold tea to the members. Previous to the commencement of business, the ladies sat upon forms, and drank tea, till such time as they considered it expedient to leave off. And a large wooden money box was conspicuously placed upon the green baize cloth of the business table, behind which the secretary stood, and acknowledged, with a gracious smile, every addition to the rich vein of copper which lay concealed within. On this particular occasion the women drank tea to a most alarming extent, greatly to the horror of Mr. Weller, Sr., who, utterly regardless of all Sam's admonitory nudgings, stared about him in every direction with the most undisguised astonishment. Sammy, whispered Mr. Weller, if some o' oh, these here people don't want tappin, tomorrow mornin', I ain't your father, and that's what it is. Why? This here old lady next me is a drowndin' herself in tea. Be quiet, can't you, murmured Sam. Sam, whispered Mr. Weller, a moment afterwards, in a tone of deep agitation, mark my words, my boy. If that, air secretary fellow keeps on for only five minutes more, he'll blow hisself up with toast and water. Well, let him, if he likes, replied Sam. It ain't no business o' oh, yourn. If this here lasts much longer, Sammy, said Mr. Weller, in the same low voice, I shall feel it my duty, as a human being, to rise and address the cheer. There's a young woman on the next form but two, as has drunk nine breakfast cups and a half, and she's a swellin' wisely before my wary eyes. There is little doubt that Mr. Weller would have carried his benevolent intention into immediate execution, if a great noise, occasioned by putting up the cups and saucers, had not very fortunately announced that the tea-drinking was over. The crockery having been removed, the table with the green baize cover was carried out into the center of the room, and the business of the evening was commenced by a little emphatic man, with a bald head and drab shorts, who suddenly rushed up the ladder, at the imminent peril of snapping the two little legs encased in the drab shorts, and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I move our excellent brother, Mr. Anthony Hum, into the chair. The ladies waved a choice selection of pocket handkerchiefs at this proposition, and the impetuous little man literally moved Mr. Hum into the chair, by taking him by the shoulders and thrusting him into a mahogany frame which had once represented that article of furniture. The waving of handkerchiefs was renewed, and Mr. Hum, who was a sleek, white-faced man, in a perpetual perspiration, bowed meekly, to the great admiration of the females, and formally took his seat. Silence was then proclaimed by the little man in the drab shorts, and Mr. Hum rose and said, that, with the permission of his Brick Lane branch brothers and sisters, then and there present, the secretary would read the report of the Brick Lane branch committee a proposition which was again received with a demonstration of pocket handkerchiefs. The secretary having sneezed in a very impressive manner, and the cough which always seizes an assembly, when anything particular is going to be done, having been duly performed. The following document was read. Report of the Committee of the Brick Lane Branch of the United Grand Junction Ebenezer Temperance Association. Your committee have pursued their grateful labors during the past month. 
and have the unspeakable pleasure of reporting the following additional cases of converts to temperance. H. Walker, Taylor, wife, and two children. When in better circumstances, owns to having been in the constant habit of drinking ale and beer. Says he is not certain whether he did not twice a week, for twenty years, taste, dog's nose, which your committee find upon inquiry, to be compounded of warm porter, moist sugar, gin, and nutmeg, a groan, and, so it is, from an elderly female. Is now out of work and penniless, thinks it must be the porter, cheers, or the loss of the use of his right hand. Is not certain which, but thinks it very likely that, if he had drunk nothing but water all his life, his fellow workmen would never have stuck a rusty needle in him, and thereby occasioned his accident, tremendous cheering. Has nothing but cold water to drink, and never feels thirsty, great applause. Betsy Martin, widow, one child, and one eye. Goes out chairing and washing, by the day. Never had more than one eye, but knows her mother drank bottled stout, and shouldn't wonder if that caused it, immense cheering. Thinks it not impossible that if she had always abstained from spirits she might have had two eyes by this time, tremendous applause. Used, at every place she went to, to have eighteen pence a day, a pint of porter, and a glass of spirits. But since she became a member of the Brick Lane branch, has always demanded three and sixpence, the announcement of this most interesting fact was received with deafening enthusiasm. Henry Beller was for many years toastmaster at various corporation dinners, during which time he drank a great deal of foreign wine, may sometimes have carried a bottle or two home with him. Is not quite certain of that, but is sure if he did, that he drank the contents. Feels very low and melancholy, is very feverish, and has a constant thirst upon him, thinks it must be the wine he used to drink, cheers. Is out of employ now. And never touches a drop of foreign wine by any chance, tremendous plaudits. Thomas Burton is purveyor of cat's meat to the Lord Mayor and Sheriffs, and several members of the Common Council, the announcement of this gentleman's name was received with breathless interest. Has a wooden leg. Finds a wooden leg expensive, going over the stones, used to wear second-hand wooden legs, and drink a glass of hot gin and water regularly every night, sometimes two, deep sighs. Found the second-hand wooden leg split and rot very quickly. Is firmly persuaded that their constitution was undermined by the gin and water, prolonged cheering. Buys new wooden legs now, and drinks nothing but water and weak tea. The new legs last twice as long as the others used to do, and he attributes this solely to his temperate habits, triumphant cheers, dot. Anthony Hum now moved that the assembly do regale itself with a song. With a view to their rational and moral enjoyment, Brother Mordlin had adapted the beautiful words of, Who hasn't heard of a jolly young waterman? To the tune of the old hundredth, which he would request them to join him in singing, great applause. He might take that opportunity of expressing his firm persuasion that the late Mr. Dibden, seeing the errors of his former life, had written that song to show the advantages of abstinence. It was a temperance song, whirlwinds of cheers. The neatness of the young man's attire, the dexterity of his feathering, the enviable state of mind which enabled him in the beautiful words of the poet, to row along, thinking of nothing at all. All combined to prove that he must have been a water drinker, cheers. Oh, what a state of virtuous jollity! Rapturous cheering! And what was the young man's reward? Let all young men present mark this. The maidens all flocked to his boat so readily. Loud cheers, in which the ladies joined. What a bright example! The sisterhood, the maidens, flocking round the young waterman, and urging him along the stream of duty and of temperance. But, was it the maidens of humble life only, who soothed, consoled, and supported him? No. He was always first oars with the fine city ladies. Immense cheering. The soft sex to a man, he begged pardon, to a female, rallied round the young waterman, and turned with disgust from the drinker of spirits, cheers. The Brick Lane Branch brothers were watermen, cheers and laughter. That room was their boat, that audience were the maidens, and he, Mr. Anthony Hum, however unworthily, was first oars, unbounded applause. 
What does he mean by the soft sex, Sammy, inquired Mr. Weller, in a whisper. The woman, said Sam, in the same tone. He ain't far out there, Sammy, replied Mr. Weller. They must be a soft sex, a wary soft sex, indeed, if they let themselves be gammoned by such fellers as him. Any further observations from the indignant old gentleman were cut short by the announcement of the song, which Mr. Anthony Hum gave out two lines at a time, for the information of such of his hearers as were unacquainted with the legend. While it was being sung, the little man with the drab shorts disappeared. He returned immediately on its conclusion, and whispered Mr. Anthony Hum, with a face of the deepest importance. My friends, said Mr. Hum, holding up his hand in a deprecatory manner, to bespeak the silence of such of the stout old ladies as were yet a line or two behind, my friends, a delegate from the dorking branch of our society, Brother Stiggins, attends below. Out came the pocket handkerchiefs again, in greater force than ever, for Mr. Stiggins was excessively popular among the female constituency of Brick Lane. He may approach, I think, said Mr. Hum, looking round him, with a fat smile. Brother Tadger, let him come forth and greet us. The little man in the drab shorts who answered to the name of Brother Tadger, bustled down the ladder with great speed, and was immediately afterwards heard tumbling up with the Reverend Mr. Stiggins. He's a comin', Sammy, whispered Mr. Weller, purple in the countenance with suppressed laughter. Don't say nothin', to me, replied Sam, for I can't bear it. He's close to the door. I hear him a knockin', his head again the lath and plaster now. As Sam Weller spoke, the little door flew open, and Brother Tadger appeared, closely followed by the Reverend Mr. Stiggins, who no sooner entered, then there was a great clapping of hands, and stamping of feet, and flourishing of handkerchiefs. To all of which manifestations of delight, Brother Stiggins returned no other acknowledgement than staring with a wild eye, and a fixed smile, at the extreme top of the wick of the candle on the table, swaying his body to and fro, meanwhile, in a very unsteady and uncertain manner. Are you unwell, Brother Stiggins? whispered Mr. Anthony Hum. I am all right, sir replied Mr. Stiggins, in a tone in which ferocity was blended with an extreme thickness of utterance, I am all right, sir. Oh, very well, rejoined Mr. Anthony Hum, retreating a few paces. I believe no man here has ventured to say that I am not all right, sir, said Mr. Stiggins. Oh, certainly not, said Mr. Hum. I should advise him not to, sir, I should advise him not, said Mr. Stiggins. By this time the audience were perfectly silent, and waited with some anxiety for the resumption of business. Will you address the meeting, brother, said Mr. Hum, with a smile of invitation. No, sir, rejoined Mr. Stiggins, no, sir. I will not, sir. The meeting looked at each other with raised eyelids, and a murmur of astonishment ran through the room. It's my opinion, sir, said Mr. Stiggins, unbuttoning his coat, and speaking very loudly, it's my opinion, sir, that this meeting is drunk, sir. Brother Tadger, sir, said Mr. Stiggins, suddenly increasing in ferocity, and turning sharp round on the little man in the drab shorts, you are drunk, sir. With this, Mr. Stiggins, entertaining a praiseworthy desire to promote the sobriety of the meeting, and to exclude therefrom all improper characters, hit Brother Tadger on the summit of the nose with such unerring aim. That the drab shorts disappeared like a flash of lightning. Brother Tadger had been knocked, head first, down the ladder. Upon this, the women set up a loud and dismal screaming, and rushing in small parties before their favorite brothers, flung their arms around them to preserve them from danger. An instance of affection, which had nearly proved fatal to Hum, who, being extremely popular, was all but suffocated, by the crowd of female devotees that hung about his neck, and heaped caresses upon him. The greater part of the lights were quickly put out, and nothing but noise and confusion resounded on all sides. Now, Sammy, said Mr. Weller, taking off his greatcoat with much deliberation, just you step out, and fetch in a watchman. And what are you a-goin' to do, the while, inquired Sam. 
Never you mind me, Sammy, replied the old gentleman, I shall occupy myself in having a small settlement with that Air Stiggins. Before Sam could interfere to prevent it, his heroic parent had penetrated into a remote corner of the room, and attacked the Reverend Mr. Stiggins with manual dexterity. Come off, said Sam. Come on, cried Mr. Weller. And without further invitation he gave the Reverend Mr. Stiggins a preliminary tap on the head, and began dancing round him in a buoyant and cork-like manner, which in a gentleman at his time of life was a perfect marvel to behold. Finding all remonstrances unavailing, Sam pulled his hat firmly on, threw his father's coat over his arm, and taking the old man round the waist, forcibly dragged him down the ladder, and into the street. Never releasing his hold, or permitting him to stop, until they reached the corner. As they gained it, they could hear the shouts of the populace, who were witnessing the removal of the Reverend Mr. Stiggins to strong lodgings for the night, and could hear the noise occasioned by the dispersion in various directions of the members of the Brick Lane branch of the United Grand Junction Ebenezer Temperance Association. Chapter 34 Is wholly devoted to a full and faithful report of the memorable trial of Bardell against Pickwick. I wonder what the foreman of the jury, whoever he'll be, has got for breakfast, said Mr. Snodgrass, by way of keeping up a conversation on the eventful morning of the 14th of February. Ah, said Perker, I hope he's got a good one. Why so, inquired Mr. Pickwick. Highly important, very important, my dear sir, replied Perker. A good, contented, well-breakfasted juryman is a capital thing to get hold of. Discontented or hungry jurymen, my dear sir, always find for the plaintiff. Bless my heart, said Mr. Pickwick, looking very blank, what do they do that for? Why, I don't know, replied the little man coolly, saves time, I suppose. If it's near dinner time, the foreman takes out his watch when the jury has retired, and says, Dear me, gentlemen, ten minutes to five, I declare. I dine at five, gentlemen. So do I, says everybody else, except two men who ought to have dined at three and seem more than half disposed to stand out in consequence. The foreman smiles, and puts up his watch, well, gentlemen, what do we say, plaintiff or defendant, gentlemen? I rather think, so far as I am concerned, gentlemen, I say, I rather think, but don't let that influence you, I rather think the plaintiff's the man. Upon this, Two or three other men are sure to say that they think so too, as of course they do. And then they get on very unanimously and comfortably. Ten minutes past nine, said the little man, looking at his watch. Time we were off, my dear sir, breach of promise trial court is generally full in such cases. You had better ring for a coach, my dear sir, or we shall be rather late. Mr. Pickwick immediately rang the bell, and a coach having been procured, the four Pickwickians and Mr. Perker ensconced themselves therein, and drove to Guildhall. Sam Weller, Mr. Low Ten, and the blue bag, following in a cab. Low Ten, said Perker, when they reached the outer hall of the court, put Mr. Pickwick's friends in the student's box, Mr. Pickwick himself had better sit by me. This way, my dear sir, this way. Taking Mr. Pickwick by the coat sleeve, the little man led him to the low seat just beneath the desks of the King's Council, which is constructed for the convenience of attorneys, who from that spot can whisper into the ear of the leading counsel in the case. Any instructions that may be necessary during the progress of the trial. The occupants of this seat are invisible to the great body of spectators, inasmuch as they sit on a much lower level than either the barristers or the audience, whose seats are raised above the floor. Of course they have their backs to both, and their faces towards the judge. That's the witness box, I suppose, said Mr. Pickwick, pointing to a kind of pulpit, with a brass rail, on his left hand. That's the witness box, my dear sir, replied Perker, disinterring a quantity of papers from the blue bag, which Low Ten had just deposited at his feet. And that, said Mr. Pickwick, pointing to a couple of enclosed seats on his right, that's where the jurymen sit, is it not? The identical place, my dear sir, replied Perker, tapping the lid of his snuff-box. Mr. Pickwick stood up in a state of great agitation, 
and took a glance at the court. There were already a pretty large sprinkling of spectators in the gallery, and a numerous muster of gentlemen in wigs, in the barrister's seats, who presented, as a body. All that pleasing and extensive variety of nose and whisker for which the Bar of England is so justly celebrated. Such of the gentlemen as had a brief to carry, carried it in as conspicuous a manner as possible, and occasionally scratched their noses therewith, to impress the fact more strongly on the observation of the spectators. Other gentlemen, who had no briefs to show, carried under their arms goodly octavos, with a red label behind, and that underdone pie-crust colored cover, which is technically known as law calf. Others, who had neither briefs nor books, thrust their hands into their pockets, and looked as wise as they conveniently could. Others, again, moved here and there with great restlessness and earnestness of manner, content to awaken thereby the admiration and astonishment of the uninitiated strangers. The whole, to the great wonderment of Mr. Pickwick, were divided into little groups, who were chatting and discussing the news of the day in the most unfeeling manner possible, just as if no trial at all were coming on. A bow from Mr. Funky, as he entered, and took his seat behind the row appropriated to the King's Council, attracted Mr. Pickwick's attention, and he had scarcely returned it, when Mr. Sergeant Snubbin appeared, followed by Mr. Mallard, who half hid the sergeant behind a large crimson bag, which he placed on his table, and, after shaking hands with Perker, withdrew. Then there entered two or three more sergeants. And among them, one with a fat body and a red face, who nodded in a friendly manner to Mr. Sergeant Snubbin, and said it was a fine morning. Who's that red-faced man, who said it was a fine morning, and nodded to our counsel, whispered Mr. Pickwick. Mr. Sergeant Buzzfoos, replied Perker. He's opposed to us, he leads on the other side. That gentleman behind him is Mr. Skimpin, his junior. Mr. Pickwick was on the point of inquiring, with great abhorrence of the man's cold-blooded villainy, how Mr. Sergeant Buzzfoos, who was counsel for the opposite party, dared to presume to tell Mr. Sergeant Snubbin, who was counsel for him, that it was a fine morning, when he was interrupted by a general rising of the barristers, and a loud cry of, silence, from the officers of the court. Looking round, he found that this was caused by the entrance of the judge. Mr. Justice Stair Lee, who sat in the absence of the Chief Justice, occasioned by indisposition, was a most particularly short man, and so fat, that he seemed all face and waistcoat. He rolled in, upon two little turned legs, and having bobbed gravely to the bar, who bobbed gravely to him, put his little legs underneath his table, and his little three-cornered hat upon it, and when Mr. Justice Stairley had done this, all you could see of him was two queer little eyes, one broad pink face, and somewhere about half of a big and very comical-looking wig. The judge had no sooner taken his seat, than the officer on the floor of the court called out, Silence, in a commanding tone, upon which another officer in the gallery cried, Silence. In an angry manner, whereupon three or four more ushers shouted, Silence, in a voice of indignant remonstrance. This being done, a gentleman in black, who sat below the judge, proceeded to call over the names of the jury. And after a great deal of bawling, it was discovered that only ten special jurymen were present. Upon this, Mr. Sergeant Buzzfoos prayed a tales, the gentleman in black then proceeded to press into the special jury, two of the common jurymen. And a greengrocer and a chemist were caught directly. Answer to your names, gentlemen, that you may be sworn, said the gentleman in black. Richard Upwich. Here, said the greengrocer. Thomas Groffin. Here, said the chemist. Take the book, gentlemen. You shall well and truly try. I beg this court's pardon, said the chemist, who was a tall, thin, yellow-visaged man, but I hope this court will excuse my attendance. On what grounds, sir, said Mr. Justice Stair Lee. I have no assistant, my lord, said the chemist. I can't help that, sir, replied Mr. Justice Stair Lee. You should hire one. I can't afford it, my lord, rejoined the chemist. Then you ought to be able to afford it, sir, said the judge, reddening, 
for Mr. Justice Sterleia's temper bordered on the irritable, and brooked not contradiction. I know I ought to do, if I got on as well as I deserved. But I don't, my lord, answered the chemist. Swear the gentleman, said the judge peremptorily. The officer had got no further than the, you shall well and truly try, when he was again interrupted by the chemist. I am to be sworn, my lord, am I? said the chemist. Certainly, sir, replied the testy little judge. Very well, my lord, replied the chemist, in a resigned manner. Then there'll be murder before this trial's over, that's all. Swear me, if you please, sir. And sworn the chemist was, before the judge could find words to utter. I merely wanted to observe, my lord, said the chemist, taking his seat with great deliberation, that I've left nobody but an errand boy in my shop. He is a very nice boy, my lord, but he is not acquainted with drugs, and I know that the prevailing impression on his mind is, that Epsom salts means oxalic acid, and syrup of senna, laudanum. That's all, my lord. With this, the tall chemist composed himself into a comfortable attitude, and, assuming a pleasant expression of countenance, appeared to have prepared himself for the worst. Mr. Pickwick was regarding the chemist with feelings of the deepest horror, when a slight sensation was perceptible in the body of the court, and immediately afterwards Mrs. Bardell, supported by Mrs. Cluppins, was led in, and placed, in a drooping state, at the other end of the seat on which Mr. Pickwick sat. An extra-sized umbrella was then handed in by Mr. Dodson, and a pair of patents by Mr. Fogg, each of whom had prepared a most sympathizing and melancholy face for the occasion. Mrs. Sanders then appeared, leading in Master Bardell. At sight of her child, Mrs. Bardell started. Suddenly recollecting herself, she kissed him in a frantic manner, then relapsing into a state of hysterical imbecility, the good lady requested to be informed where she was. In reply to this, Mrs. Cluppins and Mrs. Sanders turned their heads away and wept, while Messrs. Dodson and Fogg entreated the plaintiff to compose herself. Sergeant Buzfoos rubbed his eyes very hard with a large white handkerchief, and gave an appealing look towards the jury, while the judge was visibly affected, and several of the beholders tried to cough down their emotion. Very good notion that indeed, whispered Perker to Mr. Pickwick. Capital fellows those Dodson and Fogg, excellent ideas of effect, my dear sir, excellent. As Perker spoke, Mrs. Bardell began to recover by slow degrees, while Mrs. Cluppins, after a careful survey of Master Bardell's buttons and the buttonholes to which they severally belonged, placed him on the floor of the court in front of his mother, a commanding position in which he could not fail to awaken the full commiseration and sympathy of both judge and jury. This was not done without considerable opposition, and many tears, on the part of the young gentleman himself, who had certain inward misgivings that the placing him within the full glare of the judge's eye was only a formal prelude to his being immediately ordered away for instant execution, or for transportation beyond the seas. During the whole term of his natural life, at the very least. Bardell and Pickwick, cried the gentleman in black, calling on the case, which stood first on the list. I am for the plaintiff, my lord, said Mr. Sergeant Buzfoos. Who is with you, Brother Buzfoos, said the judge. Mr. Skimpin bowed, to intimate that he was. I appear for the defendant, my lord, said Mr. Sergeant Snubbin. Anybody with you, Brother Snubbin, inquired the court. Mr. Funky, my lord, replied Sergeant Snubbin. Sergeant Buzfoos and Mr. Skimpin for the plaintiff, said the judge, writing down the names in his notebook, and reading as he wrote, for the defendant, Sergeant Snubbin and Mr. Monkey. Beg your lordship's pardon, Funky. Oh, very good, said the judge. I never had the pleasure of hearing the gentleman's name before. Here Mr. Funky bowed and smiled, and the judge bowed and smiled too, and then Mr. Funky, blushing into the very whites of his eyes, tried to look as if he didn't know that everybody was gazing at him, a thing which no man ever succeeded in doing yet, or in all reasonable probability, ever will. Go on, said the judge. The ushers again called silence, 
and Mr. Skimpin proceeded to open the case. And the case appeared to have very little inside it when he had opened it, for he kept such particulars as he knew, completely to himself, and sat down, after a lapse of three minutes. Leaving the jury in precisely the same advanced stage of wisdom as they were in before. Sergeant Buzzfuz then rose with all the majesty and dignity which the grave nature of the proceedings demanded, and having whispered to Dodson, and conferred briefly with Fogg, pulled his gown over his shoulders, settled his wig, and addressed the jury. Sergeant Buzzfuz began by saying, that never, in the whole course of his professional experience, never. From the very first moment of his applying himself to the study and practice of the law, had he approached a case with feelings of such deep emotion, or with such a heavy sense of the responsibility imposed upon him, a responsibility, he would say, which he could never have supported, were he not buoyed up and sustained by a conviction so strong, that it amounted to positive certainty that the cause of truth and justice, or, in other words, the cause of his much injured and most oppressed client, must prevail with the high-minded and intelligent dozen of men whom he now saw in that box before him. Counsel usually begin in this way, because it puts the jury on the very best terms with themselves, and makes them think what sharp fellows they must be. A visible effect was produced immediately, several jurymen beginning to take voluminous notes with the utmost eagerness. You have heard from my learned friend, gentlemen, continued Sergeant Buzzfuz, well knowing that, from the learned friend alluded to, the gentlemen of the jury had heard just nothing at all, you have heard from my learned friend, gentlemen. That this is an action for a breach of promise of marriage, in which the damages are laid at one thousand five hundred pounds. But you have not heard from my learned friend, inasmuch as it did not come within my learned friend's province to tell you, what are the facts and circumstances of the case. Those facts and circumstances, gentlemen, you shall hear detailed by me, and proved by the unimpeachable female whom I will place in that box before you. Here, Mr. Sergeant Buzzfuz, with a tremendous emphasis on the word box, smote his table with a mighty sound, and glanced at Dodson and Fogg, who nodded admiration of the sergeant, and indignant defiance of the defendant. The plaintiff, gentlemen, continued Sergeant Buzzfuz, in a soft and melancholy voice, the plaintiff is a widow, yes, gentlemen, a widow. The late Mr. Bardell, after enjoying, for many years, the esteem and confidence of his sovereign, as one of the guardians of his royal revenues, glided almost imperceptibly from the world. To seek elsewhere for that repose and peace which a custom house can never afford. At this pathetic description of the decease of Mr. Bardell, who had been knocked on the head with a quart pot in a public house cellar, the learned sergeant's voice faltered, and he proceeded, with emotion. Some time before his death, he had stamped his likeness upon a little boy. With this little boy, the only pledge of her departed excise man, Mrs. Bardell shrank from the world, and courted the retirement and tranquility of Goswell Street. And here she placed in her front parlor window a written placard, bearing this inscription, Apartments furnished for a single gentleman. Inquire within. Here Sergeant Buzzfuz paused, while several gentlemen of the jury took a note of the document. There is no date to that, is there? inquired a juror. There is no date, gentlemen, replied Sergeant Buzzfuz, but I am instructed to say that it was put in the plaintiff's parlor window just this time three years. I entreat the attention of the jury to the wording of this document, apartments furnished for a single gentleman. Mrs. Bardell's opinions of the opposite sex, gentlemen, were derived from a long contemplation of the inestimable qualities of her lost husband. She had no fear, she had no distrust, she had no suspicion, all was confidence and reliance. Mr. Bardell, said the widow, Mr. Bardell was a man of honor, Mr. Bardell was a man of his word, Mr. Bardell was no deceiver, Mr. Bardell was once a single gentleman himself. To single gentlemen I look for protection, for assistance, for comfort, and for consolation, in single gentlemen I shall perpetually see something to remind me of what Mr. Bardell was when he first won my young and untried affections. To a single gentleman, then, shall my lodgings be let. Actuated by this beautiful and touching impulse, among the best impulses of our imperfect nature, 
gentlemen, the lonely and desolate widow dried her tears, furnished her first floor, caught her innocent boy to her maternal bosom, and put the bill up in her parlor window. Did it remain there long? No. The serpent was on the watch, the train was laid, the mine was preparing, the sapper and miner was at work. Before the bill had been in the parlor window three days, three days, gentlemen, a being, erect upon two legs, and bearing all the outward semblance of a man, and not of a monster, knocked at the door of Mrs. Bardell's house. He inquired within, he took the lodgings, and on the very next day he entered into possession of them. This man was Pickwick, Pickwick, the defendant. Sergeant Buzzfuz, who had proceeded with such volubility that his face was perfectly crimson, here paused for breath. The silence awoke Mr. Justice Stairley, who immediately wrote down something with a pen without any ink in it, and looked unusually profound, to impress the jury with the belief that he always thought most deeply with his eyes shut. Sergeant Buzzfuz proceeded. Of this man Pickwick I will say little, the subject presents but few attractions. And I, gentlemen, am not the man, nor are you, gentlemen, the men, to delight in the contemplation of revolting heartlessness, and of systematic villainy. Here Mr. Pickwick, who had been writhing in silence for some time, gave a violent start, as if some vague idea of assaulting Sergeant Buzzfuz, in the august presence of justice and law, suggested itself to his mind. An admonitory gesture from Perker restrained him, and he listened to the learned gentleman's continuation with a look of indignation, which contrasted forcibly with the admiring faces of Mrs. Cluppins and Mrs. Sanders. I say systematic villainy, gentlemen, said Sergeant Buzzfuz, looking through Mr. Pickwick, and talking at him. And when I say systematic villainy, let me tell the defendant Pickwick, if he be in court, as I am informed he is, that it would have been more decent in him, more becoming, in better judgment, and in better taste, if he had stopped away. Let me tell him, gentlemen, that any gestures of dissent or disapprobation in which he may indulge in this court will not go down with you, that you will know how to value and how to appreciate them. And let me tell him further, as my lord will tell you, gentlemen, that a counsel, in the discharge of his duty to his client, is neither to be intimidated nor bullied, nor put down. And that any attempt to do either the one or the other, or the first, or the last, will recoil on the head of the attempter, be he plaintiff or be he defendant, be his name Pickwick, or Noakes, or Stokes, or Stiles, or Brown, or Thompson. This little divergence from the subject in hand, had, of course, the intended effect of turning all eyes to Mr. Pickwick. Sergeant Buzzfuz, having partially recovered from the state of moral elevation into which he had lashed himself, resumed. I shall show you, gentlemen, that for two years, Pickwick continued to reside constantly. And without interruption or intermission, at Mrs. Bardell's house. I shall show you that Mrs. Bardell, during the whole of that time, waited on him, attended to his comforts, cooked his meals, looked out his linen for the washerwoman when it went abroad, darned, aired, and prepared it for wear, when it came home, and, in short, enjoyed his fullest trust and confidence. I shall show you that, on many occasions, he gave halfpence, and on some occasions even sixpences, to her little boy. And I shall prove to you, by a witness whose testimony it will be impossible for my learned friend to weaken or controvert, that on one occasion he patted the boy on the head, and, after inquiring whether he had won any alley tours, or comedies, lately, both of which I understand to be a particular species of marbles much prized by the youth of this town, made use of this remarkable expression. How should you like to have another father? I shall prove to you, gentlemen, that about a year ago, Pickwick suddenly began to absent himself from home, during long intervals, as if with the intention of gradually breaking off from my client. But I shall show you also, that his resolution was not at that time sufficiently strong, or that his better feelings conquered, if better feelings he has, or that the charms and accomplishments of my client prevailed against his unmanly intentions. By proving to you, that on one occasion, when he returned from the country, he distinctly and in terms, offered her marriage, previously, however, taking special care that there would be no witness to their solemn contract. And I am in a situation to prove to you, 
on the testimony of three of his own friends, most unwilling witnesses, gentlemen, most unwilling witnesses, that on that morning he was discovered by them holding the plaintiff in his arms, and soothing her agitation by his caresses and endearments. A visible impression was produced upon the auditors by this part of the learned sergeant's address. Drawing forth two very small scraps of paper, he proceeded. And now, gentlemen, but one word more. Two letters have passed between these parties, letters which are admitted to be in the handwriting of the defendant, and which speak volumes, indeed. The letters, too, bespeak the character of the man. They are not open, fervent, eloquent epistles, breathing nothing but the language of affectionate attachment. They are covert, sly, underhanded communications, but, fortunately, far more conclusive than if couched in the most glowing language and the most poetic imagery, letters that must be viewed with a cautious and suspicious eye, letters that were evidently intended at the time, by Pickwick, to mislead and delude any third parties into whose hands they might fall. Let me read the first, Garraway's, Twelve O'Clock. Dear Mrs. B. Dot, Chops and Tomato Sauce. Yours, Pickwick. Gentlemen, what does this mean? Chops and tomato sauce. Yours, Pickwick. Chops. Gracious heavens. And tomato sauce. Gentlemen, is the happiness of a sensitive and confiding female to be trifled away, by such shallow artifices as these? The next has no date whatever, which is in itself suspicious. Dear Mrs. B., I shall not be at home till tomorrow. Slow coach. And then follows this very remarkable expression. Don't trouble yourself about the warming pan. The warming pan. Why, gentlemen, who does trouble himself about a warming pan? When was the peace of mind of man or woman broken or disturbed by a warming pan, which is in itself a harmless, a useful, and I will add, gentlemen, a comforting article of domestic furniture? Why is Mrs. Bardell so earnestly entreated not to agitate herself about this warming pan, unless, as is no doubt the case, it is a mere cover for hidden fire, a mere substitute for some endearing word or promise. Agreeably to a preconcerted system of correspondence, artfully contrived by Pickwick with a view to his contemplated desertion, and which I am not in a condition to explain. And what does this allusion to the slow coach mean? For aught I know, it may be a reference to Pickwick himself, who has most unquestionably been a criminally slow coach during the whole of this transaction, but whose speed will now be very unexpectedly accelerated, and whose wheels, gentlemen, as he will find to his cost, will very soon be greased by you. Mr. Sergeant Buzzfuz paused in this place, to see whether the jury smiled at his joke. But as nobody took it but the greengrocer, whose sensitiveness on the subject was very probably occasioned by his having subjected a chaise cart to the process in question on that identical morning. The learned sergeant considered it advisable to undergo a slight relapse into the dismals before he concluded. But enough of this, gentlemen, said Mr. Sergeant Buzzfuz, it is difficult to smile with an aching heart, it is ill-jesting when our deepest sympathies are awakened. My client's hopes and prospects are ruined, and it is no figure of speech to say that her occupation is gone indeed. The bill is down, but there is no tenant. Eligible single gentlemen pass and repass, but there is no invitation for to inquire within or without. All is gloom and silence in the house, even the voice of the child is hushed, his infant sports are disregarded when his mother weeps. His alley tours and his comedies are alike neglected, he forgets the long familiar cry of, knuckle down, and at tip cheese, or odd and even, his hand is out. But Pickwick, gentlemen, Pickwick, the ruthless destroyer of this domestic oasis in the desert of Goswell Street, Pickwick who has choked up the well, and thrown ashes on the sward, Pickwick, who comes before you today with his heartless tomato sauce and warming pans, Pickwick still rears his head with unblushing effrontery, and gazes without a sigh on the ruin he has made. Damages, gentlemen, heavy damages is the only punishment with which you can visit him, the only recompense you can award to my client. And for those damages she now appeals to an enlightened, a high-minded, a right-feeling, a conscientious, a dispassionate, a sympathizing, 
a contemplative jury of her civilized countrymen. With this beautiful peroration, Mr. Sergeant Buzfu sat down, and Mr. Justice Stair Lee woke up. Call Elizabeth Cluppins, said Sergeant Buzfus, rising a minute afterwards, with renewed vigor. The nearest usher called for Elizabeth Tuppins. Another one, at a little distance off, demanded Elizabeth Jupkins, and a third rushed in a breathless state into King Street and screamed for Elizabeth Muffins till he was hoarse. Meanwhile Mrs. Cluppins, with the combined assistance of Mrs. Bardell, Mrs. Sanders, Mr. Dodson, and Mr. Fogg, was hoisted into the witness box, and when she was safely perched on the top step, Mrs. Bardell stood on the bottom one, with the pocket handkerchief and pattens in one hand, and a glass bottle that might hold about a quarter of a pint of smelling salts in the other, ready for any emergency. Mrs. Sanders, whose eyes were intently fixed on the judge's face, planted herself close by, with the large umbrella, keeping her right thumb pressed on the spring with an earnest countenance. As if she were fully prepared to put it up at a moment's notice. Mrs. Cluppins, said Sergeant Buzfus, pray compose yourself, ma'am. Of course, directly Mrs. Cluppins was desired to compose herself, she sobbed with increased vehemence, and gave diverse alarming manifestations of an approaching fainting fit, or, as she afterwards said, of her feelings being too many for her. Do you recollect, Mrs. Cluppins, said Sergeant Buzfus, after a few unimportant questions, do you recollect being in Mrs. Bardell's back one pair of stairs, on one particular morning in July last, when she was dusting Pickwick's apartment? Yes, my lord and jury, I do, replied Mrs. Cluppins. Mr. Pickwick's sitting room was the first floor front, I believe. Yes, it were, sir, replied Mrs. Cluppins. What were you doing in the back room, ma'am, inquired the little judge. My lord and jury, said Mrs. Cluppins, with interesting agitation, I will not deceive you. You had better not, ma'am, said the little judge. I was there, resumed Mrs. Cluppins, unbeknown to Mrs. Bardell. I had been out with a little basket, gentlemen, to buy three pound of red kidney perdities, which was three pound tuppence ha'penny, when I see Mrs. Bardell's street door on the jar. On the what? exclaimed the little judge. Partly open, my lord, said Sergeant Snubbin. She said on the jar, said the little judge, with a cunning look. It's all the same, my lord, said Sergeant Snubbin. The little judge looked doubtful, and said he'd make a note of it. Mrs. Cluppins then resumed. I walked in, gentlemen, just to say good morning, and went, in a promiscuous manner, upstairs, and into the back room. Gentlemen, there was the sound of voices in the front room, Anne. And you listened, I believe, Mrs. Cluppins, said Sergeant Buzfus. Begging your pardon, sir, replied Mrs. Cluppins, in a majestic manner, I would scorn the haction. The voices was very loud, sir, and forced themselves upon my ear. Well, Mrs. Cluppins, you were not listening, but you heard the voices. Was one of those voices Pickwick's? Yes, it were, sir. And Mrs. Cluppins, after distinctly stating that Mr. Pickwick addressed himself to Mrs. Bardell, repeated by slow degrees, and by dint of many questions, the conversation with which our readers are already acquainted. The jury looked suspicious, and Mr. Sergeant Buzfus smiled as he sat down. They looked positively awful when Sergeant Snubbin intimated that he should not cross-examine the witness, for Mr. Pickwick wished it to be distinctly stated that it was due to her to say that her account was in substance correct. Mrs. Cluppins having once broken the ice, thought it a favorable opportunity for entering into a short dissertation on her own domestic affairs. So she straightway proceeded to inform the court that she was the mother of eight children at that present speaking, and that she entertained confident expectations of presenting Mr. Cluppins with a ninth, somewhere about that day six months. At this interesting point, the little judge interposed most irascibly, and the effect of the interposition was, that both the worthy lady and Mrs. Sanders were politely taken out of court, under the escort of Mr. Jackson, without further parley. Nathaniel Winkle, said Mr. Skimpin. 
Here, replied a feeble voice. Mr. Winkle entered the witness box, and having been duly sworn, bowed to the judge with considerable deference. Don't look at me, sir, said the judge sharply, in acknowledgment of the salute, look at the jury. Mr. Winkle obeyed the mandate, and looked at the place where he thought it most probable the jury might be. Foreseeing anything in his then state of intellectual complication was wholly out of the question. Mr. Winkle was then examined by Mr. Skimpin, who, being a promising young man of two or three and forty, was of course anxious to confuse a witness who was notoriously predisposed in favor of the other side, as much as he could. Now, sir, said Mr. Skimpin, have the goodness to let his lordship know what your name is, will you, and Mr. Skimpin inclined his head on one side to listen with great sharpness to the answer, and glanced at the jury meanwhile, as if to imply that he rather expected Mr. Winkle's natural taste for perjury would induce him to give some name which did not belong to him. Winkle, replied the witness. What's your Christian name, sir? angrily inquired the little judge. Nathaniel, sir. Daniel, any other name? Nathaniel, sir, my lord, I mean. Nathaniel Daniel, or Daniel Nathaniel? No, my lord, only Nathaniel, not Daniel at all. What did you tell me it was Daniel for, then, sir, inquired the judge. I didn't, my lord, replied Mr. Winkle. You did, sir, replied the judge, with a severe frown. How could I have got Daniel on my notes, unless you told me so, sir? This argument was, of course, unanswerable. Mr. Winkle has rather a short memory, my lord, interposed Mr. Skimpin, with another glance at the jury. We shall find means to refresh it before we have quite done with him, I dare say. You had better be careful, sir, said the little judge, with a sinister look at the witness. Poor Mr. Winkle bowed, and endeavored to feign an easiness of manner, which, in his then state of confusion, gave him rather the air of a disconcerted pickpocket. Now, Mr. Winkle, said Mr. Skimpin, attend to me, if you please, sir. And let me recommend you, for your own sake, to bear in mind his lordship's injunctions to be careful. I believe you are a particular friend of Mr. Pickwick, the defendant, are you not? I have known Mr. Pickwick now, as well as I recollect at this moment, nearly. Pray, Mr. Winkle, do not evade the question. Are you, or are you not, a particular friend of the defendant's? I was just about to say, that. Will you, or will you not, answer my question, sir? If you don't answer the question, you'll be committed, sir, interposed the little judge, looking over his notebook. Come, sir, said Mr. Skimpin, yes or no, if you please. Yes, I am, replied Mr. Winkle. Yes, you are. And why couldn't you say that at once, sir? Perhaps you know the plaintiff too. Eh, Mr. Winkle. I don't know her, I've seen her. Oh, you don't know her, but you've seen her. Now, have the goodness to tell the gentlemen of the jury what you mean by that, Mr. Winkle. I mean that I am not intimate with her, but I have seen her when I went to call on Mr. Pickwick, in Goswell Street. How often have you seen her, sir? How often? Yes, Mr. Winkle, how often? I'll repeat the question for you a dozen times, if you require it, sir. And the learned gentleman, with a firm and steady frown, placed his hands on his hips, and smiled suspiciously to the jury. On this question there arose the edifying brow-beating, customary on such points. First of all, Mr. Winkle said it was quite impossible for him to say how many times he had seen Mrs. Bardell. Then he was asked if he had seen her twenty times, to which he replied, certainly, more than that. Then he was asked whether he hadn't seen her a hundred times, whether he couldn't swear that he had seen her more than fifty times, whether he didn't know that he had seen her at least seventy-five times, and so forth. The satisfactory conclusion which was arrived at, at last, being, that he had better take care of himself, and mind what he was about. 
The witness having been by these means reduced to the requisite ebb of nervous perplexity, the examination was continued as follows. Pray, Mr. Winkle, do you remember calling on the defendant Pickwick at these apartments in the plaintiff's house in Goswell Street, on one particular morning, in the month of July last? Yes, I do. Were you accompanied on that occasion by a friend of the name of Tupman, and another by the name of Snodgrass? Yes, I was. Are they here? Yes, they are, replied Mr. Winkle, looking very earnestly towards the spot where his friends were stationed. Pray attend to me, Mr. Winkle, and never mind your friends, said Mr. Skimpin, with another expressive look at the jury. They must tell their stories without any previous consultation with you, if none has yet taken place, another look at the jury. Now, sir, tell the gentlemen of the jury what you saw on entering the defendant's room, on this particular morning. Come, out with it, sir, we must have it, sooner or later. The defendant, Mr. Pickwick, was holding the plaintiff in his arms, with his hands clasping her waist, replied Mr. Winkle with natural hesitation, and the plaintiff appeared to have fainted away. Did you hear the defendant say anything? I heard him call Mrs. Bardell a good creature, and I heard him ask her to compose herself, for what a situation it was, if anybody should come, or words to that effect. Now, Mr. Winkle, I have only one more question to ask you, and I beg you to bear in mind his lordship's caution. Will you undertake to swear that Pickwick, the defendant, did not say on the occasion in question, My dear Mrs. Bardell, you're a good creature. Compose yourself to this situation, for to this situation you must come, or words to that effect. I, I didn't understand him so, certainly, said Mr. Winkle, astounded on this ingenious dovetailing of the few words he had heard. I was on the staircase, and couldn't hear distinctly, the impression on my mind is. The gentlemen of the jury want none of the impressions on your mind, Mr. Winkle, which I fear would be of little service to honest, straightforward men, interposed Mr. Skimpin. You were on the staircase, and didn't distinctly hear, but you will not swear that Pickwick did not make use of the expressions I have quoted? Do I understand that? No, I will not, replied Mr. Winkle, and down sat Mr. Skimpin with a triumphant countenance. Mr. Pickwick's case had not gone off in so particularly happy a manner, up to this point, that it could very well afford to have any additional suspicion cast upon it. But as it could afford to be placed in a rather better light, if possible, Mr. Funky rose for the purpose of getting something important out of Mr. Winkle in cross-examination. Whether he did get anything important out of him, will immediately appear. I believe, Mr. Winkle, said Mr. Funky, that Mr. Pickwick is not a young man. Oh, no, replied Mr. Winkle, old enough to be my father. You have told my learned friend that you have known Mr. Pickwick a long time. Had you ever any reason to suppose or believe that he was about to be married? Oh, no, certainly not, replied Mr. Winkle with so much eagerness, that Mr. Funky ought to have got him out of the box with all possible dispatch. Lawyers hold that there are two kinds of particularly bad witnesses, a reluctant witness, and a too willing witness, it was Mr. Winkle's fate to figure in both characters. I will even go further than this, Mr. Winkle, continued Mr. Funky, in a most smooth and complacent manner. Did you ever see anything in Mr. Pickwick's manner and conduct towards the opposite sex, to induce you to believe that he ever contemplated matrimony of late years, in any case? Oh, no. Certainly not, replied Mr. Winkle. Has his behavior, when females have been in the case, always been that of a man, who, having attained a pretty advanced period of life, content with his own occupations and amusements, treats them only as a father might his daughters. Not the least doubt of it, replied Mr. Winkle, in the fullness of his heart. That is, yes, oh, yes, certainly. You have never known anything in his behavior towards Mrs. Bardell, or any other female, in the least degree suspicious, said Mr. Funky, preparing to sit down, for Sergeant Snubbin was winking at him. N.N. No, replied Mr. Winkle, except on one trifling occasion, which, I have no doubt, 
might be easily explained. Now, if the unfortunate Mr. Funky had sat down when Sergeant Snubbin had winked at him, or if Sergeant Buzzfuz had stopped this irregular cross-examination at the outset, which he knew better than to do, observing Mr. Winkle's anxiety, and well knowing it would, in all probability, lead to something serviceable to him, this unfortunate admission would not have been elicited. The moment the words fell from Mr. Winkle's lips, Mr. Funky sat down, and Sergeant Snubbin rather hastily told him he might leave the box, which Mr. Winkle prepared to do with great readiness, when Sergeant Buzzfuz stopped him. Stay, Mr. Winkle, stay. Said Sergeant Buzzfuz, will your lordship have the goodness to ask him, what this one instance of suspicious behavior towards females on the part of this gentleman, who is old enough to be his father, was? You hear what the learned counsel says, sir, observed the judge, turning to the miserable and agonized Mr. Winkle. Describe the occasion to which you refer. My lord, said Mr. Winkle, trembling with anxiety, I, I'd rather not. Perhaps so, said the little judge, but you must. Amid the profound silence of the whole court, Mr. Winkle faltered out, that the trifling circumstance of suspicion was Mr. Pickwick's being found in a lady's sleeping apartment at midnight. Which had terminated, he believed, in the breaking off of the projected marriage of the lady in question, and had led, he knew, to the whole party being forcibly carried before George Nupkins, E.S.Q. Magistrate and Justice of the Peace, for the borough of Ipswich. You may leave the box, sir, said Sergeant Snubbin. Mr. Winkle did leave the box, and rushed with delirious haste to the George and Vulture, where he was discovered some hours after, by the waiter, groaning in a hollow and dismal manner, with his head buried beneath the sofa cushions. Tracy Tupman and Augustus Snodgrass were severally called into the box, both corroborated the testimony of their unhappy friend, and each was driven to the verge of desperation by excessive badgering. Susanna Sanders was then called, and examined by Sergeant Buzzfuz, and cross-examined by Sergeant Snubbin. Had always said and believed that Pickwick would marry Mrs. Bardell, knew that Mrs. Bardell's being engaged to Pickwick was the current topic of conversation in the neighborhood, after the fainting in July, had been told it herself by Mrs. Mudbury which kept a mangle, and Mrs. Bunkin which clear starched, but did not see either Mrs. Mudbury or Mrs. Bunkin in court. Had heard Pickwick ask the little boy how he should like to have another father. Did not know that Mrs. Bardell was at that time keeping company with the baker, but did know that the baker was then a single man and is now married. Couldn't swear that Mrs. Bardell was not very fond of the baker, but should think that the baker was not very fond of Mrs. Bardell, or he wouldn't have married somebody else. Thought Mrs. Bardell fainted away on the morning in July, because Pickwick asked her to name the day, knew that she, witness, fainted away stone dead when Mr. Sanders asked her to name the day, and believed that everybody as called herself a lady would do the same, under similar circumstances. Heard Pickwick ask the boy the question about the marbles, but upon her oath did not know the difference between an alley tour and a com money. By the court dot, during the period of her keeping company with Mr. Sanders, had received love letters, like other ladies. In the course of their correspondence Mr. Sanders had often called her a duck, but never chops, nor yet tomato sauce. He was particularly fond of ducks. Perhaps if he had been as fond of chops and tomato sauce, he might have called her that, as a term of affection. Sergeant Buzzfuz now rose with more importance than he had yet exhibited, if that were possible, and vociferated, call Samuel Weller. It was quite unnecessary to call Samuel Weller, for Samuel Weller stepped briskly into the box the instant his name was pronounced. And placing his hat on the floor, and his arms on the rail, took a bird's eye view of the bar, and a comprehensive survey of the bench, with a remarkably cheerful and lively aspect. What's your name, sir? inquired the judge. Sam Weller, my lord, replied that gentleman. Do you spell it with a V or a W? inquired the judge. That depends upon the taste and fancy of the speller, my lord, replied Sam. I never had occasion to spell it more than once or twice in my life, but I spells it with a V. 
Here a voice in the gallery exclaimed aloud, Quite right too, Samavel, quite right. Put it down a, we, my lord, put it down a, we. Who is that, who dares address the court, said the little judge, looking up. Usher. Yes, my lord. Bring that person here instantly. Yes, my lord. But as the usher didn't find the person, he didn't bring him. And, after a great commotion, all the people who had got up to look for the culprit, sat down again. The little judge turned to the witness as soon as his indignation would allow him to speak, and said. Do you know who that was, sir? I rather suspect it was my father, my lord, replied Sam. Do you see him here now, said the judge. No, I don't, my lord, replied Sam, staring right up into the lantern at the roof of the court. If you could have pointed him out, I would have committed him instantly, said the judge. Sam bowed his acknowledgments and turned, with unimpaired cheerfulness of countenance, toward Sergeant Buzzfuz. Now, Mr. Weller, said Sergeant Buzzfuz. Now, sir, replied Sam. I believe you are in the service of Mr. Pickwick, the defendant in this case. Speak up, if you please, Mr. Weller. I mean to speak up, sir, replied Sam. I am in the service o oh, that air genel man, and a wary good service it is. Little to do, and plenty to get, I suppose, said Sergeant Buzzfuz, with jocularity. Oh, quite enough to get, sir, as the soldier said then they ordered him three hundred and fifty lashes, replied Sam. You must not tell us what the soldier, or any other man, said, sir, interposed the judge, it's not evidence. Very good, my lord, replied Sam. Do you recollect anything particular happening on the morning when you were first engaged by the defendant, eh, Mr. Weller, said Sergeant Buzzfuz. Yes, I do, sir, replied Sam. Have the goodness to tell the jury what it was. I had a reglar new fit out o oh, clothes that morning, gentlemen of the jury, said Sam, and that was a wary particular and uncommon circumstance with me in those days. Hereupon there was a general laugh, and the little judge, looking with an angry countenance over his desk, said, You had better be careful, sir. So Mr. Pickwick said at the time, My lord, replied Sam. And I was very careful o oh, that bare suit o oh, clothes, very careful indeed, my lord. The judge looked sternly at Sam for full two minutes, but Sam's features were so perfectly calm and serene that the judge said nothing, and motioned Sergeant Buzzfuz to proceed. Do you mean to tell me, Mr. Weller, said Sergeant Buzzfuz, folding his arms emphatically, and turning half round to the jury, as if in mute assurance that he would bother the witness yet, do you mean to tell me, Mr. Weller, that you saw nothing of this fainting on the part of the plaintiff in the arms of the defendant, which you have heard described by the witnesses? Certainly not, replied Sam. I was in the passage till they called me up, and then the old lady was not there. Now, attend, Mr. Weller, said Sergeant Buzzfuz, dipping a large pen into the inkstand before him, for the purpose of frightening Sam with a show of taking down his answer. You were in the passage, and yet saw nothing of what was going forward. Have you a pair of eyes, Mr. Weller? Yes, I have a pair of eyes, replied Sam, and that's just it. If they was a pair o oh, patent double million magnifying gas microscopes of hextra power, perhaps I might be able to see through a flight o oh, stairs and a deal door, but be in only eyes, you see, my wision s limited. At this answer, which was delivered without the slightest appearance of irritation, and with the most complete simplicity and equanimity of manner, the spectators tittered, the little judge smiled, and Sergeant Buzzfuz looked particularly foolish. After a short consultation with Dodson and Fogg, the learned sergeant again turned towards Sam, and said, with a painful effort to conceal his vexation, Now, Mr. Weller, I'll ask you a question on another point, if you please. If you please, sir, rejoined Sam, with the utmost good humor. Do you remember going up to Mrs. Bardell's house, one night in November last? Oh, yes, very well. Oh, you do remember that, Mr. Weller, said Sergeant Buzzfuz, recovering his spirits, I thought we should get at something at last. 
I rather thought that, too, sir, replied Sam, and at this the spectators tittered again. Well. I suppose you went up to have a little talk about this trial, Mr. Weller, said Sergeant Buzzfuz, looking knowingly at the jury. I went up to pay the rent, but we did get a talkin' about the trial, replied Sam. Oh, you did get a talking about the trial, said Sergeant Buzzfuz, brightening up with the anticipation of some important discovery. Now, what passed about the trial, will you have the goodness to tell us, Mr. Weller? With all the pleasure in life, sir, replied Sam. Arter a few unimportant observations from the two virtuous females as has been examined here today, the ladies gets into a very great state o oh, admiration at the honorable conduct of Mr. Dodson and Fogg, them two gentlemen as is set in near you now. This, of course, drew general attention to Dodson and Fogg, who looked as virtuous as possible. The attorneys for the plaintiff, said Mr. Sergeant Buzzfuz. Well. They spoke in high praise of the honorable conduct of Messrs. Dodson and Fogg, the attorneys for the plaintiff, did they? Yes, said Sam, they said what a wary Jen Rouse thing it was owed them to have taken up the case on spec, and to charge nothing at all for costs, unless they got them out of Mr. Pickwick. At this very unexpected reply, the spectators tittered again, and Dodson and Fogg, turning very red, leaned over to Sergeant Buzzfuz, and in a hurried manner whispered something in his ear. You are quite right, said Sergeant Buzzfuz aloud, with affected composure. It's perfectly useless, my lord, attempting to get at any evidence through the impenetrable stupidity of this witness. I will not trouble the court by asking him any more questions. Stand down, sir. Would any other gentleman like to ask me anything? inquired Sam, taking up his hat, and looking round most deliberately. Not I, mister. Weller, thank you, said Sergeant Snubbin, laughing. You may go down, sir, said Sergeant Buzzfuz, waving his hand impatiently. Sam went down accordingly, after doing Messrs. Dodson and Fogg's case as much harm as he conveniently could, and saying just as little respecting Mr. Pickwick as might be, which was precisely the object he had had in view all along. I have no objection to admit, my lord, said Sergeant Snubbin, if it will save the examination of another witness, that Mr. Pickwick has retired from business, and is a gentleman of considerable independent property. Very well, said Sergeant Buzzfuz, putting in the two letters to be read, then that's my case, my lord. Sergeant Snubbin then addressed the jury on behalf of the defendant. And a very long and a very emphatic address he delivered, in which he bestowed the highest possible eulogiums on the conduct and character of Mr. Pickwick. But inasmuch as our readers are far better able to form a correct estimate of that gentleman's merits and deserts, than Sergeant Snubbin could possibly be, we do not feel called upon to enter at any length into the learned gentleman's observations. He attempted to show that the letters which had been exhibited, merely related to Mr. Pickwick's dinner, or to the preparations for receiving him in his apartments on his return from some country excursion. It is sufficient to add in general terms, that he did the best he could for Mr. Pickwick, and the best, as everybody knows, on the infallible authority of the old adage, could do no more. Mr. Justice Stairley summed up, in the old established and most approved form. He read as much of his notes to the jury as he could decipher on so short a notice, and made running comments on the evidence as he went along. If Mrs. Bardell were right, it was perfectly clear that Mr. Pickwick was wrong, and if they thought the evidence of Mrs. Cluppins worthy of credence they would believe it, and, if they didn't, why, they wouldn't. If they were satisfied that a breach of promise of marriage had been committed they would find for the plaintiff with such damages as they thought proper. And if, on the other hand, it appeared to them that no promise of marriage had ever been given, they would find for the defendant with no damages at all. The jury then retired to their private room to talk the matter over, and the judge retired to his private room, to refresh himself with a mutton chop and a glass of sherry. An anxious quarter of an hour elapsed, the jury came back. The judge was fetched in. Mr. Pickwick put on his spectacles, and gazed at the foreman with an agitated countenance and a quickly beating heart. Gentlemen, said the individual in black, are you all agreed upon your verdict? 
We are, replied the foreman. Do you find for the plaintiff, gentlemen, or for the defendant? For the plaintiff. With what damages, gentlemen? Seven hundred and fifty pounds. Mr. Pickwick took off his spectacles, carefully wiped the glasses, folded them into their case, and put them in his pocket, then, having drawn on his gloves with great nicety, and stared at the foreman all the while, he mechanically followed Mr. Perker and the blue bag out of court. They stopped in a side room while Perker paid the court fees, and here, Mr. Pickwick was joined by his friends. Here, too, he encountered Messrs. Dodson and Fogg, rubbing their hands with every token of outward satisfaction. Well, gentlemen, said Mr. Pickwick. Well, sir, said Dodson, for self and partner. You imagine you'll get your costs, don't you, gentlemen, said Mr. Pickwick. Fogg said they thought it rather probable. Dodson smiled, and said they'd try. You may try, and try, and try again, Messrs. Dodson and Fogg, said Mr. Pickwick vehemently, but not one farthing of costs or damages do you ever get from me, if I spend the rest of my existence in a debtor's prison. Ha! Ha! laughed Dodson. You'll think better of that, before next term, Mr. Pickwick. He, he, he. We'll soon see about that, Mr. Pickwick, grinned Fogg. Speechless with indignation, Mr. Pickwick allowed himself to be led by his solicitor and friends to the door, and there assisted into a hackney coach, which had been fetched for the purpose, by the ever-watchful Sam Weller. Sam had put up the steps, and was preparing to jump upon the box, when he felt himself gently touched on the shoulder, and, looking round, his father stood before him. The old gentleman's countenance wore a mournful expression, as he shook his head gravely, and said, in warning accents. I knowed what you'd come o' oh, this here mode o' oh, doin' business. Oh, Sammy, Sammy, V.Y. warn't there a alibi. Chapter 35 In which Mr. Pickwick thinks he had better go to Bath, and goes accordingly. But surely, my dear sir, said little Perker, as he stood in Mr. Pickwick's apartment on the morning after the trial, surely you don't really mean, really and seriously now, an irritation apart, that you won't pay these costs and damages. Not one halfpenny, said Mr. Pickwick firmly, not one halfpenny. Huro are for the principal, as the money lender said then he wouldn't renew the bill, observed Mr. Weller, who was clearing away the breakfast things. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, have the goodness to step downstairs. Certain L.Y., sir, replied Mr. Weller, and acting on Mr. Pickwick's gentle hint, Sam retired. No, Perker, said Mr. Pickwick, with great seriousness of manner, my friends here have endeavored to dissuade me from this determination, but without avail. I shall employ myself as usual, until the opposite party have the power of issuing a legal process of execution against me. And if they are vile enough to avail themselves of it, and to arrest my person, I shall yield myself up with perfect cheerfulness and content of heart. When can they do this? They can issue execution, my dear sir, for the amount of the damages and taxed costs, next term, replied Perker, just two months hence, my dear sir. Very good, said Mr. Pickwick. Until that time, my dear fellow, let me hear no more of the matter. And now, continued Mr. Pickwick, looking round on his friends with a good-humoured smile, and a sparkle in the eye which no spectacles could dim or conceal, the only question is, where shall we go next? Mr. Tupman and Mr. Snodgrass were too much affected by their friend's heroism to offer any reply. Mr. Winkle had not yet sufficiently recovered the recollection of his evidence at the trial, to make any observation on any subject, so Mr. Pickwick paused in vain. Well, said that gentleman, if you leave me to suggest our destination, I say Bath. I think none of us have ever been there. Nobody had, and as the proposition was warmly seconded by Perker, who considered it extremely probable that if Mr. Pickwick saw a little change in gaiety he would be inclined to think better of his determination, and worse of a debtor's prison, it was carried unanimously. And Sam was at once dispatched to the White Horse Cellar, to take five places by the half-past seven o'clock coach, 
next morning. There were just two places to be had inside, and just three to be had out. So Sam Weller booked for them all, and having exchanged a few compliments with the booking office clerk on the subject of a pewter half-crown which was tendered him as a portion of his change, walked back to the George and Vulture. Where he was pretty busily employed until bedtime in reducing clothes and linen into the smallest possible compass. And exerting his mechanical genius in constructing a variety of ingenious devices for keeping the lids on boxes which had neither locks nor hinges. The next was a very unpropitious morning for a journey, muggy, damp, and drizzly. The horses in the stages that were going out, and had come through the city, were smoking so, that the outside passengers were invisible. The newspaper sellers looked moist, and smelled moldy, the wet ran off the hats of the orange vendors as they thrust their heads into the coach windows, and diluted the insides in a refreshing manner. The Jews with the fifty-bladed penknives shut them up in despair, the men with the pocketbooks made pocketbooks of them. Watchguards and toasting forks were alike at a discount, and pencil cases and sponges were a drug in the market. Leaving Sam Weller to rescue the luggage from the seven or eight porters who flung themselves savagely upon it, the moment the coach stopped, and finding that they were about twenty minutes too early, Mr. Pickwick and his friends went for shelter into the traveler's room, the last resource of human dejection. The traveler's room at the White Horse Cellar is of course uncomfortable, it would be no traveler's room if it were not. It is the right-hand parlor, into which an aspiring kitchen fireplace appears to have walked, accompanied by a rebellious poker, tongs, and shovel. It is divided into boxes, for the solitary confinement of travelers, and is furnished with a clock, a looking-glass, and a live waiter, which latter article is kept in a small kennel for washing glasses, in a corner of the apartment. One of these boxes was occupied, on this particular occasion, by a stern-eyed man of about five and forty, who had a bald and glossy forehead, with a good deal of black hair at the sides and back of his head, and large black whiskers. He was buttoned up to the chin in a brown coat, and had a large sealskin traveling cap, and a greatcoat and cloak, lying on the seat beside him. He looked up from his breakfast as Mr. Pickwick entered, with a fierce and peremptory air, which was very dignified. And, having scrutinized that gentleman and his companions to his entire satisfaction, hummed a tune, in a manner which seemed to say that he rather suspected somebody wanted to take advantage of him, but it wouldn't do. Waiter, said the gentleman with the whiskers. Sir, replied a man with a dirty complexion, and a towel of the same, emerging from the kennel before mentioned. Some more toast. Yes, sir. Buttered toast, mind, said the gentleman fiercely. Directly, sir, replied the waiter. The gentleman with the whiskers hummed a tune in the same manner as before, and pending the arrival of the toast, advanced to the front of the fire, and, taking his coat tails under his arms, looked at his boots and ruminated. I wonder whereabouts in Bath this coach puts up, said Mr. Pickwick, mildly addressing Mr. Winkle. Hum, what's that, said the strange man. I made an observation to my friend, sir, replied Mr. Pickwick, always ready to enter into conversation. I wondered at what house the Bath coach put up. Perhaps you can inform me. Are you going to Bath? said the strange man. I am, sir, replied Mr. Pickwick. And those other gentlemen? They are going also, said Mr. Pickwick. Not inside, I'll be damned if you're going inside, said the strange man. Not all of us, said Mr. Pickwick. No, not all of you, said the strange man emphatically. I've taken two places. If they try to squeeze six people into an infernal box that only holds four, I'll take a post-chaise and bring an action. I've paid my fare. It won't do, I told the clerk when I took my places that it wouldn't do. I know these things have been done. I know they are done every day, but I never was done, and I never will be. Those who know me best, best know it, crush me. Here the fierce gentleman rang the bell with great violence, and told the waiter he'd better bring the toast in five seconds, or he'd know the reason why. My good sir, said Mr. Pickwick, you will allow me to observe that this is a very unnecessary display of excitement. 
I have only taken places inside for two. I am glad to hear it, said the fierce man. I withdraw my expressions. I tender an apology. There's my card. Give me your acquaintance. With great pleasure, sir, replied Mr. Pickwick. We are to be fellow travellers, and I hope we shall find each other's society mutually agreeable. I hope we shall, said the fierce gentleman. I know we shall. I like your looks, they please me. Gentlemen, your hands and names. Know me. Of course, an interchange of friendly salutations followed this gracious speech. And the fierce gentleman immediately proceeded to inform the friends, in the same short, abrupt, jerking sentences, that his name was Dowler, that he was going to Bath on pleasure, that he was formerly in the army. That he had now set up in business as a gentleman, that he lived upon the profits, and that the individual for whom the second place was taken, was a personage no less illustrious than Mrs. Dowler, his lady wife. She's a fine woman, said Mr. Dowler. I am proud of her. I have reason. I hope I shall have the pleasure of judging, said Mr. Pickwick, with a smile. You shall, replied Dowler. She shall know you. She shall esteem you. I courted her under singular circumstances. I won her through a rash vow. Thus. I saw her, I loved her, I proposed, she refused me. You love another. Spare my blushes. I know him. You do. Very good, if he remains here, I'll skin him. Lord bless me, exclaimed Mr. Pickwick involuntarily. Did you skin the gentleman, sir, inquired Mr. Winkle, with a very pale face. I wrote him a note, I said it was a painful thing. And so it was. Certainly, interposed Mr. Winkle. I said I had pledged my word as a gentleman to skin him. My character was at stake. I had no alternative. As an officer in His Majesty's service, I was bound to skin him. I regretted the necessity, but it must be done. He was open to conviction. He saw that the rules of the service were imperative. He fled. I married her. Here's the coach. That's her head. As Mr. Dowler concluded, he pointed to a stage which had just driven up, from the open window of which a rather pretty face in a bright blue bonnet was looking among the crowd on the pavement, most probably for the rash man himself. Mr. Dowler paid his bill, and hurried out with his traveling cap, coat, and cloak, and Mr. Pickwick and his friends followed to secure their places. Mr. Tupman and Mr. Snodgrass had seated themselves at the back part of the coach, Mr. Winkle had got inside, and Mr. Pickwick was preparing to follow him, when Sam Weller came up to his master, and whispering in his ear, begged to speak to him, with an air of the deepest mystery. Well, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, what's the matter now? Here's rather a rum go, sir, replied Sam. What? inquired Mr. Pickwick. This here, sir, rejoined Sam. I'm wary much afeard, sir, that the propriator o oh, this here coach is a playin' some imprints with us. How is that, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, aren't the names down on the way bill? The names is not only down on the way bill, sir, replied Sam, but they've painted von on m up, on the door o oh, the coach. As Sam spoke, he pointed to that part of the coach door on which the proprietor's name usually appears, and there, sure enough, in gilt letters of a goodly size, was the magic name of Pickwick. Dear me, exclaimed Mr. Pickwick, quite staggered by the coincidence, what a very extraordinary thing. Yes, but that ain't all, said Sam, again directing his master's attention to the coach door. Not content with writing up Pickwick, they puts Moses afore it, which I call Adam insult to injury, as the parrot said when they not only took him from his native land, but made him talk the English language afterwards. It's odd enough, certainly, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, but if we stand talking here, we shall lose our places. What, ain't nothing, to be done in consequence, sir, exclaimed Sam, perfectly aghast at the coolness with which Mr. Pickwick prepared to ensconce himself inside. 
Done, said Mr. Pickwick. What should be done? Ain't nobody to be whopped for talking this here liberty, sir, said Mr. Weller, who had expected that at least he would have been commissioned to challenge the guard and the coachman to a pugilistic encounter on the spot. Certainly not, replied Mr. Pickwick eagerly, not on any account. Jump up to your seat directly. I am very much afeard, muttered Sam to himself, as he turned away, that something queer's come over the governor, or he'd never ha stood this so quiet. I hope that air trial hasn't broke his spirit, but it looks bad, very bad. Mr. Weller shook his head gravely, and it is worthy of remark, as an illustration of the manner in which he took this circumstance to heart, that he did not speak another word until the coach reached the Kensington Turnpike. Which was so long a time for him to remain taciturn, that the fact may be considered wholly unprecedented. Nothing worthy of special mention occurred during the journey. Mr. Dowler related a variety of anecdotes, all illustrative of his own personal prowess and desperation, and appealed to Mrs. Dowler in corroboration thereof, when Mrs. Dowler invariably brought in, in the form of an appendix, some remarkable fact or circumstance which Mr. Dowler had forgotten, or had perhaps through modesty, omitted, for the addenda in every instance went to show that Mr. Dowler was even a more wonderful fellow than he made himself out to be. Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Winkle listened with great admiration, and at intervals conversed with Mrs. Dowler, who was a very agreeable and fascinating person. So, what between Mr. Dowler's stories, and Mrs. Dowler's charms, and Mr. Pickwick's good humor, and Mr. Winkle's good listening, the insides contrived to be very companionable all the way. The outsides did as outsides always do. They were very cheerful and talkative at the beginning of every stage, and very dismal and sleepy in the middle, and very bright and wakeful again towards the end. There was one young gentleman in an India rubber cloak, who smoked cigars all day. And there was another young gentleman in a parody upon a greatcoat, who lighted a good many, and feeling obviously unsettled after the second whiff, threw them away when he thought nobody was looking at him. There was a third young man on the box who wished to be learned in cattle, and an old one behind, who was familiar with farming. There was a constant succession of Christian names in smock frocks and white coats, who were invited to have a lift by the guard, and who knew every horse and hostler on the road and off it. And there was a dinner which would have been cheap at half a crown a mouth, if any moderate number of mouths could have eaten it in the time. And at seven o'clock p.m. Mr. Pickwick and his friends, and Mr. Dowler and his wife, respectively retired to their private sitting rooms at the White Hart Hotel, opposite the great pump room, bath, where the waiters, from their costume, might be mistaken for Westminster boys. Only they destroy the illusion by behaving themselves much better. Breakfast had scarcely been cleared away on the succeeding morning, when a waiter brought in Mr. Dowler's card, with a request to be allowed permission to introduce a friend. Mr. Dowler at once followed up the delivery of the card, by bringing himself and the friend also. The friend was a charming young man of not much more than fifty, dressed in a very bright blue coat with resplendent buttons, black trousers, and the thinnest possible pair of highly polished boots. A gold eyeglass was suspended from his neck by a short, broad, black ribbon, a gold snuffbox was lightly clasped in his left hand, gold rings innumerable glittered on his fingers, and a large diamond pin set in gold glistened in his shirt frill. He had a gold watch, and a gold curb chain with large gold seals, and he carried a pliant ebony cane with a gold top. His linen was of the very whitest, finest, and stiffest, his wig of the glossiest, blackest, and culliest. His snuff was Prince's mixture, his scent bouquet du roi. His features were contracted into a perpetual smile, and his teeth were in such perfect order that it was difficult at a small distance to tell the real from the false. Mr. Pickwick, said Mr. Dowler, my friend, Angelo Cyrus Bantam, Esquire, M.C., Bantam, Mr. Pickwick. Know each other. Welcome to Ba, A.D.H., sir. This is indeed an acquisition. Most welcome to Ba, A.D.H., sir. It is long, very long, Mr. Pickwick, since you drank the waters. It appears an age, 
Mr. Pickwick. Remarkable. Such were the expressions with which Angelo Cyrus Bantam, Esquire, M.C., took Mr. Pickwick's hand. Retaining it in his, meantime, and shrugging up his shoulders with a constant succession of bows, as if he really could not make up his mind to the trial of letting it go again. It is a very long time since I drank the waters, certainly, replied Mr. Pickwick, for, to the best of my knowledge, I was never here before. Never in Ba, ADH, Mr. Pickwick, exclaimed the Grand Master, letting the hand fall in astonishment. Never in Ba, ADH. He. He. Mr. Pickwick, you are a wag. Not bad, not bad. Good, good. He. 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 Remarkable. To my shame, I must say that I am perfectly serious, rejoined Mr. Pickwick. I really never was here before. Oh, I see, exclaimed the Grand Master, looking extremely pleased, yes, yes, good, good, better and better. You are the gentleman of whom we have heard. Yes, we know you, Mr. Pickwick, we know you. The reports of the trial in those confounded papers, thought Mr. Pickwick. They have heard all about me. You are the gentleman residing on Clapham Green, resumed Bantam, who lost the use of his limbs from imprudently taking cold after port wine. Who could not be moved in consequence of acute suffering, and who had the water from the king's bath bottled at 103 degrees, and sent by wagon to his bedroom in town, where he bathed, sneezed, and the same day recovered. Very remarkable. Mr. Pickwick acknowledged the compliment which the supposition implied, but had the self-denial to repudiate it, notwithstanding, and taking advantage of a moment's silence on the part of the MC. Begged to introduce his friends, Mr. Tupman, Mr. Winkle, and Mr. Snodgrass. An introduction which overwhelmed the MC with delight and honor. Bantam, said Mr. Dowler, Mr. Pickwick and his friends are strangers. They must put their names down. Where's the book? The register of the distinguished visitors in Ba, ADH will be at the pump room this morning at two o'clock, replied the MC, will you guide our friends to that splendid building, and enable me to procure their autographs? I will, rejoined Dowler. This is a long call. It's time to go. I shall be here again in an hour. Come. This is a ball night, said the MC, again taking Mr. Pickwick's hand, as he rose to go. The ball nights in Ba, ADH are moments snatched from paradise. Rendered bewitching by music, beauty, elegance, fashion, etiquette, and, and, above all, by the absence of tradespeople, who are quite inconsistent with paradise, and who have an amalgamation of themselves at the Guildhall every fortnight, which is, to say the least, remarkable. Goodbye, goodbye, and protesting all the way downstairs that he was most satisfied, and most delighted, and most overpowered, and most flattered, Angelo Cyrus Bantam, Esquire, M.C. Stepped into a very elegant chariot that waited at the door, and rattled off. At the appointed hour, Mr. Pickwick and his friends, escorted by Dowler, repaired to the assembly rooms, and wrote their names down in the book an instance of condescension at which Angelo Bantam was even more overpowered than before. Tickets of admission to that evening's assembly were to have been prepared for the whole party, but as they were not ready, Mr. Pickwick undertook, despite all the protestations to the contrary of Angelo Bantam, to send Sam for them at four o'clock in the afternoon, to the MC's house in Queen Square. Having taken a short walk through the city, and arrived at the unanimous conclusion that Park Street was very much like the perpendicular streets a man sees in a dream, which he cannot get up for the life of him, they returned to the White Hart. And dispatched Sam on the errand to which his master had pledged him. Sam Weller put on his hat in a very easy and graceful manner, and, thrusting his hands in his waistcoat pockets, walked with great deliberation to Queen Square, whistling as he went along, several of the most popular airs of the day. As arranged with entirely new movements for that noble instrument the organ, either mouth or barrel. Arriving at the number in Queen Square to which he had been directed, he left off whistling and gave a cheerful knock, which was instantaneously answered by a powdered-headed footman in gorgeous livery, and of symmetrical stature. 
Is this here Mr. Bantam's, old feller, inquired Sam Weller, nothing abashed by the blaze of splendor which burst upon his sight in the person of the powdered-headed footman with the gorgeous livery. Why, young man? Was the haughty inquiry of the powdered-headed footman. Cos if it is, just you step into him with that bare card, and say Mr. Veller's a waitin', will you, said Sam. And saying it, he very coolly walked into the hall, and sat down. The powdered-headed footman slammed the door very hard, and scowled very grandly, but both the slam and the scowl were lost upon Sam, who was regarding a mahogany umbrella stand with every outward token of critical approval. Apparently his master's reception of the card had impressed the powdered-headed footman in Sam's favor, for when he came back from delivering it, he smiled in a friendly manner, and said that the answer would be ready directly. Very good, said Sam. Tell the old Gen LMN not to put himself in a perspiration. No hurry, six foot. I've had my dinner. You dine early, sir, said the powdered-headed footman. I find I gets on better at supper when I does, replied Sam. Have you been long in bath, sir, inquired the powdered-headed footman. I have not had the pleasure of hearing of you before. I haven't created any wary surprisen sensation here, as yet, rejoined Sam, for me and the other fashionables only come last night. Nice place, sir, said the powdered-headed footman. Seems so, observed Sam. Pleasant society, sir, remarked the powdered-headed footman. Very agreeable servants, sir. I should think they was, replied Sam. Affable, unaffected, say nothing to nobody sorts oh, fellers. Oh, very much so, indeed, sir, said the powdered-headed footman, taking Sam's remarks as a high compliment. Very much so indeed. Do you do anything in this way, sir? Inquired the tall footman, producing a small snuff-box with a fox's head on the top of it. Not without sneezing, replied Sam. Why, it is difficult, sir, I confess, said the tall footman. It may be done by degrees, sir. Coffee is the best practice. I carried coffee, sir, for a long time. It looks very like rap pee, sir. Here, a sharp peal at the bell reduced the powdered-headed footman to the ignominious necessity of putting the fox's head in his pocket, and hastening with a humble countenance to Mr. Bantam's study. By the by, who ever knew a man who never read or wrote either, who hadn't got some small back parlor which he would call a study? There is the answer, sir, said the powdered-headed footman. I'm afraid you'll find it inconveniently large. Don't mention it, said Sam, taking a letter with a small enclosure. It's just possible as exhausted nature may manage to survive it. I hope we shall meet again, sir, said the powdered-headed footman, rubbing his hands, and following Sam out to the doorstep. You are wary obligin', sir, replied Sam. Now, don't allow yourself to be fatigued beyond your powers. There's a amiable bein'. Consider what you owe to society, and don't let yourself be injured by too much work. For the sake o' oh, your feller creators, keep yourself as quiet as you can, only think what a loss you would be. With these pathetic words, Sam Weller departed. A very singular young man that, said the powdered-headed footman, looking after Mr. Weller, with a countenance which clearly showed he could make nothing of him. Sam said nothing at all. He winked, shook his head, smiled, winked again, and, with an expression of countenance which seemed to denote that he was greatly amused with something or other, walked merrily away. At precisely twenty minutes before eight o'clock that night, Angelo Cyrus Bantam, E.S.Q. The master of the ceremonies, emerged from his chariot at the door of the assembly rooms in the same wig, the same teeth, the same eyeglass, the same watch and seals, the same rings, the same shirt pin, and the same cane. The only observable alterations in his appearance were, that he wore a brighter blue coat, with a white silk lining, black tights, black silk stockings, and pumps, and a white waistcoat, and was, if possible, just a thought more scented. Thus attired, the master of the ceremonies, in strict discharge of the important duties of his all-important office, planted himself in the room to receive the company. Bath being full, the company, 
and the sixpences for tea, poured in, in shoals. In the ballroom, the long card room, the octagonal card room, the staircases, and the passages, the hum of many voices, and the sound of many feet, were perfectly bewildering. Dresses rustled, feathers waved, lights shone, and jewels sparkled. There was the music, not of the quadrille band, for it had not yet commenced, but the music of soft, tiny footsteps, with now and then a clear, merry laugh, low and gentle, but very pleasant to hear in a female voice, whether in bath or elsewhere. Brilliant eyes, lighted up with pleasurable expectation, gleamed from every side, and, look where you would, some exquisite form glided gracefully through the throng, and was no sooner lost, than it was replaced by another as dainty and bewitching. In the tea room, and hovering round the card tables, were a vast number of queer old ladies, and decrepit old gentlemen, discussing all the small talk and scandal of the day. With a relish and gusto which sufficiently bespoke the intensity of the pleasure they derived from the occupation. Mingled with these groups, were three or four match-making mamas, appearing to be wholly absorbed by the conversation in which they were taking part, but failing not from time to time to cast an anxious sidelong glance upon their daughters, who, remembering the maternal injunction to make the best use of their youth, had already commenced incipient flirtations in the mislaying scarves, putting on gloves, setting down cups, and so forth. Slight matters apparently, but which may be turned to surprisingly good account by expert practitioners. Lounging near the doors, and in remote corners, were various knots of silly young men, displaying various varieties of puppyism and stupidity. Amusing all sensible people near them with their folly and conceit, and happily thinking themselves the objects of general admiration, a wise and merciful dispensation which no good man will quarrel with. And lastly, seated on some of the back benches, where they had already taken up their positions for the evening, were divers unmarried ladies past their grand climacteric, who, not dancing because there were no partners for them, and not playing cards lest they should be set down as irretrievably single, were in the favorable situation of being able to abuse everybody without reflecting on themselves. In short, they could abuse everybody, because everybody was there. It was a scene of gaiety, glitter, and show, of richly dressed people, handsome mirrors, chalked floors, girandoles and wax candles. And in all parts of the scene, gliding from spot to spot in silent softness, bowing obsequiously to this party, nodding familiarly to that, and smiling complacently on all, was the sprucely attired person of Angelo Cyrus Bantam, Esquire. The master of the ceremonies. Stop in the tea room. Take your six by north. Then lay on hot water, and call it tea. Drink it, said Mr. Dowler, in a loud voice, directing Mr. Pickwick, who advanced at the head of the little party, with Mrs. Dowler on his arm. Into the tea room Mr. Pickwick turned, and catching sight of him, Mr. Bantam corkscrewed his way through the crowd and welcomed him with ecstasy. My dear sir, I am highly honored. Bah, ADH is favored. Mrs. Dowler, you embellish the rooms. I congratulate you on your feathers. Remarkable. Anybody here? inquired Dowler suspiciously. Anybody. The elite of Ba, A.T.H. Mr. Pickwick, do you see the old lady in the gauze turban? The fat old lady, inquired Mr. Pickwick innocently. Hush, my dear sir, nobody's fat or old in Ba, A.T.H. That's the dowager lady snuff enough. Is it, indeed, said Mr. Pickwick. No less a person, I assure you, said the master of the ceremonies. Hush. Draw a little nearer, Mr. Pickwick. You see the splendidly dressed young man coming this way. The one with the long hair, and the particularly small forehead, inquired Mr. Pickwick. The same. The richest young man in Ba, ADH at this moment. Young Lord Mutinhead. You don't say so. Said Mr. Pickwick. Yes. You'll hear his voice in a moment, Mr. Pickwick. He'll speak to me. The other gentleman with him, in the red underwaistcoat and dark mustache, is the Honorable Mr. Crush Tun, his bosom friend. How do you do, my lord? View a hot, bantam, said his lordship. It is very warm, my lord, replied the MC. 
confounded, assented the Honorable Mr. Crushton. Have you seen his lordship's mail cart, Bantam? inquired the Honorable Mr. Crushton, after a short pause, during which young Lord Mutinhead had been endeavoring to stare Mr. Pickwick out of countenance, and Mr. Crushton had been reflecting what subject his lordship could talk about best. Dear me, no, replied the MC. A mail cart. What an excellent idea. Remarkable. Gracious heavens, said his lordship, I thought everybody had seen the new mail cart, it's the neatest, pettiest, gracefulest thing that ever won upon wheels. Painted wed, with a queen piebald. With a real box for the letters, and all complete, said the Honorable Mr. Crushton. And a little seat in front, with an I one whale, for the driver, added his lordship. I dwove it over to Bristol the other morning, in a crimson coat, with two servants riding a quarter of a mile behind, and confound me if the people didn't whoosh out of their cottages, and asked my progress, to know if I wasn't the post. Glorious, glorious. At this anecdote his lordship laughed very heartily, as did the listeners, of course. Then, drawing his arm through that of the obsequious Mr. Crush Tun, Lord Mutinhead walked away. Delightful young man, his lordship, said the master of the ceremonies. So I should think, rejoined Mr. Pickwick drilly. The dancing having commenced, the necessary introductions having been made, and all preliminaries arranged, Angelo Bantam rejoined Mr. Pickwick, and led him into the card room. Just at the very moment of their entrance, the dowager Lady Snuffenuff and two other ladies of an ancient and whist-like appearance, were hovering over an unoccupied card table, and they no sooner set eyes upon Mr. Pickwick under the convoy of Angelo Bantam, then they exchanged glances with each other, seeing that he was precisely the very person they wanted, to make up the rubber. My dear Bantam, said the dowager lady Snuffenough coaxingly, find us some nice creature to make up this table, there's a good soul. Mr. Pickwick happened to be looking another way at the moment, so her ladyship nodded her head towards him, and frowned expressively. My friend Mr. Pickwick, my lady, will be most happy, I am sure, remarkably so, said the MC, taking the hint. Mr. Pickwick, Lady Snuffenough, Mrs. Colonel Wugsby, Miss Buello. Mr. Pickwick bowed to each of the ladies, and, finding escape impossible, cut. Mr. Pickwick and Miss Buello against Lady Snuffenough and Mrs. Colonel Wugsby. As the trump card was turned up, at the commencement of the second deal, two young ladies hurried into the room, and took their stations on either side of Mrs. Colonel Wugsby's chair, where they waited patiently until the hand was over. Now, Jane, said Mrs. Colonel Wugsby, turning to one of the girls, what is it? I came to ask, Ma, whether I might dance with the youngest Mr. Crawley, whispered the prettier and younger of the two. Good God, Jane, how can you think of such things, replied the mama indignantly. Haven't you repeatedly heard that his father has eight hundred a year, which dies with him. I am ashamed of you. Not on any account. Ma, whispered the other, who was much older than her sister, and very insipid and artificial, Lord Mutinhead has been introduced to me. I said I thought I wasn't engaged, Ma. You're a sweet pet, my love, replied Mrs. Colonel Wugsby, tapping her daughter's cheek with her fan, and are always to be trusted. He's immensely rich, my dear. Bless you. With these words Mrs. Colonel Wugsby kissed her eldest daughter most affectionately, and frowning in a warning manner upon the other, sorted her cards. Poor Mr. Pickwick. He had never played with three thorough-paced female card players before. They were so desperately sharp, that they quite frightened him. If he played a wrong card, Miss Buello looked a small armory of daggers. If he stopped to consider which was the right one, Lady Snuffenough would throw herself back in her chair, and smile with a mingled glance of impatience and pity to Mrs. Colonel Wugsby, at which Mrs. Colonel Wugsby would shrug up her shoulders, and cough, as much as to say she wondered whether he ever would begin. Then, at the end of every hand, Miss Buello would inquire with a dismal countenance and reproachful sigh, why Mr. Pickwick had not returned that diamond, or led the club, or roughed the spade, or finessed the heart, or led through the honor, 
or brought out the ace, or played up to the king, or some such thing, and in reply to all these grave charges, Mr. Pickwick would be wholly unable to plead any justification whatever, having by this time forgotten all about the game. People came and looked on, too, which made Mr. Pickwick nervous. Besides all this, there was a great deal of distracting conversation near the table, between Angelo Bantam and the two Misses Madinter, who, being single and singular, paid great court to the master of the ceremonies. In the hope of getting a stray partner now and then. All these things, combined with the noises and interruptions of constant comings in and goings out, made Mr. Pickwick play rather badly, the cards were against him, also. And when they left off at ten minutes past eleven, Miss Buello rose from the table considerably agitated, and went straight home, in a flood of tears and a sedan chair. Being joined by his friends, who one and all protested that they had scarcely ever spent a more pleasant evening, Mr. Pickwick accompanied them to the White Hart, and having soothed his feelings with something hot, went to bed, and to sleep, almost simultaneously. Chapter 36 The chief features of which will be found to be an authentic version of the legend of Prince Bladud, and a most extraordinary calamity that befell Mr. Winkle. As Mr. Pickwick contemplated a stay of at least two months in Bath, he deemed it advisable to take private lodgings for himself and friends for that period. And as a favourable opportunity offered for their securing, on moderate terms, the upper portion of a house in the Royal Crescent, which was larger than they required, Mr. and Mrs. Dowler offered to relieve them of a bedroom and sitting room. This proposition was at once accepted, and in three days' time they were all located in their new abode, when Mr. Pickwick began to drink the waters with the utmost assiduity. Mr. Pickwick took them systematically. He drank a quarter of a pint before breakfast, and then walked up a hill, and another quarter of a pint after breakfast, and then walked down a hill, and, after every fresh quarter of a pint, Mr. Pickwick declared, in the most solemn and emphatic terms, that he felt a great deal better, whereat his friends were very much delighted, though they had not been previously aware that there was anything the matter with him. The great pump room is a spacious saloon, ornamented with Corinthian pillars, and a music gallery, and a Tompion clock, and a statue of Nash, and a golden inscription, to which all the water drinkers should attend. For it appeals to them in the cause of a deserving charity. There is a large bar with a marble vase, out of which the pumper gets the water, and there are a number of yellow-looking tumblers, out of which the company get it. And it is a most edifying and satisfactory sight to behold the perseverance and gravity with which they swallow it. There are baths near at hand, in which a part of the company wash themselves. And a band plays afterwards, to congratulate the remainder on their having done so. There is another pump room, into which infirm ladies and gentlemen are wheeled, in such an astonishing variety of chairs and chaises, that any adventurous individual who goes in with the regular number of toes is in imminent danger of coming out without them. And there is a third, into which the quiet people go, for it is less noisy than either. There is an immensity of promenading, on crutches and off, with sticks and without, and a great deal of conversation, and liveliness, and pleasantry. Every morning, the regular water drinkers, Mr. Pickwick among the number, met each other in the pump room, took their quarter of a pint, and walked constitutionally. At the afternoon's promenade, Lord Mutonhead, and the Honourable Mr. Crush Tun, the Dowager Lady Snuffenough, Mrs. Colonel Wugsby, and all the great people, and all the morning water drinkers, met in grand assemblage. After this, they walked out, or drove out, or were pushed out in bath chairs, and met one another again. After this, the gentlemen went to the reading rooms, and met divisions of the mass. After this, they went home. If it were theatre night, perhaps they met at the theatre, if it were assembly night, they met at the rooms, and if it were neither, they met the next day. A very pleasant routine, with perhaps a slight tinge of sameness. Mr. Pickwick was sitting up by himself, after a day spent in this manner, making entries in his journal, his friends having retired to bed, when he was roused by a gentle tap at the room door. Beg your pardon, sir, said Mrs. Craddock, the landlady, peeping in, but did you want anything more, sir? Nothing more, ma'am, replied Mr. Pickwick. 
My young girl is gone to bed, sir, said Mrs. Craddock, and Mr. Dowler is good enough to say that he'll sit up for Mrs. Dowler, as the party isn't expected to be over till late, so I was thinking that if you wanted nothing more, Mr. Pickwick, I would go to bed. By all means, ma'am, replied Mr. Pickwick. Wish you good night, sir, said Mrs. Craddock. Good night, ma'am, rejoined Mr. Pickwick. Mrs. Craddock closed the door, and Mr. Pickwick resumed his writing. In half an hour's time the entries were concluded. Mr. Pickwick carefully rubbed the last page on the blotting paper, shut up the book, wiped his pen on the bottom of the inside of his coat tail, and opened the drawer of the inkstand to put it carefully away. There were a couple of sheets of writing paper, pretty closely written over, in the inkstand drawer, and they were folded so, that the title, which was in a good round hand, was fully disclosed to him. Seeing from this, that it was no private document, and as it seemed to relate to Bath, and was very short, Mr. Pickwick unfolded it, lighted his bedroom candle that it might burn up well by the time he finished. And drawing his chair nearer the fire, read as follows. The True Legend of Prince Bladded Less than two hundred years ago, on one of the public baths in this city, there appeared an inscription in honor of its mighty founder. The renowned Prince Bladded that inscription is now erased. For many hundred years before that time, there had been handed down, from age to age, an old legend, that the illustrious prince being afflicted with leprosy, on his return from reaping a rich harvest of knowledge in Athens, shunned the court of his royal father, and consorted moodily with husbandmen and pigs. Among the herd, so said the legend, was a pig of grave and solemn countenance, with whom the prince had a fellow feeling, for he too was wise, a pig of thoughtful and reserved demeanor. An animal superior to his fellows, whose grunt was terrible, and whose bite was sharp. The young prince sighed deeply as he looked upon the countenance of the majestic swine, he thought of his royal father, and his eyes were bedewed with tears. This sagacious pig was fond of bathing in rich, moist mud. Not in summer, as common pigs do now, to cool themselves, and did even in those distant ages, which is a proof that the light of civilization had already begun to dawn, though feebly, but in the cold, sharp days of winter. His coat was ever so sleek, and his complexion so clear, that the prince resolved to essay the purifying qualities of the same water that his friend resorted to. He made the trial. Beneath that black mud, bubbled the hot springs of bath. He washed, and was cured. Hastening to his father's court, he paid his best respects, and returning quickly hither, founded this city and its famous baths. He sought the pig with all the ardor of their early friendship, but, alas! The waters had been his death. He had imprudently taken a bath at too high a temperature, and the natural philosopher was no more. He was succeeded by Pliny, who also fell a victim to his thirst for knowledge. This was the legend. Listen to the true one. A great many centuries since, there flourished, in great state, the famous and renowned Lud Hudibras, King of Britain. He was a mighty monarch. The earth shook when he walked, he was so very stout. His people basked in the light of his countenance, it was so red and glowing. He was, indeed, every inch a king. And there were a good many inches of him, too, for although he was not very tall, he was a remarkable size round, and the inches that he wanted in height, he made up in circumference. If any degenerate monarch of modern times could be in any way compared with him, I should say the venerable King Cole would be that illustrious potentate. This good king had a queen, who eighteen years before, had had a son, who was called Bladded. He was sent to a preparatory seminary in his father's dominions until he was ten years old, and was then dispatched, in charge of a trusty messenger, to a finishing school at Athens. And as there was no extra charge for remaining during the holidays, and no notice required previous to the removal of a pupil, there he remained for eight long years, at the expiration of which time. The king his father sent the Lord Chamberlain over, to settle the bill, and to bring him home. Which, the Lord Chamberlain doing, was received with shouts, and pensioned immediately. When King Lud saw the prince his son, and found he had grown up such a fine young man, 
he perceived what a grand thing it would be to have him married without delay, so that his children might be the means of perpetuating the glorious race of Lud. Down to the very latest ages of the world. With this view, he sent a special embassy, composed of great noblemen who had nothing particular to do, and wanted lucrative employment, to a neighboring king, and demanded his fair daughter in marriage for his son. Stating at the same time that he was anxious to be on the most affectionate terms with his brother and friend, but that if they couldn't agree in arranging this marriage, he should be under the unpleasant necessity of invading his kingdom and putting his eyes out. To this, the other king, who was the weaker of the two, replied that he was very much obliged to his friend and brother for all his goodness and magnanimity, and that his daughter was quite ready to be married. Whenever Prince Bladed liked to come and fetch her. This answer no sooner reached Britain, than the whole nation was transported with joy. Nothing was heard, on all sides, but the sounds of feasting and revelry, except the chinking of money as it was paid in by the people to the collector of the royal treasures, to defray the expenses of the happy ceremony. It was upon this occasion that King Lud, seated on the top of his throne in full council, rose, in the exuberance of his feelings and commanded the Lord Chief Justice to order in the richest wines and the court minstrels, an act of graciousness which has been, through the ignorance of traditionary historians, attributed to King Cole. In those celebrated lines in which His Majesty is represented as calling for his pipe, and calling for his pot, and calling for his fiddlers three, which is an obvious injustice to the memory of King Lud, and a dishonest exaltation of the virtues of King Cole. But, in the midst of all this festivity and rejoicing, there was one individual present, who tasted not when the sparkling wines were poured forth, and who danced not, when the minstrels played. This was no other than Prince Bladed himself, in honor of whose happiness a whole people were, at that very moment, straining alike their throats and purse strings. The truth was, that the prince, forgetting the undoubted right of the minister for foreign affairs to fall in love on his behalf, had, contrary to every precedent of policy in diplomacy, already fallen in love on his own account, and privately contracted himself unto the fair daughter of a noble Athenian. Here we have a striking example of one of the manifold advantages of civilization and refinement. If the prince had lived in later days, he might at once have married the object of his father's choice, and then set himself seriously to work, to relieve himself of the burden which rested heavily upon him. He might have endeavored to break her heart by a systematic course of insult and neglect. Or, if the spirit of her sex, and a proud consciousness of her many wrongs had upheld her under this ill treatment, he might have sought to take her life, and so get rid of her effectually. But neither mode of relief suggested itself to Prince Bladed, so he solicited a private audience, and told his father. It is an old prerogative of kings to govern everything but their passions. King Lud flew into a frightful rage, tossed his crown up to the ceiling, and caught it again, for in those days kings kept their crowns on their heads, and not in the tower, stamped the ground, wrapped his forehead. Wondered why his own flesh and blood rebelled against him, and, finally, calling in his guards, ordered the prince away to instant confinement in a lofty turret. A course of treatment which the kings of old very generally pursued towards their sons, when their matrimonial inclinations did not happen to point to the same quarter as their own. When Prince Bladed had been shut up in the lofty turret for the greater part of a year, with no better prospect before his bodily eyes than a stone wall, or before his mental vision than prolonged imprisonment. He naturally began to ruminate on a plan of escape, which, after months of preparation, he managed to accomplish. Considerately leaving his dinner knife in the heart of his jailer, lest the poor fellow, who had a family, should be considered privy to his flight, and punished accordingly by the infuriated king. The monarch was frantic at the loss of his son. He knew not on whom to vent his grief and wrath, until fortunately bethinking himself of the Lord Chamberlain who had brought him home, he struck off his pension and his head together. Meanwhile, the young prince, effectually disguised, wandered on foot through his father's dominions, cheered and supported in all his hardships by sweet thoughts of the Athenian maid, who was the innocent cause of his weary trials. One day he stopped to rest in a country village, 
and seeing that there were gay dances going forward on the green, and gay faces passing to and fro, ventured to inquire of a reveller who stood near him, the reason for this rejoicing. Know you not, O stranger, was the reply, of the recent proclamation of our gracious king? Proclamation. No. What proclamation? Rejoined the prince, for he had travelled along the by and little frequented ways, and knew nothing of what had passed upon the public roads, such as they were. Why, replied the peasant, the foreign lady that our prince wished to wed, is married to a foreign noble of her own country, and the king proclaims the fact, and a great public festival besides. For now, of course, Prince Bladed will come back and marry the lady his father chose, who they say is as beautiful as the noonday sun. Your health, sir. God save the king. The prince remained to hear no more. He fled from the spot, and plunged into the thickest recesses of a neighboring wood. On, on, he wandered, night and day, beneath the blazing sun, and the cold pale moon, through the dry heat of noon, and the damp cold of night. In the gray light of morn, and the red glare of eve. So heedless was he of time or object, that being bound for Athens, he wandered as far out of his way as Bath. There was no city where Bath stands, then. There was no vestige of human habitation, or sign of man's resort, to bear the name. But there was the same noble country, the same broad expanse of hill and dale, the same beautiful channel stealing on, far away, the same lofty mountains which, like the troubles of life, viewed at a distance. And partially obscured by the bright mist of its morning, lose their ruggedness and asperity, and seem all ease and softness. Moved by the gentle beauty of the scene, the prince sank upon the green turf, and bathed his swollen feet in his tears. Oh! said the unhappy bladded, clasping his hands, and mournfully raising his eyes towards the sky, would that my wanderings might end here. Would that these grateful tears with which I now mourn hope misplaced, and love despised, might flow in peace for ever. The wish was heard. It was in the time of the heathen deities, who used occasionally to take people at their words, with a promptness, in some cases, extremely awkward. The ground opened beneath the prince's feet, he sank into the chasm. And instantaneously it closed upon his head for ever, save where his hot tears welled up through the earth, and where they have continued to gush forth ever since. It is observable that, to this day, large numbers of elderly ladies and gentlemen who have been disappointed in procuring partners, and almost as many young ones who are anxious to obtain them, repair annually to Bath to drink the waters. From which they derive much strength and comfort. This is most complimentary to the virtue of Prince Bladet's tears, and strongly corroborative of the veracity of this legend. Mr. Pickwick yawned several times when he had arrived at the end of this little manuscript, carefully refold, and replaced it in the inkstand drawer, and then, with a countenance expressive of the utmost weariness, lighted his chamber candle. And went upstairs to bed. He stopped at Mr. Dowler's door, according to custom, and knocked to say good night. Ah, said Dowler, going to bed. I wish I was. Dismal night. Windy, isn't it? Very, said Mr. Pickwick. Good night. Good night. Mr. Pickwick went to his bedchamber, and Mr. Dowler resumed his seat before the fire, in fulfillment of his rash promise to sit up till his wife came home. There are few things more worrying than sitting up for somebody, especially if that somebody be at a party. You cannot help thinking how quickly the time passes with them, which drags so heavily with you. And the more you think of this, the more your hopes of their speedy arrival decline. Clocks tick so loud, too, when you are sitting up alone, and you seem as if you had an undergarment of cobwebs on. First, something tickles your right knee, and then the same sensation irritates your left. You have no sooner changed your position, than it comes again in the arms. When you have fidgeted your limbs into all sorts of queer shapes, you have a sudden relapse in the nose, which you rub as if to rub it off, as there is no doubt you would, if you could. Eyes, too, are mere personal inconveniences. And the wick of one candle gets an inch and a half long, while you are snuffing the other. These, and various other little nervous annoyances, 
Render sitting up for a length of time after everybody else has gone to bed, anything but a cheerful amusement. This was just Mr. Dowler's opinion, as he sat before the fire, and felt honestly indignant with all the inhuman people at the party who were keeping him up. He was not put into better humor either, by the reflection that he had taken it into his head, early in the evening, to think he had got an ache there, and so stopped at home. At length, after several droppings asleep, and fallings forward towards the bars, and catchings backward soon enough to prevent being branded in the face, Mr. Dowler made up his mind that he would throw himself on the bed in the back room and think, not sleep, of course. I'm a heavy sleeper, said Mr. Dowler, as he flung himself on the bed. I must keep awake. I suppose I shall hear a knock here. Yes. I thought so. I can hear the watchman. There he goes. Fainter now, though. A little fainter. He's turning the corner. Ah. When Mr. Dowler arrived at this point, he turned the corner at which he had been long hesitating, and fell fast asleep. Just as the clock struck three, there was blown into the crescent a sedan chair with Mrs. Dowler inside, borne by one short, fat chairman, and one long, thin one, who had had much ado to keep their bodies perpendicular, to say nothing of the chair. But on that high ground, and in the crescent, which the wind swept round and round as if it were going to tear the paving stones up, its fury was tremendous. They were very glad to set the chair down, and give a good round loud double knock at the street door. They waited some time, but nobody came. Servants is in the arms o oh, porpoise, I think, said the short chairman, warming his hands at the attendant link boy's torch. I wish he'd give em a squeeze and wake em, observed the long one. Knock again, will you, if you please, cried Mrs. Dowler from the chair. Knock two or three times, if you please. The short man was quite willing to get the job over, as soon as possible. So he stood on the step, and gave four or five most startling double knocks, of eight or ten knocks a piece, while the long man went into the road, and looked up at the windows for a light. Nobody came. It was all as silent and dark as ever. Dear me, said Mrs. Dowler. You must knock again, if you please. There ain't a bell, is there, ma'am, said the short chairman. Yes, there is, interposed the link boy, I've been a-ringing at it ever so long. It's only a handle, said Mrs. Dowler, the wire's broken. I wish the servants' heads was, growled the long man. I must trouble you to knock again, if you please, said Mrs. Dowler, with the utmost politeness. The short man did knock again several times, without producing the smallest effect. The tall man, growing very impatient, then relieved him, and kept on perpetually knocking double knocks of two loud knocks each, like an insane postman. At length Mr. Winkle began to dream that he was at a club, and that the members being very refractory, the chairman was obliged to hammer the table a good deal to preserve order. Then he had a confused notion of an auction room where there were no bidders, and the auctioneer was buying everything in, and ultimately he began to think it just within the bounds of possibility that somebody might be knocking at the street door. To make quite certain, however, he remained quiet in bed for ten minutes or so, and listened, and when he had counted two or three and thirty knocks, he felt quite satisfied, and gave himself a great deal of credit for being so wakeful. Rap 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 ra, 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 rap, went the knocker. Mr. Winkle jumped out of bed, wondering very much what could possibly be the matter, and hastily putting on his stockings and slippers, folded his dressing gown round him, lighted a flat candle from the rushlight that was burning in the fireplace, and hurried downstairs. Here's somebody comin' at last, ma'am, said the short chairman. I wish I was behind him with a bradawl, muttered the long one. Who's there, cried Mr. Winkle, undoing the chain. Don't stop to ask questions, cast iron head, replied the long man, with great disgust, taking it for granted that the inquirer was a footman, but opened the door. Come, look sharp, timber eyelids, added the other encouragingly. Mr. Winkle, being half asleep, obeyed the command mechanically, 
opened the door a little, and peeped out. The first thing he saw, was the red glare of the Link Boy's torch. Startled by the sudden fear that the house might be on fire, he hastily threw the door wide open, and holding the candle above his head, stared eagerly before him, not quite certain whether what he saw was a sedan chair or a fire engine. At this instant there came a violent gust of wind, the light was blown out, Mr. Winkle felt himself irresistibly impelled on to the steps, and the door blew to, with a loud crash. Well, young man, now you have done it, said the short chairman. Mr. Winkle, catching sight of a lady's face at the window of the sedan, turned hastily round, plied the knocker with all his might and main, and called frantically upon the chairman to take the chair away again. Take it away, take it away, cried Mr. Winkle. Here's somebody coming out of another house, put me into the chair. Hide me. Do something with me. All this time he was shivering with cold. And every time he raised his hand to the knocker, the wind took the dressing gown in a most unpleasant manner. The people are coming down the crescent now. There are ladies with them, cover me up with something. Stand before me, roared Mr. Winkle. But the chairmen were too much exhausted with laughing to afford him the slightest assistance, and the ladies were every moment approaching nearer and nearer. Mr. Winkle gave a last hopeless knock, the ladies were only a few doors off. He threw away the extinguished candle, which, all this time he had held above his head, and fairly bolted into the sedan chair where Mrs. Dowler was. Now, Mrs. Craddock had heard the knocking in the voices at last. And, only waiting to put something smarter on her head than her nightcap, ran down into the front drawing room to make sure that it was the right party. Throwing up the window sash as Mr. Winkle was rushing into the chair, she no sooner caught sight of what was going forward below, than she raised a vehement and dismal shriek, and implored Mr. Dowler to get up directly, for his wife was running away with another gentleman. Upon this, Mr. Dowler bounced off the bed as abruptly as an India rubber ball, and rushing into the front room, arrived at one window just as Mr. Pickwick threw up the other, when the first object that met the gaze of both, was Mr. Winkle bolting into the sedan chair. Watchman, shouted Dowler furiously, stop him, hold him, keep him tight, shut him in, till I come down. I'll cut his throat, give me a knife, from ear to ear, Mrs. Craddock. I will. And breaking from the shrieking landlady, and from Mr. Pickwick, the indignant husband seized a small supper knife, and tore into the street. But Mr. Winkle didn't wait for him. He no sooner heard the horrible threat of the valorous Dowler, than he bounced out of the sedan, quite as quickly as he had bounced in, and throwing off his slippers into the road, took to his heels and tore round the crescent. Hotly pursued by Dowler and the watchman. He kept ahead, the door was open as he came round the second time. He rushed in, slammed it in Dowler's face, mounted to his bedroom, locked the door, piled a washhand stand, chest of drawers, and a table against it, and packed up a few necessaries ready for flight with the first ray of morning. Dowler came up to the outside of the door, avowed, through the keyhole, his steadfast determination of cutting Mr. Winkle's throat next day, and, after a great confusion of voices in the drawing room, amidst which that of Mr. Pickwick was distinctly heard endeavouring to make peace, the inmates dispersed to their several bedchambers, and all was quiet once more. It is not unlikely that the inquiry may be made, where Mr. Weller was, all this time. We will state where he was, in the next chapter. Chapter 37 Honorably accounts for Mr. Weller's absence, by describing a soiree to which he was invited and went, also relates how he was entrusted by Mr. Pickwick with a private mission of delicacy and importance. Mr. Weller, said Mrs. Craddock, upon the morning of this very eventful day, here's a letter for you. Wary odd that, said Sam. I'm afeard there must be something the matter, for I don't recollect any Gen L M N in my circle of acquaintance as is capable o' oh, writin' one. Perhaps something uncommon has taken place, observed Mrs. Craddock. It must be something, wary uncommon indeed, as could produce a letter out oh, any friend oh, mine, replied Sam, shaking his head dubiously, nothing, less than a natural convulsion, as the young gentleman observed when he was took with fits. It can't be from the governor, 
said Sam, looking at the direction. He always prints, I know, cause he learnt writin' from the large bills in the booking offices. It's a weary strange thing now, where this here letter can ha come from. As Sam said this, he did what a great many people do when they are uncertain about the writer of a note, looked at the seal, and then at the front, and then at the back, and then at the sides, and then at the superscription. And, as a last resource, thought perhaps he might as well look at the inside, and try to find out from that. It's wrote on gilt-edged paper, said Sam, as he unfolded it, and sealed in bronze vax with the top of a door key. Now for it. And, with a very grave face, Mr. Weller slowly read as follows. A select company of the Bath footmen presents their compliments to Mr. Weller, and requests the pleasure of his company this evening, to a friendly soiree, consisting of a boiled leg of mutton with the usual trimmings. The soiree to be on table at half past nine o'clock punctually. This was enclosed in another note, which ran thus Mr. John Smocker, the gentleman who had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Weller at the house of their mutual acquaintance, Mr. Bantam, a few days since, begs to enclose Mr. Weller the here with invitation. If Mr. Weller will call on Mr. John Smocker at nine o'clock, Mr. John Smocker will have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Weller. Signed, John Smocker. The envelope was directed to Blank Weller, ESQ, at Mr. Pickwick's, and in a parenthesis, in the left-hand corner, were the words, Barry Bell, as an instruction to the bearer. Vell, said Sam, this is comin', it rather powerful, this is. I never heard a biled leg o oh, mutton called a soiree for. I wonder what they'd call a roast one. However, without waiting to debate the point, Sam at once betook himself into the presence of Mr. Pickwick, and requested leave of absence for that evening, which was readily granted. With this permission and the street door key, Sam Weller issued forth a little before the appointed time, and strolled leisurely towards Queen Square, which he no sooner gained than he had the satisfaction of beholding Mr. John Smocker leaning his powdered head against a lamppost at a short distance off, smoking a cigar through an amber tube. How do you do, Mr. Weller, said Mr. John Smocker, raising his hat gracefully with one hand, while he gently waved the other in a condescending manner. How do you do, sir? Why, reasonably convalescent, replied Sam. How do you find yourself, my dear feller? Only so-so, said Mr. John Smocker. Ah, you've been a-workin' too hard, observed Sam. I was fearful you would, it won't do, you know, you must not give way to that, air uncompromising spirit o oh, yorn. It's not so much that, Mr. Weller, replied Mr. John Smocker, as bad wine, I'm afraid I've been dissipating. Oh. That's it, is it, said Sam, that's a wary bad complaint, that. And yet the temptation, you see, Mr. Weller, observed Mr. John Smocker. Ah. To be sure, said Sam. Plunged into the very vortex of society, you know, Mr. Weller, said Mr. John Smocker, with a sigh. Dreadful, indeed, rejoined Sam. But it's always the way, said Mr. John Smocker. If your destiny leads you into public life, and public station, you must expect to be subjected to temptations which other people is free from, Mr. Weller. Precisely what my uncle said, then he vent into the public line, remarked Sam, and wary right the old Gen LMN was, for he drank hisself to death in something less than a quarter. Mr. John Smocker looked deeply indignant at any parallel being drawn between himself and the deceased gentleman in question, but, as Sam's face was in the most immovable state of calmness, he thought better of it, and looked affable again. Perhaps we had better be walking, said Mr. Smocker, consulting a copper timepiece which dwelt at the bottom of a deep watch pocket, and was raised to the surface by means of a black string, with a copper key at the other end. Perhaps we had, replied Sam, or they'll overdo the soiree, and that'll spile it. Have you drank the waters, Mr. Weller, inquired his companion, as they walked towards High Street. Once, replied Sam. What did you think of M, sir? I thought they was particularly unpleasant, replied Sam. Ah, said Mr. John Smocker, 
You dislike the Kilabiat taste, perhaps? I don't know much about that, air, said Sam. I thought they'd a very strong flavor, oh, warm flat irons. That is the Kilabiat, Mr. Weller, observed Mr. John Smocker contemptuously. Well, if it is, it's a very inexpressive word, that's all, said Sam. It may be, but I ain't much in the chemical line myself, so I can't say. And here, to the great horror of Mr. John Smocker, Sam Weller began to whistle. I beg your pardon, Mr. Weller, said Mr. John Smocker, agonized at the exceeding ungenteel sound, will you take my arm? Thank ye, you're wary good, but I won't deprive you of it, replied Sam. I've rather away oh, putting my hands in my pockets, if it's all the same to you. As Sam said this, he suited the action to the word, and whistled far louder than before. This way, said his new friend, apparently much relieved as they turned down a by-street, we shall soon be there. Shall we, said Sam, quite unmoved by the announcement of his close vicinity to the select footmen of Bath. Yes, said Mr. John Smocker. Don't be alarmed, Mr. Weller. Oh, no, said Sam. You'll see some very handsome uniforms, Mr. Weller, continued Mr. John Smocker. And perhaps you'll find some of the gentlemen rather high at first, you know, but they'll soon come round. That's very kind on M, replied Sam. And you know, resumed Mr. John Smocker, with an air of sublime protection, you know, as you're a stranger, perhaps, they'll be rather hard upon you at first. They won't be very cruel, though, will they? inquired Sam. No, no, replied Mr. John Smocker, pulling forth the fox's head, and taking a gentlemanly pinch. There are some funny dogs among us, and they will have their joke, you know, but you mustn't mind M, you mustn't mind M. I'll try and bear up Agin such a reglar knock down oak talent, replied Sam. That's right, said Mr. John Smocker, putting forth his fox's head, and elevating his own, I'll stand by you. By this time they had reached a small greengrocer's shop which Mr. John Smocker entered, followed by Sam, who, the moment he got behind him, relapsed into a series of the very broadest and most unmitigated grins, and manifested other demonstrations of being in a highly enviable state of inward merriment. Crossing the greengrocer's shop, and putting their hats on the stairs in the little passage behind it, they walked into a small parlor and here the full splendor of the scene burst upon Mr. Weller's view. A couple of tables were put together in the middle of the parlor, covered with three or four cloths of different ages and dates of washing, arranged to look as much like one as the circumstances of the case would allow. Upon these were laid knives and forks for six or eight people. Some of the knife handles were green, others red, and a few yellow, and as all the forks were black, the combination of colors was exceedingly striking. Plates for a corresponding number of guests were warming behind the fender. And the guests themselves were warming before it, the chief and most important of whom appeared to be a stoutish gentleman in a bright crimson coat with long tails, vividly red breeches, and a cocked hat, who was standing with his back to the fire. And had apparently just entered, for besides retaining his cocked hat on his head, he carried in his hand a high stick such as gentlemen of his profession usually elevate in a sloping position over the roofs of carriages. Smocker, my lad, you're fin, said the gentleman with the cocked hat. Mr. Smocker dovetailed the top joint of his right-hand little finger into that of the gentleman with the cocked hat, and said he was charmed to see him looking so well. Well, they tell me I am looking pretty blooming, said the man with the cocked hat, and it's a wonder, too. I've been following our old woman about, two hours a day, for the last fortnight. And if a constant contemplation of the manner in which she hooks and eyes that infernal lavender-colored old gown of hers behind, isn't enough to throw anybody into a low state of despondency for life, stop my quarter's salary. At this, the assembled selections laughed very heartily, and one gentleman in a yellow waistcoat, with a coach-trimming border, whispered a neighbor in green foil smalls, that Tuckle was in spirits tonight. By the by, said Mr. Tuckle, Smocker, my boy, you, the remainder of the sentence was forwarded into Mr. John Smocker's ear, by whisper. Oh, dear me, I quite forgot, said Mr. John Smocker. 
Gentlemen, my friend Mr. Weller. Sorry to keep the fire off you, Weller, said Mr. Tuckle, with a familiar nod. Hope you're not cold, Weller. Not by no means, blazes, replied Sam. It, you'd be a wary chilly subject as felt cold when you stood opposite. You'd save coals if they put you behind the fender in the waiting room at a public office, you would. As this retort appeared to convey rather a personal allusion to Mr. Tuckle's crimson livery, that gentleman looked majestic for a few seconds, but gradually edging away from the fire, broke into a forced smile, and said it wasn't bad. Very much obliged for your good opinion, sir, replied Sam. We shall get on by degrees, I dessay. We'll try a better one by and by. At this point the conversation was interrupted by the arrival of a gentleman in orange-colored plush, accompanied by another selection in purple cloth, with a great extent of stocking. The newcomers having been welcomed by the old ones, Mr. Tuckle put the question that supper be ordered in, which was carried unanimously. The greengrocer and his wife then arranged upon the table a boiled leg of mutton, hot, with caper sauce, turnips, and potatoes. Mr. Tuckle took the chair, and was supported at the other end of the board by the gentleman in orange plush. The greengrocer put on a pair of wash leather gloves to hand the plates with, and stationed himself behind Mr. Tuckle's chair. Harris, said Mr. Tuckle, in a commanding tone. Sir, said the greengrocer. Have you got your gloves on? Yes, sir. Then take the kiver off. Yes, sir. The greengrocer did as he was told, with a show of great humility, and obsequiously handed Mr. Tuckle the carving knife, in doing which, he accidentally gaped. What do you mean by that, sir, said Mr. Tuckle, with great asperity. I beg your pardon, sir, replied the crestfallen greengrocer, I didn't mean to do it, sir, I was up very late last night, sir. I tell you what my opinion of you is, Harris, said Mr. Tuckle, with a most impressive air, you're a woolger beast. I hope, gentlemen, said Harris, that you won't be severe with me, gentlemen. I am very much obliged to you indeed, gentlemen, for your patronage, and also for your recommendations, gentlemen, whenever additional assistance in waiting is required. I hope, gentlemen, I give satisfaction. No, you don't, sir, said Mr. Tuckle. Very far from it, sir. We consider you an inattentive rascal, said the gentleman in the orange plush. And a low thief, added the gentleman in the green foil smalls. And an unreclaimable blagard, added the gentleman in purple. The poor greengrocer bowed very humbly while these little epithets were bestowed upon him, in the true spirit of the very smallest tyranny, and when everybody had said something to show his superiority, Mr. Tuckle proceeded to carve the leg of mutton, and to help the company. This important business of the evening had hardly commenced, when the door was thrown briskly open, and another gentleman in a light blue suit, and leaden buttons, made his appearance. Against the rules, said Mr. Tuckle. Too late, too late. No, no, positively I couldn't help it, said the gentleman in blue. I appeal to the company. An affair of gallantry now, an appointment at the theatre. Oh, that indeed, said the gentleman in the orange plush. Yes. Raleigh now, honor bright, said the man in blue. I made a promise to fetch our youngest daughter at half past ten, and she is such an uncommonly fine gal, that I Raleigh hadn't the art to disappoint her. No offense to the present company, sir, but a petticut, sir, a petticut, sir, is irrevocable. I begin to suspect there's something in that quarter, said Tuckle, as the newcomer took his seat next Sam, I've remarked, once or twice, that she leans very heavy on your shoulder when she gets in and out of the carriage. Oh, Raleigh, Raleigh, Tuckle, you shouldn't, said the man in blue. It's not fair. I may have said to one or two friends that she was a very divine creature, and had refused one or two offers without any hobbus cause, but, no, 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 indeed, Tuckle, before strangers, too, it's not right, you shouldn't. Delicacy, my dear friend, delicacy. And the man in blue, pulling up his neckerchief, and adjusting his coat cuffs, nodded and frowned as if there were more behind, 
which he could say if he liked, but was bound in honor to suppress. The man in blue being a light-haired, stiff-necked, free and easy sort of footman, with a swaggering air and pert face, had attracted Mr. Weller's special attention at first, but when he began to come out in this way, Sam felt more than ever disposed to cultivate his acquaintance, so he launched himself into the conversation at once, with characteristic independence. Your health, sir, said Sam. I like your conversation much. I think it's very pretty. At this the man in blue smiled, as if it were a compliment he was well used to. But looked approvingly on Sam at the same time, and said he hoped he should be better acquainted with him, for without any flattery at all he seemed to have the makings of a very nice fellow about him, and to be just the man after his own heart. You're very good, sir, said Sam. What a lucky fellow you are. How do you mean, inquired the gentleman in blue. That, air young lady, replied Sam. She knows what's what, she does. Ah. I see. Mr. Weller closed one eye, and shook his head from side to side, in a manner which was highly gratifying to the personal vanity of the gentleman in blue. I'm afraid you're a cunning fellow, Mr. Weller, said that individual. No, no, said Sam. I leave all that, bare to you. It's a great deal more in your way than mine, as the Gen L M N on the right side o oh, the garden ball said to the man on the wrong un, then the mad bull vase coming up the lane. Well, well, Mr. Weller, said the gentleman in blue, I think she has remarked my air and manner, Mr. Weller. I should think she couldn't very well be off old oh, that, said Sam. Have you any little thing of that kind in hand, sir? inquired the favored gentleman in blue, drawing a toothpick from his waistcoat pocket. Not exactly, said Sam. There's no daughters at my place, else of course I should hop made up to Von on M. As it is, I don't think I can do with anything under a female Marcus. I might keep up with a young woman o oh, large property as hadn't a title, if she made very fierce love to me. Not else. Of course not, Mr. Weller, said the gentleman in blue, one can't be troubled, you know, and we know, Mr. Weller, we, who are men of the world, that a good uniform must work its way with the women, sooner or later. In fact, that's the only thing, between you and me, that makes the service worth entering into. Just so, said Sam. That's it, oh, course. When this confidential dialogue had gone thus far, glasses were placed round, and every gentleman ordered what he liked best, before the public house shut up. The gentleman in blue, and the man in orange, who were the chief exquisites of the party, ordered, cold shrub and water, but with the others, gin and water, sweet, appeared to be the favorite beverage. Sam called the greengrocer a, desperate willin, and ordered a large bowl of punch, two circumstances which seemed to raise him very much in the opinion of the selections. Gentlemen, said the man in blue, with an air of the most consummate dandyism, I'll give you the ladies, come. Here, here, said Sam. The young missus is. Here there was a loud cry of, order, and Mr. John Smocker, as the gentleman who had introduced Mr. Weller into that company, begged to inform him that the word he had just made use of, was unparliamentary. Which word was that, air, sir, inquired Sam. Mrs. is, sir, replied Mr. John Smocker, with an alarming frown. We don't recognize such distinctions here. Oh, very good, said Sam, then I'll amend the observation and call, em the dear creators, if Blazesville allow me. Some doubt appeared to exist in the mind of the gentleman in the green foil smalls, whether the chairman could be legally appealed to, as, Blazes, but as the company seemed more disposed to stand upon their own rights than his. The question was not raised. The man with the cocked hat breathed short, and looked long at Sam, but apparently thought it as well to say nothing, in case he should get the worst of it. After a short silence, a gentleman in an embroidered coat reaching down to his heels, and a waistcoat of the same which kept one half of his legs warm, stirred his gin and water with great energy, and putting himself upon his feet. All at once by a violent effort, said he was desirous of offering a few remarks to the company. 
whereupon the person in the cocked hat had no doubt that the company would be very happy to hear any remarks that the man in the long coat might wish to offer. I feel a great delicacy, gentlemen, in coming forward, said the man in the long coat, having the misfortune to be a coachman, and being only admitted as an honorary member of these agreeable soirees, but I do feel myself bound. Gentlemen, drove into a corner, if I may use the expression, to make known an afflicting circumstance which has come to my knowledge. Which has happened I may say within the soap of my everyday contemplation. Gentlemen, our friend Mr. Whiffers, everybody looked at the individual in orange, our friend Mr. Whiffers has resigned. Universal astonishment fell upon the hearers. Each gentleman looked in his neighbor's face, and then transferred his glance to the upstanding coachman. You may well be separatist, gentlemen, said the coachman. I will not venture to state the reasons of this irreparable loss to the service, but I will beg Mr. Whiffers to state them himself, for the improvement and imitation of his admiring friends. The suggestion being loudly approved of, Mr. Whiffers explained. He said he certainly could have wished to have continued to hold the appointment he had just resigned. The uniform was extremely rich and expensive, the females of the family was most agreeable, and the duties of the situation was not, he was bound to say, too heavy. The principal service that was required of him, being, that he should look out of the hall window as much as possible, in company with another gentleman, who had also resigned. He could have wished to have spared that company the painful and disgusting detail on which he was about to enter, but as the explanation had been demanded of him, he had no alternative but to state, boldly and distinctly, that he had been required to eat cold meat. It is impossible to conceive the disgust which this avowal awakened in the bosoms of the hearers. Loud cries of, shame, mingled with groans and hisses, prevailed for a quarter of an hour. Mr. Whiffers then added that he feared a portion of this outrage might be traced to his own forbearing and accommodating disposition. He had a distinct recollection of having once consented to eat salt butter, and he had, moreover, on an occasion of sudden sickness in the house, so far forgotten himself as to carry a coal scuttle up to the second floor. He trusted he had not lowered himself in the good opinion of his friends by this frank confession of his faults. And he hoped the promptness with which he had resented the last unmanly outrage on his feelings, to which he had referred, would reinstate him in their good opinion, if he had. Mr. Whiffer's address was responded to, with a shout of admiration, and the health of the interesting martyr was drunk in a most enthusiastic manner, for this, the martyr returned thanks, and proposed their visitor, Mr. Weller, a gentleman whom he had not the pleasure of an intimate acquaintance with, but who was the friend of Mr. John Smocker, which was a sufficient letter of recommendation to any society of gentlemen whatever, or wherever. On this account, he should have been disposed to have given Mr. Weller's health with all the honors, if his friends had been drinking wine. But as they were taking spirits by way of a change, and as it might be inconvenient to empty a tumbler at every toast, he should propose that the honours be understood. At the conclusion of this speech, everybody took a sip in honour of Sam. And Sam having ladled out, and drunk, two full glasses of punch in honour of himself, returned thanks in a neat speech. Very much obliged to you, old fellers, said Sam, ladling away at the punch in the most unembarrassed manner possible, for this here compliment, which, comin' from sich a quarter, is wary over Velman. I've heard a good deal on you as a body, but I will say, that I never thought you was sich uncommon nice men as I find you air. I only hope you'll take care o' yourselves, and not compromise nothin' o' your dignity, which is a wary charmin thing to see, when one's out a walkin', and has always made me wary happy to look at. Ever since I was a boy about half as high as the brass-headed stick oh, my wary respectable friend, blazes, there. As to the victim of oppression in the suit oh, brimstone, all I can say of him, is, that I hope he'll get just as good a berth as he deserves, in which case it's wary little cold soiree as ever he'll be troubled with Agin. Here Sam sat down with a pleasant smile, and his speech having been vociferously applauded, the company broke up. W.I., you don't mean to say you're ego and old feller, said Sam Weller to his friend, Mr. John Smocker. I must, indeed, said Mr. Smocker, I promised Bantam. Oh, very well, 
said Sam, that's another thing. Perhaps he'd resign if you disappointed him. You ain't a goin', Blazes. Yes, I am, said the man with the cocked hat. What, and leave three quarters of a bowl of punch behind you, said Sam, nonsense, set down Agin. Mr. Tuckle was not proof against this invitation. He laid aside the cocked hat and stick which he had just taken up, and said he would have one glass, for good fellowship's sake. As the gentleman in blue went home the same way as Mr. Tuckle, he was prevailed upon to stop too. When the punch was about half gone, Sam ordered in some oysters from the greengrocer's shop, and the effect of both was so extremely exhilarating, that Mr. Tuckle, dressed out with the cocked hat and stick, danced the frog hornpipe among the shells on the table, while the gentleman in blue played an accompaniment upon an ingenious musical instrument formed of a hair comb upon a curl paper. At last, when the punch was all gone, and the night nearly so, they sallied forth to see each other home. Mr. Tuckle no sooner got into the open air, than he was seized with a sudden desire to lie on the curbstone. Sam thought it would be a pity to contradict him, and so let him have his own way. As the cocked hat would have been spoiled if left there, Sam very considerately flattened it down on the head of the gentleman in blue, and putting the big stick in his hand, propped him up against his own street door, rang the bell, and walked quietly home. At a much earlier hour next morning than his usual time of rising, Mr. Pickwick walked downstairs completely dressed, and rang the bell. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, when Mr. Weller appeared in reply to the summons, shut the door. Mr. Weller did so. There was an unfortunate occurrence here, last night, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, which gave Mr. Winkle some cause to apprehend violence from Mr. Dowler. So I've heard from the old lady downstairs, sir, replied Sam. And I'm sorry to say, Sam, continued Mr. Pickwick, with a most perplexed countenance, that in dread of this violence, Mr. Winkle has gone away. Gone Avery, said Sam. Left the house early this morning, without the slightest previous communication with me, replied Mr. Pickwick. And is gone, I know not where. He should ha, stopped and fought it out, sir, replied Sam contemptuously. It wouldn't take much to settle that, air Dowler, sir. Well, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, I may have my doubts of his great bravery and determination also. But however that may be, Mr. Winkle is gone. He must be found, Sam. Found and brought back to me. And I suppose he won't come back, sir, said Sam. He must be made, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. Who's to do it, sir, inquired Sam, with a smile. You, replied Mr. Pickwick. Very good, sir. With these words Mr. Weller left the room, and immediately afterwards was heard to shut the street door. In two hours' time he returned with so much coolness as if he had been dispatched on the most ordinary message possible, and brought the information that an individual, in every respect answering Mr. Winkle's description, had gone over to Bristol that morning, by the branch coach from the Royal Hotel. Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, grasping his hand, you're a capital fellow, an invaluable fellow. You must follow him, Sam. Sir Penelwy, sir, replied Mr. Weller. The instant you discover him, write to me immediately, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. If he attempts to run away from you, knock him down, or lock him up. You have my full authority, Sam. I'll be very careful, sir, rejoined Sam. You'll tell him, said Mr. Pickwick, that I am highly excited, highly displeased, and naturally indignant, at the very extraordinary course he has thought proper to pursue. I will, sir, replied Sam. You'll tell him, said Mr. Pickwick, that if he does not come back to this very house, with you, he will come back with me, for I will come and fetch him. I'll mention that, air, sir, rejoined Sam. You think you can find him, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, looking earnestly in his face. Oh, I'll find him if he's any veer, rejoined Sam, with great confidence. Very well, said Mr. Pickwick. Then the sooner you go the better. With these instructions, Mr. Pickwick placed a sum of money in the hands of his faithful servitor, 
and ordered him to start for Bristol immediately, in pursuit of the fugitive. Sam put a few necessaries in a carpet bag, and was ready for starting. He stopped when he had got to the end of the passage, and walking quietly back, thrust his head in at the parlor door. Sir, whispered Sam. Well, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. I fully understands my instructions, do I, sir, inquired Sam. I hope so, said Mr. Pickwick. It's Reg Larley understood about the knock and down, is it, sir, inquired Sam. Perfectly, replied Pickwick. Thoroughly. Do what you think necessary. You have my orders. Sam gave a nod of intelligence, and withdrawing his head from the door, set forth on his pilgrimage with a light heart. Chapter 38 How Mr. Winkle, when he stepped out of the frying pan, walked gently and comfortably into the fire. The ill-starred gentleman who had been the unfortunate cause of the unusual noise and disturbance which alarmed the inhabitants of the Royal Crescent in manner and form already described. After passing a night of great confusion and anxiety, left the roof beneath which his friend still slumbered, bound he knew not whither. The excellent and considerate feelings which prompted Mr. Winkle to take this step can never be too highly appreciated or too warmly extolled. If, reasoned Mr. Winkle with himself, if this Dowler attempts, as I have no doubt he will, to carry into execution his threat of personal violence against myself, it will be incumbent on me to call him out. He has a wife. That wife is attached to, and dependent on him. Heavens! If I should kill him in the blindness of my wrath, what would be my feelings ever afterwards? This painful consideration operated so powerfully on the feelings of the humane young man, as to cause his knees to knock together, and his countenance to exhibit alarming manifestations of inward emotion. Impelled by such reflections, he grasped his carpet bag, and creeping stealthily downstairs, shut the detestable street door with as little noise as possible, and walked off. Bending his steps towards the Royal Hotel, he found a coach on the point of starting for Bristol, and, thinking Bristol as good a place for his purpose as any other he could go to, he mounted the box. And reached his place of destination in such time as the pair of horses, who went the whole stage and back again, twice a day or more, could be reasonably supposed to arrive there. He took up his quarters at the bush, and designing to postpone any communication by letter with Mr. Pickwick until it was probable that Mr. Dowler's wrath might have in some degree evaporated, walked forth to view the city, which struck him as being a shade more dirty than any place he had ever seen. Having inspected the docks and shipping, and viewed the cathedral, he inquired his way to Clifton, and being directed thither, took the route which was pointed out to him. But as the pavements of Bristol are not the widest or cleanest upon earth, so its streets are not altogether the straightest or least intricate, and Mr. Winkle, being greatly puzzled by their manifold windings and twistings, looked about him for a decent shop in which he could apply afresh for counsel and instruction. His eye fell upon a newly painted tenement which had been recently converted into something between a shop and a private house, and which a red lamp, projecting over the fanlight of the street door, would have sufficiently announced as the residence of a medical practitioner, even if the word, surgery, had not been inscribed in golden characters on a wainscot ground, above the window of what, in times bygone, had been the front parlor. Thinking this an eligible place wherein to make his inquiries, Mr. Winkle stepped into the little shop where the gilt-labeled drawers and bottles were. And finding nobody there, knocked with a half-crown on the counter, to attract the attention of anybody who might happen to be in the back parlor, which he judged to be the innermost and peculiar sanctum of the establishment. From the repetition of the word surgery on the door, painted in white letters this time, by way of taking off the monotony. At the first knock, a sound, as of persons fencing with fire irons, which had until now been very audible, suddenly ceased. At the second, a studious-looking young gentleman in green spectacles, with a very large book in his hand, glided quietly into the shop, and stepping behind the counter, requested to know the visitor's pleasure. I am sorry to trouble you, sir, said Mr. Winkle, but will you have the goodness to direct me to? Ha! 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 roared the studious young gentleman, throwing the large book up into the air, 
and catching it with great dexterity at the very moment when it threatened to smash to atoms all the bottles on the counter. Here's a start. There was, without doubt. For Mr. Winkle was so very much astonished at the extraordinary behavior of the medical gentleman, that he involuntarily retreated towards the door, and looked very much disturbed at his strange reception. What, don't you know me? said the medical gentleman. Mr. Winkle murmured, in reply, that he had not that pleasure. Why, then, said the medical gentleman, there are hopes for me yet, I may attend half the old women in Bristol, if I've decent luck. Get out, you mouldy old villain, get out. With this adjuration, which was addressed to the large book, the medical gentleman kicked the volume with remarkable agility to the farther end of the shop, and, pulling off his green spectacles, grinned the identical grin of Robert Sawyer, Esquire. Formerly of Guy's Hospital in the borough, with a private residence in Lant Street. You don't mean to say you weren't down upon me, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, shaking Mr. Winkle's hand with friendly warmth. Upon my word I was not, replied Mr. Winkle, returning his pressure. I wonder you didn't see the name, said Bob Sawyer, calling his friend's attention to the outer door, on which, in the same white paint, were traced the words, Sawyer, late Nakamorph. It never caught my eye, returned Mr. Winkle. Lord, if I had known who you were, I should have rushed out, and caught you in my arms, said Bob Sawyer, but upon my life, I thought you were the king's taxes. No, said Mr. Winkle. I did, indeed, responded Bob Sawyer, and I was just going to say that I wasn't at home, but if you'd leave a message I'd be sure to give it to myself, for he don't know me, no more does the lighting and paving. I think the church rates guesses who I am, and I know the waterworks does, because I drew a tooth of his when I first came down here. But come in, come in. Chattering in this way, Mr. Bob Sawyer pushed Mr. Winkle into the back room, where, amusing himself by boring little circular caverns in the chimney piece with a red hot poker, sat no less a person than Mr. Benjamin Allen. Well, said Mr. Winkle. This is indeed a pleasure I did not expect. What a very nice place you have here. Pretty well, pretty well, replied Bob Sawyer. I passed, soon after that precious party, and my friends came down with the needful for this business. So I put on a black suit of clothes, and a pair of spectacles, and came here to look as solemn as I could. And a very snug little business you have, no doubt, said Mr. Winkle knowingly. Very, replied Bob Sawyer. So snug, that at the end of a few years you might put all the profits in a wine glass, and cover em over with a gooseberry leaf. You cannot surely mean that, said Mr. Winkle. The stock itself. Dummies, my dear boy, said Bob Sawyer. Half the drawers have nothing in em, and the other half don't open. Nonsense, said Mr. Winkle. Fact, honor. Returned Bob Sawyer, stepping out into the shop, and demonstrating the veracity of the assertion by divers' hard pulls at the little gilt knobs on the counterfeit drawers. Hardly anything real in the shop but the leeches, and they are second-hand. I shouldn't have thought it, exclaimed Mr. Winkle, much surprised. I hope not, replied Bob Sawyer, else where's the use of appearances, eh? But what will you take? Do as we do. That's right. Ben, my fine fellow, put your hand into the cupboard, and bring out the patent digester. Mr. Benjamin Allen smiled his readiness, and produced from the closet at his elbow a black bottle half full of brandy. You don't take water, of course. Said Bob Sawyer. Thank you, replied Mr. Winkle. It's rather early. I should like to qualify it, if you have no objection. None in the least, if you can reconcile it to your conscience, replied Bob Sawyer, tossing off, as he spoke, a glass of the liquor with great relish. Ben, the Pipkin. Mr. Benjamin Allen drew forth, from the same hiding place, a small brass pipkin, which Bob Sawyer observed he prided himself upon, particularly because it looked so businesslike. The water in the professional pipkin having been made to boil, in course of time, by various little shovelfuls of coal, which Mr. Bob Sawyer took out of a practicable window seat, labeled soda water, 
Mr. Winkle adulterated his brandy. And the conversation was becoming general, when it was interrupted by the entrance into the shop of a boy, in a sober grey livery and a gold-laced hat, with a small covered basket under his arm, whom Mr. Bob Sawyer immediately hailed with, Tom, you vagabond, come here. The boy presented himself accordingly. You've been stopping to, over, all the posts in Bristol, you idle young scamp, said Mr. Bob Sawyer. No, sir, I haven't, replied the boy. You had better not, said Mr. Bob Sawyer, with a threatening aspect. Who do you suppose will ever employ a professional man, when they see his boy playing at marbles in the gutter, or flying the garter in the horse road? Have you no feeling for your profession, you groveler? Did you leave all the medicine? Yes, sir. The powders for the child, at the large house with the new family, and the pills to be taken four times a day at the ill-tempered old gentleman's with the gouty leg? Yes, sir. Then shut the door, and mind the shop. Come, said Mr. Winkle, as the boy retired, things are not quite so bad as you would have me believe, either. There is some medicine to be sent out. Mr. Bob Sawyer peeped into the shop to see that no stranger was within hearing, and leaning forward to Mr. Winkle, said, in a low tone. He leaves it all at the wrong houses. Mr. Winkle looked perplexed, and Bob Sawyer and his friend laughed. Don't you see, said Bob. He goes up to a house, rings the area bell, pokes a packet of medicine without a direction into the servant's hand, and walks off. Servant takes it into the dining parlor. Master opens it, and reads the label, draft to be taken at bedtime, pills as before, lotion as usual, the powder. From Sawyer's, late Nakamorphs. Physician's prescriptions carefully prepared, and all the rest of it. Shows it to his wife, she reads the label, it goes down to the servants, they read the label. Next day, boy calls, very sorry, his mistake, immense business, great many parcels to deliver, Mr. Sawyer's compliments, late Nakamorph. The name gets known, and that's the thing, my boy, in the medical way. Bless your heart, old fellow, it's better than all the advertising in the world. We have got one four-ounce bottle that's been to half the houses in Bristol, and hasn't done yet. Dear me, I see, observed Mr. Winkle, what an excellent plan. Oh, Ben and I have hit upon a dozen such, replied Bob Sawyer, with great glee. The lamplighter has eighteen pence a week to pull the night bell for ten minutes every time he comes round. And my boy always rushes into the church just before the psalms, when the people have got nothing to do but look about them, and calls me out, with horror and dismay depicted on his countenance. Bless my soul, everybody says, somebody taken suddenly ill. Sawyer, late Nakamorph, sent for. What a business that young man has. At the termination of this disclosure of some of the mysteries of medicine, Mr. Bob Sawyer and his friend, Ben Allen, threw themselves back in their respective chairs, and laughed boisterously. When they had enjoyed the joke to their heart's content, the discourse changed to topics in which Mr. Winkle was more immediately interested. We think we have hinted elsewhere, that Mr. Benjamin Allen had a way of becoming sentimental after Brandy. The case is not a peculiar one, as we ourselves can testify, having, on a few occasions, had to deal with patients who have been afflicted in a similar manner. At this precise period of his existence, Mr. Benjamin Allen had perhaps a greater predisposition to maudlinism than he had ever known before, the cause of which malady was briefly this. He had been staying nearly three weeks with Mr. Bob Sawyer, Mr. Bob Sawyer was not remarkable for temperance, nor was Mr. Benjamin Allen for the ownership of a very strong head, the consequence was that, during the whole space of time just mentioned, Mr. Benjamin Allen had been wavering between intoxication partial, and intoxication complete. My dear friend, said Mr. Ben Allen, taking advantage of Mr. Bob Sawyer's temporary absence behind the counter, whither he had retired to dispense some of the second-hand leeches, previously referred to, my dear friend, I am very miserable. Mr. Winkle professed his heartfelt regret to hear it, 
and begged to know whether he could do anything to alleviate the sorrows of the suffering student. Nothing, my dear boy, nothing, said Ben. You recollect Arabella, Winkle. My sister Arabella, a little girl, Winkle, with black eyes, when we were down at Wardle's. I don't know whether you happen to notice her, a nice little girl, Winkle. Perhaps my features may recall her countenance to your recollection. Mr. Winkle required nothing to recall the charming Arabella to his mind, and it was rather fortunate he did not, for the features of her brother Benjamin would unquestionably have proved but an indifferent refresher to his memory. He answered, with as much calmness as he could assume, that he perfectly remembered the young lady referred to, and sincerely trusted she was in good health. Our friend Bob is a delightful fellow, Winkle, was the only reply of Mr. Ben Allen. Very, said Mr. Winkle, not much relishing this close connection of the two names. I designed M for each other, they were made for each other, sent into the world for each other, born for each other, Winkle, said Mr. Ben Allen, setting down his glass with emphasis. There's a special destiny in the matter, my dear sir, there's only five years difference between M and both their birthdays are in August. Mr. Winkle was too anxious to hear what was to follow to express much wonderment at this extraordinary coincidence, marvelous as it was, so Mr. Ben Allen, after a tear or two, went on to say that, notwithstanding all his esteem and respect and veneration for his friend, Arabella had unaccountably and undutifully evinced the most determined antipathy to his person. And I think, said Mr. Ben Allen, in conclusion, I think there's a prior attachment. Have you any idea who the object of it might be? asked Mr. Winkle, with great trepidation. Mr. Ben Allen seized the poker, flourished it in a warlike manner above his head, inflicted a savage blow on an imaginary skull, and wound up by saying, in a very expressive manner, that he only wished he could guess, that was all. I'd show him what I thought of him, said Mr. Ben Allen. And round went the poker again, more fiercely than before. All this was, of course, very soothing to the feelings of Mr. Winkle, who remained silent for a few minutes. But at length mustered up resolution to inquire whether Miss Allen was in Kent. No, no, said Mr. Ben Allen, laying aside the poker, and looking very cunning, I didn't think Wardle's exactly the place for a headstrong girl. So, as I am her natural protector and guardian, our parents being dead, I have brought her down into this part of the country to spend a few months at an old aunt's, in a nice, dull, close place. I think that will cure her, my boy. If it doesn't, I'll take her abroad for a little while, and see what that'll do. Oh, the aunt's is in Bristol, is it? faltered Mr. Winkle. No, no, not in Bristol, replied Mr. Ben Allen, jerking his thumb over his right shoulder. Over that way, down there. But, Hush, here's Bob. Not a word, my dear friend, not a word. Short as this conversation was, it roused in Mr. Winkle the highest degree of excitement and anxiety. The suspected prior attachment rankled in his heart. Could he be the object of it? Could it be for him that the fair Arabella had looked scornfully on the sprightly Bob Sawyer, or had he a successful rival? He determined to see her, cost what it might. But here an insurmountable objection presented itself, for whether the explanatory over that way, and down there, of Mr. Ben Allen, meant three miles off, or thirty, or three hundred, he could in no wise guess. But he had no opportunity of pondering over his love just then, for Bob Sawyer's return was the immediate precursor of the arrival of a meat pie from the baker's, of which that gentleman insisted on his staying to partake. The cloth was laid by an occasional charwoman, who officiated in the capacity of Mr. Bob Sawyer's housekeeper, and a third knife and fork having been borrowed from the mother of the boy in the grey livery, for Mr. Sawyer's domestic arrangements were as yet conducted on a limited scale, they sat down to dinner, the beer being served up, as Mr. Sawyer remarked, in its native pewter. After dinner, Mr. Bob Sawyer ordered in the largest mortar in the shop, and proceeded to brew a reeking jorum of rum punch therein, stirring up and amalgamating the materials with a pestle in a very creditable and apothecary-like manner. Mr. Sawyer, being a bachelor, 
had only one tumbler in the house, which was assigned to Mr. Winkle as a compliment to the visitor, Mr. Ben Allen being accommodated with a funnel with a cork in the narrow end, and Bob Sawyer contented himself with one of those wide-lipped crystal vessels inscribed with a variety of cabalistic characters, in which chemists are wont to measure out their liquid drugs in compounding prescriptions. These preliminaries adjusted, the punch was tasted, and pronounced excellent, and it having been arranged that Bob Sawyer and Ben Allen should be considered at liberty to fill twice to Mr. Winkles once, they started fair, with great satisfaction and good fellowship. There was no singing, because Mr. Bob Sawyer said it wouldn't look professional. But to make amends for this deprivation there was so much talking and laughing that it might have been heard, and very likely was, at the end of the street. Which conversation materially lightened the hours and improved the mind of Mr. Bob Sawyer's boy, who, instead of devoting the evening to his ordinary occupation of writing his name on the counter, and rubbing it out again, peeped through the glass door, and thus listened and looked on at the same time. The mirth of Mr. Bob Sawyer was rapidly ripening into the furious, Mr. Ben Allen was fast relapsing into the sentimental, and the punch had well-nigh disappeared altogether, when the boy hastily running in, announced that a young woman had just come over, to say that Sawyer late Nakamorph was wanted directly. A couple of streets off. This broke up the party. Mr. Bob Sawyer, understanding the message, after some twenty repetitions, tied a wet cloth round his head to sober himself, and, having partially succeeded, put on his green spectacles and issued forth. Resisting all entreaties to stay till he came back, and finding it quite impossible to engage Mr. Ben Allen in any intelligible conversation on the subject nearest his heart, or indeed on any other, Mr. Winkle took his departure, and returned to the bush. The anxiety of his mind, and the numerous meditations which Arabella had awakened, prevented his share of the mortar of punch producing that effect upon him which it would have had under other circumstances. So, after taking a glass of soda water and brandy at the bar, he turned into the coffee-room, dispirited rather than elevated by the occurrences of the evening. Sitting in front of the fire, with his back towards him, was a tallish gentleman in a greatcoat, the only other occupant of the room. It was rather a cool evening for the season of the year, and the gentleman drew his chair aside to afford the newcomer a sight of the fire. What were Mr. Winkle's feelings when, in doing so, he disclosed to view the face and figure of the vindictive and sanguinary Dowler. Mr. Winkle's first impulse was to give a violent pull at the nearest bell handle, but that unfortunately happened to be immediately behind Mr. Dowler's head. He had made one step towards it, before he checked himself. As he did so, Mr. Dowler very hastily drew back. Mr. Winkle, sir. Be calm. Don't strike me. I won't bear it. A blow. Never, said Mr. Dowler, looking meeker than Mr. Winkle had expected in a gentleman of his ferocity. A blow, sir, stammered Mr. Winkle. A blow, sir, replied Dowler. Compose your feelings. Sit down. Hear me. Sir, said Mr. Winkle, trembling from head to foot, before I consent to sit down beside, or opposite you, without the presence of a waiter, I must be secured by some further understanding. You used a threat against me last night, sir, a dreadful threat, sir. Here Mr. Winkle turned very pale indeed, and stopped short. I did, said Dowler, with a countenance almost as white as Mr. Winkle's. Circumstances were suspicious. They have been explained. I respect your bravery. Your feeling is upright. Conscious innocence. There's my hand. Grasp it. Really, sir, said Mr. Winkle, hesitating whether to give his hand or not, and almost fearing that it was demanded in order that he might be taken at an advantage, really, sir, I. I know what you mean, interposed Dowler. You feel aggrieved. Very natural. So should I. I was wrong. I beg your pardon. Be friendly. Forgive me. With this, Dowler fairly forced his hand upon Mr. Winkle, 
and shaking it with the utmost vehemence, declared he was a fellow of extreme spirit, and he had a higher opinion of him than ever. Now, said Dowler, sit down. Relate it all. How did you find me? When did you follow? Be frank. Tell me. It's quite accidental, replied Mr. Winkle, greatly perplexed by the curious and unexpected nature of the interview. Quite. Glad of it, said Dowler. I woke this morning. I had forgotten my threat. I laughed at the accident. I felt friendly. I said so. To whom, inquired Mr. Winkle. To Mrs. Dowler. You made a vow, said she. I did, said I. It was a rash one, said she. It was, said I, I'll apologize. Where is he? Who, inquired Mr. Winkle. You, replied Dowler. I went downstairs. You were not to be found. Pickwick looked gloomy. Shook his head. Hoped no violence would be committed. I saw it all. You felt yourself insulted. You had gone, for a friend perhaps. Possibly for pistols. High spirit, said I, I admire him. Mr. Winkle coughed, and beginning to see how the land lay, assumed a look of importance. I left a note for you, resumed Dowler. I said I was sorry. So I was. Pressing business called me here. You were not satisfied. You followed. You required a verbal explanation. You were right. It's all over now. My business is finished. I go back tomorrow. Join me. As Dowler progressed in his explanation, Mr. Winkle's countenance grew more and more dignified. The mysterious nature of the commencement of their conversation was explained, Mr. Dowler had as great an objection to dueling as himself. In short, this blustering and awful personage was one of the most egregious cowards in existence, and interpreting Mr. Winkle's absence through the medium of his own fears, had taken the same step as himself, and prudently retired until all excitement of feeling should have subsided. As the real state of the case dawned upon Mr. Winkle's mind, he looked very terrible, and said he was perfectly satisfied, but at the same time, said so with an air that left Mr. Dowler no alternative but to infer that if he had not been, something most horrible and destructive must inevitably have occurred. Mr. Dowler appeared to be impressed with a becoming sense of Mr. Winkle's magnanimity and condescension. And the two belligerents parted for the night, with many protestations of eternal friendship. About half past twelve o'clock, when Mr. Winkle had been reveling some twenty minutes in the full luxury of his first sleep, he was suddenly awakened by a loud knocking at his chamber door, which, being repeated with increased vehemence, caused him to start up in bed. And inquire who was there, and what the matter was. Please, sir, here's a young man which says he must see you directly, responded the voice of the chambermaid. A young man, exclaimed Mr. Winkle. No mistake about that, air, sir, replied another voice through the keyhole. And if that wary same interest in young creeter ain't let in without delay, it's wary possible as his legs will enter afore his countenance. The young man gave a gentle kick at one of the lower panels of the door, after he had given utterance to this hint, as if to add force and point to the remark. Is that you, Sam? inquired Mr. Winkle, springing out of bed. Quite impossible to identify any Gen LMN with any degree o oh, mental satisfaction, without looking at him, sir, replied the voice dogmatically. Mr. Winkle, not much doubting who the young man was, unlocked the door. Which he had no sooner done than Mr. Samuel Weller entered with great precipitation, and carefully relocking it on the inside, deliberately put the key in his waistcoat pocket, and, after surveying Mr. Winkle from head to foot, said, You're a wary humorous young Gen LMN, you air, sir. What do you mean by this conduct, Sam, inquired Mr. Winkle indignantly. Get out, sir, this instant. What do you mean, sir? What do I mean, retorted Sam. Come, sir, 
this is rather too rich, as the young lady said when she remonstrated with the pastry cook, arter he'd sold her a pork pie as had got nothing but fat inside. What do I mean? Well, that ain't a bad un, that ain't. Unlock that door, and leave this room immediately, sir, said Mr. Winkle. I shall leave this here room, sir, just precisely at the very same moment as you leaves it, responded Sam, speaking in a forcible manner, and seating himself with perfect gravity. If I find it necessary to carry you away, pick a back, oh, course I shall leave it the least bit, oh, time possible afore you, but allow me to express a hope as you won't reduce me to extremities. In saying which, I merely quote what the nobleman said to the fractious Pennywinkle, then he wound come out of his shell by means of a pin, and he consequently began to be afeard that he should be obliged to crack him in the parlor door. At the end of this address, which was unusually lengthy for him, Mr. Weller planted his hands on his knees, and looked full in Mr. Winkle's face, with an expression of countenance which showed that he had not the remotest intention of being trifled with. You're a amiably disposed young man, sir, I don't think, resumed Mr. Weller, in a tone of moral reproof, to go in wooing our precious governor in all sorts o' oh, fantiques, when he's made up his mind to go through everything for principle. You're far worse nor Dodson, sir. And as for Fogg, I consider him a born angel to you. Mr. Weller having accompanied this last sentiment with an emphatic slap on each knee, folded his arms with a look of great disgust, and threw himself back in his chair, as if awaiting the criminal's defense. My good fellow, said Mr. Winkle, extending his hand, his teeth chattering all the time he spoke, for he had been standing, during the whole of Mr. Weller's lecture, in his night gear, my good fellow, I respect your attachment to my excellent friend, and I am very sorry indeed to have added to his causes for disquiet. There, Sam, there. Well, said Sam, rather sulkily, but giving the proffered hand a respectful shake at the same time, well, so you ought to be, and I am very glad to find you heir, for, if I can help it, I won't have him put upon by nobody, and that's all about it. Certainly not, Sam, said Mr. Winkle. There. Now go to bed, Sam, and we'll talk further about this in the morning. I'm very sorry, said Sam, but I can't go to bed. Not go to bed, repeated Mr. Winkle. No, said Sam, shaking his head. Can't be done. You don't mean to say you're going back tonight, Sam, urged Mr. Winkle, greatly surprised. Not unless you particularly wish it, replied Sam, but I mustn't leave this here room. The governor's orders was peremptory. Nonsense, Sam, said Mr. Winkle, I must stop here two or three days, and more than that, Sam, you must stop here too, to assist me in gaining an interview with a young lady, Miss Allen, Sam. You remember her, whom I must and will see before I leave Bristol. But in reply to each of these positions, Sam shook his head with great firmness, and energetically replied, It can't be done. After a great deal of argument and representation on the part of Mr. Winkle, however, and a full disclosure of what had passed in the interview with Dowler, Sam began to waver. And at length a compromise was effected, of which the following were the main and principal conditions. That Sam should retire, and leave Mr. Winkle in the undisturbed possession of his apartment, on the condition that he had permission to lock the door on the outside, and carry off the key. Provided always, that in the event of an alarm of fire, or other dangerous contingency, the door should be instantly unlocked. That a letter should be written to Mr. Pickwick early next morning, and forwarded per Dowler, requesting his consent to Sam and Mr. Winkle's remaining at Bristol, for the purpose and with the object already assigned, and begging an answer by the next coach, if favorable, the aforesaid parties to remain accordingly, and if not, to return to Bath immediately on the receipt thereof. And, lastly, that Mr. Winkle should be understood as distinctly pledging himself not to resort to the window, fireplace, or other surreptitious mode of escape in the meanwhile. These stipulations having been concluded, Sam locked the door and departed. He had nearly got downstairs, when he stopped, and drew the key from his pocket. I quite forgot about the knock and down, said Sam, half turning back. 
the governor distinctly said it was to be done. Amazing, stupid, oh, me, that, air. Never mind, said Sam, brightening up, it's easily done tomorrow, anyways. Apparently much consoled by this reflection, Mr. Weller once more deposited the key in his pocket, and descending the remainder of the stairs without any fresh visitations of conscience, was soon, in common with the other inmates of the house, buried in profound repose. Chapter 39 Mr. Samuel Weller, being entrusted with a mission of love, proceeds to execute it, with what success will hereinafter appear. During the whole of next day, Sam kept Mr. Winkle steadily in sight, fully determined not to take his eyes off him for one instant, until he should receive express instructions from the fountain head. However disagreeable Sam's very close watch and great vigilance were to Mr. Winkle, he thought it better to bear with them, than, by any act of violent opposition, to hazard being carried away by force, which Mr. Weller more than once strongly hinted was the line of conduct that a strict sense of duty prompted him to pursue. There is little reason to doubt that Sam would very speedily have quieted his scruples, by bearing Mr. Winkle back to Bath, bound hand and foot, had not Mr. Pickwick's prompt attention to the note, which Dowler had undertaken to deliver, forestalled any such proceeding. In short, at eight o'clock in the evening, Mr. Pickwick himself walked into the coffee room of the Bush Tavern, and told Sam with a smile, to his very great relief, that he had done quite right, and it was unnecessary for him to mount guard any longer. I thought it better to come myself, said Mr. Pickwick, addressing Mr. Winkle, as Sam disencumbered him of his great coat and traveling shawl, to ascertain, before I gave my consent to Sam's employment in this matter, that you are quite in earnest and serious, with respect to this young lady. Serious, from my heart, from my soul, returned Mr. Winkle, with great energy. Remember, said Mr. Pickwick, with beaming eyes, we met her at our excellent and hospitable friends, Winkle. It would be an ill return to tamper lightly, and without due consideration, with this young lady's affections. I'll not allow that, sir. I'll not allow it. I have no such intention, indeed, exclaimed Mr. Winkle warmly. I have considered the matter well, for a long time, and I feel that my happiness is bound up in her. That's what we call tying it up in a small parcel, sir, interposed Mr. Weller, with an agreeable smile. Mr. Winkle looked somewhat stern at this interruption, and Mr. Pickwick angrily requested his attendant not to jest with one of the best feelings of our nature, to which Sam replied, that he wouldn't, if he was aware on it. But there were so many on M, that he hardly knowed which was the best ones when he heard M mentioned. Mr. Winkle then recounted what had passed between himself and Mr. Ben Allen, relative to Arabella. Stated that his object was to gain an interview with the young lady, and make a formal disclosure of his passion. And declared his conviction, founded on certain dark hints and mutterings of the aforesaid Ben, that, wherever she was at present immured, it was somewhere near the Downs. And this was his whole stock of knowledge or suspicion on the subject. With this very slight clue to guide him, it was determined that Mr. Weller should start next morning on an expedition of discovery, it was also arranged that Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Winkle, who were less confident of their powers, should parade the town meanwhile, and accidentally drop in upon Mr. Bob Sawyer in the course of the day, in the hope of seeing or hearing something of the young lady's whereabouts. Accordingly, next morning, Sam Weller issued forth upon his quest, in no way daunted by the very discouraging prospect before him. And away he walked, up one street and down another, we were going to say, up one hill and down another, only it's all uphill at Clifton, without meeting with anything or anybody that tended to throw the faintest light on the matter in hand. Many were the colloquies into which Sam entered with grooms who were airing horses on roads, and nursemaids who were airing children in lanes. But nothing could Sam elicit from either the first mentioned or the last, which bore the slightest reference to the object of his artfully prosecuted inquiries. There were a great many young ladies in a great many houses, the greater part whereof were shrewdly suspected by the male and female domestics to be deeply attached to somebody, or perfectly ready to become so, if opportunity afforded. 
But as none among these young ladies was Miss Arabella Allen, the information left Sam at exactly the old point of wisdom at which he had stood before. Sam struggled across the downs against a good high wind, wondering whether it was always necessary to hold your hat on with both hands in that part of the country, and came to a shady by-place, about which were sprinkled several little villas of quiet and secluded appearance. Outside a stable door at the bottom of a long back lane without a thoroughfare, a groom in undress was idling about, apparently persuading himself that he was doing something with a spade and a wheelbarrow. We may remark, in this place, that we have scarcely ever seen a groom near a stable, in his lazy moments, who has not been, to a greater or less extent, the victim of this singular delusion. Sam thought he might as well talk to this groom as to anyone else, especially as he was very tired with walking, and there was a good large stone just opposite the wheelbarrow. So he strolled down the lane, and, seating himself on the stone, opened a conversation with the ease and freedom for which he was remarkable. Morning, old friend, said Sam. Arternoon, you mean, replied the groom, casting a surly look at Sam. You're wary right, old friend, said Sam, I do mean Arternoon. How are you? Why, I don't find myself much the better for seeing of you, replied the ill-tempered groom. That's wary odd, that is, said Sam, for you look so uncommon cheerful, and seem altogether so lively, that it does Vun's heart good to see you. The surly groom looked surlier still at this, but not sufficiently so to produce any effect upon Sam, who immediately inquired, with a countenance of great anxiety, whether his master's name was not Walker. No, it ain't, said the groom. Nor Brown, I suppose, said Sam. No, it ain't. Nor Vilson. No, nor that either, said the groom. Vell, replied Sam, then I'm mistaken, and he hasn't got the honor o, oh, my acquaintance, which I thought he had. Don't wait here out o, oh, compliment to me, said Sam, as the groom wheeled in the barrow, and prepared to shut the gate. Ease a for ceremony, old boy, I'll excuse you. I'd knock your head off for half a crown, said the surly groom, bolting one half of the gate. Couldn't afford to have it done on those terms, rejoined Sam. It, you'd be worth a life's board wages at least, to you, and, you'd be cheap at that. Make my compliments indoors. Tell em not to vait dinner for me, and say they needn't mind puttin any by, for it'll be cold afore I come in. In reply to this, the groom waxing very wroth, muttered a desire to damage somebody's person but disappeared without carrying it into execution, slamming the door angrily after him, and wholly unheeding Sam's affectionate request, that he would leave him a lock of his hair before he went. Sam continued to sit on the large stone, meditating upon what was best to be done, and revolving in his mind a plan for knocking at all the doors within five miles of Bristol, taking them at a hundred and fifty or two hundred a day, and endeavouring to find Miss Arabella by that expedient when accident all of a sudden threw in his way what he might have sat there for a twelvemonth and yet not found without it. Into the lane where he sat, there opened three or four garden gates, belonging to as many houses, which though detached from each other, were only separated by their gardens. As these were large and long, and well planted with trees, the houses were not only at some distance off, but the greater part of them were nearly concealed from view. Sam was sitting with his eyes fixed upon the dust heap outside the next gate to that by which the groom had disappeared, profoundly turning over in his mind the difficulties of his present undertaking, when the gate opened. And a female servant came out into the lane to shake some bedside carpets. Sam was so very busy with his own thoughts, that it is probable he would have taken no more notice of the young woman than just raising his head and remarking that she had a very neat and pretty figure. If his feelings of gallantry had not been most strongly roused by observing that she had no one to help her, and that the carpet seemed too heavy for her single strength. Mr. Weller was a gentleman of great gallantry in his own way, and he no sooner remarked this circumstance than he hastily rose from the large stone, and advanced towards her. My dear, said Sam, sliding up with an air of great respect, you'll spile that wary pretty figure out oh, all proportion if you shake them carpets by yourself. Let me help you. The young lady, who had been coyly affecting not to know that a gentleman was so near, 
turned round as Sam spoke, no doubt, indeed she said so, afterwards, to decline this offer from a perfect stranger, when instead of speaking, she started back. And uttered a half-suppressed scream. Sam was scarcely less staggered, for in the countenance of the well-shaped female servant, he beheld the very features of his valentine, the pretty housemaid from Mr. Nupkins's. W.I., Mary, my dear, said Sam. Lauk, Mr. Weller, said Mary, how you do frighten one. Sam made no verbal answer to this complaint, nor can we precisely say what reply he did make. We merely know that after a short pause Mary said, Lor, do addin, Mr. Weller. And that his hat had fallen off a few moments before, from both of which tokens we should be disposed to infer that one kiss, or more, had passed between the parties. Why, how did you come here? said Mary, when the conversation to which this interruption had been offered, was resumed. Oh, course I came to look arter you, my darling, replied Mr. Weller, for once permitting his passion to get the better of his veracity. And how did you know I was here, inquired Mary. Who could have told you that I took another service at Ipswich, and that they afterwards moved all the way here? Who could have told you that, Mr. Weller? Ah, to be sure, said Sam, with a cunning look, that's the pint. Who could ha, told me? It wasn't Mr. Muzzle, was it, inquired Mary. Oh, no, replied Sam, with a solemn shake of the head, it warned him. It must have been the cook, said Mary. Oh, course it must, said Sam. Well, I never heard the like of that, exclaimed Mary. No more did I, said Sam. But Mary, my dear, here Sam's manner grew extremely affectionate, Mary, my dear, I've got another affair in hand as is wary press in. There's one oh, my governor's friends, Mr. Winkle, you remember him? Him in the green coat, said Mary. Oh, yes, I remember him. Well, said Sam, he's in a horrid state oh love, Reg Larley come fuzzled, and done over with it. Lor, interposed Mary. Yes, said Sam, but that's nothing if we could find out the young woman. And here Sam, with many digressions upon the personal beauty of Mary, and the unspeakable tortures he had experienced since he last saw her, gave a faithful account of Mr. Winkle's present predicament. Well, said Mary, I never did. Oh, course not, said Sam, and nobody never did, nor never vill neither. And here am I a walkin' about like the wandering Jew, a sportin' character you have perhaps heard on Mary, my dear, as Vos Alves doin' a match agin, time, and never vent to sleep, looking arter this here Miss Arabella Allen. Miss who? said Mary, in great astonishment. Miss Arabella Allen, said Sam. Goodness gracious, said Mary, pointing to the garden door which the sulky groom had locked after him. Why, it's that very house, she's been living there these six weeks. Their upper housemaid, which is lady's maid too, told me all about it over the wash house palings before the family was out of bed, one morning. Dot. What, the wary next door to you, said Sam. The very next, replied Mary. Mr. Weller was so deeply overcome on receiving this intelligence that he found it absolutely necessary to cling to his fair informant for support. And divers little love passages had passed between them, before he was sufficiently collected to return to the subject. Vell, said Sam at length, if this don't beat cockfightin', nothin', never vill, as the Lord Mayor said, then the Chief Secretary, O, oh, State proposed his missus's health arter dinner. That wary next house. W.I., I've got a message to her as I've been a-trying all day to deliver. Ah, said Mary, but you can't deliver it now, because she only walks in the garden in the evening, and then only for a very little time. She never goes out, without the old lady. Sam ruminated for a few moments, and finally hit upon the following plan of operations. That he should return just at dusk, the time at which Arabella invariably took her walk, and, being admitted by Mary into the garden of the house to which she belonged, would contrive to scramble up the wall. Beneath the overhanging boughs of a large pear tree, which would effectually screen him from observation. Would there deliver his message, and arrange, if possible, 
an interview on behalf of Mr. Winkle for the ensuing evening at the same hour. Having made this arrangement with great dispatch, he assisted Mary in the long-deferred occupation of shaking the carpets. It is not half as innocent a thing as it looks, that shaking little pieces of carpet, at least, there may be no great harm in the shaking, but the folding is a very insidious process. So long as the shaking lasts, and the two parties are kept the carpet's length apart, it is as innocent an amusement as can well be devised. But when the folding begins, and the distance between them gets gradually lessened from one half its former length to a quarter, and then to an eighth, and then to a sixteenth, and then to a thirty-second, if the carpet be long enough. It becomes dangerous. We do not know, to a nicety, how many pieces of carpet were folded in this instance, but we can venture to state that as many pieces as there were, so many times did Sam kiss the pretty housemaid. Mr. Weller regaled himself with moderation at the nearest tavern until it was nearly dusk, and then returned to the lane without the thoroughfare. Having been admitted into the garden by Mary, and having received from that lady sundry admonitions concerning the safety of his limbs and neck, Sam mounted into the pear tree, to wait until Arabella should come into sight. He waited so long without this anxiously expected event occurring, that he began to think it was not going to take place at all, when he heard light footsteps upon the gravel. And immediately afterwards beheld Arabella walking pensively down the garden. As soon as she came nearly below the tree, Sam began, by way of gently indicating his presence. To make sundry diabolical noises similar to those which would probably be natural to a person of middle age who had been afflicted with a combination of inflammatory sore throat, croup, and whooping cough, from his earliest infancy. Upon this, the young lady cast a hurried glance towards the spot whence the dreadful sounds proceeded. And her previous alarm being not at all diminished when she saw a man among the branches, she would most certainly have decamped, and alarmed the house, had not fear fortunately deprived her of the power of moving. And caused her to sink down on a garden seat, which happened by good luck to be near at hand. She's a goin' off, soliloquized Sam in great perplexity. What a thing it is, as these here young creeters will go a faint in Ava e just then they oughtn't to. Here, young woman, Miss Sawbones, Mrs. Vinkle, don't. Whether it was the magic of Mr. Winkle's name, or the coolness of the open air, or some recollection of Mr. Weller's voice, that revived Arabella, matters not. She raised her head and languidly inquired, Who's that, and what do you want? Hush, said Sam, swinging himself on to the wall, and crouching therein as small a compass as he could reduce himself to, Only me, miss, only me. Mr. Pickwick's servant, said Arabella earnestly. The wary same, miss, replied Sam. Here's Mr. Vinkle Reglarly sewed up with desperation, miss. Ah, said Arabella, drawing nearer the wall. Ah, indeed, said Sam. V thought V e should ha been obliged to straight basket him last night, he's been a raven all day. And he says if he can't see you afore tomorrow night's over, he wishes he may be something unpleasant if he don't drown himself. Oh, no, no, Mr. Weller, said Arabella, clasping her hands. That's what he says, miss, replied Sam coolly. He's a man of his word, and it's my opinion he'll do it, miss. He's heard all about you from the sawbones in barnacles. From my brother, said Arabella, having some faint recognition of Sam's description. I don't rightly know which is your brother, miss, replied Sam. Is it the dirtiest one o oh, the two? Yes, yes, Mr. Weller, returned Arabella, go on. Make haste, pray. Well, miss, said Sam, he's heard all about it from him. And it's the governor's opinion that if you don't see him wery quick, the sawbones as we've been a speakin' on, you'll get as much extra lead in his head as'll rather damage the development o oh, the organs if they ever put it in spirits art of arts. Oh, what can I do to prevent these dreadful quarrels, exclaimed Arabella. It's the suspicion of a priory, attachment as is the cause of it all, replied Sam. You'd better see him, miss. But how, where, cried Arabella. I dare not leave the house alone. My brother is so unkind, so unreasonable. 
I know how strange my talking thus to you may appear, Mr. Weller, but I am very, very unhappy, and here poor Arabella wept so bitterly that Sam grew chivalrous. It may seem very strange talking to me about these here affairs, miss, said Sam, with great vehemence, but all I can say is, that I'm not only ready but villain to do anything as'll make matters agreeable. And if chuckin' either o' oh, them sawbones is out o' oh, winder, you'll do it, I'm the man. As Sam Weller said this, he tucked up his wristbands, at the imminent hazard of falling off the wall in so doing, to intimate his readiness to set to work immediately. Flattering as these professions of good feeling were, Arabella resolutely declined, most unaccountably, as Sam thought, to avail herself of them. For some time she strenuously refused to grant Mr. Winkle the interview Sam had so pathetically requested. But at length, when the conversation threatened to be interrupted by the unwelcome arrival of a third party, she hurriedly gave him to understand, with many professions of gratitude. That it was barely possible she might be in the garden an hour later, next evening. Sam understood this perfectly well, and Arabella, bestowing upon him one of her sweetest smiles, tripped gracefully away, leaving Mr. Weller in a state of very great admiration of her charms, both personal and mental. Having descended in safety from the wall, and not forgotten to devote a few moments to his own particular business in the same department, Mr. Weller then made the best of his way back to the bush, where his prolonged absence had occasioned much speculation and some alarm. We must be careful, said Mr. Pickwick, after listening attentively to Sam's tale, not for our sakes, but for that of the young lady. We must be very cautious. We, said Mr. Winkle, with marked emphasis. Mr. Pickwick's momentary look of indignation at the tone of this remark, subsided into his characteristic expression of benevolence, as he replied. We, sir. I shall accompany you. You, said Mr. Winkle. I, replied Mr. Pickwick mildly. In affording you this interview, the young lady has taken a natural, perhaps, but still a very imprudent step. If I am present at the meeting, a mutual friend, who is old enough to be the father of both parties, the voice of calumny can never be raised against her hereafter. Mr. Pickwick's eyes lightened with honest exultation at his own foresight, as he spoke thus. Mr. Winkle was touched by this little trait of his delicate respect for the young protégé of his friend, and took his hand with a feeling of regard, akin to veneration. You shall go, said Mr. Winkle. I will, said Mr. Pickwick. Sam, have my greatcoat and shawl ready, and order a conveyance to be at the door tomorrow evening, rather earlier than is absolutely necessary, in order that we may be in good time. Mr. Weller touched his hat, as an earnest of his obedience, and withdrew to make all needful preparations for the expedition. The coach was punctual to the time appointed, and Mr. Weller, after duly installing Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Winkle inside, took his seat on the box by the driver. They alighted, as had been agreed on, about a quarter of a mile from the place of rendezvous, and desiring the coachman to await their return, proceeded the remaining distance on foot. It was at this stage of the undertaking that Mr. Pickwick, with many smiles and various other indications of great self-satisfaction, produced from one of his coat pockets a dark lantern, with which he had specially provided himself for the occasion, and the great mechanical beauty of which he proceeded to explain to Mr. Winkle, as they walked along, to the no small surprise of the few stragglers they met. I should have been the better for something of this kind, in my last garden expedition, at night, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, looking good-humouredly round at his follower, who was trudging behind. Very nice things, if they're managed properly, sir, replied Mr. Weller. But when you don't want to be seen, I think they're more useful arter the candles gone out, than when it's a light. Mr. Pickwick appeared struck by Sam's remarks, for he put the lantern into his pocket again, and they walked on in silence. Down here, sir, said Sam. Let me lead the way. This is the lane, sir. Down the lane they went, and dark enough it was. Mr. Pickwick brought out the lantern, once or twice, as they groped their way along, 
and through a very brilliant little tunnel of light before them, about a foot in diameter. It was very pretty to look at, but seemed to have the effect of rendering surrounding objects rather darker than before. At length they arrived at the large stone. Here Sam recommended his master and mister. Winkle to seat themselves, while he reconnoitred, and ascertained whether Mary was yet in waiting. After an absence of five or ten minutes, Sam returned to say that the gate was opened, and all quiet. Following him with stealthy tread, Mr. Pickwick and Mr. Winkle soon found themselves in the garden. Here everybody said, hush, a good many times, and that being done, no one seemed to have any very distinct apprehension of what was to be done next. Is Miss Allen in the garden yet, Mary? inquired Mr. Winkle, much agitated. I don't know, sir, replied the pretty housemaid. The best thing to be done, sir, will be for Mr. Weller to give you a hoist up into the tree, and perhaps Mr. Pickwick will have the goodness to see that nobody comes up the lane, while I watch at the other end of the garden. Goodness gracious, what's that? That bare blessed lantern, you'll be the death on us all, exclaimed Sam peevishly. Take care what you're a doin' on, sir, you're a sendin' a blaze o' light, right into the back parlor winder. Dear me, said Mr. Pickwick, turning hastily aside, I didn't mean to do that. Now, it's in the next house, sir, remonstrated Sam. Bless my heart, exclaimed Mr. Pickwick, turning round again. Now, it's in the stable, and they'll think the place is a fire, said Sam. Shut it up, sir can't you? It's the most extraordinary lantern I ever met with, in all my life!" exclaimed Mr. Pickwick, greatly bewildered by the effects he had so unintentionally produced. I never saw such a powerful reflector. It'll be vun too powerful for us, if you keep blazin' Avi in that manner, sir, replied Sam, as Mr. Pickwick, after various unsuccessful efforts, managed to close the slide. There's the young lady's footsteps. Now, Mr. Winkle, sir, up with you. Stop, stop, said Mr. Pickwick, I must speak to her first. Help me up, Sam. Gently, sir, said Sam, planting his head against the wall, and making a platform of his back. Step atop o oh, that air flower pot, sir. Now then, up with you. I'm afraid I shall hurt you, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick. Never mind me, sir, replied Sam. Lend him a hand, Mr. Winkle, sir. Steady, sir, steady. That's the time o oh, day. As Sam spoke, Mr. Pickwick, by exertions almost supernatural in a gentleman of his years and weight, contrived to get upon Sam's back, and Sam gently raising himself up, and Mr. Pickwick holding on fast by the top of the wall, while Mr. Winkle clasped him tight by the legs, they contrived by these means to bring his spectacles just above the level of the coping. My dear, said Mr. Pickwick, looking over the wall, and catching sight of Arabella, on the other side, don't be frightened, my dear, it's only me. Oh, pray go away, Mr. Pickwick, said Arabella. Tell them all to go away. I am so dreadfully frightened. Dear, dear Mr. Pickwick, don't stop there. You'll fall down and kill yourself, I know you will. Now, pray don't alarm yourself, my dear, said Mr. Pickwick soothingly. There is not the least cause for fear, I assure you. Stand firm, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, looking down. All right, sir, replied Mr. Weller. Don't be longer than you can conveniently help sir. You're rather heavy. Only another moment, Sam, replied Mr. Pickwick. I merely wished you to know, my dear, that I should not have allowed my young friend to see you in this clandestine way, if the situation in which you are placed had left him any alternative. And, lest the impropriety of this step should cause you any uneasiness, my love, it may be a satisfaction to you, to know that I am present. That's all, my dear. Indeed, Mr. Pickwick, I am very much obliged to you for your kindness and consideration, replied Arabella, drying her tears with her handkerchief. She would probably have said much more, had not Mr. 
Pickwick's head disappeared with great swiftness, in consequence of a false step on Sam's shoulder which brought him suddenly to the ground. He was up again in an instant however, and bidding Mr. Winkle make haste and get the interview over, ran out into the lane to keep watch, with all the courage and ardor of youth. Mr. Winkle himself, inspired by the occasion, was on the wall in a moment, merely pausing to request Sam to be careful of his master. I'll take care on him, sir, replied Sam. Leave him to me. Where is he? What's he doing, Sam, inquired Mr. Winkle. Bless his old gaiters, rejoined Sam, looking out at the garden door. He's a keepin' guard in the lane with that bare dark lantern, like a amiable Guy Fox. I never see such a fine creature in my days. Blessed if I don't think his heart must ha been born five and twenty year arter his body, at least. Mr. Winkle stayed not to hear the encomium upon his friend. He had dropped from the wall, thrown himself at Arabella's feet. And by this time was pleading the sincerity of his passion with an eloquence worthy even of Mr. Pickwick himself. While these things were going on in the open air, an elderly gentleman of scientific attainments was seated in his library, two or three houses off, writing a philosophical treatise. And ever and anon moistening his clay and his labors with a glass of claret from a venerable looking bottle which stood by his side. In the agonies of composition, the elderly gentleman looked sometimes at the carpet, sometimes at the ceiling, and sometimes at the wall. And when neither carpet, ceiling, nor wall afforded the requisite degree of inspiration, he looked out of the window. In one of these pauses of invention, the scientific gentleman was gazing abstractedly on the thick darkness outside, when he was very much surprised by observing a most brilliant light glide through the air, at a short distance above the ground. And almost instantaneously vanish. After a short time the phenomenon was repeated, not once or twice, but several times, at last the scientific gentleman, laying down his pen, began to consider to what natural causes these appearances were to be assigned. They were not meteors. They were too low. They were not glowworms, they were too high. They were not will-o'-the-wisps, they were not fireflies, they were not fireworks. What could they be? Some extraordinary and wonderful phenomenon of nature, which no philosopher had ever seen before, something which it had been reserved for him alone to discover, and which he should immortalize his name by chronicling for the benefit of posterity. Full of this idea, the scientific gentleman seized his pen again, and committed to paper sundry notes of these unparalleled appearances, with the date, day, hour, minute, and precise second at which they were visible, all of which were to form the data of a voluminous treatise of great research and deep learning, which should astonish all the atmospherical wiseacres that ever drew breath in any part of the civilized globe. He threw himself back in his easy chair, wrapped in contemplations of his future greatness. The mysterious light appeared more brilliantly than before, dancing, to all appearance, up and down the lane, crossing from side to side, and moving in an orbit as eccentric as comets themselves. The scientific gentleman was a bachelor. He had no wife to call in and astonish, so he rang the bell for his servant. Pruffle, said the scientific gentleman, there is something very extraordinary in the air tonight. Did you see that? Said the scientific gentleman, pointing out of the window, as the light again became visible. Yes, I did, sir. What do you think of it, Pruffle? Think of it, sir. Yes. You have been bred up in this country. What should you say was the cause for those lights, now? The scientific gentleman smilingly anticipated Pruffle's reply that he could assign no cause for them at all. Pruffle meditated. I should say it was thieves, sir, said Pruffle at length. You're a fool, and may go downstairs, said the scientific gentleman. Thank you, sir, said Pruffle. And down he went. But the scientific gentleman could not rest under the idea of the ingenious treatise he had projected being lost to the world, which must inevitably be the case if the speculation of the ingenious Mr. Pruffle were not stifled in its birth. He put on his hat and walked quickly down the garden, determined to investigate the matter to the very bottom. 
Now, shortly before the scientific gentleman walked out into the garden, Mr. Pickwick had run down the lane as fast as he could, to convey a false alarm that somebody was coming that way, occasionally drawing back the slide of the dark lantern to keep himself from the ditch. The alarm was no sooner given, than Mr. Winkle scrambled back over the wall, and Arabella ran into the house, the garden gate was shut, and the three adventurers were making the best of their way down the lane, when they were startled by the scientific gentleman unlocking his garden gate. Hold hard, whispered Sam, who was, of course, the first of the party. Show a light for just one second, sir. Mr. Pickwick did as he was desired, and Sam, seeing a man's head peeping out very cautiously within half a yard of his own, gave it a gentle tap with his clenched fist, which knocked it, with a hollow sound, against the gate. Having performed this feat with great suddenness and dexterity, Mr. Weller caught Mr. Pickwick up on his back, and followed Mr. Winkle down the lane at a pace which, considering the burden he carried, was perfectly astonishing. Have you got your wind back again, sir? inquired Sam, when they had reached the end. Quite. Quite, now, replied Mr. Pickwick. Then come along, sir, said Sam, setting his master on his feet again. Come between us, sir. Not half a mile to run. Think you're vinin' a cup, sir. Now for it. Thus encouraged, Mr. Pickwick made the very best use of his legs. It may be confidently stated that a pair of black gaiters never got over the ground in better style than did those of Mr. Pickwick on this memorable occasion. The coach was waiting, the horses were fresh, the roads were good, and the driver was willing. The whole party arrived in safety at the bush before Mr. Pickwick had recovered his breath. In with you at once, sir, said Sam, as he helped his master out. Don't stop a second in the street, arter that air exercise. Beg your pardon, sir, continued Sam, touching his hat as Mr. Winkle descended, hope there weren't a priory, attachment, sir. Mr. Winkle grasped his humble friend by the hand, and whispered in his ear, it's all right, Sam, quite right. Upon which Mr. Weller struck three distinct blows upon his nose in token of intelligence, smiled, winked, and proceeded to put the steps up, with a countenance expressive of lively satisfaction. As to the scientific gentleman, he demonstrated, in a masterly treatise, that these wonderful lights were the effect of electricity and clearly proved the same by detailing how a flash of fire danced before his eyes when he put his head out of the gate, and how he received a shock which stunned him for a quarter of an hour afterwards. Which demonstration delighted all the scientific associations beyond measure, and caused him to be considered a light of science ever afterwards. Chapter 40 Introduces Mr. Pickwick to a new and not uninteresting scene in the great drama of life. The remainder of the period which Mr. Pickwick had assigned as the duration of the stay at Bath passed over without the occurrence of anything material. Trinity term commenced. On the expiration of its first week, Mr. Pickwick and his friends returned to London, and the former gentleman, attended of course by Sam, straightway repaired to his old quarters at the George and Vulture. On the third morning after their arrival, just as all the clocks in the city were striking nine individually, and somewhere about 999 collectively, Sam was taking the air in George Yard. When a queer sort of fresh-painted vehicle drove up, out of which there jumped with great agility, throwing the reins to a stout man who sat beside him, a queer sort of gentleman, who seemed made for the vehicle, and the vehicle for him. The vehicle was not exactly a gig, neither was it a stanhope. It was not what is currently denominated a dog cart, neither was it a taxed cart, nor a chaise cart, nor a guillotine cabriolet. And yet it had something of the character of each and every of these machines. It was painted a bright yellow, with the shafts and wheels picked out in black. And the driver sat in the orthodox sporting style, on cushions piled about two feet above the rail. The horse was a bay, a well-looking animal enough. But with something of a flash and dog-fighting air about him, nevertheless, which accorded both with the vehicle and his master. The master himself was a man of about forty, with black hair, and carefully combed whiskers. He was dressed in a particularly gorgeous manner, 
with plenty of articles of jewelry about him, all about three sizes larger than those which are usually worn by gentlemen, and a rough greatcoat to crown the whole. Into one pocket of this greatcoat, he thrust his left hand the moment he dismounted, while from the other he drew forth, with his right, a very bright and glaring silk handkerchief, with which he whisked a speck or two of dust from his boots. And then, crumpling it in his hand, swaggered up the court. It had not escaped Sam's attention that, when this person dismounted, a shabby-looking man in a brown greatcoat shorn of divers' buttons, who had been previously slinking about, on the opposite side of the way, crossed over. And remained stationary close by. Having something more than a suspicion of the object of the gentleman's visit, Sam preceded him to the George and Vulture, and, turning sharp round, planted himself in the center of the doorway. Now, my fine fellow, said the man in the rough coat, in an imperious tone, attempting at the same time to push his way past. Now, sir, what's the matter, replied Sam, returning the push with compound interest. Come, none of this, my man. This won't do with me, said the owner of the rough coat, raising his voice, and turning white. Here, smouch. Well, what's amiss here, growled the man in the brown coat, who had been gradually sneaking up the court during this short dialogue. Only some insolence of this young man's, said the principal, giving Sam another push. Come, none owe this gammon, growled Smouch, giving him another, and a harder one. This last push had the effect which it was intended by the experienced Mr. Smouch to produce, for while Sam, anxious to return the compliment, was grinding that gentleman's body against the doorpost, the principal crept past, and made his way to the bar, whither Sam, after bandying a few epithetical remarks with Mr. Smouch, followed at once. Good morning, my dear, said the principal, addressing the young lady at the bar, with Botany Bay ease, and New South Wales gentility, which is Mr. Pickwick's room, my dear. Show him up, said the barmaid to a waiter, without deigning another look at the exquisite, in reply to his inquiry. The waiter led the way upstairs as he was desired, and the man in the rough coat followed, with Sam behind him, who, in his progress up the staircase, indulged in sundry gestures indicative of supreme contempt and defiance. To the unspeakable gratification of the servants and other lookers-on. Mr. Smouch, who was troubled with a hoarse cough, remained below, and expectorated in the passage. Mr. Pickwick was fast asleep in bed, when his early visitor, followed by Sam, entered the room. The noise they made, in so doing, awoke him. Shaving water, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, from within the curtains. Shave you directly, Mr. Pickwick, said the visitor, drawing one of them back from the bed's head. I've got an execution against you, at the suit of Bardeld, here's the warrant. Common please dot, here's my card. I suppose you'll come over to my house. Giving Mr. Pickwick a friendly tap on the shoulder, the sheriff's officer, for such he was, threw his card on the counterpane, and pulled a gold toothpick from his waistcoat pocket. Namby's the name, said the sheriff's deputy, as Mr. Pickwick took his spectacles from under the pillow, and put them on, to read the card. Namby, Bell Alley, Coleman Street. At this point, Sam Weller, who had had his eyes fixed hitherto on Mr. Namby's shining beaver, interfered. Are you a Quaker? said Sam. I'll let you know I am, before I've done with you, replied the indignant officer. I'll teach you manners, my fine fellow, one of these fine mornings. Thank ye, said Sam. I'll do the same to you. Take your hat off. With this, Mr. Weller, in the most dexterous manner, knocked Mr. Namby's hat to the other side of the room, with such violence, that he had very nearly caused him to swallow the gold toothpick into the bargain. Observe this, Mr. Pickwick, said the disconcerted officer, gasping for breath. I've been assaulted in the execution of my duty by your servant in your chamber. I'm in bodily fear. I call you to witness this. Don't witness nothing, sir, interposed Sam. Shut your eyes up tight, sir. I'd pitch him out oh, winder, only he couldn't fall far enough, cause oh the lead's outside. Sam, said Mr. 
Pickwick, in an angry voice, as his attendant made various demonstrations of hostilities, if you say another word, or offer the slightest interference with this person, I discharge you that instant. But, sir, said Sam. Hold your tongue, interposed Mr. Pickwick. Take that hat up again. But this Sam flatly and positively refused to do. And, after he had been severely reprimanded by his master, the officer, being in a hurry, condescended to pick it up himself, venting a great variety of threats against Sam meanwhile, which that gentleman received with perfect composure. Merely observing that if Mr. Namby would have the goodness to put his hat on again, he would knock it into the latter end of next week. Mr. Namby, perhaps thinking that such a process might be productive of inconvenience to himself, declined to offer the temptation, and, soon after, called up Smouch. Having informed him that the capture was made, and that he was to wait for the prisoner until he should have finished dressing, Namby then swaggered out, and drove away. Smouch, requesting Mr. Pickwick in a surly manner, to be as alive as he could, for it was a busy time, drew up a chair by the door and sat there, until he had finished dressing. Sam was then dispatched for a hackney coach, and in it the triumvirate proceeded to Coleman Street. It was fortunate the distance was short, for Mr. Smouch, besides possessing no very enchanting conversational powers, was rendered a decidedly unpleasant companion in a limited space, by the physical weakness to which we have elsewhere adverted. The coach having turned into a very narrow and dark street, stopped before a house with iron bars to all the windows, the doorposts of which were graced by the name and title of Namby, officer to the sheriffs of London. The inner gate having been opened by a gentleman who might have passed for a neglected twin brother of Mr. Smouch, and who was endowed with a large key for the purpose, Mr. Pickwick was shown into the coffee room. This coffee room was a front parlor, the principal features of which were fresh sand and stale tobacco smoke. Mr. Pickwick bowed to the three persons who were seated in it when he entered. And having dispatched Sam for Perker, withdrew into an obscure corner, and looked thence with some curiosity upon his new companions. One of these was a mere boy of nineteen or twenty, who, though it was yet barely ten o'clock, was drinking gin and water, and smoking a cigar, amusements to which, judging from his inflamed countenance, he had devoted himself pretty constantly for the last year or two of his life. Opposite him, engaged in stirring the fire with the toe of his right boot, was a coarse, vulgar young man of about thirty, with a sallow face and harsh voice. Evidently possessed of that knowledge of the world, and captivating freedom of manner, which is to be acquired in public house parlors, and at low billiard tables. The third tenant of the apartment was a middle-aged man in a very old suit of black, who looked pale and haggard, and paced up and down the room incessantly. Stopping, now and then, to look with great anxiety out of the window as if he expected somebody, and then resuming his walk. You'd better have the loan of my razor this morning, Mr. Ayrsley, said the man who was stirring the fire, tipping the wink to his friend the boy. Thank you, no, I shan't want it, I expect I shall be out, in the course of an hour or so, replied the other in a hurried manner. Then, walking again up to the window, and once more returning disappointed, he sighed deeply, and left the room, upon which the other two burst into a loud laugh. Well, I never saw such a game as that, said the gentleman who had offered the razor, whose name appeared to be Price. Never. Mr. Price confirmed the assertion with an oath, and then laughed again, when of course the boy, who thought his companion one of the most dashing fellows alive, laughed also. You'd hardly think, would you now, said Price, turning towards Mr. Pickwick, that that chap's been here a week yesterday, and never once shaved himself yet, because he feels so certain he's going out in half an hour's time, thinks he may as well put it off till he gets home. Poor man, said Mr. Pickwick. Are his chances of getting out of his difficulties really so great? Chances be d, d, replied Price, he hasn't half the ghost of one. I wouldn't give that for his chance of walking about the streets this time ten years. With this, Mr. Price snapped his fingers contemptuously, and rang the bell. Give me a sheet of paper, crookie, said Mr. Price to the attendant, 
who in dress and general appearance looked something between a bankrupt glazier and a drover in a state of insolvency, and a glass of brandy and water, crooky, G here. I'm going to write to my father, and I must have a stimulant, or I shan't be able to pitch it strong enough into the old boy. At this facetious speech, the young boy, it is almost needless to say, was fairly convulsed. That's right, said Mr. Price. Never say die. All fun, ain't it? Prime, said the young gentleman. You've got some spirit about you, you have, said Price. You've seen something of life. I rather think I have, replied the boy. He had looked at it through the dirty panes of glass in a bar door. Mr. Pickwick, feeling not a little disgusted with this dialogue, as well as with the air and manner of the two beings by whom it had been carried on, was about to inquire whether he could not be accommodated with a private sitting room. When two or three strangers of genteel appearance entered, at sight of whom the boy threw his cigar into the fire, and whispering to Mr. Price that they had come to make it all right for him, joined them at a table in the farther end of the room. It would appear, however, that matters were not going to be made all right quite so speedily as the young gentleman anticipated. For a very long conversation ensued, of which Mr. Pickwick could not avoid hearing certain angry fragments regarding dissolute conduct, and repeated forgiveness. At last, there were very distinct allusions made by the oldest gentleman of the party to one white cross street, at which the young gentleman, notwithstanding his primeness and his spirit, and his knowledge of life into the bargain, reclined his head upon the table, and howled dismally. Very much satisfied with this sudden bringing down of the youth's valor, and this effectual lowering of his tone, Mr. Pickwick rang the bell, and was shown, at his own request, into a private room furnished with a carpet, table, chairs, sideboard and sofa, and ornamented with a looking-glass, and various old prints. Here he had the advantage of hearing Mrs. Namby's performance on a square piano overhead, while the breakfast was getting ready, when it came, Mr. Perker came too. Aha, my dear sir, said the little man, nailed at last, eh. Come, come, I'm not sorry for it either, because now you'll see the absurdity of this conduct. I've noted down the amount of the taxed costs and damages for which the CASA was issued, and we had better settle at once and lose no time. Namby is come home by this time, I dare say. What say you, my dear sir? Shall I draw a check, or will you? The little man rubbed his hands with affected cheerfulness as he said this, but glancing at Mr. Pickwick's countenance, could not forbear at the same time casting a desponding look towards Sam Weller. Perker, said Mr. Pickwick, let me hear no more of this, I beg. I see no advantage in staying here, so I shall go to prison tonight. You can't go to Whitecross Street, my dear sir, said Perker. Impossible. There are sixty beds in a ward, and the bolts on, sixteen hours out of the four and twenty. I would rather go to some other place of confinement if I can, said Mr. Pickwick. If not, I must make the best I can of that. You can go to the fleet, my dear sir, if you're determined to go somewhere, said Perker. That'll do, said Mr. Pickwick. I'll go there directly I have finished my breakfast. Stop, stop, my dear sir, not the least occasion for being in such a violent hurry to get into a place that most other men are as eager to get out of, said the good-natured little attorney. We must have a habeas corpus. There'll be no judge at Chambers till four o'clock this afternoon. You must wait till then. Very good, said Mr. Pickwick, with unmoved patience. Then we will have a chop here, at two. See about it, Sam, and tell them to be punctual. Mr. Pickwick remaining firm, despite all the remonstrances and arguments of Perker, the chops appeared and disappeared in due course, he was then put into another hackney coach, and carried off to Chancery Lane, after waiting half an hour or so for Mr. Namby, who had a select dinner party and could on no account be disturbed before. There were two judges in attendance at Sergeant's Inn, one King's Bench, and one Common Pleas, and a great deal of business appeared to be transacting before them, if the number of lawyers' clerks who were hurrying in and out with bundles of papers afforded any test. 
When they reached the low archway which forms the entrance to the inn, Perker was detained a few moments parlaying with the coachman about the fare and the change, and Mr. Pickwick, stepping to one side to be out of the way of the stream of people that were pouring in and out, looked about him with some curiosity. The people that attracted his attention most, were three or four men of shabby genteel appearance, who touched their hats to many of the attorneys who passed, and seemed to have some business there, the nature of which Mr. Pickwick could not divine. They were curious-looking fellows. One was a slim and rather lame man in rusty black, and a white neckerchief, another was a stout, burly person, dressed in the same apparel, with a great reddish-black cloth round his neck. A third was a little weazen, drunken-looking body, with a pimply face. They were loitering about, with their hands behind them, and now and then with an anxious countenance whispered something in the ear of some of the gentlemen with papers, as they hurried by. Mr. Pickwick remembered to have very often observed them lounging under the archway when he had been walking past, and his curiosity was quite excited to know to what branch of the profession these dingy-looking loungers could possibly belong. He was about to propound the question to Namby, who kept close beside him, sucking a large gold ring on his little finger, when Perker bustled up, and observing that there was no time to lose, led the way into the inn. As Mr. Pickwick followed, the lame man stepped up to him, and civilly touching his hat, held out a written card, which Mr. Pickwick, not wishing to hurt the man's feelings by refusing, courteously accepted and deposited in his waistcoat pocket. Now, said Perker, turning round before he entered one of the offices, to see that his companions were close behind him. In here, my dear sir. Hello, what do you want? This last question was addressed to the lame man, who, unobserved by Mr. Pickwick, made one of the party. In reply to it, the lame man touched his hat again, with all imaginable politeness, and motioned towards Mr. Pickwick. No, no, said Perker, with a smile. We don't want you, my dear friend, we don't want you. I beg your pardon, sir, said the lame man. The gentleman took my card. I hope you will employ me, sir. The gentleman nodded to me. I'll be judged by the gentleman himself. You nodded to me, sir. Pooh, pooh, nonsense. You didn't nod to anybody, Pickwick. A mistake, a mistake, said Perker. The gentleman handed me his card, replied Mr. Pickwick, producing it from his waistcoat pocket. I accepted it, as the gentleman seemed to wish it, in fact I had some curiosity to look at it when I should be at leisure. I. The little attorney burst into a loud laugh, and returning the card to the lame man, informing him it was all a mistake, whispered to Mr. Pickwick as the man turned away in dudgeon, that he was only a bail. A what? exclaimed Mr. Pickwick. A bail, replied Perker. A bail. Yes, my dear sir, half a dozen of them here. Bail you to any amount, and only charge half a crown. Curious trade, isn't it? said Perker, regaling himself with a pinch of snuff. What? Am I to understand that these men earn a livelihood by waiting about here, to perjure themselves before the judges of the land? at the rate of half a crown a crime, exclaimed Mr. Pickwick, quite aghast at the disclosure. Why, I don't exactly know about perjury, my dear sir, replied the little gentleman. Harsh word, my dear sir, very harsh word indeed. It's a legal fiction, my dear sir, nothing more. Saying which, the attorney shrugged his shoulders, smiled, took a second pinch of snuff, and led the way into the office of the judge's clerk. This was a room of specially dirty appearance, with a very low ceiling and old panelled walls. And so badly lighted, that although it was broad day outside, great tallow candles were burning on the desks. At one end, was a door leading to the judge's private apartment, round which were congregated a crowd of attorneys and managing clerks, who were called in, in the order in which their respective appointments stood upon the file. Every time this door was opened to let a party out, the next party made a violent rush to get in. And, as in addition to the numerous dialogues which passed between the gentlemen who were waiting to see the judge, a variety of personal squabbles ensued between the greater part of those who had seen him. 
there was as much noise as could well be raised in an apartment of such confined dimensions. Nor were the conversations of these gentlemen the only sounds that broke upon the ear. Standing on a box behind a wooden bar at another end of the room was a clerk in spectacles who was taking the affidavits. Large batches of which were, from time to time, carried into the private room by another clerk for the judge's signature. There were a large number of attorneys' clerks to be sworn, and it being a moral impossibility to swear them all at once, the struggles of these gentlemen to reach the clerk in spectacles were like those of a crowd to get in at the pit door of a theater when gracious majesty honors it with its presence. Another functionary, from time to time, exercised his lungs in calling over the names of those who had been sworn, for the purpose of restoring to them their affidavits after they had been signed by the judge, which gave rise to a few more scuffles. And all these things going on at the same time, occasioned as much bustle as the most active and excitable person could desire to behold. There were yet another class of persons, those who were waiting to attend summonses their employers had taken out, which it was optional to the attorney on the opposite side to attend or not, and whose business it was, from time to time. To cry out the opposite attorney's name. To make certain that he was not in attendance without their knowledge. For example. Leaning against the wall, close beside the seat Mr. Pickwick had taken, was an office lad of fourteen, with a tenor voice. Near him a common law clerk with a base one. A clerk hurried in with a bundle of papers, and stared about him. Sniggle and blink, cried the tenor. Porkin and snob, growled the base. Stumpy and deacon, said the newcomer. Nobody answered. The next man who came in, was bailed by the whole three, and he in his turn shouted for another firm, and then somebody else roared in a loud voice for another, and so forth. All this time, the man in the spectacles was hard at work, swearing the clerks. The oath being invariably administered, without any effort at punctuation. And usually in the following terms. Take the book in your right hand this is your name and handwriting you swear that the contents of this your affidavit are true so help you got a shilling you must get change I haven't got it. Well, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, I suppose they are getting the habeas corpus ready? Yes, said Sam, and I wish they'd bring out the have his carcass. It's wary unpleasant keepin' us veitin' here. I'd ha got half a dozen have his carcasses ready, packed up and all, by this time. What sort of cumbrous and unmanageable machine, Sam Weller imagined a habeas corpus to be, does not appear, for Perker, at that moment, walked up and took Mr. Pickwick away. The usual forms having been gone through, the body of Samuel Pickwick was soon afterwards confided to the custody of the tipstaff, to be by him taken to the warden of the fleet prison. And there detained until the amount of the damages and costs in the action of Bardell against Pickwick was fully paid and satisfied. And that, said Mr. Pickwick, laughing, will be a very long time. Sam, call another hackney coach. Perker, my dear friend, goodbye. I shall go with you, and see you safe there, said Perker. Indeed, replied Mr. Pickwick, I would rather go without any other attendant than Sam. As soon as I get settled, I will write and let you know, and I shall expect you immediately. Until then, goodbye. As Mr. Pickwick said this, he got into the coach which had by this time arrived, followed by the tipstaff. Sam having stationed himself on the box, it rolled away. A most extraordinary man that, said Perker, as he stopped to pull on his gloves. What a bankrupt he'd make, sir, observed Mr. Lowten, who was standing near. How he would bother the commissioners. He'd set M at defiance if they talked of committing him, sir. The attorney did not appear very much delighted with his clerk's professional estimate of Mr. Pickwick's character, for he walked away without deigning any reply. The hackney coach jolted along Fleet Street, as hackney coaches usually do. The horses went better, the driver said, when they had anything before them, they must have gone at a most extraordinary pace when there was nothing, and so the vehicle kept behind a cart, when the cart stopped, it stopped. And when the cart went on again, it did the same. Mr. Pickwick sat opposite the tipstaff, 
and the tipstaff sat with his hat between his knees, whistling a tune, and looking out of the coach window. Time performs wonders. By the powerful old gentleman's aid, even a hackney coach gets over half a mile of ground. They stopped at length, and Mr. Pickwick alighted at the gate of the fleet. The tipstaff, just looking over his shoulder to see that his charge was following close at his heels, preceded Mr. Pickwick into the prison. Turning to the left, after they had entered, they passed through an open door into a lobby, from which a heavy gate, opposite to that by which they had entered, and which was guarded by a stout turnkey with the key in his hand, led at once into the interior of the prison. Here they stopped, while the tipstaff delivered his papers, and here Mr. Pickwick was apprised that he would remain, until he had undergone the ceremony, known to the initiated as, sitting for your portrait. Sitting for my portrait, said Mr. Pickwick. Having your likeness taken, sir, replied the stout turnkey. We're capital hands at likenesses here. Take M in no time, and always exact. Walk in, sir, and make yourself at home. Mr. Pickwick complied with the invitation, and sat himself down, when Mr. Weller, who stationed himself at the back of the chair, whispered that the sitting was merely another term for undergoing an inspection by the different turnkeys, in order that they might know prisoners from visitors. Well, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, then I wish the artists would come. This is rather a public place. They vaunt be long, sir, I dessay, replied Sam. There's a Dutch clock, sir. So I see, observed Mr. Pickwick. And a bird cage, sir, says Sam. Veals within veals, a prison in a prison. Ain't it, sir? As Mr. Weller made this philosophical remark, Mr. Pickwick was aware that his sitting had commenced. The stout turnkey having been relieved from the lock, sat down, and looked at him carelessly, from time to time, while a long thin man who had relieved him, thrust his hands beneath his coat tails, and planting himself opposite, took a good long view of him. A third rather surly looking gentleman, who had apparently been disturbed at his tea, for he was disposing of the last remnant of a crust and butter when he came in, stationed himself close to Mr. Pickwick. And, resting his hands on his hips, inspected him narrowly, while two others mixed with the group, and studied his features with most intent and thoughtful faces. Mr. Pickwick winced a good deal under the operation, and appeared to sit very uneasily in his chair. But he made no remark to anybody while it was being performed, not even to Sam, who reclined upon the back of the chair, reflecting, partly on the situation of his master, and partly on the great satisfaction it would have afforded him to make a fierce assault upon all the turnkeys there assembled, one after the other, if it were lawful and peaceable so to do. At length the likeness was completed, and Mr. Pickwick was informed that he might now proceed into the prison. Where am I to sleep tonight? inquired Mr. Pickwick. Why, I don't rightly know about tonight, replied the stout turnkey. You'll be chummed on somebody tomorrow, and then you'll be all snug and comfortable. The first night's generally rather unsettled, but you'll be set all squares tomorrow. After some discussion, it was discovered that one of the turnkeys had a bed to let, which Mr. Pickwick could have for that night. He gladly agreed to hire it. If you'll come with me, I'll show it you at once, said the man. It ain't a large un. But it's an out and outer to sleep in. This way, sir. They passed through the inner gate, and descended a short flight of steps. The key was turned after them, and Mr. Pickwick found himself, for the first time in his life, within the walls of a debtor's prison. Chapter 41 What befell Mr. Pickwick when he got into the fleet, what prisoners he saw there, and how he passed the night. Mr. Tom Roker, the gentleman who had accompanied Mr. Pickwick into the prison, turned sharp round to the right when he got to the bottom of the little flight of steps, and led the way, through an iron gate which stood open, and up another short flight of steps, into a long narrow gallery. Dirty and low, paved with stone, and very dimly lighted by a window at each remote end. This, said the gentleman, thrusting his hands into his pockets, and looking carelessly over his shoulder to Mr. Pickwick, this here is the hall flight. 
Oh, replied Mr. Pickwick, looking down a dark and filthy staircase, which appeared to lead to a range of damp and gloomy stone vaults, beneath the ground, and those, I suppose, are the little cellars where the prisoners keep their small quantities of coals. Unpleasant places to have to go down to, but very convenient, I dare say. Yes, I shouldn't wonder if they was convenient, replied the gentleman, seeing that a few people live there, pretty snug. That's the fare, that is. My friend, said Mr. Pickwick, you don't really mean to say that human beings live down in those wretched dungeons? Don't I, replied Mr. Roker, with indignant astonishment, why shouldn't I? Live, live down there, exclaimed Mr. Pickwick. Live down there. Yes, and die down there, too, very often, replied Mr. Roker, and what of that? Who's got to say anything egg in it? Live down there. Yes, and a very good place it is to live in, ain't it? As Roker turned somewhat fiercely upon Mr. Pickwick in saying this, and moreover muttered in an excited fashion certain unpleasant invocations concerning his own eyes, limbs, and circulating fluids, the latter gentleman deemed it advisable to pursue the discourse no further. Mr. Roker then proceeded to mount another staircase, as dirty as that which led to the place which has just been the subject of discussion, in which ascent he was closely followed by Mr. Pickwick and Sam. There, said Mr. Roker, pausing for breath when they reached another gallery of the same dimensions as the one below, this is the coffee room flight, the one above's the third, and the one above that's the top. And the room where you're a going to sleep tonight is the warden's room, and it's this way, come on. Having said all this in a breath, Mr. Roker mounted another flight of stairs with Mr. Pickwick and Sam Weller following at his heels. These staircases received light from sundry windows placed at some little distance above the floor, and looking into a graveled area bounded by a high brick wall, with iron chevaux de frise at the top. This area, it appeared from Mr. Roker's statement, was the racket ground. And it further appeared, on the testimony of the same gentleman, that there was a smaller area in that portion of the prison which was nearest Farringdon Street, denominated and called the Painted Ground. From the fact of its walls having once displayed the semblance of various men of war in full sail, and other artistical effects achieved in bygone times by some imprisoned draftsman in his leisure hours. Having communicated this piece of information, apparently more for the purpose of discharging his bosom of an important fact, than with any specific view of enlightening Mr. Pickwick, the guide, having at length reached another gallery, led the way into a small passage at the extreme end, opened a door, and disclosed an apartment of an appearance by no means inviting, containing eight or nine iron bedsteads. There, said Mr. Roker, holding the door open, and looking triumphantly round at Mr. Pickwick, there's a room. Mr. Pickwick's face, however, betokened such a very trifling portion of satisfaction at the appearance of his lodging, that Mr. Roker looked, for a reciprocity of feeling, into the countenance of Samuel Weller, who, until now, had observed a dignified silence. There's a room, young man, observed Mr. Roker. I see it, replied Sam, with a placid nod of the head. You wouldn't think to find such a room as this in the Farringdon Hotel, would you, said Mr. Roker, with a complacent smile. To this Mr. Weller replied with an easy and unstudied closing of one eye. Which might be considered to mean either that he would have thought it, or that he would not have thought it, or that he had never thought anything at all about it, as the observer's imagination suggested. Having executed this feat, and reopened his eye, Mr. Weller proceeded to inquire which was the individual bedstead that Mr. Roker had so flatteringly described as an out and outer to sleep in. That's it, replied Mr. Roker, pointing to a very rusty one in a corner. It would make any one go to sleep, that bedstead would, whether they wanted to or not. I should think, said Sam, eyeing the piece of furniture in question with a look of excessive disgust, I should think Poppy's was nothing to it. Nothing at all, said Mr. Roker. And I suppose, said Sam, with a sidelong glance at his master, as if to see whether there were any symptoms of his determination being shaken by what passed, I suppose the other gentlemen as sleeps here are gentlemen. Nothing but it, said Mr. Roker. 
One of them takes his twelve pints of ale a day, and never leaves off smoking even at his meals. He must be a first-rater, said Sam. A one, replied Mr. Roker. Nothing daunted, even by this intelligence, Mr. Pickwick smilingly announced his determination to test the powers of the narcotic bedstead for that night, and Mr. Roker, after informing him that he could retire to rest at whatever hour he thought proper, without any further notice or formality, walked off, leaving him standing with Sam in the gallery. It was getting dark. That is to say, a few gas jets were kindled in this place which was never light, by way of compliment to the evening, which had set in outside. As it was rather warm, some of the tenants of the numerous little rooms which opened into the gallery on either hand, had set their doors ajar. Mr. Pickwick peeped into them as he passed along, with great curiosity and interest. Here, four or five great hulking fellows, just visible through a cloud of tobacco smoke, were engaged in noisy and riotous conversation over half-emptied pots of beer, or playing at all fours with a very greasy pack of cards. In the adjoining room, some solitary tenant might be seen pouring, by the light of a feeble tallow candle, over a bundle of soiled and tattered papers, yellow with dust and dropping to pieces from age, writing, for the hundredth time. Some lengthened statement of his grievances, for the perusal of some great man whose eyes it would never reach, or whose heart it would never touch. In a third, a man, with his wife and a whole crowd of children, might be seen making up a scanty bed on the ground, or upon a few chairs, for the younger ones to pass the night in. And in a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth, and a seventh, the noise, and the beer, and the tobacco smoke, and the cards, all came over again in greater force than before. In the galleries themselves, and more especially on the staircases, there lingered a great number of people, who came there, some because their rooms were empty and lonesome, others because their rooms were full and hot. The greater part because they were restless and uncomfortable, and not possessed of the secret of exactly knowing what to do with themselves. There were many classes of people here, from the laboring man in his fustian jacket, to the broken-down spendthrift in his shawl dressing gown, most appropriately out at elbows. But there was the same air about them all, a kind of listless, jailbird, careless swagger, a vagabondish who's afraid sort of bearing, which is wholly indescribable in words, but which any man can understand in one moment if he wish. By setting foot in the nearest debtor's prison, and looking at the very first group of people he sees there, with the same interest as Mr. Pickwick did. It strikes me, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, leaning over the iron rail at the stairhead, it strikes me, Sam, that imprisonment for debt is scarcely any punishment at all. Think not, sir, inquired Mr. Weller. You see how these fellows drink, and smoke, and roar, replied Mr. Pickwick. It's quite impossible that they can mind it much. Ah, that's just the wary thing, sir, rejoined Sam, they don't mind it. It's a reglar holiday to them, all porter and skittles. It's the t'other vuns as gets done over vit this sort o' oh, thing, them downhearted fellers as can't swig avy at the beer, nor play at skittles neither. Them as vood pay if they could, and gets low by being boxed up. I'll tell you what it is, sir, them as is always a idlin, in public houses it don't damage at all, and them as is alvis a workin, when they can, it damages too much. It's unequal, as my father used to say when his grog weren't made half and half, it's unequal, and that's the fault on it. I think you're right, Sam, said Mr. Pickwick, after a few moments' reflection, quite right. Perhaps, now and then, there's some honest people as likes it, observed Mr. Weller, in a ruminative tone, but I never heard oh one as I can call to mind, cept the little dirty-faced man in the brown coat, and that was force of habit. And who was he? inquired Mr. Pickwick. W.I., that's just the wary point as nobody never knowed, replied Sam. But what did he do? W.I., he did what many men as has been much better knowed has done in their time, sir, replied Sam, he run a match egg in the constable, and vun it. In other words, I suppose, said Mr. Pickwick, he got into debt. Just that, sir, replied Sam, and in course o' oh, time he come here in consequence. It warn't much, execution for nine pound nothing, 
multiplied by five for costs, but how's ever here he stopped for seventeen year. If he got any wrinkles in his face, they were stopped up with the dirt, for both the dirty face and the brown coat was just the same at the end oh, that time as they was at the beginning. He was a wary peaceful, inoffendant little creeter, and was always a bustlin, about for somebody, or playin rackets and never vinin. Till at last the turnkeys they got quite fond on him, and he was in the lodge every night, a chattering with em, and tellin, stories, and all that, air. One night he was in there as usual, along with a wary old friend of his, as was on the lock, then he says all of a sudden, I ain't seen the market outside, Bill, he says, fleet market was there at that time, I ain't seen the market outside, Bill. He says, for seventeen year. I know you ain't, says the turnkey, smoking his pipe. I should like to see it for a minute, Bill, he says. Wary probable, says the turnkey, smoking his pipe wary fierce, and making believe he warn't up to what the little man wanted. Bill, says the little man, more abrupt than afore, I've got the fancy in my head. Let me see the public streets once more afore I die. And if I ain't struck with apoplexy, I'll be back in five minutes by the clock. And what, you d become o, oh, me if you was struck with apoplexy, said the turnkey. W.I., says the little creeter, whoever found me, you d bring me home, for I've got my card in my pocket, Bill, he says, no. Twenty, coffee room flight, and that was true, sure enough, for when he wanted to make the acquaintance of any newcomer, he used to pull out a little limp card with them words on it and nothing else. In consideration of which, he vas alves called number twenty. The turnkey takes a fixed look at him, and at last he says in a solemn manner, twenty, he says, I'll trust you, you won't get your old friend into trouble. No, my boy. I hope I've something better behind here, says the little man, and as he said it he hit his little vesket wary hard, and then a tear started out oh each eye, which was wary extraordinary, for it was supposed as water never touched his face. He shook the turnkey by the hand, out he vent. And never came back again, said Mr. Pickwick. Wrong for once, sir, replied Mr. Weller, for back he come, two minutes afore the time, a bylin with rage, saying how he'd been nearly run over by a hackney coach that he warn't used to it, and he was blowed if he wouldn't write to the Lord Mayor. They got him pacified at last. And for five years arter that, he never even so much as peeped out oh, the lodge gate. At the expiration of that time he died, I suppose, said Mr. Pickwick. No, he didn't, sir, replied Sam. He got a curiosity to go and taste the beer at a new public house over the way, and it was such a wary nice parlour, that he took it into his head to go there every night, which he did for a long time. Always coming back Reglar about a quarter of an hour afore the gate shut, which was all wary snug and comfortable. At last he began to get so precious jolly, that he used to forget how the time vent, or care nothing, at all about it, and he went on getting later and later. Till one night his old friend was just a shutting the gate, had turned the key in fact, when he come up. Hold hard, Bill, he says. What, ain't you come home yet, Twenty, says the turnkey, I thought you was in, long ago. No, I wasn't, says the little man, with a smile. Well, then, I'll tell you what it is, my friend, says the turnkey, opening the gate wary slow and sulky, it's my opinion as you've got into bad company, oh, late, which I'm wary sorry to see. Now, I don't wish to do nothing harsh, he says, but if you can't confine yourself to steady circles, and find your way back at Reglar hours, as sure as you're a standin' there, I'll shut you out altogether. The little man was seized with a violent fit o oh, tremblin', and never vent outside the prison walls artervards. As Sam concluded, Mr. Pickwick slowly retraced his steps downstairs. After a few thoughtful turns in the painted ground, which, as it was now dark, was nearly deserted, he intimated to Mr. Weller that he thought it high time for him to withdraw for the night. Requesting him to seek a bed in some adjacent public house, and return early in the morning, to make arrangements for the removal of his master's wardrobe from the George and Vulture. This request Mr. Samuel Weller prepared to obey, 
with as good a grace as he could assume, but with a very considerable show of reluctance nevertheless. He even went so far as to essay sundry ineffectual hints regarding the expediency of stretching himself on the gravel for that night, but finding Mr. Pickwick obstinately deaf to any such suggestions, finally withdrew. There is no disguising the fact that Mr. Pickwick felt very low-spirited and uncomfortable, not for lack of society, for the prison was very full, and a bottle of wine would at once have purchased the utmost good fellowship of a few choice spirits. Without any more formal ceremony of introduction. But he was alone in the coarse, vulgar crowd, and felt the depression of spirits and sinking of heart, naturally consequent on the reflection that he was cooped and caged up, without a prospect of liberation. As to the idea of releasing himself by ministering to the sharpness of Dodson and Fogg, it never for an instant entered his thoughts. In this frame of mind he turned again into the coffee-room gallery, and walked slowly to and fro. The place was intolerably dirty, and the smell of tobacco smoke perfectly suffocating. There was a perpetual slamming and banging of doors as the people went in and out. And the noise of their voices and footsteps echoed and re-echoed through the passages constantly. A young woman, with a child in her arms, who seemed scarcely able to crawl, from emaciation and misery, was walking up and down the passage in conversation with her husband, who had no other place to see her in. As they passed Mr. Pickwick, he could hear the female sob bitterly, and once she burst into such a passion of grief, that she was compelled to lean against the wall for support, while the man took the child in his arms, and tried to soothe her. Mr. Pickwick's heart was really too full to bear it, and he went upstairs to bed. Now, although the warder's room was a very uncomfortable one, being, in every point of decoration and convenience, several hundred degrees inferior to the common infirmary of a county jail. It had at present the merit of being wholly deserted save by Mr. Pickwick himself. So, he sat down at the foot of his little iron bedstead, and began to wonder how much a year the warder made out of the dirty room. Having satisfied himself, by mathematical calculation, that the apartment was about equal in annual value to the freehold of a small street in the suburbs of London. He took to wondering what possible temptation could have induced a dingy-looking fly that was crawling over his pantaloons to come into a close prison. When he had the choice of so many airy situations, a course of meditation which led him to the irresistible conclusion that the insect was insane. After settling this point, he began to be conscious that he was getting sleepy. Whereupon he took his nightcap out of the pocket in which he had had the precaution to stow it in the morning, and, leisurely undressing himself, got into bed and fell asleep. Bravo! Heel over toe, cut and shuffle, pay away at it, Zephyr. I'm smothered if the opera house isn't your proper hemisphere. Keep it up. Hooray! These expressions, delivered in a most boisterous tone, and accompanied with loud peals of laughter, roused Mr. Pickwick from one of those sound slumbers which, lasting in reality some half-hour, seemed to the sleeper to have been protracted for three weeks or a month. The voice had no sooner ceased than the room was shaken with such violence that the windows rattled in their frames, and the bedsteads trembled again. Mr. Pickwick started up, and remained for some minutes fixed in mute astonishment at the scene before him. On the floor of the room, a man in a broad-skirted green coat, with corduroy knee smalls and grey cotton stockings, was performing the most popular steps of a hornpipe, with a slang and burlesque caricature of grace and lightness, which, combined with the very appropriate character of his costume, was inexpressibly absurd. Another man, evidently very drunk, who had probably been tumbled into bed by his companions, was sitting up between the sheets, warbling as much as he could recollect of a comic song, with the most intensely sentimental feeling and expression. While a third, seated on one of the bedsteads, was applauding both performers with the air of a profound connoisseur, and encouraging them by such ebullitions of feeling as had already roused Mr. Pickwick from his sleep. This last man was an admirable specimen of a class of gentry which never can be seen in full perfection but in such places, they may be met with, in an imperfect state, occasionally about stable yards and public houses. But they never attain their full bloom except in these hotbeds, 
which would almost seem to be considerately provided by the legislature for the sole purpose of rearing them. He was a tall fellow, with an olive complexion, long dark hair, and very thick bushy whiskers meeting under his chin. He wore no neckerchief, as he had been playing rackets all day, and his open shirt collar displayed their full luxuriance. On his head he wore one of the common eighteenpenny French skullcaps, with a gaudy tassel dangling therefrom, very happily in keeping with a common fustian coat. His legs, which, being long, were afflicted with weakness, graced a pair of Oxford mixture trousers, made to show the full symmetry of those limbs. Being somewhat negligently braced, however, and, moreover, but imperfectly buttoned, they fell in a series of not the most graceful folds over a pair of shoes sufficiently down at heel to display a pair of very soiled white stockings. There was a rakish, vagabond smartness, and a kind of boastful rascality, about the whole man, that was worth a mine of gold. This figure was the first to perceive that Mr. Pickwick was looking on. Upon which he winked to the Zephyr, and entreated him, with mock gravity, not to wake the gentleman. Why, bless the gentleman's honest heart and soul, said the Zephyr, turning round and affecting the extremity of surprise, the gentleman is awake. Hem, Shakespeare. How do you do, sir? How is Mary and Sarah, sir? And the dear old lady at home, sir? Will you have the kindness to put my compliments into the first little parcel you're sending that way, sir, and say that I would have sent them before, only I was afraid they might be broken in the wagon, sir? Don't overwhelm the gentleman with ordinary civilities when you see he's anxious to have something to drink, said the gentleman with the whiskers, with a jocose air. Why don't you ask the gentleman what he'll take? Dear me, I quite forgot, replied the other. What will you take, sir? Will you take port wine, sir, or sherry wine, sir? I can recommend the ale, sir, or perhaps you'd like to taste the porter, sir. Allow me to have the felicity of hanging up your nightcap, sir. With this, the speaker snatched that article of dress from Mr. Pickwick's head, and fixed it in a twinkling on that of the drunken man, who, firmly impressed with the belief that he was delighting a numerous assembly, continued to hammer away at the comic song in the most melancholy strains imaginable. Taking a man's nightcap from his brow by violent means, and adjusting it on the head of an unknown gentleman, of dirty exterior, however ingenious a witticism in itself, is unquestionably one of those which come under the denomination of practical jokes. Viewing the matter precisely in this light, Mr. Pickwick, without the slightest intimation of his purpose, sprang vigorously out of bed, struck the Zephyr so smart a blow in the chest as to deprive him of a considerable portion of the commodity which sometimes bears his name, and then, recapturing his nightcap, boldly placed himself in an attitude of defense. Now, said Mr. Pickwick, gasping no less from excitement than from the expenditure of so much energy, come on, both of you, both of you. With this liberal invitation the worthy gentleman communicated a revolving motion to his clenched fists, by way of appalling his antagonists with a display of science. It might have been Mr. Pickwick's very unexpected gallantry, or it might have been the complicated manner in which he had got himself out of bed, and fallen all in a mass upon the hornpipe man, that touched his adversaries. Touched they were. For, instead of then and there making an attempt to commit manslaughter, as Mr. Pickwick implicitly believed they would have done, they paused, stared at each other a short time, and finally laughed outright. Well, you're a trump, and I like you all the better for it, said the Zephyr. Now jump into bed again, or you'll catch the rheumatics. No malice, I hope. Said the man, extending a hand the size of the yellow clump of fingers which sometimes swings over a glover's door. Certainly not, said Mr. Pickwick, with great alacrity. For, now that the excitement was over, he began to feel rather cool about the legs. Allow me the H owner, said the gentleman with the whiskers, presenting his dexter hand, and aspirating the H. With much pleasure, sir, said Mr. Pickwick. And having executed a very long and solemn shake, he got into bed again. My name is Smangle, sir, said the man with the whiskers. Oh, said Mr. Pickwick. Mine is Mavins, said the man in the stockings. I am delighted to hear it, 
sir, said Mr. Pickwick. Hem, coughed Mr. Smangle. Did you speak, sir, said Mr. Pickwick. No, I did not, sir, said Mr. Smangle. All this was very genteel and pleasant, and, to make matters still more comfortable, Mr. Smangle assured Mr. Pickwick a great many more times that he entertained a very high respect for the feelings of a gentleman, which sentiment, indeed, did him infinite credit, as he could be in no wise supposed to understand them. Are you going through the court, sir? inquired Mr. Smangle. Through the what? said Mr. Pickwick. Through the court, Portugal Street, the court for relief of, you know. Oh, no, replied Mr. Pickwick. No, I am not. Going out, perhaps? suggested Mr. Mavins. I fear not, replied Mr. Pickwick. I refuse to pay some damages, and am here in consequence. Ah, said Mr. Smangle, paper has been my ruin. A stationer, I presume, sir, said Mr. Pickwick innocently. Stationer. No, no. Confound and curse me. Not so low as that. No trade. When I say paper, I mean bills. Oh, you use the word in that sense. I see, said Mr. Pickwick. Damn. A gentleman must expect reverses, said Smangle. What of that? Here am I in the fleet prison. Well, good. What then? I'm none the worse for that, am I? Not a bit, replied Mr. Mavins. And he was quite right, for, so far from Mr. Smangle being any the worse for it, he was something the better, inasmuch as to qualify himself for the place, he had attained gratuitous possession of certain articles of jewellery, which, long before that, had found their way to the pawnbrokers. Well, but come, said Mr. Smangle, this is dry work. Let's rinse our mouths with a drop of burnt sherry, the last comer shall stand it, Mavins shall fetch it, and I'll help to drink it. That's a fair and gentlemanlike division of labor, anyhow. Curse me. Unwilling to hazard another quarrel, Mr. Pickwick gladly assented to the proposition, and consigned the money to Mr. Mavins, who, as it was nearly eleven o'clock, lost no time in repairing to the coffee-room on his errand. I say, whispered Smangle, the moment his friend had left the room, what did you give him? Half a sovereign, said Mr. Pickwick. He's a devilish pleasant gentlemanly dog, said Mr. Smangle, infernal pleasant. I don't know anybody more so. But, here Mr. Smangle stopped short, and shook his head dubiously. You don't think there is any probability of his appropriating the money to his own use, said Mr. Pickwick. Oh, no. Mind, I don't say that. I expressly say that he's a devilish gentlemanly fellow, said Mr. Smangle. But I think, perhaps, if somebody went down, just to see that he didn't dip his beak into the jug by accident, or make some confounded mistake in losing the money as he came upstairs, it would be as well. Here, you sir, just run downstairs, and look after that gentleman, will you? This request was addressed to a little timid-looking, nervous man, whose appearance bespoke great poverty, and who had been crouching on his bedstead all this while, apparently stupefied by the novelty of his situation. You know where the coffee room is, said Smangle, just run down, and tell that gentleman you've come to help him up with the jug. Or, stop, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you how we'll do him, said Smangle, with a cunning look. How, said Mr. Pickwick. Send down word that he's to spend the change in cigars. Capital thought. Run and tell him that, gee here. They shan't be wasted, continued Smangle, turning to Mr. Pickwick. I'll smoke M. This maneuvering was so exceedingly ingenious and, withal, performed with such a movable composure and coolness, that Mr. Pickwick would have had no wish to disturb it, even if he had had the power. In a short time Mr. Mivins returned, bearing the sherry, which Mr. Smangle dispensed in two little cracked mugs. Considerately remarking, with reference to himself, that a gentleman must not be particular under such circumstances, and that, for his part, he was not too proud to drink out of the jug. In which, to show his sincerity, he forthwith pledged the company in a draft which half emptied it. 
an excellent understanding having been by these means promoted, Mr. Smangel proceeded to entertain his hearers with a relation of divers' romantic adventures in which he had been from time to time engaged, involving various interesting anecdotes of a thoroughbred horse, and a magnificent Jewess. Both of surpassing beauty, and much coveted by the nobility and gentry of these kingdoms. Long before these elegant extracts from the biography of a gentleman were concluded, Mr. Mavins had Baedeken himself to bed, and had set in snoring for the night, leaving the timid stranger and Mr. Pickwick to the full benefit of Mr. Smangle's experiences. Nor were the two last-named gentlemen as much edified as they might have been by the moving passages narrated. Mr. Pickwick had been in a state of slumber for some time, when he had a faint perception of the drunken man bursting out afresh with the comic song, and receiving from Mr. Smangle a gentle intimation, through the medium of the water jug, that his audience was not musically disposed. Mr. Pickwick then once again dropped off to sleep, with a confused consciousness that Mr. Smangle was still engaged in relating a long story, the chief point of which appeared to be that, on some occasion particularly stated and set forth, he had done a bill and a gentleman at the same time. Chapter 42